the National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, room 114. It is 4.47 p.m. the afternoon of October 29th, 1927. Liz Ferris, a chambermaid at the Hotel Alamo in the town of Limpia, Texas, approaches Sam Bixby, the desk clerk. Mr. Bixby. Hmm? <laughs> oh, Liz, thought you went home. I uh, can't see if I'll ever get home till I get the rooms finished. And I still ain't been in room 114. 114? Mm hmm? That's Mr. Boland's room. Oh, he went out a couple hours ago. Well, he left one of them do-not-disturb cards on his door just the same. His key ain't in the box there. I looked before while you were sorting out the mail. Well, he probably just forgot to leave his key. You got your pass key, you can get in. Well, how'd you know he didn't come back again without you seeing him? Suppose he's in there taking a bath. <laughs> all right, Liz, all right, come on. I'll come back with you. Give me the keys. Uh -huh. Some folks don't care at all when I finish work, long as they can sleep the day away. Now, Liz, Mr. Boland's been here for two days, and this is the first time he's given you any trouble. Well, if it ain't him, it's somebody else. There, there's that do not disturb card on the door, like I said. You try knocking? Not on the door, of course I didn't. I got some consideration for other folks, even if they ain't got none for me. Besides, I run the vacuum cleaner in the hall hard enough to wake the dead. Well, he don't answer and knock. Sure, he went out. Well, you're so sure. Why don't you open the door, then? You, uh... You in, Mr. Boland? Mr. Boland? He's out, all right. Go ahead, Liz. All right, I'll make the bed first, then get the bed. <gasps> sell some cattle at the auction barn. All the way up here from Lone Star to auction cattle? It's pretty far. Mm, not that you mention it is. Yeah, plenty far. I discovered the body. The rest of the scene. You must pass him out in the hall. I told him to wait right outside. Yeah, I saw him. We better talk to him. Right. Just trying to clean the Yes, Range wants to go. Oh, sure thing. I already told you all I know, Sheriff. Anybody come in to visit in this room today? Well, that's hard to say, Ranger. A lot of cattlemen in town when the auction's running. 
Well, nobody stopped by the desk, but you know how it is. Men know each other, visit around. Sure. If he'd been out tending his business like a man ought to be, he mightn't be dead. That's what I said. Now, Liz, I told you he was out. I saw him go. When was this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little later, maybe. But I didn't see him come in again. Are you sure it was Boland you saw? Might have been somebody dressed like him, wearing his clothes, maybe. Oh, no, I saw him good enough to know for sure. Stopped just a few feet from the desk to wipe his eyeglasses with a handkerchief. Eyeglasses? There's something wrong with that, Gene? I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, he wear glasses all the time? Mm, every time I yeah, see him, sure he did. I see. When you opened this door, most of the body was hidden by the bed, wasn't it? Yeah. That's right. The bed's been moved since then. I think you better come in and identify the body. Oh, do we have to? Yeah, I'm afraid it's necessary. Because the man in here didn't wear glasses. Oh. Come on. Okay. Now, look, he, he wouldn't have to be wearing them when he was killed, Jay. He never wore them. The man who wears glasses all the time has little pressure marks alongside the bridge of his nose. It's a thing we always look for. Helps with identification. Now, move the sheet. Mm-hmm. What? That ain't Mr. Bowling. No, it ain't. Well, then who is this man? Sheriff, I don't know. I, I never saw him before. He, he's a lot different. Mr. Bowling not only wore glasses, he had a mustache. Mm -hmm. And this fella don't. This couldn't be him clean-shaven? No, sir, could not. Looks like Bowling isn't our victim, Sheriff. Looks like he's the killer. <laughs> photos of the dead man, got a quick developing job done, then headed for Lone Star, the town Boland had given us his address. On the way, I called my headquarters and asked to have Ranger Steve Clark meet me there. He was waiting at the county courthouse when I drove up. Howdy, Jason. Howdy, Steve. Been waiting long? No, just got here about half an hour ago. Say, what's up? Headquarters fill you in on the killing of the Alamo Hotel in Olympia? Yeah, they told me about it. Here. How far out's the Boland Ranch? Well, it begins nine miles southwest. What do we do, go out and grab Boland? If he's around, but it isn't likely. After checking out of that hotel and leaving a dead man in his room... Why'd you head this way, then? Well, nobody at Olympia had seen the dead man before. we got to find out who he is. If there was bad blood between him and Boland, somebody around here might know about it. That's a good thought. I'll load my horse in with yours, and we can go out to the ranch and wake him up. <laughs> spreading and sprawling out south of the main highway. The ranch house was deserted except for a Mexican woman. She was frightened and wouldn't unlatch the screen door. We just want to talk to you, ma'am. Go away, all. go away. You come back again when Mr. Boland is here. We're Texas Rangers. We just want some information from you. I know nothing, please. You go away. If Mr. Boland is in there, we'd like to talk to him. No one is here, senor. No one but me. It won't do you any good to hide him, ma'am. If he's not there, why can't we come in and look around? No. We should have gotten the search warrant, James. No, she's just frightened because she's alone. There ought to be somebody else around a ranch this size. Boland must have hands. Yeah. Uh, where are the men, senora? The vaqueros who work on the ranch. Round up, all out to work, they round up. All right, senor. You can go back to bed. We'll go talk to them. <laughs> Your senora wasn't too happy to see you, boy. I know. Well, let's get the horses out of the trailer. You really want to look for those cowboys tonight? Yeah, because we got plenty of other things to do in the morning. Come on, Charcoal. I'm going. Come on. What's on your mind for the morning? Find out where Boland banks. Watch his account so we can trace him if he cashes a check anyplace. Hey, it'll make it tougher for him to hide, all right. That's how I want to make it. Tough. Well, let's ride. Yeah. Get up, sir. Get up. Get up. Ha. Ha. Boland had plenty of stock, all right. He passed cows and calves for the score. But ground marks showed that the main herds, the selling beef, were driving south. Railroad runs to the south, Chase. Guess they're moving them that way for shipping. Figures. That's why we had to ride so far. Yeah, it must make, take them three or four days to cut out the steers and drive them to a main camp. We ought to be spotting some riders soon. Rail marks have been getting fresher. And if we don't, we're going to have to rest these ponies. We've been knocking on them steady now for about That's three... It's all right. We're getting yeah. close. They can rest soon. Look. Where? Mace over there in the moonlight. Look down at the base. On the east end. Yeah, campfire. Come on, Charlie. Come on, get out. 
the stock now, only part of the herd from the looks of it. Probably got a few folks working each section driving into the railhead from different angles. They can drive them any way they want. All I want is somebody who can identify the photographs of a dead man. <laughs> by cow folks, they gotta be around. Horses couldn't move far if they were hobbled, but there ain't any horses inside either. Nothing but part of the herd. Maybe they moved around the other side of the mesa. <coughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, Where'd that shot come from, Jace? Up a brush and rock at the edge of the mesa. Whoa, easy. Come on, Hold it. Here we are. Come on, boy, we can see you and keep your hands high. Not while you're gunning from cover. Who are you? Color, this trolley's small. Never mind the introductions, Color. You always throw lead at anybody riding this range? I fired over your head. Just a warning. A warning for what? It's orders, Rangers. Somebody's been making off with some stock, and Boland told us to be on the lookout for strange riders. Boland? He around? No. When did you see him last? Just before we started out on Roundup. Teller and I ain't seen anybody but each other for almost a week. And you don't have any idea where your boss might be? How would we know? You seem mighty anxious to find him. I am mighty anxious. Well, the boss in uh, some kind of trouble? He's in plenty of trouble. We'll find it out sooner or later. Yeah. He's wanted for murdering a man in a hotel in Limpia. So if you know where he is or even where he might be, you better talk up. Well, if we knew, we'd tell you right off, but we don't. You know anybody Bolin's been having trouble with? No. Nope. Well, the boss never had trouble with nobody. There's a dead man would disagree with that if he could. Get those photos out of your saddlebag, will you, Steve? Right. Maybe you can identify the man Bowen killed. Here you are, Chief. Thanks. Here, Teller, you're yes. too small. Huh? Take a look. Why, say, Ranger, Bowen never killed this man. What makes you so sure of that? Because this is the boss. This is a picture of Bowen himself. <laughs> You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Room 114, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We had our killer cold, knew his name, his address, and he turned out to be the dead man. Case fell apart. It didn't make sense. You're sure this is a photo of Bowling? We ought to know. We've been working for him for a year ever since he came down from Wyoming and bought this spread. The best clerk at the hotel in Limpia said he'd never seen this man before. I can't have that. Bowling was registered at that hotel for two days. The clerk said he wore eyeglasses and a mustache. Then the man he saw wasn't Henry Bowling. There's something fishy about this whole thing, Jace. I can't figure why anybody. Wait a minute, Steve. Huh? You fellas said Bolin thought somebody was running his stock off? Yes, right. Is his brand registered? Well, sure it is. Box B brand. Thanks. If you want any more information, we'll be out to see you later. Come on, Steve. But, Jay's Come we... on. Get mounted. Get up, son. Get up. Come on. Hope you catch the man you after. Hey. What's on your mind, Jace? What'd you ask about the missing cattle and the brand registration? Bolin thought some of his cattle were missing. The registered brand stolen cattle are hard to get rid of. It wouldn't be so hard if the thief took them to an out-of-the-way auction barn like the one in Limpia and then pretended to be Boland when he sold them. Hey, Jace, that makes sense. Sure it does. That's why somebody registered the Alamo under Boland's name. Then Boland must have found out about it, went up to Limpia for his showdown, and got himself killed. That's the picture. I'll buy it, Jace, but who killed it? That's something we're going to have to find out. Whoever it was, it was somebody Boland knew. He wouldn't have been able to follow him to that hotel room. And if the cattle were stolen from here by somebody Bolin knew, Bolin hadn't been here very long. 
The thief might have been one of his own ranch hands. You play it that way, Steve. And stick around here and see if we can find a poke with a mustache and eyeglasses. <laughs> Spotted a pair of riders and asked if they knew of a hand with a mustache and glasses. There was such a man on the ranch, and they told us what general direction he might be working in. A couple of hours later, we found him alone, pushing some strays out of a blind draw. That's him, Jace. Just saw the sun reflect on his glasses. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. You! There I where you are! Don't move for that rifle holster! Questions. Mustache, too, Yeah. Just sit tight on that horse until I get your rifle. Now look, Ranger, when you come riding down on me like I've done something and grab my gun, I reckon I've got a right to know what it's all about. You been at the Alamo Hotel in Limpia recently? Never been in Limpia in my whole life. Where you been for the past four days? Right here on this range, work. Anybody with you? No, just me. How come? The other hands are working in twos and threes. Well, I ain't. I've been working through this Badland strip. No herding here. Nothing but a few strays that one man can dig out. That's how it come. Anybody seen you here in the last couple of days? How could anybody see me? I've been way back in that scrub canyon. Yeah. Nobody saw you there. Nobody'd see you if you weren't there either. What's your name? Dave Boot. Boot, huh? All right, you better come with us. Come with you? For what? I ain't coming any place. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Somebody murdered your boss, Henry Boland, up in Limpia yesterday. Murdered Hank Boland? That's right. The description of the killer fits you. What? Well, you're crazy. I, I've been right here, I tell you. Tell me anything you want. But you're coming to Limpia. I want a couple of people to get a look at you. We got back to the car and drove Dave Booten to the sheriff's office in Limpia to see if he could be identified. Ranger, I'm telling you, I ain't never been near this town. If you haven't been here, you got nothing to worry about. Did you send for the chambermaid and the dust blood chef? Yeah, yeah, they'll be here right off. Thanks. As a matter of fact, they they come now, up the outside steps. You see them through the window? Ranger, I'm telling you... You better I... not say anything just now, Booten. Come in. Howdy. 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 Uh, reckon you remember that Ranger here? Well, ain't likely we'd forget him after seeing him only yesterday. Liz, Mr. Bixby, I want you to meet Mr. Booten. Howdy. Howdy. Seem like you've ever met Mr. Booten before. I thought maybe you had. Nope. Can't say I ever had the pleasure. No, me neither. Although for a minute it did look like. Like who? Now listen, lady, you never. Quiet, oh, Booten. Liz, what's everybody getting excited about? I was just going to say, it looked like Caroline and Bo, the one that run off when everybody expected they was going to get married. <laughs> oh, Reggie is so ready. Thanks, Liz, Mr. Bixby. We just wanted to be sure that this man wasn't the one who was registered under the name of Henry Bowler. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, no, nothing like him. Except for the eyeglasses and the mustache. Yeah, I guess we might as well let these folks go back to the hotel, Jason. Yeah, it's like you were telling the truth, Wooden. I'm sorry. No harm done, Ranger. No way you could have known. Uh, Jace, I've been thinking. You suppose uh, mustache and eyeglasses might have been uh, disguised to throw us off? That's a thought, Sheriff. It's been done before. Well, that ain't the way it was this time, Ranger. Why not, Bixby? Well, them glasses may have been fake, but not the mustache. Man, you're after had a real mustache. I know, because cause I seen him in the barber shop, and the barber trimmed it. <laughs> put Boudin on the bus to Lone Star and sent him back to the Boland Ranch. Clark and I spent the next day questioning everybody in Limpia. The crew at the auction barn, cattlemen, everybody. They couldn't add a thing to what we already knew. When we got back to the sheriff's office, there was more bad news. I had a call from your headquarters at Austin, Jase. They checked those prints the lab crew lifted from 114. Whoever left him had no record. Yeah, that does it. I still think it must have been somebody from Boland's ranch. Somebody he knew. That's what we think, and that's the way it looks. Let's face it, Jace. Could have been a stranger stole the cattle. Boland found out about it, went in for a showdown like any hothead, and got himself killed. The killer could have come in from any direction and left in any direction. Yeah, that's right, Jace. No way you're telling me. Come in. How do you, Sheriff? Rangers? Yeah. Something we can do for you? Well, my name is Denny. I drive a line haul for interstate trucking. Route between New Orleans and El Paso. I think I got some information you might want. 
Leastwise, I thought so over at Alamo Hotel. What kind of information? This? Key to room 114, the Alamo. Where'd you get this? Was it? was nightfall last. The night of the day Bolton was killed, Jake. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so my relief man was driving. We made a coffee stop, place about 40 mile this side, Lone Star. Pulled a truck in the side of the service station there. I was sleeping, didn't want no coffee, so I stayed in the cab and dozed while a relief man went inside. I got it. Go on. Well, cattle truck pulled in for gas. Empty cattle truck, huh? Headed which way? Southwest, toward Lone Star. You notice the license? No, no, but there was a mark on the side box with a B in the middle of it. Bolin's Box B brand, Jase. Must have been the truck used to haul the stolen cattle up here. To haul the killer back to the ranch. Uh, what about the key? I was coming to that. Uh, he fell in the cattle truck. He paid for the gas. I didn't say him too good. And I was just sort of slumped in my cab. You know, half groggy. Not exactly washing him, but seeing him. I know what you mean. Well, when he fished the money out of his pocket, I saw him kind of look at something. He dug out with it. Then he sort of looked around like he was looking for some place to throw it. Station man left him to go inside to change. Then the fellow walked right past my truck real quick. He didn't see me, of course, because the cab was dark, and I heard him throw something. Make kind of a clank. Then he went back to the cattle rig and drove off. Just what he threw away, the hotel key here? That's it. I found it when my partner came out. We went back to check the top and the tailgate, and I sort of looked around and found the key with my flash. How come you didn't just drop it in the mailbox? Well, we had a lot of stops along the line, loading, unloading. And the route came right through here. Thought I'd stop it and just drop it off. Information help you in? It sure does. Thanks. Headquarters will see to it your boss hears about it, too. Sheriff, better take down his statement. Okay, James. Come on, Steve. Right. See you later. All right, James. Heading back for Lone Star. Fast the wheels will turn. Pile in. Yeah. How are we going to narrow it down, Chase? Boudin was the only hand with a mustache and the glasses, and he's clear. Glasses still could have been phony. Some of the killer wore only while he was in Limpia. We know the mustache wasn't a phony. Boudin's hands have been on Roundup for a couple of weeks. A lot of them let their beards grow. Would have been a simple matter to shave the beard and leave a lip cover. Sneak away with a load of cattle and then shave clean before he got back. I uh, know, I know, but Boudin was the only hand working alone. One of the others did it and disappeared for a few days. His sidekick know about it. It doesn't have to be a one-man job, Steve. Sidekick could be in on it, too. Well, that figures. Well, what's our play, Chase? Fingerprint them all and get a check on the prints up at Austin? I think we can wrap it up quicker than that. We know the killer doesn't have a beard now. and uses a straight razor. That was the murder weapon. Yeah. Boudin can tell us which of the men shaved with straight razors. And once we know that, we can settle the rest with a camera I got in the car trunk. How? By asking the straight razor men if they'd like to pose for a couple of identification pictures with eyeglasses and a phony mustache. Tell them we'll have to hold them until the pictures are seen by a couple of witnesses in Limpia. Well, that ought to flush some action from them. Action. I'm betting the man who killed Boland will raise more fuss than the alligator when the lake went dry. Got back to Lone Star just in time. The bank had taken over the management of Boland's ranch as executors, and the roundup was just about complete. Last the herd was being driven into the stock pens near the railroad siding when we reached the south end of the ranch. There's Boudin, Jason. Take care of the horses over there by the corral. Yeah. Come on. Hey, Boudin. Hey, Boudin. Yeah? I want to talk to you a minute. Oh, hello, Reason. How you making out? I will make out fine if you will help. Pretty sure it was somebody on the ranch who killed your boss. Well, how can I help you? Just tell me which of the folks use straight razors for shaving. Hmm. Let's see, is Jones and Tuller and Happy. Tuller, huh? Hey, Jace, isn't he the bright boy that fired on us first time we rode out on the range? He's the one, all right. He was clean shaven, too. The fellow with him was named Small. Do you know where they are, Boot? Well, it was over there a minute ago, driving the last... Oh, oh, here they come now, Chase, around the end of the corral with their horses. Hey, you better drift away, Boot. Go with Well, howdy, Rangers. Back again? Yeah. I'd like to have another talk with you, Tuller. You too, Small. Sure, ain't you? What's it about? Make your way till you dismount. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What do you want? Yeah. Find out who killed Bowling? I'm pretty sure it's one of the hands. All you fellas without beards are going in with us. What for? Why? Yeah. 
What would that prove? Prove plenty when we get what we want. Take photos of all of you with prop eyeglasses and mustache on you. A couple of people in Limpia want to see them. Well, if they think they recognize somebody, that ain't legal evidence. We'll have something to help it along. We'll fingerprint the man they think they saw what? because Poland's killer left his prints all over that hotel room. Please, you warn me. Shut up, huh? I helped steal the cattle, that's all. I didn't go to Olympia, he did. I told you to shut up, you rat. All right, Color. You can both. Get out of here. Oh, shut his horse and dove behind the other mounts at the rack. The frightened animal reared over us, knocked small into me before Clark could grab the bridle. Oh, keep your eye on small, Steve. I'm going after Tuller. He jumped the fence into the cattle chute, Ranger. Don't let him in. I'll climb up. Get him from above. in the crime, Charles Small received a sentence of 25 years. Frank Tuller was tried and convicted for the murder of rancher Henry Boland. Today, after two decades, he still serves his sentence. Life imprisonment. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Reflecting on the old-time One Riot, One Ranger reputation of the Texas Rangers, a visitor to Texas recently mentioned to a ranger that he'd been noticing a number of current press reports where two rangers had participated in the quelling of a riot or investigation of a crime. After citing this observance to the ranger, the man asked, how come two men are being assigned to some of these cases now? Are the rangers less effective than they used to be? The lanky ranger shook his head. Oh, no, he said. One ranger is still sufficient to handle the situation, all right, but in these days of complex legal technicalities, we've been sending two of them along. One to take care of what trouble there is, and the other one to serve as a sort of a disinterested witness. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Ann Diamond, Herb Bygren, Peggy Weber, Tom McKee, Bill Johnstone, Herb Ellis, and Barney Phillips. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. This is Hal Gibney speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Monday chimes mean the best in music on NBC. Tomorrow night, Gordon McRae stars in the Railroad Hour presentation of the operetta The Firefly. The NBC Symphony presents a one-hour concert featuring works by Vivaldi, Wagner, and Stravinsky. Tomorrow's NBC Symphony concert marks the first in the series under the baton of the widely acclaimed young conductor, Guido Cantelli. Now, the $64 question. Three chimes mean good times on NBC.
Before we bring you tonight's Tales of the Texas Rangers, here's a Christmas message all of us associated with this program would like you to hear. Christmas is just two weeks away, and unless everybody helps in his own city or town, there are some less fortunate children who will not receive Christmas gifts. Let's everyone join your local groups and give a thing. A thing for kids for Christmas. In your town, there are one or more agencies collecting toys for less fortunate children. Do your part and contribute the things you can. Thank you. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joe McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, the lucky dollar. It is 7.30 of a simmering hot night. August 14th, 1945. In a small South Texas town not far from Corpus Christi, Joe Barry is counting up the day's receipts of his modest store. His wife, Clara, is locking up in back. What the? Well, what's happened to the lights? I'm not through back here. Well, I didn't turn them off, Mom. One of the fuses must have blown. See if it could be the refrigerator again? No, I just put in a whole new unit, didn't I? Hey, you just stay where you are, Claire. I'll get my flashlight here and see what the trouble is. <laughs> and don't worry, honey. I'll be careful. Yeah, let's see what we got here now. Oh, well, these fuses look good. Joseph? Now, everything seems all right in here, Ma. Must be in the main switch box. I'll take a look outside. Down. No switch is closed. Well, who is that? Well, get back to me and give me a flash. What? Who are you? Never mind. Now, hold up. Uh, Nobody's going to hold up to a bearing. I'll call you. I'll call. I'll call. Hello? 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 What are you doing trying to count up here with so little? You need Joseph. What are you doing? Keep away from me. Joseph! Get away from me, Joseph! Shut up! Joseph Barry regained consciousness, he staggered to the phone and called Sheriff Jennings, who in turn requested help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was at the scene of the crime a short time later. Just like Barry said, Sheriff, if he pulled this master switch outside the store, it'll draw out the storekeeper. And he must have thought Joe was alone in the store. Sure he did. Too bad he wasn't. He said Barry would be alive now. Well, let's go inside again, Sheriff. I'd like to ask Barry a few more questions. You know, Jace. This is mighty like another holdup we've had in this area just a week ago. Yeah? Liquor store. No gunplay, but otherwise just the same. Same switch pulled, only went out to check the fuses. The slug. Nobody saw the thief? Nobody. It could be the same guy. Could be. Mr. Barry. Here, stranger. Find anything more? Maybe. I know this is hard on me, but I'd like to ask a few more questions. Sir? 
Go right ahead, Ranger. Ask all you want. I'll do anything to catch the devil that, that murdered my wife. Oh. You're sure you didn't get a good look at the burglar? Something you could remember as identification? No, sir. He came up on me out of nowhere. No sound, nothing, until he spoke. Then we fought. But that voice... I remember that whispering voice anywhere. He spoke. You didn't mention that before, Joe. Uh, didn't I? It's kind of hard to think right now, sir. But poor Clara. What'd the burglar say, Mr. Barry? Not much, Ranger. But I know that voice. I'd know it all right. Go on. Try to remember. Word for word. Uh, he said, hold everything, Pop. Keep your back to me and hand over your flashlight. And then when I fought him, let go, you old fool. And I fought. He let me in. The next thing I knew, I saw Clara. It's all right, Mr. Barron. I won't ask you to talk much more now, but would you mind coming over to the cash register for a minute? Sure. I for you. There was so little in the thrill, Ranger. Only $45 it was. $45 for my Clara. Look here, Mr. Barry. Hmm? Can you tell me about this piece of adhesive stuck on the front of the register? Looks like something was pasted to it. It was, Ranger. That murdering skunk even took the first dollar this store ever made. My lucky dog. Lucky dog? Yeah. Had it stuck up there on the register with a couple of pieces of adhesive tape. He took it. Not all of it, Mr. Barry. Look here. The corner of the bill is still stuck under this piece of adhesive. Must have torn off when he grabbed it. It's not much to go on, Jay. It's a start, Sheriff. Dollar bill that matches this torn corner and the bullets from Mrs. Barry's body. <coughs> How can we help him, Jace? And best thing for him is some rest, Sheriff. I'll leave it to you. All right. What about you? I'm hoping we can pick up some fingerprints on the register here and from the outside switch box. I'll radio the lab crew to fly down here and we'll see what they can find. Meantime, we'll notify all banks to be on the lookout for a sticky dollar bill with one corner missing. The lab crew came in from Austin and gathered all evidence. By the next day, I had a report from Captain Stinson. On that very robbery and homicide, Jase. Yeah, Captain. They make on the bullets or prints? Nothing on the bullets. All we know is that they're from the 32. But on the prints, that's another thing. Something What's that? No direct prints, Jase, but the thief wore cotton gloves. There's an imperfection in the weave of the left thumb. Mm, There's not a lot to go on, Captain. I know it, Jase. You got any more leads? Not exactly, but we don't think it was done by somebody just passing through. No, why not? Because Sheriff Jennings had a similar robbery in this area last week with the same M.O. Pulled the switch and worked in the dark. A lot of people down there with the cotton season in full swing, aren't there? Swarms of them. Uh, it's hard to say. Well, if it is, you've got a big territory to cover, Jase. Well, I got an old dollar bill working for me, too, Captain. Yes. And by the way, Jase, all the banks in your territory will have blow-ups of the torn corner of that bill by morning. Good. I guess all we can do now, Captain, is sweat it out and wait for that dollar bill to pay off. <laughs> Captain Stinson made good his promise. By next morning, every bank in the area had a description of the missing lucky dollar and photos of the torn corner. Two days went by. Then, on the 19th of August, a man walked into State Bank. Yes, what can I do for you? Money. Here is money to pay for the loan on my house. Oh, we have a loan on your house? See. Si. Your name, please? Hey, Ramos. Juan Ramos. Oh, I'll get your records, Mr. Ramos. Sir. Uh, uh, what is wrong, senor? This dollar bill you gave me, the uh, uh, corner's torn away. Mm, well, it's good. The dollar is good, no? Oh, sure. Sure, but uh, 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 just a minute, please. Oh, okay. Hello. Hello, operator. Get me to the sheriff's office. Sheriff's office, Jenny speaking. Hello, Sheriff. This is Jim Loftus over at the bank. Oh, yes, Jim. What can we do for you? Well, I just came to the bank and handed me that dollar you're looking for. You did? Let me see. Hold on a minute. What's up, sir? Name by the name of Ramos. Just passed a dollar at the bank that answers the description of the lucky dollar we've been looking for. He's still there. Down the stall and we'll be right over. Hello, Jim. Yes, sir. We're coming right over and don't let that Ramos get away. 
This is the missing lucky doll, all right, Sheriff. See how it matches? But I swear to you, Ranger, I do nothing wrong. I come to the bank to make payment for my house. Where'd you get this dollar, Ramos? Well, I earn it, Ranger. King Sabi, where it come from? One day I work one place, one day another place. Who knows where I get paid it all? Where was your last job? Well, I, I worked four or five days for Mr. Larson here. You know, it was a trap. Larson, Cody uh, runs a sort of swap shop in the Mexican settlement, Jase. It's a dump, but Cody does a pretty good business. Let's go see Mr. Larson. Then. Maybe you'll be able to tell us something about Ramos and the lucky dollar. <laughs> Tell him, Mr. Larson. Sure, Ramos worked for me, Ranger, but only for a few days. Mr. Larson, look carefully at this dollar. Hmm. What about it? Ever see it before? Hmm, how do I know, Ranger? A dollar's a dollar, ain't it? Not always. Feel this one, for instance. Can is sticky. And the edge is torn. Try to remember, Ordy. It's very important. For you. To me. An old lady was shot down, killed by someone who stole this particular dollar. I know, lady, that dollar from someone. No, 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 I didn't do it, Ranger. I earned the dollar here for Mr. Larson. Take it easy. Say, maybe I do remember this dollar, Ranger. You do? And it seems to me a little Mexican girl gave it to me. Sure, I remember because it stuck to the other money she gave me. Now, where we can find her? I uh, think she worked at one of the cotton farms near her, sir. I don't know for sure, but she gave me this dollar and two more to pay down on a red silk dress. Yeah, I told you, she was back to me. Never mind that, Mr. Larson. Just when did she pay you on the dress? Uh, just last evening, Ranger. Yeah, I keep open at night for the workers, the cotton pickers. I paid off Ramos when we closed up. Must have given him that sticky buck along with the rest of his pay. <laughs> I told you. Mr. Larson, give me that dollar. Did the girl say when she'd be back for a dress? Today. You've never seen the girl before, Mr. Larson? You don't know her name or where she lives? No. Didn't you give her some kind of receipt for her deposit? Oh, sure, but just for the three bucks. When she brings in the receipt and the rest of the money, she gets the dress. You don't need a name and address for that. You're going to think, too. I think we'll wait for the lady, Sheriff. Meantime, Ramos, if she would even dig around town, we may want to talk to you again. She will see her. Good idea. Good idea. Mr. Larson, do you mind if we wait for the girl in the back room? Of course not, Ranger. Just come this way. It ain't much to look at. All this junk fires in the air, but make yourself comfortable as you can. Don't worry about us, Mr. Larson. Just go on about your business as if we weren't here. When the girl comes in, let us know. You can depend on that, Ranger. I will. Jake, you reckon O.J.'s telling us the truth? I don't know, Sheriff. We ought to find out pretty soon. I got a hunch that lucky dollar is going to hit the jackpot. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, The Lucky Dollar. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. the rest of the money? Yes. Mm. Darling, get the dress. And you wait here now, and I'll go get the dress. It's hard, Ranger. It's hard. Sure. You, young lady? Yes. What is it, Ranger? You mind telling me your name, where you live? My name is Judah Marcellus. I live right now at Mr. Compton's farm. It's his coffee. My whole family works there. My mother, father, brother. That's got Thompson. I know him, Jace. Owns one of the biggest farms in these parts. When does he pay his pickers, sir? Uh, twice a week. Once a week. Saturdays. What's wrong? I thought you 
Mr. Because you paid this dollar down on that dress last night, Chica. It's the dollar we've been looking for. Did you spend it? Well, where'd you get it? Someone told I did for working in the streets, picking cotton. If you're a picker, how come you're off work at this time of day? If you want to get my new dress, I ride you to town in one of the trucks. You can walk off your job anytime you feel like it, Chica. It's my business. You're wrong there, young lady. Plenty of our business when you pass a stolen dollar. Stolen? Come on. You're going back to the Compton Farm with us. <laughs> Sheriff Jennings and I drove Cheetah Marsalis back to the Compton Farm. The girl had a new red dress that had been seen to make her happy. We found Prescott Compton at one of the trucks near the main house wearing the cotton as pickers were bringing in. Well, that's Compton right over there. Okay, I'll take that joke out. Come on. Miss Thank Compton. Well, loudish, yeah. This is Ranger Pearson. We'd like to talk to you. Good. This girl work for you, Mr. Compton? Cheetah? Oh, sure she does, Ranger. Old Marsalis family works for me. They're fine people. Hey, what are you doing away from the field, Cheetah? You haven't gotten yourself in any trouble, have you? I've done nothing, Mr. Compton. She passed this dollar bill that was stolen in a robbery and killing four days ago, Mr. Compton. Cheetah can't seem to remember where she got it. Not for me, she didn't. That robber was four days ago. I pay off on Saturdays, Ranger. Where a whole family is hired, like the Marsalas, I pay the head of the family. In this case, the father. You see that dollar, Ranger? There you are. No, sir. Didn't get this from me, I swear. I've been paying my pigs off with new bills. New bills. Well, Cheetah? I didn't do anything wrong, Ranger. I don't know where that dollar came from. Well, we'll soon settle this, Ranger. Cheetah's brother is working right close here. Carlos. Carlos. Oh, no. Oh, Carlos. Please. Hey. No. Come over here, man, boy. Yes, I okay. Hey, senor. Uh, what do you want? Cheetah, where you been? Papa looked everywhere for you. The uh, Ranger here wants to ask some questions, Carlos, about some money your sister had. It's been a little trouble. Trouble? Trouble with Cheetah? What you done? Did your father give her any spending money, Carlos? Uh, father gave us all a little saving, 50, maybe 75 cents. And he never gave Cheetah as much as eight or nine dollars at a time, eh? Oh, no, sir, no matter. Cheetah never had that money. Any idea where she might have gotten it? I can guess. From Dandy Bird. <laughs> from who? Dandy Bird. John Oda, Dandy Bird, has worked for me for over a year, Ranger. Trust with it, as far as I know. Except he fancies himself sort of a lady <laughs> man or oh, <laughs> Cheetah. Did Donald Bird give you this dollar? No, I tell you, I don't know where I get that dollar. Then you lied to him. Hey, take it easy, my son. I'll get the money from no other place in your... Dandy. <laughs> no sister of mine go to take money from a man like that. Where does Bird work, Mr. Compton? Well, Carlos can take you right to the truck, Ranger. See, you better show you the way, Ranger. And you, little sister. You pick your cotton here across to the house where I can keep an eye on you when we come back with your fine dandy. It's changing everybody. <laughs> Come on, Sheriff. Well, let's, let's get started for Bird's truck. Carlos <laughs> Marsalis directed us along the road to the cotton fields where Donald Bird had been working. A trailer was there, but the truck was nowhere in sight. Hey, that's strange, senor. You know he was working too. Hey, Sam! Come over here a minute, huh? Come right over. Maybe move to another part of the field. No, I don't think so, sir. What do you want, Carl? Where's Dandy Bird? This ranger still want him. What, Dandy drove out of the field three or four hours ago, Mr. Ranger. He had full load. He's in town? He sure is, boss. It's a cotton gin. Did Dandy get himself some kind of trouble? I want to make him plenty of trouble. We don't need cheer alone. Sister? Well, she drove into town with Dandy. She did. She lied to us twice, Sheriff. Bird was at the gin when she came to the store for her dress. Sure he was. Thanks for the information, Sam. Oh, glad I can help, Mr. Thomas. Carlos. Si, senor. Can you give us a good description of Dandy Bird? Si, si. He's about as tall as the sheriff. That makes him five foot ten. He's thin, blonde, color eyes, and blue. Pale blue. Cold like a snake's eyes. Uh, no scars, no distinguishing marks? No, sir. Uh, only he is always dressed up, even in a truck at work. He just is fancy. That's why they call him Dandy. That's a pretty good description, Jay. Couldn't be hard to pick him out in the crowd. Oh, please, Ranger, let me go with you to town. No. You can do more good back at the farm, Carlos. I'll drop you there. You keep an eye on your sister until we contact you again. Eh, bueno, sir. 
We'll head back for town, Sheriff. We'll pick up Dandy at the cotton gin. There was a big lineup of trucks at the cotton gin, but we didn't see any driver that answered Dandy's description. Sheriff Jennings and I went up to the loading platform and headed for the superintendent's office. Here we are, Jane. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? Ranger Pearson would uh, like some information, Mr. Cullen. Why, sure. Come on in my office so we can hear ourselves talk. Well, have a chair, gentlemen. Uh, hmm. Now, how can I help you? You know most of the drivers by sight, don't you, Mr. Collins? I'd say so, Ranger. The regulars, anyway. But there's a heavy crop this year. You saw the line of trucks outside. Well, there's lots of new drivers. The man we want is regular, Mr. Collins. Works for press conference. The man's name is Donald, or Dandy Bird. Dandy? Why, sure, I know him. Honey, you should ask for him, too. Somebody else wanted him? Yeah, phone call came in here about a half hour ago. Phone call? Mm-hmm. I went out on the platform and gave a yell. Dandy moved up close to the head of the line. And he climbed out and came back in the office with me. And you heard the conversation? What there was of it, Ranger. I wasn't paying much attention. But it seems to me he did say something about meeting somebody at the same place tonight. Then he hightailed out of here, and I haven't seen him since. You any idea where he went? No, and I wish I did. Left the truck standing, blocking the whole line. You're looking for Dandy Bird, Ranger. I'd like to get my hands on him myself. Well, thanks, Mr. Collins. Oh, uh, just one thing more. But do you know who called Bird on the phone? I know. Sounded like some little Mexican guy. Anybody do to get the rangers after him? The guys are always looking for trouble. Hey, what about them deer? Dandy, you tell me the truth. Hmm? For you, I leave my family, Dandy. I love you. Yeah, yeah, I know, Katie. You killed, senor. Ah, just in time. Boy, am I dry. Like I said, kid, Dandy Bird never makes trouble for nobody. I've got plans for you. Dandy, what's wrong? The ranger coming in the door. Hmm? He's heading this way. Oh, he's a gun, Dandy. Come on, shoot up and get out of here. There are you are, Bird. So you did leave the rangers here. No, Dandy. You stay where you are, ranger. Don't go for your guns. I've got the girl in front of me. Dandy, let me go. Hold on, Dandy. Oh, please, Dandy. Oh, Dandy, you stay close to me. Dandy! Dandy, let me go. 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 Dand
glove with the imperfect weave was found on Donald Byrd at the time of his capture. Confronted with this and the undeniable evidence establishing his gun as the murder weapon, Donald Bandy Byrd made a full confession. Cheetah Marcellus was given a suspended sentence of five years. Byrd was sent to the state penitentiary at Huntsville for the rest of his life. Joel McRae with another interesting anecdote about the Texas Rangers. In the early oil boom days of Texas, the Rangers were faced with a problem of rounding up lawbreakers and holding them in custody until they could get them to the nearest jail, which might be 50 miles away. Captain M.P. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, now commander of Company D, Texas Rangers, used a novel fresh air jail that became known as the Ranger Trotline. It was simply a long chain strung up between two posts with 50 or 60 trace chains attached. When an arrest was made, he padlocked the free end of the trace chain to his prisoner and left him there to face the jives and laughter of local citizens. Though it's no longer used today, the Ranger truck line started quite a few would-be bad men in a straight and narrow path. And to this day, there are some characters who still can't stand the sight of a trace chain. Good night, folks. See you same time next week. Good night, Joel. Folks, there have been so many requests for the Texas Ranger prayer read by Joel McRae a few weeks ago that there has been some delay in answering all of the mail. If your copy of the Texas Ranger prayer has not been received as yet, please be patient. You should receive your copy soon. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of... The Texas Rangers. Chimes mean good times on NBC. It's yo ho for the open sea tomorrow as the Railroad Hour presents Gilbert and Sullivan's comic opera, The Pirates of Penzance, starring Gordon McRae, Lucille Norman, and Clark Dennis. Gordon McRae will star in the comedy character role of the Major General. This will be the third of Gilbert and Sullivan's musical whimsies offered on the Railroad Hour. For music in a more serious manner tomorrow, the NBC Symphony brings you another hour-long concert of some of the world's greatest music under the baton of the brilliant young conductor, Tito Cantelli. Now the $64 question. Three chimes mean good times on NBC.
the National Broadcasting Company presents Joe McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, the Cactus Pear. It is 4 p.m. the afternoon of March 28, 1947. Robert Coots, a new hand on the Triangle Ranch, is repairing a fence on the southeast range. He stops as a rifle approaches. Oh, oh boy. Oh. Howdy, Bragg. Oh, howdy, me, Coots. Well, I see you finally got my job. I got a job because there was one open. If you left it open, that's your worry, I reckon, not mine. You've been making up to the old man trying to get me fired ever since you came into this country. That ain't so, and you know it. I've been looking for work, yeah. But you didn't get fired on my account. You got sacked because you can't leave a bottle alone. Sounds like you're calling me a liar. I ain't calling you anything. I'm just telling you. And how about clearing off? You telling me to clear off this range? All right, I'll get but before I do, I'm going to whip your tail, Coots. You better not try it, Breck, because you ain't about to whip my tail. No. Wait, I... You ain't. Now, clear off, like I told you. Don't come back. Ain't going to be no need for me to come back. Put that shotgun down. Get away from me. Get away. Here's the other barrel for good measure. All right, boy. Come on, get up. Get up. was discovered by the owner of the ranch next day when he rode out to search for the missing rider. He summoned the sheriff, and the sheriff called for the assistance of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. You say you spotted the buzzards this morning, Mr. Galt? Yeah, yeah, and I found Coach. I'm look of him, he must have been shot sometime yesterday. Thought I heard a shotgun yesterday afternoon. Should have rode out then. Why didn't you? Uh, Sheriff, you know, we've been having a time with the coyotes and mountain cats lately. I just figured one of my hands must have spotted one and cut loose. Coots was fixing a break in the fence, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'd have known something was wrong when Coots didn't come back to the ranch last night. The uh, spot's just up ahead where my deputy's standing. Yeah, I can see the body now. Anybody been stealing cattle around here lately, Sheriff? Oh, a few head now and then, Chase. Nothing big. Coots might have run into somebody doing it, though. Might have. Well, here we are. Oh, boy. Oh, oh boy. Howdy, Sheriff. Uh, Ranger. Hi there. Hi there. Yeah. Tie the horses off the fence here. I don't want them tramping around the other body. Good no, idea. Right. Uh, Coots with you a long time, Mr. Galt? No, Ranger, no. Hired him on less than a week ago. He was new around here, Chase. Only been here about a month, all told. Ever say where he came from? Yep. Yep, over around Marfa. Head with both valves, Jace. Once through the stomach, once through the head. Yeah. He's on the ground when the second charge hit him, though. Look, some of the shot clipped the grass. Yeah. Killer's horse stopped here, too. Looks like. Shoots must have had a fist fight with the man who killed him. How do you figure that, Jace? A little dried blood on the grass here. A scuffle marks and some of the blades pressed down as though somebody had been lying here. Hmm. Coots was shot, though. Might be his blood, huh? No. With his wounds, he was killed instantly. He didn't move 15 feet and then back again after getting blasted like that. Come on. All right. 
Hey, what you looking for? Oh, she moved off this way. Prince mixed right in with some of your herd. Grazing around here and then took off mighty sudden. See here where they dug in to get started? Yeah, that could mean a cattle thief, all right, chasing the stock, Jace. We'll find out. Let's get back to the horses and follow this trail. <laughs> so the trail of his horse wouldn't stand out clear. Uh, I don't see how you can tell that. Heard him up range toward the mesa. Anybody stealing him would have been driving him to the south fence where the state road is. Have to get him to a truck to get him away. Yeah, but what made him run then, Chase? A uh, shotgun must have stampeded him. They'd been driven. Some of them have left marks where they cut out to get away from the rider. And the rider would have left tracks cutting after him. I see what you mean. But shouldn't we keep on trailing him, though? Yeah, but not this way. He was headed for rocky ground near the mesa, trying to lose anybody who might follow him. He's smart. I don't get your plan. And he was careful leaving here after he killed a man. He might have been so careful riding in before he killed. We'll backtrack the trail he took getting here. He might tell us where he came from. That makes sense, Jace. Let's go. Up, boy. Uh, uh, Ranger, can I have the body picked up by the funeral house now? Yeah. Even an autopsy isn't going to tell us much. Oh? I thought you could tell a lot from the shot that killed somebody. That uh, ballistic stuff. Not so much with a shotgun. Barrels are smooth bore. Don't leave rifle marks, but... Hey, hold it. Hey, whoop, whoop. Hey. What'd you find, Ranger? These. Empty 16-gauge shotgun shells. The killer might have ejected him here to reload his shotgun in case he ran into trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell anything with those? If we find the gun they came from, we might be able to match the way the hammer hits the shell. Yeah. If we find the shotgun. Every rancher in Calpoke in the county must have one. The sheriff and I backtracked on the approach the killer had used to get to the Triangle Ranch owned by Galt. But we came to a dead end. Well, Chase... Guess this is as far as we go. Can't follow them on pavement or the gravel road shoulder. Yeah, rode road out from town. It's too bad. I was hoping he'd come from a ranch someplace. Would have narrowed us down to one spot. Nothing much we can do now, except we can go around examining shotguns. One other thing first. A couple of deep tracks in that ditch off the road. Must have had rain here recently. Yeah, day before yesterday. That's why I left such a clear print there yesterday, man. I want to get a kit from my radio car and drive back here. What for? Take a couple of photographs of that print. Make a plaster impression of it. Help us to identify the horse if we find him. We took the cast and headed for town. To check every horse in the territory would have been impossible, so I had to gamble on a shortcut. Howdy, Ranger. Sheriff. Howdy. Howdy. Hey, uh, mind dropping that hammer a minute and taking a look at this? Sure thing. Hey, what is it? Plaster cast. Shoe print of a left hind hoof. You remember making a shoe like this, Ed? In common plate, sir. It was caulked or something I might remember, but I don't know. I know it's a tough one, but all shoes are a little different. We're in different places. They just have to be fitted for slightly different shapes. That's true, all right. If I come across that shoe now, after seeing the cast, I might recognize it. Good. I'm going to leave this cast here. If anybody brings in a horse to be shod, and the left hind hoof looks like the cast, don't touch it until you call us. You're right glad to have you. Keep my eyes open. Any other blacksmiths around here, Sheriff? Oh, not for over 50 miles. Are you going looking for that gun now? You start on it. I'm going to pay another visit to the Triangle Ranch. I want to talk with Mr. Gall again. <laughs> Uh, finish here in a minute, Ranger. Hey, Joe, run on rest of the irrigation pumps, will you? Okay. That's fine. Good. Uh, what was it you wanted to know? I asked you if Coot seemed nervous, like he'd been running away from something, or somebody he was afraid might catch up with him. Uh, no, I can't say he did. All he was anxious about was finding a job. 
seemed like good workers, so I went ahead and opened and I took them on regular. Oh, one of your hands leave? No, no. You see, I, I had to fire a folk named Harvey Breck. Fired him? Huh? Why? This Breck no boots? No, well, just we've seen him around. How did Breck take it when you told him he was fired? Well, he was kind of drunk. Cussed me out a little. Is that all? Yep. yep. I played him off, give him an extra month like I do with any hand I have to let go. He seemed all right after that. You know where this Breck is living now? Well, here he's bunked up in one of them deserted Dobie huts by the old quits of the mine. The road's washed out, though. All the huts are empty since mine stopped operating. Uh, why, is it? You want to see him? I sure intend to. I went back through town and picked up the sheriff, and we rode our horses out to the abandoned mine. I've checked a hundred guns today, Chase. Every tough and near tough I could think of. No good, though, huh? No, no hammer marks like the one we're looking for. You fire the guns to get a test shell for comparison? Sure. But I swear none of them was the gun we want. I kept the most likely ones and labeled them for you, though. Good. You can add one more when we test Breck's gun. Hey, here's the shacks now. Whoa, boy. Oh, oh, charcoal. Oh. Must be that one. Little smoke's coming up the chimney. There's Breck. Red is coming. You fellas looking for... Oh. Howdy, Sheriff. Howdy, Breck. Ranger wants a few words with you. Okay. Mind if we come inside? All right. Reagan, you know that somebody killed the man who took your place over at the Triangle Ranch. Yes, yeah, so I heard. Happened Tuesday afternoon. Where were you? I was right here. Anybody who says I wasn't is a liar. Nobody said anything yet. Where's your shotgun? I don't have a gun. You don't, huh? Where's the gun you cleaned not long ago? I didn't click... Don't tell me you didn't. This oily rag in the corner says you did. This rag was used for cleaning a gun and nothing else. Better get the gun, Breck. We want to see it. It's under the bunk. Sixteen gauge double barrel. Yeah, loaded too. Hey, let me have it a minute. these with the shells you've been carrying, Sheriff. Hey, Shut up, you... Rick. Twins, all right, Sheriff. No doubt about these, Matron. Breck, we found these shells on the Triangle Ranch. Hammer marks match yours. And Coots was killed with a shotgun. Not that gun. Sure, you found shells from it on the Triangle Ranch because I worked on the Triangle Ranch, remember? You get laughed out of court with evidence like that. I fired a hundred shots out there at Coyotes. Story could hold this. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Because there's one other thing, Breck. We're all going to take a ride into town after I check the shoes on your horse. Now, that's real interesting, Ranger. Because if we're riding into town, you'll be packing me behind you. I don't own a horse. Listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Now we continue with tonight's case, The Cactus Pear, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Breck had a stop, and we knew it. The story about the coyotes and the empty shotgun shells covered him, and we didn't even have enough to take him in. We left him and headed back for town. If he is the one, Chase, we're going to have a time proving it. Gun would have made a strong case against anybody who hadn't worked on the ranch, but we can alibi that. Yeah. You got something on your mind, Chase. What is it? He swore he hadn't been on the Triangle Ranch in a week since Galt fired him. Yeah. We can't prove otherwise. I don't know. If he did shoot at a coyote, it must have been before Galt fired him. That means those empty shells would have been lying out in the ground when it rained two days ago. The cardboard portion of the shells don't look like they've been wet. The sun could have dried them out after the rain, Chase. Yeah, the 
There's some metal on the shell, too. I'm going to send those shells through to the lab at Austin. Do you think they'll be able to tell if they've been out in the rain or not? If metal gets wet, there's got to be some oxidation. The lab will know whether there is or not. If there isn't, I mean the shells were fired in the past two days. Yeah, but he'd still stick to his story, Chase. You know how a jury is with scientific evidence. A little leery of it sometimes. I know we'll need more. I wasn't thinking of the shells as jury evidence. I was thinking of them as a time saver for us. Oh. If he's telling the truth, we'll have to start all over. But if he's lying, we'll have to trip him up. <laughs> the shells through to Austin, and while I waited for a report, I drove to Pete's old home at Marfa. He'd been well liked there. No reason for anybody to follow him and kill him. It was a routine check, and on the way back, I got my report from Austin. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead. I have a report from Austin Lab on exhibits submitted by Unit 10 for examination. Ready for it. Lab reports slight oxidation probably caused by brief exposure to normal night moisture. No evidence that shells were thoroughly soaked, though. No indication of such exposure in lab report. 10-4, unit 10 clear. PDXA Austin. I drove back south as hard as I could. When I got near the quicksilver mine, I took charcoal out of the trailer and rode onto the shack Breck had been using to make sure he was still around. Oh, boy. Oh, charcoal. Breck, open up. I want to talk to you. All right. What do you want this time? I just want to make sure you're still around, that's all. Well, you see me, don't you? Yeah. I see something else, too. It's like you've been packing a few things in there. That's my business, not yours. I'll make it my business if you try to leave this county. Now, look, Frenchie, you've got nothing on me. You'd have taken me in before. If I want to move out of here, I reckon I can move. Try it. You hit the county jail so fast, it won't even give your spurs time to rattle. Yeah, you're talking big, but you ain't got a charge to hold me on. Ain't no law against shooting coyotes. No. There's a law against moving into a shack without the owner's permission. The mining company give you the right to live here? Yeah. This isn't going to be hard to check on. All right, then, Ranger, go back to town and check. Because until you do and get a warrant, you got no right in here. Have you? Okay, Brick. I'll be back. And you better be here. I got back to town as fast as I could. I had to have a minor charge to hold him on. As I pulled up to the sheriff's office, I found out I wasn't going to need it. Stay in the car, Chase. Why? What's up? You got here just in time. We're just heading for my car. Let's move. Which way? Straight ahead. Blacksmith shop. He found the horse we've been looking for. Oh, boy. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Here, Ranger. Look. Just like the cast. Oh, oh, boy. See this nick in the left hind shoe? It's nail bent a little. Same as the impression on the cast. Sit, all right. Who owns him? Ranger, you're probably going to eat me out for this, but he's mine. Yours? You mean to say you couldn't recognize a shoe you fitted to one of your own horses? Well, that's a trouble, Ranger. I didn't show him. I only bought him a month ago, and I was just going to put new plates on him for the first time now. That's how come I just spotted the shoe. What were you doing out on the Triangle Ranch when Pooch was killed? But, Ranger, I wasn't out there. Your horse was, last Tuesday. But I wasn't riding him. I loaned him out. You better tell us who you loaned him to. Well, I let Harvey Breck use him. What? Breck? Well, well, my wife can tell you. I'll call her. You don't have to call her. Come on, Sheriff. Let's go. Stopped for the sheriff's horse, loaded him in the double trailer with charcoal, and headed for the mine. He left the car at the washout, unloaded the horses, and drove to the adobe shack Breck was using. We got enough to take him in now, Chase. He's still here. He was packing to leave. Look, he hasn't left yet. Here's the hut he was using. Drag the light under the door. We're on time, then. Not much to spare. 
The cinch he figures to move out tonight. He won't move now. Stop here. Oh, 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 stop. Oh. Oh. He isn't going to come easy, Sheriff. Watch out for that shotgun. He wants gunplay. He can have it. We'll know when he answers the door. All right, Brack. Open up. We know you're in there, Brack. Now, come on. He'll be waiting there so he can nail us with that shotgun if we bust in. We can wait out here for you, Brack. That light in there could keep us waiting all night if he's gone. You mean it's a trick to slow us up? We'll find out. Keep that door covered while I kick it in. Like... But he's in here. He made his getaway. We went over the ground outside to get his direction. We led toward rugged country, and we followed as fast as we could on horseback. Cutting back and forth to pick up his marks. Well, we went up into these hills, Sheriff. We made some time. It was easy to trail this far, and he's on foot. Yeah, but we're going to be on foot, too, now. Why? He's headed for the border, Jace. Rio Grande's that way, but no horse can take this country between here and there. Oh, boy. Oh, Charlie. How far is it to the river? Forty miles of country the devil won't have, and we'll have to cover every inch of an underfoot. Well, that's what he's doing. Come on, let's go. We must be close to a fight. Hey, look, Sheriff. That's you. Top of the ridge. Get to cover under that ledge. Huh? Bridge and we'll be moving right into his sights. You go around that way. All right. Crawl and hug whatever cover you can find. I'll go the other way and see if we can't circle in behind him. We move slowly, inches at a time, up the side of the treacherous slope. It took almost an hour. It was just what Breck wanted. All right, don't move. Thank you, yes. Up here was a trick or something, giving him time. Sure it was. He's ahead of us with a night to cover him. We don't have horses to give us an edge anymore. Let's see if we can pick up his trail. Jace, if we're going into this, we're going to need water. It's time to go back for it now. We'll have to get it as we find it. If we find it. He's headed this way. Come on. We'll have to keep trail cutting. And it's going to be plenty rough. It's like the sheriff said, the country the devil wouldn't have. Breck was piling up a lead with every hour of the night. We have to cover two miles to his one, Jace. Every time we lose the trail, he gains ground. Yeah. Can't be helped. We get to the top of this ridge and it may be the wrong one again like the last two we climbed. It'll be daylight in a couple of hours. We'll be able to spot his tracks. Better then we can move fast. Maybe we better rest until then. Can. Count on him having a rest. That's the only time we can make up on him. Let him go right, Chase. But it'll be another day and night of this without a wink, and no guarantee we'll catch him at that. We may go any direction to make us cross him. Just a few hours while I go on ahead. If you're going, I'm going. Good. Come on. If we only knew which... Hold it, Sheriff. Right. Scrub between the rocks. Here, yeah, throw your light on it. All right. Look. Barely grown in the earth between the rocks. <laughs> Roots ripped out a little and exposed. Yeah. Flesh to grab the scrub to pull himself up. Good. Means we aren't trying to listen for nothing this time. No. Better keep on climbing. No, no, cut 
over this way. Something on the ground by that cactus patch. Yeah. We dug for water again and hit it, too. See, we dig a little. Get a drink for yourself. Knows the country, all right. Never misses. Seems to know just where to dig if there's even a mouthful of water. What you doing over there? The aid here. Rest of two. Actress pear's been cut and skinned. The sun hasn't dried the skins out yet. He's only an hour or so ahead now. His tracks show he's slowing down. Still going fast enough to make that river sometime tonight, though. We'll be there, too, then. A little water running up in this hole now, Chase. You better take him half full. You first. Thanks. Then let's move. We as hard as we could. He was getting closer to the river. We're going towards that Alina Canyon, Chase. It was narrow there. How far? Just a half a mile away. Gotta run then, Sheriff. You make it? Try. Keep going. <laughs> we heard him in front of us. And we broke through the brush at the river. He was just waiting in. Stop, Brett! I'll get him. Don't make me put a bullet in you, Brett. Yeah, you, you ain't taking me. Oh, yes, I am. Let go. Let go. I'm over the border. He's... That's why you're still in the river. Let's go, I said. Oh. Get him! Yeah. But you're gonna have to help me. Drag him to shore. You few more feet. Speed up, made it. Maybe just a few more seconds. Just about as long as it took to eat a cactus. Breck was tried and convicted for the murder of Robert Coots. His sentence, 99 years. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. When the Allies invaded Normandy in World War II, they got an idea as to how far the fame of the Texas Rangers had spread. Both surrendering Nazis and liberated free French said they knew the war was as good as over because the Texas Rangers had landed. Of course, it was the heroic American Ranger troops who made the landings, but nothing could convince the Nazi war prisoners that these were not the terrible Texans they'd heard about in many American legends. Good night, folks. See you same time next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of... The Texas Rangers! Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Wilms Herbert, Tom McKee, and Gerald Moore. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Monday means music on NBC. Tomorrow night... The Voice of Firestorm presents a selection of melodies in the Christmas spirit with Metropolitan Opera star Jerome Hines of Soloist. The NBC Symphony brings you another one-hour concert 
featuring works by Vivaldi and Beethoven under the baton of the brilliant young conductor Guido Cantelli. Stay tuned for the $64 question with more good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Christmas present. It is 2 p.m. December 21st, four days before Christmas, the Depression year of 1931. On a city street corner in North Texas, a man dressed as Santa Claus suddenly leaves his post beside a large red pot labeled Help the Poor. Shivering with cold, he enters the newly opened building of the Panhandle Equity Bank and approaches the bank guard. Say, master, you mind if I stay in here a few minutes, warm up a little? I sure don't. I've been watching you through the window. Don't know how you stood it as long as you did. Oh, this Santa Claus outfit's pretty warm at first, but then the cold sort of creeps in on you. How long do they expect you to stand out in that? Oh, eight to two. Six hours, that's all. Well, it's uh, two o'clock right now. You can go home. Yeah, not till my relief man shows up, I can't. Can't leave till he gets here some money in a pot out there. Oh. Well, why don't you wait right in here till you see? Well, I was hoping you'd say that, because I'm sure... Oh, there he is now. Just drove up in the car. Oh, he can't leave the car parked there in front of the bank. There's a time limit on parking. Well, I think he's just wondering why I'm not there. I better go out and... Oh, excuse me, he's coming in. Howdy. Howdy. I was wondering when you get here. God let me come in and warm up. I hope your Santa Claus suit is warmer than his. We'll be closed up by the time you need warming. Oh, I don't think I'll get very cold. I got a cool 45 in my pocket, one to write for you, Billy. Now don't move for me. Don't move, Santa Claus. Keep your hand away from me, Billy. You, you guys are pulling the stick up. Don't you can figure that all out for yourself, stupid. Let's make it a nice, quiet stick up. Just walk to the rear of the bank with us, take us through the door to the money in the vault. Now go on. You'll never get away with this. You just try and attract any attention. You never live to know whether we're doing that. All right. Open that door. The girl by the desk has to open it. It's button control. Well, tell her you want in. Uh, Miss Keene. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Lovett. Your Santa Claus friend's coming in with you? Yeah. We're so busy, I didn't even notice it. Something wrong, Mr. Lovett. You look kind of sick. You'd be more than sick if you let out one, yeah. They've got guns in their pockets, Miss Keene. <gasps> Watch your mouth, sister. Hope you can see us now. Take his gun. I've got it. Now, sister, whether he lives or not is up to you, understand? What do you want me to do? Put the keys of those money trays. Get to it. All right. You've got the sack. Tell her what to put in it. Stuff it in your jacket when you're through. All right. And remember, sister, one you have to miss your kit. All right, all right. Go on. Come on, stuff it in the sack. What are you going to do when you leave? Come on, fast. What do you mean? We'll give you a chance to get away. Uh, I mean, we, we, we won't yell or anything until you're gone. Honest. Honey, oh, yeah, that's real nice of you. Maybe you ought to be wearing the Santa Claus suit instead of me. You think I'm going to fall for a free up, will you? One of the bank executives is heading back here. Oh, all right, all right. I'm almost through. As soon as I get it in my... Hey, what yeah. are you doing back here, Lovett? Why aren't you out front? Uh, the, the, the Santa Claus fellas, Mr. Peabody, just wanted to... Oh, what's the other one doing in the vault there? The scheme ought to... Oh! oh. Answer this question later. When and if he comes to. 
Congratulations on your self-control. You'll have to get medals for saving your own lives. Oh, come on, let's go. I got All right. Go. Let's leave these people to quiet. We... Oh! Statewide alarm was put out to all law enforcement agencies in a matter of minutes, but the perpetrators of the Santa Claus stick-up had vanished. Texas Ranger Jace Pearson, the closest unit to the scene of the crime, was requested to investigate. The chief police gave me the general details. I'd like to get your story firsthand. Well, I I saw the guard take them through there, Ranger. I, I went back to see why he was leaving his post on the bank floor, and that's that's when I got hit. You have any idea how big they were? No, I don't. I was too excited. Let's see. What's your name? Leon Peabody. I'm second vice president. How about the girl, Miss Keene, and the guard, Lover? Both of them were knocked out, too. Miss Keene finally came to and we sent her home, but they took Lover to the hospital. He, he wasn't in good shape. Skull fracture? They don't know. Oh, how come you stayed around? It's a nasty bump you got. <laughs> I feel it, too. Plenty. Ooh. But uh, I knew the police would need whatever information there is, so I stayed. Yeah, you better sit down. Oh, thanks. You think you could recognize either of the hold-up men? Yeah. Dressed the way they were? I'm afraid not. It's a cinch they chucked those Santa Claus suits right after they left here. I hope they left a few fingerprints. Mm, both of them were, were wearing gloves. You get a tally on how much they made off with? We're, we're running a tape on it. We'll know in a couple of minutes. This job worked pretty smoothly. They seem to know the setup behind the petitions there. Have any of your employees ever been in any trouble? Those men weren't employees of the bank. I uh, know they weren't. But somebody inside could have supplied them with your new layout. Help them plan the job. Well, sir, all of our employees have been with us for at least a year, and we haven't taken on any new ones since we moved over here two months ago. Mr. Peabody. Uh, oh, yes, Donnelly. Is that the rundown? Yes, sir. 63,800. And we've got serial numbers on some of the larger bills. Good. That'll help if they try to pass any. I'll take a copy of that list. Police can alert the other banks and merchants. We'll get numbers out on the statewide and interstate. We may run down some more serial numbers when we cross-check the deposit. That'll be fine. I think you ought to go home now, Mr. Peabody. We can reach you there if you're needed. Oh, thank you. I guess I shouldn't even... Think about myself, though. I'm a bachelor, but the God love it. He's got a wife and three children. Yeah. Pretty rotten Christmas present for them if he, if he doesn't pull through. I paid a call on Miss Keene, the girl who'd been slugged. She was in the state of shock and hysteria. By nightfall, all possible angles had been checked, and we still didn't have a lead. My boss... Ranger Captain Stinson flew in, and I met him at the airport and drove him to town. You talked to all the welfare agencies that have Santa Clauses stationed on the streets? Yeah, and every man they have checked out clean. It was a phony setup, Captain. Even though one of the bandits spent the whole day right out the corner outside the bank. Well, that was smart. Got the bank guard used to seeing him. Yeah. The city police are checking to see if they can find out where the suits came from and who got them. Good idea. How's the bank guard doing? Love it. I checked the hospital. He's still out. No fracture, but they can't bring him around. He may have... KTXA to Unit 10. That's yours, Jason. Yeah. Unit 10. Go ahead, KTXA. City police report stolen car found in alley off Crockett Street between Maple and Lolly. Maybe car used in Panhandle Equity Bank robbery. Police chief requests your assistance. 10-4. Proceeding there immediately. 10-4. Unit 10, clear. We better get there fast. This may be the break we need. Here it is, Rangers. Abandoned in the alley. Prowl car's spot didn't check the license on the stolen car list. When was it reported stolen, Chief? Early this morning. The owner says it might have been missing since yesterday. He, he's been away. You check on him? Yep, he's clear. That's where he said he was. What makes you fellas think this is the car? Found this on the floor, under the seat. Big red button. Hmm. Off a Santa suit, all right. I'm going to climb in behind the wheel for a second. Ask one of the men in the prowl car to flash his light this way. Good. Let's have a spotlight here, will you, boys? Okay, Chief. That do, Ranger? Yeah, that's fine. 
Have any of your men moved this rear vision mirror, Chief? Who? How about this front seat? You slide it back to get that button you found? Who just saw it under there and reached in and got it. What are you trying to figure, Jace? The last fellow who drove this car was pretty big. About an inch or an inch and a half taller than I am. What makes you think so? Because the seat's all the way back where it would be for a tall driver. And I have to raise myself a bit to get a clear view through the rear vision mirror. Hey, well, that's good thinking, James. Yeah, but maybe he didn't touch anything. Maybe he left the car just like it was when he stole it. I'll give odds against that. The man who's getting away from a bank stick-up wants to know what's coming behind him. <laughs> since the report of the robbery, so the men we were after figured to be close by. But all we knew was that one of them was about six foot three. In the morning, we made a routine check with police headquarters. Good morning, Rangers. Good morning, Chief. Good morning, Chief. Did your men come across anything? I'm just going to check through this report. It tells us the location of just about every Santa Claus suit in town. All of them belong to organizations using for their Christmas parties. Was once in a while they let some private individual bomb for a kid party or something, as if they put up deposit money. You got a list of the places that have loaned suits out? We got them. That top paper. We we'll just start checking. You look if you like. Thanks. Looks like we might be adding a murder charge to the armed robbery, Captain. The bank got dead? Not yet, but it looks bad. They're operating for a blood clot on the brain. Uh... Wait a minute. What is it, Jase? We've got a boy to talk to. This list. Two suits borrowed from two different organizations, but both borrowed by the same man, Anthony Ross, 124 Pettigrosa Street. Say, that's worth looking into, Jace. Come on. Let's pick him up. listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Christmas Present, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The home of Anthony Ross at 124 Pettigrosa Street turned out to be a rundown shack on the outskirts of town. A small boy and girl, not dressed well enough against the cold, stopped playing with a mongrel dog as we drove up. They stared at us while we went up the rickety porch, the dog barking at our heels. It's all right, boy, it's all right. Take it easy. Good boy, there's a good Yeah, what? Oh, Texas Rangers. You Anthony Ross? Yeah. We'd like to come in. Oh, sure. Danny, you and Jim take the dog in the back of the house. boxes on the table. What's in them? I, I, don't, I don't know. Just just a couple of packages. That's all. They, they ain't mine. You better open them up, Jason. Yeah. No, no, no. Wait a minute. I, I, I tell you, they ain't mine. You got no right to... This search look. warrant says we have. Search warrant? Now, now look. Now, the, those things ain't stolen. They were rented. Mm-hmm. A couple of Santa suits, all right, Captain. And look. A button missing from the jacket of this one. I, I don't know what this is all about. Why, why are you coming? Maybe we can refresh your memory. The guard you slugged at the Panhandle Equity Bank isn't expected to live. What? Who was wearing the other suit, Ross? Who was your partner? What are you guys doing to me? I I, I don't know what you're talking about. We're talking about the $63,000 stick-up you and somebody else pulled yesterday. And since you're about five foot ten, I can tell you that your partner is about 6'3". Rangers, you're making a mistake. I, I, I don't even know anything about a hold up. The button missing from this suit was found in your getaway car, the one your partner drove. It wasn't me. I, I tell you, I, I didn't even know what kind of costumes were in them boxes. They ain't mine. And where'd you get them? Uh, I, I picked them up at, at, a, at a couple of places yesterday morning. You say you picked them up, and you're trying to tell us you don't know what's in the box. I picked them up for somebody else. They were rented out in your name. The woman ordered them in my name. What woman? The one who hired me to pick them up. That's a pretty phony story, Ross. Who was this woman you're talking about? What's her name? I I, I don't know. I I don't even know. 
You better come with us, Ross. No, 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 no. You, you got to listen to me. Please, please listen. You, you got to believe me. I, I, I was in town early yesterday morning. She, she come right up to me on the street. I, I was put, pulling my, my, my kid's old wagon along trying to find some junk I might sell. You sure you don't want to think this story over before you go any further? She, she, she asked me if I wanted to earn a dollar running a couple of errands. I said, sure. A buck could give my kids a meal for a change. She asked me my name and address, and I told her, and then, then she told me to wait while, while she went into a booth and made some phone calls. When she come out, she sent me to two different clubs, told me there'd be costumes and packages. She had them left in my name to avoid the confusion, she said. You didn't think that was funny? Mister, all I could think about was earning that dollar. She, she gave me money, deposit money for the costumes, and, and, and told me to come back and, and meet her with the stuff on that same corner. Where were you at 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon? I, I was looking around for a junk again for a couple hours after I delivered the packages. And, and I, I guess at, at 2 o'clock, I, I was walking back home from town. Long walk to here in this weather. Cost of a bus ride will buy a loaf of bread for the kids you saw outside. Is that a crime? What's it to you if I walk my feet off to feed my kids? All right, Ross. That was a nice act. But there's a big hole in it. You say you delivered the Santa Claus suits to a woman you didn't know. But you've still got them. Yeah, I've got them. They're going to mean a good business. Uh, you're not going to believe what I tell you. The woman came here last night, drove up in a car, woke me up. She, she, she said she was leaving town in a hurry. She didn't have time to take the costume back herself. And, uh, and if I'd take them back, I, I could keep the deposit. Fifteen dollars each. Yeah, but you're not going to believe that, are you? You better get to will you, will you give me a chance to ask one of the neighbors to watch out for my kids? I'm afraid you'll be gone too long for that. I'm sorry, but we'll have to take him into the juvenile home. Oh. <laughs> I, guess, I guess they'll get better care there than I've been able to get. I get my coat. Ross, you been doing any painting around here? Paint? This place looks like it ever saw paint. What made you ask that, Jason? I just noticed this inside the leg of this Santa Claus suit. Paint blob. Looks fresh. Well, how come it's inside the leg, not outside? I don't know. Something we'll have to figure. This is the large size suit. Must have been worn by the big boy we're looking for. <laughs> It's the only thing to do. I cried for my father. I must make something inside you cry a little with him. I took Ross to the jail and locked him up. Well, that seems to be it, Rangers. By the time he comes up for trial, he should be ready to name his accomplice. That is, if we don't find him before then. I'd go along with that, Chief, if we'd found any money on him or in the house, even a few dollars. Uh. Kids got under your skin, aren't you? They got under yours, too, Captain. You know it. Yeah. But we gotta remember, that bank guard has kids, too. Have you got any late reports on him from the hospital? Man stationed there says the operation is over. Don't know how it's gonna come out yet, though. Might as well go over there and check with the doctors, Jace. I gotta get back to company headquarters. Do me a favor, then. You're heading toward Austin. Take the Santa outfits with you and have them sent on to the lab. Get an analysis of that paint in the trousers. Maybe some traces in the boots, too. Well, how come the boots? Well, they need to go on over regular shoes. I figured that paint stain on the inside of the pants came from a blob of paint on the shoe of the man who put them on. I see. All right, Jace, you want to know the content of the paint and see if lab can run down the source, is that it? Yeah. You were working up to some kind of a lead? Maybe. A few things I'm trying to fit together. Maybe they won't fit. If they do, though... You will hear from me. I went over to the hospital and checked with the doctors. The outcome was still in doubt. The guard's wife was there, face twisted with worry and fear. There was nothing I could do to help until I got some sleep. Then in the morning, I went back to see the police chief. Oh, 
Lone Ranger. I'm glad you dropped in. I just had a long distance call from your lab headquarters in Austin. Report on that paint. Here, I wrote it all down. Paint is manufactured right here in town. The brand name is Light Glow. Light Glow, huh? Mm-hmm. Can you get a list of local painting contractors who use it? Well, I reckon just about all of them do. Good paint. This wouldn't hardly be Texas if we didn't deal with a local outfit, would it? <laughs> no, it wouldn't. Thanks a lot. I'll see you later. Where are you going? Over to the Panhandle Equity Bank. Mr. Peabody, do you know who painted this bank before you opened? Well, uh, there was a contract for the building included the paint. And I guess that was done on a subcontract. Did you find out from the contractor? Sure. Do you mind my asking why? I told you the day of the robbery. Everything was too well planned. Like the men who did it knew the inside of the bank. Yes, I remember you saying that. You think the painters may have? Uh, that's what I think. But do uh, why not some of the construction men? I've got a reason for being interested in painters. Check it for me, will you? He checked. The contractor gave the name of the painters. Two men, Eddie West and Martin Parker. They'd been working the day of the robbery, he said, at a house on the north side of town. I went out to the house to see the owner. Well, yes, Ranger. They worked here all day that day. I remember we heard the report of the robbery on the radio. They were both here all day? Yes. Didn't even go out to eat? Had their lunches with them. Hmm, kind of smelly when a house gets painted. Most women usually get out of the way. I wanted to watch them. So I was here every minute. See, they didn't get sloppy. I like things neat. I see. Well, thanks, ma'am. I'm sorry I bothered you. Uh, why are you asking about them, Ranger? Nothing important. Not as long as you say that we're here. Goodbye, ma'am. Merry Christmas to you. Thank you, Randy. Merry Christmas. She was the alibi for Eddie West and Martin Parker. She was too nervous about answering a few simple questions, nervous enough to make me wonder. I went back to the jail, got Anthony Ross out of my custody, and drove him to the north side of town. Get out, Ross. We're going in here for a minute. Why? What are you trying to frame now? I just want you to meet somebody. Well, back again, Ranger. I thought we'd... That's her. Ranger, that's the woman... Who is he? Who is this man? You ought to remember me, lady. My kids are in juvenile home on account of you, and I've been in jail. I never saw you before in my whole life. Tell him the truth. Tell him before I... Hold it, Ross. Take him away from here. Go away, both of you. Ranger, I got those costumes for her. For her. You're a liar, a liar. That word fits somebody, all right. Can I come in and have a look around, ma'am? What for? What do you want? I want to check over the painting job to see if it's just new painting or if there's some new plaster on that something. You can't come in. You have no right. The boys, your alibi on the floor must have come back here after they cracked the bank. Because you must have picked them up in your car after they ditched the one they're using. I don't know what you're talking about. Carry the money on them. Did they cover it up here, safe under fresh plaster and paint until it cools no. off? No! No! Call for a search warrant and wait till the crew comes and tears this place apart. Go better for you if you don't try to cover. The money isn't here. Well, come on, come on. Where is it? It's it's here, all right. In that wall behind the picture. Come on, Ross. Which one's your boyfriend? Morgan or West? Eddie. West. He said we'd get married. Go to Europe next year. We'll all go someplace next year, but it won't be Europe. West about six foot three? Yes. How did you know? I got an early Christmas present. Somebody sent me a crystal ball. As soon as I call the police and dig out that bank money, you're coming with us. Ranger, uh, I'm clear now, ain't I? Looks that way, Ross, but you'll have to go back to jail for a while and be checked out by the local police. That won't take any longer than it'll take me to pick up Eddie West and Martin Pogden. <laughs> Christmas Eve like a couple of house painters would be doing. I found out where they were working. Loft of a warehouse. Local police covered the building when I went in. Eddie. 
is that? Who came in? Bob will be the Watson. Watch out for those pain chains. No worry. I see him. That ain't the Watson boy, is it? Well, Martha Shannon's where we can see you. I'm coming. But seeing me isn't going to make you happy. Hey, he has a Texas Ranger. Shut up, Hogan. I got my gun. All right, Ranger. Something you want? Yeah. I want the two men who robbed the Panhandle Equity Bank. Shut up. What would we know about that, Ranger? I'm down off that scaffold, and I'll tell you. Okay. Marty, low away. Too bad you aren't working in a place with a phone. Your girlfriend could have warned you earlier. Get into news. I'll get them. Keep your hands away. Oh, oh. Oh. I'm, I'm hurt. I'm, I'm bleeding. I just nicked you when you tried to dig for that gun in your pocket. You're not hurt. Oh, we didn't do anything, Ranger. Nobody should have told you that the real Santa Claus gives. He doesn't take. Get up and try this present I've got for you. A pair of handcuffs. Well, that winds it up for sure, Ranger. Didn't turn out too bad either. Just heard from the hospital. Guard passed the crisis. He's going to be all right. We couldn't have better news, Chief. Just in time, too. It's getting dark. Uh, you let Anthony Ross go? Mm-hmm, about ten minutes ago. He didn't seem to be happy, though. Like, just like he didn't care. What with his kids in the juvenile home and everything. Judge mightn't even release him if he can't care for him. Ross didn't have a dime. Not even bus fare. It'd take him a couple hours to walk home. Oh, why didn't I think? Well, maybe it's just as well that way. Let me call the judge. And Mr. Peabody, the bank vice president. Mm-hmm. Stores will be open late, won't they? Sure, sure. Why? It'll take Ross a long time to get to his house. Maybe we can get some of your boys to help us and change his mind about Christmas. Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Shepard Menken, Jim Nusser, Virginia Gregg, Victor Rodman, and Byron Kane. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three times.
Mornings mean good times on NBC. Monday means music on NBC, and for your Christmas night listening pleasure tomorrow, The Voice of Firestorm presents soprano Eleanor Stever in a thrilling selection of Christmas melodies. Next, Jack Parr calls a Marine veteran in Japan on NBC. <laughs> National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men will make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, The Devil Share. It is 6.45 p.m. October 26, 1939. Frank Whelan, a dirt farmer, is sitting down to a simple evening meal. When the door to the kitchen opens and his brother, Jeff Whelan, comes in. Well, yeah. howdy, Jeff. Thought you was going to spend a couple of weeks up at Big D. So I changed my mind to come back. Is there a law against that? Didn't say there was. Yeah, just fix you need. I'll get your plate. Stop playing steak, brother. I won't eat. I can rustle my own grub. Call that fat back and beans grub. What's the matter with you anyhow, Jeff? Nothing. Just leave me alone. You've been acting like this for quite a spell. Go taking a trip and do you some good. Jeff, why'd you come back? I met Luke Riggs up in Big D. He told me you and Ma Jan were fixing to get married. Oh. So that's it. Why didn't you tell me? Because of the way you've been acting. I was going to tell you when you come back. You should have had a talk with me, Frank. Marjan used to be my girl, man. Used to be ain't now, Jeff. Maybe you should ask me a few things about Marjan. Maybe there's a couple of things you ought to know. Anything I want to know about Marjan, you should tell me yourself. As far as you're concerned, ain't nothing to tell. No. You ought to learn a little about women, Frank. You might learn a lot if you didn't spend so many days looking at the rear end of a mule... So many nights poking your nose in that Bible here. If it's hurt me any, I reckon I'll find out when judgment comes. Meantime, I ain't taking your word for it. Meantime, you ain't bringing Marjan here either. Maybe you're forgetting it. I'm half owner this point. You'll never prove it by anything you grew here. The law says I'm half owner with or without grown in it. You want to bring a wife here, you better buy me out. You have my share for two thousand dollars in good rent. Jeff, you got yourself a deal. I'll give you 800 cash in the morning and notes for the rest. You give me 2,000 cash? I ain't got that kind of money, and you know it. Who do you think you can? You had a good crop? You got that much in the bank right now? Yeah, yeah, I got it. And almost half of it belongs to old Uncle Joe for working on shares. Work you wouldn't raise a hand to do. I don't care about you or Uncle Joe. Let him wait, not me. Jeff, get this. Get it straight. Uncle Joe is going to get every nickel that's coming to him whenever and however he wants it. He's worth for it. Okay, Frank. I just guess you, me, and Mark Jan going to live here like one big happy family. Maybe Mark Jan like that more than you think. You! Jeff, if you wasn't my brother... I'll get you money for you, somehow. I'll get it and you're going to clear out. I wouldn't have my Jan around dirt like you for a million dollars. Oh, she used to be mighty fond of dirt like me. Jeff, shut up, I tell you. Don't say anything, Jeff. Don't open your mouth. It's only remembering 
When we were kids together in the memory of more and more to keep me from beating you. too bad. Because I ain't like you. Memories don't bother me at all. You ain't gonna do anything to me, right? And I'm gonna get what I want, and I'm gonna get it all now, including much. Jim! Put that bread knife back on the table! I took a knife to you once before, Frank. The ball stopped me that time. Boy, I ain't around anymore. Give me that knife, Joe! But you sure wish Paul was here this time. <laughs> Whalen waited until next morning before reporting the death of his brother Frank to the local sheriff. The sheriff asked for the assistance of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. Well, Jace, I went all over the place earlier this morning when I was called here, and now you've been all over. If you see anything, I must have missed you. There doesn't seem to be much to see except the body. You want to talk to the brother now? He's still waiting in the park. Yeah, I know. I'll see him in a minute. Look at the table where Frank Whalen was eating was cutting his bread from this whole loaf. Crumbs show that. And it was a sharp, clean cut. This eating knife's the only one on the table, though. That's not sharp enough to slice the bread that way. He might have cut the bread, then put the knife away. Mm, it's possible, but it doesn't figure. No, no, it doesn't. Fellow sits down to his food, he don't put nothing away until he's through. And Whalen wasn't through. The looks of it, he just started eating. What you looking in the drawers for? Murder weapon, maybe. Something like this bread knife? Could be, I guess. That knife's clean. Yeah. Too clean. Look at the blade and the handle. Well, what about them? The other knives in this drawer don't shine like this one. This one's got special treatment. Hey, I see what you're driving at. You figured it was rubbed with a scouring pad to remove blood, maybe, huh? That's something we'll have to find out, but it's worth a bet. It's been cleaned up too well to help us any, though. Well, we might as well put it back in the drawer. Seems like that knife's the only thing we got to go on, Chase. And we're not even sure of that. I know. And yeah, we better have a talk with Wayland's brother right now. Sure. But Jeff won't be able to help much. Why not? He just got back from Dallas early this morning. Called me as soon as he found the body. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, we might as well see him anyhow. Marjan Galt's in the parlor with him, Chase. Who's she? And Marjan and Frank Whalen was fixing to get married. Folks tried to keep her away when the news got out, but came anyhow. Yeah, it's just as well. She might know something. She broke up pretty bad. Parlor's here. Sliding door. I'll leave. Jeff, the ranger would like to talk to you and Marjan now. Uh... When he's not nice see Frank, I want to see him now. I think it would be better if you didn't, ma'am. For your own good, Marjan. Last night. Only last night I was home. I'm so unfortunate. No, come on, please, Marjorie. Look, do you have to talk to her now? I can tell you anything you want to know. All right. But I think you'd better come into the next room, then. Okay. Ma'am, why don't you just stretch out on that sofa and rest? All right, Jeff. When did you find your brother's body? Well, like I told the sheriff, by five o'clock this morning when I come home. He was killed last night around dinner time. Where were you then? On the road, I reckon. Having up to Big D for the last five, six days. Did you drive back? Didn't have nothing to drive back in. I hitched rides. Come back, same way I went. You got here at 5 a.m.? When did you leave Dallas? Oh, yesterday afternoon, I guess, about 2 o'clock. Why? Why are you asking me this? You're supposed to be finding out who killed Frank. Now, don't get steaming, Jeff. Ranger's got a reason for asking. You didn't touch anything in the house when you got in? Ranger, first thing I saw was my brother laying there on the kitchen floor. Then I hot-tailed back to the high one called the sheriff. Waited right there till he come pick me up. Okay. Your brother been having trouble with anybody? You know of any reason why anybody might want to kill him? No. Nothing I can think of. I said, go ahead, Jeff. Why, well, really, just something come to my mind, Sheriff, but no. couldn't be him. Couldn't be who? Come on, Jeff. Your brother's laying dead in there. We gotta know every little thing, no matter how small. Well, all right. Just before I left, Frank did have a little argument with Uncle Joe. 
Uncle Joe, who's he? Old sharecropper. I've been working a good piece this far for Frank. What was the argument between him and Frank? Well, no, old Joe claimed that Frank owed him some money from his crop. Frank said it didn't. They both were pretty hot about it. And that don't sound like your brother Frank. Or Uncle Joe. Well, I know it don't. It's probably just a misunderstanding that's straight now. That's why I told you it wasn't worth mentioning. When it comes to murder, anything is worth mentioning. And this sounds like it might be plenty important. Sheriff, we'd better ask Uncle Joe to account for his movements last night. I haven't seen him around, but his granddaughter, Belle, might be able to tell us something. She's been standing around outside the house ever since we got here. Look, I'd like to go back to Ma, Jan. She needs somebody with her. All right, go ahead. Tell Belle to come in here, will you? All right. I'll send her right in. Oh, uh, just a second, Sheriff. Yeah? You must be pretty tired. Did you have much trouble catching rides last night? Well, I got one long ride in a truck. You know who owned the truck or anything about the driver? Well, no. No, I didn't talk to the driver much. I slept most of the time. I think it was out of state. Huh? The truckers usually don't like sleeping rider beside them on a night call. Well, I, uh, th- this fellow let me sleep on the shelf uh, up in the back of the cab. Oh, I see. All right. Send Bell in. Okay. You've been asking him a lot of funny questions. Yeah, and he's been giving me a lot of funny answers. What do you mean, Jay? That stuff about sleeping on a shelf in a truck cab. He never slept in that suit he's wearing. It's too well pressed. So he changed clothes when he got home this morning. He said he ran to call you the minute he saw his brother. Can you see me, Mr. Lincoln? Yes, Bell. Come in. Bell, you and your grandfather, Uncle Joe, you live on this farm? Yes. That little house down there near the meadow. You can see it. Just the two of you? Yes, sir. Where was your grandfather last night? He was home, sir. He don't know if he knows it. Was he home all night? Where was he at dinner time? He was so honest. The only time he left was for a few minutes to be... He didn't leave the house at all. Not in no time. He didn't leave the house at all. Belle, you're lying. No, sir, no, I'm not. Look, Belle, you started to say something, then you backed away no, from No, sir, I didn't. Belle, if you want to help us and your grandfather, you better talk to us. I told you everything. I don't know I did. With all this going on, why isn't your grandpa around? Why did he run off? He didn't run off. He went to the church to pray for Mr. Frank. He loved Mr. Frank. He would never hurt him. Mr. Frank was good to us. Where's the church? He left fork of the road just out of town, but he probably ran off someplace. We'll find out about that later if he isn't at the church. Let's go. <laughs> Uncle Joe was at his church, all right. We saw him kneeling in the dim light when we opened the door. The sheriff beckoned to him and he came out into the sunlight. Tears were streaming down his face. I was just saying the prayers to Mr. Frank, sir. I didn't know you'd be in the for the things. Where were you at dinner time last night, Uncle Joe? Why are you asking me that, Mr. Sheriff? Just answer the question, Uncle Joe. You, you can't be thinking that I killed Mr. Frank, is you? We just want to know where you were. I never heard Mr. Frank. He's the best man I ever knew. Why, he, he's even helping me so I could buy my own strip of land and my own meal. Uncle Joe, I want an answer. And tell the truth. Bell already tried to lie for you. Begging your pardon, Mr. Sheriff, but don't nobody never have to lie for me, sir. Truth ain't never hurt me. I ain't never hurt the truth. Well, you better tell us just a minute, Sheriff. Uncle Joe, did you leave your house at supper time yesterday? Yes, sir, Mr. Raymond. I do. Where'd you go? To Mr. Frank's house, sir, like, like I do every evening. To bring him some of Bell's fresh bread for his supper. Uncle Joe, I better tell you right now that anything you say from here on can be used against you. Used against me for what, sir? I'm ashamed to tell you. How long did you stay there? Mr. Frank was cooking him some food. I just stayed long enough to move the bread and to fix up with him to meet him Friday at the bank so he could give him the money. What money? What is mine? What's mine, Sheriff? Are you saying Frank Whalen was holding money of yours? You had an argument about whether or not he owed you that money, didn't you? Mr. Frank and me ain't never had no argument, sir. He was my good friend. Hey, Jake, here comes one of my deputies, Ben Sloan. 
Thought he and the other boys were beating around the farm. Well, they might have found something. Howdy, Ben. Howdy, Sheriff. What's that you got wrapped in that newspaper? This. <laughs> a bloody knife. Where'd you get it? I reckon old Uncle Joe here could tell you as well as I can. They found it in the weeds, out behind his shack on Whalen's farm. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, The Devil Chair, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Uncle Joe stared at the blood-stained knife the deputy found behind his house. The stare was a look of recognition. You ever seen this knife before, Uncle Joe? Come on, answer me. You know we've seen it before, Sheriff. You can tell it is by looking at it. How about it, Uncle Joe? Yes, sir, Mr. Ranger. This knife. It's just an old Brooklyn knife. But I never used that or nothing else on Mr. Frank. Uncle Joe, you're under arrest for the murder of Frank Whalen. Mr. Sheriff, I'm telling you here, outside of God's own house, I've never done it. I think maybe you better deputize a few more men, Sheriff. We might need them. Why? What for? People around here thought mighty high of Frank Whalen, Jason. They aren't going to cotton to the idea of him being killed because somebody he took in and helped and you can't blame him for that. I can blame anybody for anything that doesn't follow the law. You're not going to have any problem with Uncle Joe, Sheriff. I'm going to take him off your hands. Now, hold on, Jason. He's my prisoner, and I'll guarantee his safety. I know you'd protect him. That isn't why I'm taking him. I'll give you a receipt for him and bring him back here later. Where are you taking him? On the radio for Unit 88. The ranger plane to pick us up and fly us to Austin. And you'd better hand over that knife, Ben. That goes with me. <laughs> through my call to Camp Mabry, Austin, and the ranger plane picked us up at the nearest airfield. Uncle Joe tightened up as we took off, and his lips moved like he was praying. After that, he relaxed. Where are you taking me to, sir? Ranger camp and lab at Austin, Uncle Joe. You know what a lie detector is? Austin. Awesome. Well, it's a kind of a machine. It's called a polygraph. It can tell whether a man is lying or telling the truth. Whether or not you take the test is up to you. We can't force you. Look, I'm colored, folks. Would it work right on me? Yeah. It'll work all right, Joe. If you say it's all right, Mr. Ranger, then I'll do it. I trust you, sir. These good folks. Like Mr. Frank was. We landed at Camp Mabry. Dropped the bloodstained knife at the lab and then took Uncle Joe upstairs to the polygraph room. He wavered a little when we seated him in the chair and fixed the bands to measure his blood pressure, pulse, and respiration. Sir, this chair. This is an electric chair, is it? Don't worry. It won't hurt you, Uncle Joe. We're ready to go, Jace. Okay. I'll be waiting in the next office. Now, no matter what I ask you, Uncle Joe, I want you to answer yes or no. That's all, understand? Yes. Is your name Uncle Joe? Yes. Sir. Is Belle your granddaughter? Yes. Sir. Do you go to church? Yes, sir. I waited in the next office, knowing what was happening technician would go through the list of questions, the simple, harmless questions that would register truthful reaction on the graph. And then he'd start to get the questions that mattered, the questions about Frank Whalen. Yes. Did you have an argument with him about money? Yes, sir. Did you use a knife on him? No, sir. Did you kill Frank Whalen? No, sir. Was the knife with the blood on it yours? Yes, sir. Do you know how the blood got on it? No, sir. Is that the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. Well, that's all, I guess. <laughs> now, you just stay put, Uncle Joe. I'll take those things off in a minute. Yes. We're all finished, Chase. Good. What was the reaction? 
Looks like he's telling the truth, Jase, all the way down the line. Even about not having an argument with Frank Whalen over money? According to the graph, no argument. He wasn't lying. Good, because that means somebody else was lying. I'm going to take him back. In just a second, here. Kenny speaking. Yo. Uh, tell him. He'll be right down. That was the lab on that knife you brought in. Yeah, they typed the blood? It isn't human blood, Jace. It's chicken blood. Unit 88 flew us back to the airfield where I'd left my car and horse trailer. The sheriff had been notified that we were returning and he met us at the jail with a couple of deputies. At my request, Uncle Joe agreed to spend the night in a cell for safekeeping, and I filled the sheriff in on what I'd found out at Austin. Chicken blood. I don't get it, Chase. Why didn't Uncle Joe say he'd use that knife to kill a hen? Because he didn't. That knife was planted where it was found, and whoever planted it didn't expect the investigation to go any further. Uncle Joe kept the knife in the shed behind his house. The killer got it during the night after the murder, stuck a hen with it, and tossed it in the weeds. Had to be somebody who knew the place pretty well to find that knife and do the plant. It was somebody who knew the place. Frank's brother, Jeff? Frank's brother, Jeff. What do you know about him? He ever been in any trouble? Not around here. We better check and find out where he stayed in Dallas and who saw him while he was there. We don't know for sure he was there. Oh, he was there, all right. How do you know? Because Luther Riggs saw him. Luther just drove back from Dallas this morning. I met him about an hour ago, and he told me he'd seen Jeff there. How long was Riggs up in Dallas? Just overnight. Quick business trip. Why? Did it seem kind of funny that Jeff hitchhiked back here in such a hurry when he could have stayed over until this morning and gotten a sure ride with somebody he knew? <laughs> Didn't think of that. Where does Riggs live? Farm, four mile out. Let's drive out there. I want to see him. <laughs> Thanks. Let go of that cow for a minute, Luther. I want you to meet Ranger Pearson. I uh, sure thing. Howdy. Howdy. Sheriff tells me you met Jeff Whalen up in Dallas yesterday. That's right. When? I reckon it was just about 9 o'clock a.m. I'd been driving most of the night to get there. Stopped for a red light, and there was Jeff just fixing across the street. You talked to him at all? Sure. I told him to hop in, and I'd take him wherever he was going. He said he was just drifting around, so we went and had some breakfast together. Did he tell you he was heading back for home? Mm, not right off, he didn't. Sounded first like he was planning to spend quite a while in Big D. Didn't say nothing about coming home until, well, uh, until after I told him that Mar Jan's folks had told me that Mar Jan and Frank was getting ready to set the date. You mean he didn't know his brother was going to get married? Didn't seem to. Matter of fact, now that you mention it, he looked right upset when I brought it up. Maybe it was because of Frank not telling him. Or maybe it was because... Maybe it was what? Go ahead. I think I can answer that one, Jace. Marjan and Jeff used to walk out together about a year ago. Then Marjan sort of broke off with him. Took up with Frank later. That's right, Ranger. But Jeff never looked like it bothered him none. The way a man looks doesn't have anything to do with what goes on inside of him. Thanks for your help, Riggs. Come on, Sheriff. You're welcome, like you dug up a motive, Jace. Yeah, we need evidence to go with it. Jeff left Dallas a lot earlier than he told us he did. Not much chance of digging up anybody who gave him a lift, I guess. I'd say no chance at all. Yeah, there's something else we can look for, though. What's that? Remember my saying that his clothes didn't look like he'd slept in them or driven a long way in them? Yeah, I do. The only reason he'd have changed clothes would be because the things he'd been wearing might have gotten blood on him. I'm not saying you're wrong, Jase, but we combed that house. There wasn't nothing there. No. They'll be on the farm someplace. What makes you think so? Jeff couldn't risk being seen around any place last night. Any move he'd make would have to be on foot. He had no other way. So it's a good bet he stuck close by the farm until he called you this morning. I got my horse in the trailer. We'll pick up one for you and take another look around. We've been out here half the night. I don't think we're going to find anything. Maybe not. Come on back to my place and let's get the sack. When we wake up, we can start out fresh. I don't want to wait too long. 
we come here by daylight, Jeff will see us look up. Well, I'm beat. Can't we just go into the trees over yonder and rest a while? Yeah, I guess so. It'll be dawn in about two hours. We can move faster then with a little light. Good. Come on, boy, over to the trees. We'll all take a breather. Come on, Sharky. <laughs> trees dismounted and hobbled the horses. The sheriff dozed off quickly and then I began to nod. An hour later I came out of it. There was a bright glow across the fields beyond some corn stalks. And it wasn't the morning sun. I put my hand over the sheriff's mouth and shook him. Shh, shh. Look over there. It looks like a fire. Yeah, just beyond the corn. Come on. Quick, quiet. What do you think it is? Jeff Whalen, burning those clothes we've been looking for. We ran for the cornfield, and when we got into it, the light rustle of the morning wind and the stalks covered our approach. We came to the edge of the field and saw him, Jeff Whalen, dumping kerosene on a pile of smoldering cloth. Kerosene on him long enough. Let's get him. All right, Jeff. Huh? That's enough. Drop that can. Drop it, I said. Well, sure. Sure, I'll drop it. What a chase! He threw the can onto the fire, and a sheet of flame leaped up between us like a blinding flare. I dove across it, trying to clear my eyes. Look out, Case. He's got a knife. Uh, I was on him before I saw him. The blade flashed. I dug for my gun, but I couldn't bring it up in time. The knife slashed into my shoulder and went to the ground. He landed on top of me, but as he raised his hand to strike, I got my gun free with my left hand and slapped the barrel against the side of his head. You all right, Case? Yeah. I guess my shirt will need a little stitching. Oh. Your shoulder will need a little stitching, too. Couldn't risk a shot. You were too close. Yeah. Come on. Got to stamp that fire out before all the evidence is burned. Well, that's the only kerosene on the ground burning. I kicked what we need out of the fire. Plenty left for your lab to work on. Right, good thinking, Sheriff. Uh, coming too, Jace. Yeah. Uh, All right, Jeff. Come out of it. Uh, come on. Uh, what did you jump me for? Uh, I was only burning some old fire. Yeah, we know. The old things you happen to be wearing when you killed your brother. You were right about that bread knife, Jace. Look, here's what he used on you. You got nervous about that too, didn't you, Jeff? Decided to get rid of everything and let old Uncle Joe ride for you. I look, you're crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah? I talk kind of a foreign language. But maybe the grand jury will understand me when they indict you for murdering your brother. Come on. Get on your feet. Move. Mm -hmm. Whelan was tried and convicted for the brutal knife murder of his brother, Frank. On August 2nd, 1940, at Huntsville Penitentiary, he died in the electric chair. This is Joel McRae, wishing you all a very, very happy new year. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Trend. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Tom McKee, Parley Bear, Peggy Weber, Roy Glenn, Wilm Herbert, and Rye Billsbury. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Hal Gibney speaking. for the $64 question. Tomorrow, remember the Cotton Bowl game on NBC.
Broadcasting Company presents Joe McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joe McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Deadhead Freight. It is shortly before midnight, August 27, 1938, at the Santa Fe Freight Yards in Lubbock, Texas. A deadhead freight hauling empties back to the west coast from Galveston has just pulled into the yard. The brakeman and a railroad detective are making a routine check of the cars for free-riding hobos. If I was a yard dick, I'd be snoozing in the roundhouse. You ain't found a free-rider in months. Yeah, so what? I get paid to check and I check. Oh, you know, bows on the freights always hop off before we pull into the yards. I ever think one of them might fall asleep in the car and not have anybody to wake him up? Well, could be. Yeah, flash your light, Nissan. Okay. Hey, she? Nobody. Yeah. Now, the car up ahead is the last of the boxcars. I walked the flats and gondolas while we was rolling, so I know that they're clear. Hey, hey, why's the door rolled shut on this one? Well, I don't know now. It shouldn't be. Now, let's get her open. And throw your light around. Yeah. Nobody riding, huh? <laughs> Come on. All right, Bo, on your feet. And throw that light right on it. Yeah. Well, no wonder it didn't move just an old duffel bag. Yeah. yeah. What's a duffel bag doing on a dead head freight? Isn't there something in it, man? Hey, hey, come here. Feel this. I feels like a bunny. Hey, you got a knife on him? Yeah, here. That's a good thing we didn't pass this car. Top of the bag sewed up tight. I have to cut right through the side. Yeah. What? It's a young woman. Yeah. Stabbed it there. And threw that light around the car. Well, what are you looking for? There's no blood any place. She wasn't killed on the train. Somebody must have loaded the body on to get rid of it. Yeah, so the murder can't be pinned down to any definite area. Hey, where'd you stop last before you pulled in here? Poseidon, west of Sweetwater? body must have been put on someplace between there and Galveston, then. We better call the police so they can notify the Texas Ranger. After a brief but penetrating study of the situation, Ranger Captain Stinson had the body removed to a Lubbock funeral park. He then requested Texas Ranger Jace Pearson to take over the case. Well, there it is, Jace. Pretty brutal job of stabbing. Figured having a good piece of it. Yeah. A couple of reasons for that. Here's a map. Shows the route the freight train took. Spot circled in red shows where it made stops. And at what time. Let's see. No stops after it left the siding outside Sweetwater. Huh? Right. And most of the stops were made much further east. Well, according to the time of these stops... Body must have been loaded on the train between Presby here and Turner City here. Well, how do you arrive at that? The train made all its night stops between these points. It isn't likely the killer loaded the body on by daylight. Too much chance of being spotted by the train crew. That's good reasoning, Grace. You may be right. He said the body was sewed up in a duffel bag. Yeah. You better look at it before I send it on to the lab. I have the undertaker lock it in this cabinet and give me the key. Yeah, here it is. Regular opening at the top of the bag is sewed up tight. The draw cord is missing. 
See? Mm-hmm. Good thing the man who found the body cut into the bag instead of ripping out those new stitches. Yeah. I see what you mean. Kind of funny stitching. It may have been made by somebody with a special trade where that kind of stitching's used. Lab gets a look at it. may be able to tell us what trade. No, I hope so. Well, the bag itself won't help much, I'm afraid. Uh, probably picked up in the war surplus. Could belong to anybody. Hey, look at this. The bottom of the bag. It's kind of soiled. Whoever carted it around with a body in it must have set it on the ground to rest. Sure did. On reddish brown earth. Blood seepage made some of it stick. Let's have a look at that train map again. I think that earth stain kind of narrows down our search, Captain. Oh? How come? I know the country that train passed at night. I've been over it plenty. Only place I've seen earth that color is right around this area and a few stream beds. Cotton Belt runs parallel to the railroad for about 40 miles through there. Well, I've seen all I want to see, unless you have something else. Nope. Let's go. I'll get this bag off to Austin. Body going to be held here for identification? Yeah. If she isn't identified, we'll see if we can run down something by her clothes. Any laundry marks or anything on them? Great not, Jace. Homemade and home laundered. No dental work to help us either. And her fingerprints aren't on the fire. I have a man check on the shoes she was wearing. They weren't homemade. Yeah, we'll try it. You got any ideas about what you're going to do? If it's all right with you, I'd like to take a crack at that cotton belt area. Tow charcoal down in the horse trailer and then ride parallel to the railroad tracks and see what I can find. Well, that's a lot of territory. How about Steve Clark riding with you? Good deal. If we get anything from the lab, I'll let you know. I'll radio Clark and assign him, and you can pick him up on the way. Good luck, Jace. Thanks, Captain. You'll hear from me. drove down to the beginning of the area I wanted to check, left the car, and used our horses for the long ride along the rail bed. By noon of the next day, we covered 15 miles. Horses are getting tired, Jase. I know. There's a siding a little ways ahead. Freight stopped there. Yeah. Look, another culvert coming up. Yeah. Uh, bank's pretty steep. Watch your horse. All right. Careful, boy. Easy, Charco. Careful. Easy. Steep climb out of here, Jase. Maybe if we ride... Hey, what are you looking at? Oh, the ground, huh? Yeah. Same reddish brown color we've been checking for. Yeah, don't see anything else, though. Want to ride through it a ways? Yeah. Come on, Charlie. Oh, boy. I don't want to be a killjoy, Jace, but we've done this in a dozen creek beds. Yeah, but none of the others were as close to a train stop. The siding's only about 50 yards further up the... Ooh, ooh, Charlie. Oh, boy. Ooh. Find something, Jace? Yeah. Come here. What is it? Marks in the sand. Trace of a couple of footprints, not enough to make it pass, but look at this other mark. A round impression. Yeah. What made it? Might have been somebody setting that duffel bag down. Yeah? Well, that would account for the dirt you found on the bag. We'll find out. Get a glass jar from your saddle pack. Huh? Okay. You gonna cut a core around that mark? Yeah. Lab contested for blood trace. Earth this color, we can't tell anything by sight. Well, here's the jar. Thanks. A few empty cans around here, Jace. Those marks might have been made by a hobo. I don't think so. Bindle stiffs travel light. They don't carry duffel bags. What's the nearest town to here? You know, Bullville, about a mile further on. Well, let's get there. We phone for a highway patrol car, and they can drive you back and pick up our car. All right. You going to check around Bullville? With a fine tooth comb. The cotton crop around Bullville was good. Too good. Migratory pickers were jamming the town. I had photos of the dead girl and tried to find somebody who might have seen her. No, no, Ranger. Never saw her around the gin here. The town's full up, though. It's possible one of the pickers saw her someplace. You know anybody who comes in contact with a lot of the pickers? No, no. Afraid you have to tackle them crew by crew. That's what I was trying to avoid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Must be a couple of thousand migratories around. You mind if I ask your man at the weighing platform to check with the haulers when they bring cotton in for ginning? No, it's all right with me. Thanks. Or a ranger. Hold a second. Uh, just happened to think. There is somebody who gets to see a lot of the pickers. Who? The Mexican woman. Name's old Rosie. Drives a junky old truck around peddling soda pop in the fields. You know where I can locate her? Yeah, haulers give you a lift out to the fields. And somebody will steer you out to her. <laughs> 
Everybody knows old Rosie. Somebody killed that poor girl, huh? That's right, Rosie. You overseer? You find who killed her, you going to put him in a jail? That's my job. How about it? You ever seen her around here? She, one time. Where? At the bus station in the town. She was with a man. You know who the man was? No, senor. Why'd you hesitate? Is that the truth? Why should I tell a lie, senor? I don't know who the man was. She described the man vague, stumbling description that might fit anybody. And while she described him, I had a feeling she was lying. A feeling that was strengthened by a faint odor of whiskey coming from the truck. Whatever business Rosie was in, it wasn't limited to the sale of soft drinks. I pretended to swallow her story, then I got a lift back to town where Steve Clark was waiting with our car. Better hop in, Jace. Just had a call from Austin. Yeah, they checked the earth samples they sent in in the jar. Yeah, blood trace, all right. Same type as the victims. They got a line on a few other things, too. The shoes on the dead girl have been traced through the manufacturer to a store in Sheffield. Yeah, I wrote down the name of the store and the address. Better get over there and see if we can establish identity. Yeah, shoes will be waiting at the Sheffield airport. is isn't likely that a shoe clerk is going to remember who he sold them to, though. I saw the shoes. They've been repaired recently. Whoever fixed them might remember. Well, that's a chance. Any information on that duffel bag? Uh, yeah, a lab ties it in with a seaman. Now, oh. those stitches used to sew up the bag are the kind seaman used to mend a torn sail. Chase, you look like that throws you. It does a little. I was beginning to have a sneaking suspicion about an old Mexican woman. But she's no seaman. <laughs> well, what made you suspect her? She said she saw the dead girl with a man. She gave me kind of a phony description. Not only that, but she's supposed to be selling soft drinks to the field hands from an old truck. It reeked of liquor. Oh, bootlegging, huh? Hey, that could mean something. What? A report from Austin mentioned liquor stains in that duffel bag. Naturally, they just figured that a bottle had been broken in the bag at one time or another, but... Yeah, but it could be something else, too. Yeah? That bag might have been used for hauling moonshine. Stop the car. Hey, Chase, what's the matter? Slide out. I'm going to Sheffield alone. You stay here. Okay, Chase. What do you want me to work on? Tail old Rosie, the Mexican woman, while I'm gone. Check on any special contact she makes. Whoever she sees, find out who they are. See if you can run down any who've worked as seamen. I burned up the road to Sheffield. The clerk who'd sold the shoes couldn't help, but I got the information I was after in a repair shop. My show, show, I fix it is, all right? Look, here's who I sold the broken strap, see? Uh, I remember because of something else. I thought I'd never get a penny for the job. Whose shoes are they? Mrs. Watson. She's living two blocks off the Brownwood house. Mrs. Watson, huh? Is her husband around? No, no, no. He's a go away a month ago. That's why she got no money for pay for the shoes. I know you bother her. She lived with her mother and her little baby. She's a one-year-old. Any idea where her husband went? Oh, no. Sometimes she says to go away for work or someplace with the cotton. Sometimes to Galveston to work for the boat. Mm, and a sailor, huh? Sailor, everything. Whatever he is, he's not send the money. Last week, she come in. She says she's going to meet him and she's going to pay me when she's come back. But she's not come back. Hey, just a minute. Why are you asking me all these things, eh? You know, how come you got to the shoes? Because Mrs. Watson doesn't need him anymore. She's dead. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Chase Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Deadhead Freight. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. It wasn't the kind of news you enjoy breaking to a dead girl's mother. The girl's baby crying in the next room would really help for that. <laughs> you see, they split up about a month ago. And then last week, her husband wrote to her from Bowlville. Daddy was sorry wanted my daughter Helen to come with me. I thought she was there with you. Looks like she was for a while. Oh, he promised Helen everything in the letter. Said he had a lot of money for her and her baby. He was never any good. 
And now the baby's left to me, and I'm just too old. I'm sorry, ma'am. Can you give me your son-in-law's full name and his description? Clifford Watson is his name. They call him Bert. Herbert Bud Watson. <laughs> About how tall would you say he was? <laughs> Better pull yourself together, ma'am. Somebody's at the door. I, I'll call out the window and send him away. I, I don't want to see anybody. No. <laughs> What is it, ma'am? What's the matter? Oh, somebody! Open the door! It's him. I said he'd open. All right, ma'am. Open the door and let him in. Go ahead. Well, what took you so long? Where's Helen? Do you know where she is? What did you do to her? What did you do to my girl? Are you crazy? What's the matter? Let him go, ma'am, and stand back. What? Ranger, what? Get your hands up and turn around. You killed her. And you got the gall to come here with your own baby cry. Ranger, what is this? Kill who? Helen. Where's Helen? Where is she? Don't you know, Watson? Or did you think she'd never be identified? Helen's the murdered? Oh, no. No. You did it. You no, did No, no, Mom, no. I, I gave her money. I told her to come back home and I'd meet her here today. <laughs> who is going to take the kid? Make a fresh start. How much money did you give your wife? A thousand dollars. That's a lot. Where'd you get it? Come on. Uh, uh, I was bootlegged into the pickers. How long you been getting away with that? Started at last since. Did old Rosie sell any of this stuff for you? How did you know about that? I didn't for sure until now. Come on. We're going back to your place of business in Bowlville. <laughs> Got your message to meet you here. Rose is over there. Want to get her off the truck? Yeah, she can talk from there. Come on. You too, Watson. Okay. Bud Watson murdered girl's husband. Bootleg in here. Rosie's been moving some of the stuff for him. Oh. Why you keep me from my work, senor? Your work isn't as legal as it could be, Rosie, so sit tight. Uh, yeah, you ever seen this man before? You know she's seen me before. They didn't ask you. How about it, Rosie? Si. All right, Rosie. Now, is he the same man you saw at the bus depot with a girl whose picture I showed you? Si. He's the man. At the bus depot? But that ain't so. I was never with Helen at the bus depot. You didn't meet her when she came down here? No, I tell you. I didn't know what bus she was coming in on. Or even if she would come after she got my letter. First I saw her, she turned up here at the shack. How about when she left to go home? Uh, she only stayed two, three hours, all told. Let her go back to the bus depot alone because... Well, it was getting dark. Near time for the pickers to be coming there to buy drinks. You hear that, Rosie? That means one of you is lying. Rosie, tell the truth, senor. Uh, you don't always tell the truth, Rosie. The first time I asked you about the man you saw, you said he was a stranger, a man you'd never seen before. I forget, senor. I see a lot of people every day in the fields. I, yeah, I... Are you trying to kid me? You've been selling liquor for this man. You couldn't mistake him for a stranger. Well, I do, senor. I make mistakes. You want to help, I give you help. Rosie tell you all she knows, that's all. Now it was obvious that Rosie was lying, just as I'd suspected her of lying the first time. There had to be a reason for it. He took Bud Watson into Bowlville jail and then went back to search his shack. I can't figure something, Jason. Why won't Watson admit it if he was at the bus station with his wife? That wouldn't hurt him. No, it wouldn't. That's why I think he's telling the truth. You know, Rosie must be covering up for something. Covering up for somebody's a better guess. She might have done it herself. No, so she's too old to cart a body across the country to the railroad. Uh, you figure she really did see Mrs. Watson at the bus depot with a man, huh? Yeah. The man who killed her to get the thousand dollars Bud Watson had given her. Well, then what's Rosie's angle in lying to us? Well, that's an easy one, Steve. Shake down. Hey, Chase, you're right. Couldn't be anything else. Why, it'd be worth the cut for her to forget seeing the man and say it was Watson instead. Only one thing wrong with it. What? Well, I watched her while you were gone. She didn't make any suspicious contacts, nothing that could have been a payoff. She might have gotten her payoff right after I showed her the Watson girl's picture and told her she'd been murdered. That was before you started the tailor. Yeah, I didn't think of that. She had time. 
Well, we call this shack, Jase. Nothing here. What do we do now? Go back to Taylor and Rosie again. If she squeezed hush money out of the man once, she's liable to try it again. They all do. We'll start by watching her house when she comes in from the fields tonight. We staked out near Rosie's adobe hut. But it got dark and she didn't come in from the fields. I left Steve on watch and went out to look for her, keeping an eye out for her old truck. I found it about five miles out, surrounded by a group of men carrying torches. Hey, what's going on here? Uh, oh, Ranger! Uh, oh, Rosie! You better come! Yeah, what happened? Uh, we was walking into town. Saw the touch here by the side of the road, thought maybe it broke down, so we started to call for old Rosie. And one of the boys spotted the blood on the ground. What blood? Can I show you over here. Must be old Rosie's, I reckon, because we found her over here in the cotton row. She's dead, Ranger. Somebody cut her throat from ear to ear. Old Rosie had tried to shake down a killer once too often with the usual payoff. I sent a rush call to Steve Clark to tow his horse out and join me. We followed the trail which led to a deserted picker shack way off in a field that looked like it hadn't been cultivated for years. The shack had been occupied, though, recently occupied. But whoever had been there was gone. There's a lamp there, Steve. Light it. Yeah. Clean as a whistle, Jay. Yeah, it's too clean. The floor's been scrubbed mighty hard for a shack like this. It sure has. Especially for a place nobody's living in. Must have been cleaning up blood. Yeah. And there are two other things. What's that? Whoever was hiding here was mighty handy with a knife. Look at the inside of the door, a circle drawn on the wood. Wood chipped where somebody practiced throwing a knife at it. Yeah, good, ain't it? And all the marks are right smack inside the circle. Now, what else? Take a look at the lamp you just lit. The cord it's hanging by. Well, it's just an ordinary hunk of rope. Except for the knot holding the lamp, a running bowling. So the light could be raised or lowered toward the table. A running bowling is a seaman's knot. Yeah, and that cord is just about big enough to be the draw cord from a duffel bag. Our seaman was here, all right. But it couldn't have been Watson, Jace. He was safe in jail when Rosie was killed. Yeah. Whoever Rosie saw with Mrs. Watson at the bus depot must have met the girl after she left Watson, after she had the money. Yeah? Married woman on her way home to her baby isn't liable to leave a bus depot with a stranger, is she? Chances are it was somebody she knew. Well, Watson's been a sailor. Think it might have been an old shipmate of his. Let's go see if he remembers one who was handy with a knife. <laughs> Say somebody killed old Rosie? Yeah. The same man who killed your wife. Now think and think hard. The killer was a seaman. We got reason to think it could be an old shipmate of yours who knew your wife. Well, but Helen knew shipmates of mine all along the Gulf. I introduced her to lots of them. The one we want had a habit of throwing a knife. Yeah, he threw targets on a door. And never missed. Matt Corbett. It was Matt Corbett! How do you know? Any reason for him to be around here? Yeah. He was my partner last year. Bootlegging here. Business got bad and he left. I wrote to him months ago, asking him to come back for this ticket, but he never answered me. Did Rosie know him? Sure she did. From last year. That's it, Clark. Rosie'd seen Corbett with Mrs. Watson. That's why he couldn't run with the money after he killed her. He had to wait to see if the body was found and identified. And when we moved in and she knew about the murder, she really had him pinned down. And he used to be my best friend. A sneak. Never mind that now. Where would he run to? I don't know. He was always Roman, like me. Hey, you wrote to him someplace, you said. You must have an address. Yeah. Yeah, it was a general delivery at Port O'Connor. There's no bait shack there. He lived in it whenever he had enough money to stop moving for a while. He's got enough now. What he got from your wife. Come on, Clark. Let's get him. <laughs> Port O'Connor. Made it by morning and found the abandoned bait shack. Nobody inside, Jay. can see through the window. He isn't here. Yeah, he's probably traveling by freight to avoid being spotted. He couldn't have beaten us here. We rolled too fast. You gonna stake it out and wait? Yeah. Our car's out of sight where we left it. He won't spot it coming along the wharf. Come on, let's go inside. Corbett 
Harris, the man we're after, all right. Same trademarks here with Harlan, that picker shack at Bullville. Yeah. Knife marks in a circle on the door. Same running bull and holding the lamp. Draw that burlap sack across the window. That'll make it pretty dark of you, Jason. You want it dark when you're throwing a surprise party. <laughs> Wake up. What? Shh. Somebody come along the wharf. It's dark. What time is it? A little after midnight. Steps are coming closer. Yeah, it must be Corbett. Not going to bring anybody else this way at this time of night. He's heading for here, all right. Yeah. Let him get all the way inside. Remember, he's got that knife, and he's handy with it. I know. Just dropped in to arrest you for the murder of Helen Watson and old Rosie up at Bullville. It'd be nice if you could prove it. I haven't been near Bullville. I think we can prove you were. A mark you left on the door and a few other things. How'd you come back, Freight? Are you kidding? No, I'm serious. You should have rode Pullman. Get your shoes shined on a Pullman. Would have taken that reddish brown earth off your shoes. Our lab can match that with Bullville. Watch out for that shoulder. Yeah, that's better, Corbett. Want to cuff him, Jason? No. I think he'll come quiet. All right, Corbett. Let's go. Herbert Bud Watson served the required term for his bootlegging activities, and Matt Corbett was tried and convicted of murder. The sentence of the court was carried out on February 20th, 1939, when at Huntsville Penitentiary, Matt Corbett died in the electric chair. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. In the early days of Texas, major disturbances were not infrequent. It was a lusty, brawling, growing territory, and as happens in such a territory, there were days when the streets were not safe for the good citizens. An Easterner, happening into a Texas town at such a time, found shelter in the house of a minister. Everything will be all right soon, he was assured. Later that same afternoon, the minister, who'd been looking out the window, said, Well, friend, the streets are safe now. You may go about your business. The Easterner looked out the window, but all he saw was a lone figure riding casually down the main street on a horse. What makes you think it's safe for me out there now, he asked in bewilderment. The minister pointed to the horseman. Because that feller on the horse is a Texas Ranger, he said. Only folks that aren't safe in this town now are the ones who started the trouble. And when he finds them, they'll wish they'd been peaceable. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production, Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Herb Ellis, Tom Holland, Byron Kane, Tom McKee, and Lillian Byer. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murtock, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Al Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers.
Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, death in the cards. p.m. on the night of January 26, 1947, at the ranch house of Chester Gentry in Reeves County, Texas. Chester is on the telephone with his stepson, Will Ennis. All right. Call me when you find me. Thanks, Sheriff. Where you been, Will? Just out having a beer. That Sheriff Bennett you talked to? Yeah. My friend Tobich telephoned you a while ago. Tobich? Oh, you didn't tell the Sheriff about Tobich. I sure did. Sheriff just called to say he located Tobich's rooming house over in Biggest Town, but Tobich wasn't there. Well, I've told you a hundred times it's the worst thing in the world he could do. If Tobich finds out, he'll kill me. Will, I... Maybe he has found out, you told the sheriff. Maybe he's on his way here right now to get me. Look, you've got to give me the money to pay him off now. No, Will. No more money. Do you know what you're saying? He'll kill me if I don't pay him. He told me. So. Now you listen to me, Will. I've reached the end of my rope in this whole rotten mess. I'm through. I'm not going to get another dime from you. I've done everything I can for you, but... You're just no good. Please, Dad, I need that donut. You shut up and listen to me. When your ma died, I promised her I'd do everything I could for you. And I have. I treated you like you was my own son. I've given you a home. I've given you money. A lot of money. And what have you done? You've thrown it away to a slimy gambler named Toby. But, Dad... For two months has been going on. For two months you've been leaving me wait to pay off that gambler. I told you to stay away from him, but you didn't. Now it's high time for me to meet him and tell him face to face to stay away from you. No, Dad, no. If you just give me the money this once more, I'll straighten out. I promise. Your promises ain't worth a bale of straw. That's what you said last week. You'd straighten out. Told you then I'd give you just one week to do it, and if you didn't, you'd get no more money from me now or ever. Dad, you don't mean... Oh, don't I? You got yourself into this mess, you get yourself out of it. The witch can bluff you, but he can't bluff me. Dad, Dad. Huh? What's the matter? The window. I told you I just saw him at the window. What? Huh? Now he's gone. I'm heading to the front door. All right, let him. Turn off the lights, Will. But, Dad... Turn them off. What are you doing? Get my gun. I'll give this to a reception he ain't looking for. No, Dad, no. Front door, Dad. No, well, stay away from that door, Dad. Don't open it. Please don't. Can't see a thing. Now, look, Will, you... Will. 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 Mr. Gentry lay dead at his own front door. Will immediately notified Sheriff Bennett's office. Sheriff requested help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. He joined Sheriff Bennett at the Gentry Ranch. Yeah, it looks like an open and shut case, Jace. Kovich came here to get Will, but it was Chester who opened the door and collected the slugs instead. Where was the body, Sheriff? Lying right across the front doorway here. How long ago did the shooting take place? Mm, a couple of hours ago. Chester notified me earlier in the evening he'd gotten a call from this Tovich. The call came from Biggerstown, so I went over there to see if I could find him. I located his rooming house, but he checked out. Looks like while I was there, he was here. You say Tovich had been bleeding Will and Chester for some time? Mm, yeah, about two months, according to what Chester told me on the phone. Well, let's talk to Will. Sheriff, come on in. Uh, this is Ranger Pearson, Will. He'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Sure. How long have you known this Tobitz, Will? A couple of months, I think. Where'd you first meet him? 
Pete's place? Down the highway. That's a road now, Chase. Is that where you did your gambling? No. Tovich would call me from time to time and tell me I had a game lined up. So I'd meet him at his room in the house in Vegas town. Who else was in the games? A couple other fellas. Different ones each time. I didn't know any of them. I didn't even know their names. You kept losing to Tovich, didn't you? Yeah, I did. But you kept on playing cards with him. I kept thinking my luck would change. Your luck never changes when you're up against a professional gambler. Yes, I know that now. It's too bad you didn't know it two months ago. Your stepfather might still be alive. Ranger, there just isn't a thing you can say to me that I haven't already said to myself. I've been sitting here for two hours thinking about it. Knowing if I had the guts to straighten out, this wouldn't happen. There's only one thing I hope right now. I hope somehow Dad knows how I feel. All right, man. What does Tovich look like? Well, pretty ordinary looking fella. Man, you never noticed the crowd. About my height, I'd say. Black hair, regular features, nothing to really set him apart. You know, it's pretty general. Yes, it is, but it's the best I can do. Okay, better get some sleep. Did you find any tracks outside, Sheriff? Nope, my deputy scoured the yard, but it's too gravelly to hold any kind of tracks, car or foot. Will, uh, do you remember hearing a car pull away from here after the shooting? Why, no, Ranger. When I come to think of it, I, I didn't even hear one come up. Okay. When it gets light, we'll ride around a little in the back of the ranch, Sheriff, and see if we can pick up any footprints. Right. In the meantime, let's take a run over to Biggerstown and talk to George's landlady. Maybe she can give us a better line on him. Afraid I can't help you much on a description, Ranger. I only got a good look at Tovich once. That was when I rented this room to him a few months ago. Well, it's pretty strange that would be the only time you saw him, Mrs. Packer. Well, he came and went by night. I'd hear voices in his room sometime in the evening. A couple of times a woman's voice. But as far as seeing him around, I didn't. You said he checked out earlier tonight. Didn't you see him then? No. He just left an envelope under my door with his key and the money he owed on the room. Think you'd recognize him if you saw him again, Mrs. Packer? Well, I might. I don't know. But to sit down and describe him to you, I'm afraid I can't be much help there. I don't like it, Sheriff. The man's been living in this room for two months. Take a look around you. It's clean, too clean. Nothing here to give us any line on. Hey, wait a minute. Have you cleaned this room since Tovich checked out? No. I ain't gotten around to it yet. I was figuring on giving it a good swamping out in the morning. I'd like to save you the trouble. What do you mean? I'd like to have one of our men from the lab vacuum the room for you. Well, <laughs> it's my back the way it is. I sure ain't gonna say no. You figure on having the contents of the dust bag analyzed, Jay? Yeah. Tovich has covered his tracks pretty well so far, but maybe he doesn't know you can sometimes pick up a lot besides dust with a vacuum cleaner. Mrs. Packer, if you should ever see Tovich again, I'd like you to get in touch with me right away. Well, you can count on that, Ranger. Say, I don't think her to have any killers running loose around my room in the house. The dawn came, and the only thing new on the case was the publicity. Papers were carrying the story with pictures of Chester and Will. The sheriff and I started scouring the country in back of the gentry ranch on horseback. This is hunting weather, Jace, with all that frost on the ground. Yeah, so far the hunting hasn't been good. Let's see, we're right in line with the back of the ranch house now. Yeah, maybe we better split up and go around. Hey, ooh, ooh, hold it. Oh. Take a look on the ground there. Yeah, foot tracks. Coming from the back of the ranch house, too. And judging from the distance between the tracks, he was in a hurry. Come on. Heading straight north for the river, Jace. He could be trying for the New Mexico border. Could be. The one thing, it would be pretty easy to follow the tracks in the frost. Yeah. There's something funny about these tracks, though. What do you mean? I don't know yet. Yeah, just put my finger on it, but we'll keep trailing. See if we can put our finger on Tovich. Come on, Charcoal. Yeah. 
beginning to understand why you don't want to cross the river, Jason. Cox led smack into it back there. Yeah, I know it, Sheriff, but let's just keep looking along the bank on this side. Okay, but he probably waded along a spell and kept going on the other side. What's on the other side? Santa Fe track, about 15 miles away. And what's between the river and the tracks? Just open country. That's what I mean. I don't think Tovich would risk 15 miles of open country. Yeah, see your point. Yeah, we'll keep looking along this side, then. No, we don't have to look any farther, Sheriff. Look, there they are. Ooh, oh, oh. ooh, Charlie. Ah. Yeah, they, they sure are. Tracks coming up out of the river and heading back the way we came. There's still one thing I don't understand. What's that? The shooting took place about 11.30 last night. Kovitch could have been halfway across that open country on the other side of the river by dawn. Now, why'd you double back? I think I've got an answer for that, Sheriff. I told you a while back something was bothering me about those tracks. I finally figured out what it is. Oh? Look at the tracks, and then look at the hoof marks of our horses. Well, they look just about the same to me. Hey, they both cut down through the frost. Yeah, that's the point. What time do you figure the frost formed on the ground this morning? four and five, maybe? And those tracks were made after the frost formed. They cut through it. If they'd been made before the frost, it would have formed over them. Wait a minute. Maybe Tovich realized he killed the wrong man. Maybe he hid around the ranch trying for another crack at Will. Now those tracks are heading toward the ranch again. Come on, Sheriff. We better get back there in a hurry. <laughs> Followed the tracks back to the highway a mile below the ranch and lost them there. Then we headed for the ranch house. There was no sign of life around the place. I don't see Will outside anywhere. And his car's in the driveway. I hope we're not too late. Will! Will! Oh, morning, Sheriff. Rainy. <sighs> sure. That's a relief. Well, come on in. Something the matter? We thought there might be. Can you use your phone? I want to call my office and see if there's anything new. Come here, sir. Back in the hall. Okay, thanks. Ranger, what's the sheriff mean about being relieved to see me? Well, it's possible Topich hung around here at the ranch last night after the shooting. What? Did you see or hear anything after we left? It wasn't my imagination. What do you mean? Well, after you fellas left, I locked up tight. About three or four this morning, a sound woke me up. What kind of a sound? Somebody walking around outside. They could have been Tovich. I don't know. Well, I've got Dad's gun. If Tovich ever shows up around here again, I'll handle him. Law enforcing's our business, Will. Don't try and take it into your own hands. Yes. Yes, Sheriff. What is it? My deputy just told me that landlady, Miss Packer, phoned the office for you about an hour ago. Mrs. Packer? Yeah, they told her to call out here. Will? Yeah. Did a Mrs. Packer phone me? Oh, uh, a woman phone. Didn't leave a name, but she did leave a number. I got it written down right here. Thanks. Operator? 2734J. How long ago did she call, Will? Oh, about an hour ago, I think. Did she leave any message? No. Just said to ask you to call. You told her to get in touch with you if she ever saw Tovich again, Jace. Yeah, I know. <laughs> No answer. Come on, Sheriff. We better get over to Biggerstown and find out what's on Mrs. Packer's mind. Hmm. She must have gone out. The door is unlocked. Mrs. Packer. Mrs. Packer. Look, Jesus. On the table, there by the phone. Hmm. Newspaper. Folded to the story of the killing. She can't have gone very far. Coffee's boiling on the hot bed. Hmm. Hot's just about boiled dry. Come on, let's take a look in the next room. You know, it's funny she'd call and then. Yes. On the bed. Yeah. This is Packer. You are 
listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Death in the Cards, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We were getting nowhere fast on this case. First Chester Gentry, then Mrs. Packer. We questioned all the rumors, but none of them had seen a thing. Then we went back to the sheriff's office. And, Jace, there's no doubt about it at all. Miss Packer was trying to tell you something about Hope. But he got to her first and killed her to shut her mouth. Yeah, we know who the killer is, all right. But the big question is, where is he? It's just like the earth opened and swallowed him up. Well, every sheriff's office in the state's been alerted. Highway patrol's on the lookout, too. So sooner or later, we're bound to... Yeah. Excuse me, Jace. Sheriff Bennett speaking. Oh, yeah, just a minute. Your headquarters, Jace. Captain Stinson. Thanks. Hello, Captain. Just got a report from the lab on the vacuum sweep that you had to take from Kovic's room in Biggestown, Jace. What'd they find? Only items of interest were two or three women's hairs. Red. Hmm. A lot of redheads in Texas, Captain. Afraid that's not much help. Maybe more than you think. This hair wasn't naturally red. It was a inner dye job. And judging from the distance between the roots and the dye, the lab figures it was dyed about a week ago. Well, that's a horse of a different color. Thanks a lot, Captain. I'll keep you posted. Sheriff, we haven't had any luck finding Tovich, have we? We sure haven't. Okay, now we're going to start looking for Tovich's girl. His girl? How many beauty parlors do you figure there are in Biggestown? Mm, I don't know, six or seven, maybe? Before the day's over, we'll know exactly how many there are. We're going to visit them all. <laughs> The sheriff had underestimated the town. There were ten of them. We had no luck on the first seven, and then, just at dark, we hit number eight. There we found an operator who remembered giving a henna dye job to a girl named Thelma Parrish about a week ago. We learned that Thelma was a waitress in a coffee shop, so I parked my car around the corner, and we dropped in on her. Well, you men look like you could use a nice cup of coffee. Nothing I'd like better right now than having a pretty red-headed waitress pour me one, ma'am. <laughs> Why, thank you, Ranger. Come on. What do you think, please? I think, maybe. Cream? Uh, black. Yeah, black here, too. Well, here you are. Thanks. Hey, seen your boyfriend lately? Boyfriend? Tovich. Who? Tovich. You must have me mixed up with somebody else, Ranger. I don't know anybody by that name. Are you real sure about that, ma'am? Of course I am. A girl's sure who she does know and who she doesn't. Well, either I'm mistaken or you're lying to me. Look, I don't know what this is all about, but I do know better than lie to a Ranger. I hope so. Well, come on, Sheriff. You better be getting back to your office. Okay, Jake. Here's for the coffee. Thanks. Sorry I can't help you any about what's his name. So am I. This way, Sheriff. Where are we going? Across the street. Yeah, the car's on this side, around the corner. Keep walking. She's watching us from inside. Think she was lying? That's what I want to find out. Well, she seemed pretty sure of herself. Okay, we're out of our line of sight now. Let's get in this doorway, quick. Good. Now we're in the shadows here. She can't spot us from across the street. Now we just keep an eye on the front of that coffee shop. Jeez, and... look. She's coming outside. Uh-huh. False alarm. She's just washing the windows. Yeah? Well, that's the fastest wash job I've ever seen. She's heading inside of here. She came out to make sure we'd gone. Come on. Work away along the sidewalk until we can see across the street into the coffee shop. Yeah, but she may spot us. Hold it. She's on the phone with her back to us. She's lying, all right. Probably calling Tobitz right now. Sheriff, how about slipping into the drugstore and tracing that call? Mm -hmm. I can keep an eye on the front of the shop from my car. I'll meet you there. <laughs> The sheriff disappeared into the drugstore. I waited in my car. A 
couple of minutes later, he came over and got in wearing a very puzzled look. Must be some mistake, Jason. Yeah, what do you mean? That waitress, she just telephoned the Gentry Ranch. I don't think there is any mistake, Sheriff. And right now, it doesn't surprise me much. Yeah, but as far as we know, the only one of the Gentry Ranch is Will. Yeah, but Will's going to have company as soon as we can make it there. Wait a minute. You're trying to say that Will Gentry... Sheriff, it looks like there is no Tovich and never has been. I guess the boy we've been up against right from the start is Will Gentry. I radioed KTXA to set up a roadblock on the highway 10 miles each way from the Gentry Ranch in case Will should take off before we could get there. And I jammed the gas pedal to the floor and held it there. Jace, you're leaving me way behind. Will Gentry. Looks like I was way behind for a while, too. Looking back on it, it all falls into place. We know Will was always after money from his stepfather, Chester. And he invented the story about a gambler named Tovich as an excuse to get that money? He even went so far as to rent a room in Biggerstown under that name. But when Chester cracked down and threatened to disinherit him, Will used the same Tovich device to kill Chester. That way, he'd get all Chester's money. So when Chester opened the front door thinking Tovich was outside, there wasn't anybody there at all. And it was Will who plugged him. Unit 10, go ahead, KTXA. Unit 320, stationed at Tucker's Junction. Unit 256, stationed at Biggerstown, turn off. Unit 10, 10 4. KTXA, clear. Well, we got the roadblock set up. Tucker's Junction's about five miles the other side of the Gentry Ranch, isn't it? Yep. And with another highway patrol car back off us at the Biggerstown turn off, looks like we've got Will bottled up tight if he makes a run for it. There's no side roads off the highway for 67 miles along here. Good. As soon as we get to the top of this rise, we ought to be able to spot the Gentry Ranch. Yeah, ranch house only a mile or so from here, Jase. It was Will who made those tracks in the frost then, huh? He heard me say we'd start trailing in the morning. I guess he figured on giving us something to trail. Yeah, and that explains Miss Packer's murder, too. She must have seen Will's picture in the paper, recognized him as Tovich, so she tried to phone you. And when she called the ranch house, Will knew he had to shut her mouth for keeps. He probably got back from killing her just before we showed up at the ranch house after the trailing. There's the ranch house, only half a mile more. Now wait, taillight's swinging out off the highway. He's making a run for it. What kind of car is he drive? Gray sedan, isn't it? Yep. Unit 10 to all units and roadblock. Subject, Will Gentry, attempting getaway. Proceeding east on Highway 19 in Gray sedan. Unit 10 pursuing. Unit 203 to Unit 10. Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 203. Unit 203 on Highway 19, three miles west of Tucker Junction. That's only a couple of miles east of us, Jase. Proceed west on Highway 19, Unit 203. Unit 203, 10-4. Unit 10, clear. Well, we've got him bottled up for sure, Jase. We're backstopped at both ends, and we're coming at him from both ends. It's a squeeze place. I sure hope so. Unit 10 to Unit 203. Have you sighted Gentry's car yet? Not yet, Unit 10. We'll report contact. Unit 10, clear. I don't get it, Sheriff. We should have spotted Gentry by this time. We're almost together. Hey, watch it, Chase. Sharp bend in the road just ahead. Just past this drive-in movie here. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> Only way Gentry could get off the highway is to ditch his car, and I don't think he'd do that. Hey, a red light coming at us. That must be Unit 203. He's stopping, too. But where's Will? No sign of Gentry? Okay. No, but there aren't any side roads at all. He couldn't have vanished into thin air. Hey, wait a minute. That drive-in movie we just passed. You think he turned in? It's the only place he could have turned in. Come on. <laughs> back to the drive-in theater, stationed the highway patrol car at the exit, and the sheriff and I talked to the theater manager. He remembered a gray sedan pulling in there a few minutes before. He'd sent it to the rear aisle, so the three of us circled around the theater on the outside of the fence and then came in through a small gate in the rear. But Gentry's car wasn't in the back row. But he's got to be in this back row, Ranger. That's where I sent him. Look, a vacant spot in a row. One in the next row ahead. He could have wormed his way forward a few rows. Yeah, that's right. A lot of people do that trying to get a better spot. Mm, about 200 cars in here. It's going to be like looking for a new game. Hold it. Three aisles up near the side. Yeah. That's his car. Right? Going to take him now, Jason. Sure. Let's do it. 
too many cars around and it's a cinch he won't come peacefully somebody might get shot we can only get the car on each side of him to get clear i could make an announcement on the public address no it's no good he'd probably start shooting i can't warn the car on each side will would spot me same goes for you sheriff want me to do it you i don't know it'd be pretty hey, wait a minute. yeah i think i got it you go up to the car on this side of will tell him to clear out in exactly one minute then go to Will's car and tell him you're checking the reception on those speakers they hang on the side of their cars. And then go to the car the other side of him and tell them to clear out in two minutes. Good idea. That way, maybe Will won't get suspicious. Thirty seconds after the second car leaves, turn on all the lights. Okay, I'll give it a whirl. See you after it's all over. I hope. Will, what's the matter? Come on, Will. Come on, Will. seconds till the lights go on. Come on. Let me get just a little closer. I'll take him from this side. Hey, Jace. He's starting up. He must have got suspicious. He won't get far. Get in the car! Will! Come out of that car with your hands in the air! There go the lights, Tom. Huh? It's coming out all right, Ranger. Look out, Jace! Oh. Ah. Come on, Sheriff. You okay, Jace? Uh, yeah. You sure enough him down hollow. Oh. Hit him in the shoulder. Why don't you finish me off? That's up to the state of Texas, Will, not me. But I think they'll oblige you, all right? Will Gentry was tried and convicted of the murders of Chester Gentry and Leona Packer. On the morning of April 12, 1948, he was executed in the electric chair at Huntsville Penitentiary. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. Although the Texas Rangers is a highly organized law enforcement agency, the men themselves are rugged individualists. One ranger in particular that I know of carries his six shooters with only five shells in each gun. One day he was asked why he did this. If the hammer's resting on an empty chamber, he said, the gun can't be fired accidentally. But said his interested friend, with only five bullets instead of six in the gun, aren't you endangering your own position? Maybe so, he said with a grin. If you can't hit your target with five shells, the sixth one won't do you much good anyhow. Good night, folks. See you next week. Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Barley Bear, Jeanette Nolan, Byron Kane, Mike Barrett, and Ernie Newton. This story was transcribed and adapted by Bob Reif, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Remember all the delightful troubles that beset Mr. Blandings when he built his dream house? Well, starting next Sunday afternoon, you can hear the further adventures of the beleaguered Mr. Blandings and his wonderful wife, Muriel. It's top listening for the entire family next Sunday and Sundays thereafter when Cary Grant and Betsy Drake star as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Stay tuned for the $64 question. Tomorrow, hear the symphony on NBC. <laughs> National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers.
tonight transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Blood Harvest. It is a moonless midnight, September 16th, 1947. A truck without lights is parked in a cultivated field several miles from Fairvale, Texas. In the darkness, two men are perspiring freely as they load bales and seasoned alfalfa hmm? onto the truck. Yeah. How many more we got to go, Slim? Uh, 15, 20, that's all. Uh, now we can get it all on here, then. This will be the last load. That suits me fine. The sooner you get off the place with us, better. Come on. Yeah, whoa, take it easy, will you, Slim? How about time out for a smoke? Smoke? You out of your mind, Trent? Oh, we're a half mile from the house. And besides, you said Mullen was asleep. Look, don't give me an argument. All right, all right. But I moved more than 200 bales of this stuff tonight. I'm going to rest for a minute. If you don't like it, load the rest of it yourself. Okay, don't get hot about it. I'm just as tired as you are. I'll sit on a running board. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mullen sure going to be surprised when he gets a look at this field tomorrow. Yeah, okay, he sure is. What do we get for this stuff? About $30 a ton. Ain't bad. Found a clear almost 200 bucks a piece. Yeah. Could make more than that running a couple of head of cattle without working up to a pig sweat, though. Sure, smart guy. Run cattle and get picked up and sent to the pen. Maybe there ain't as much money in alfalfa, but one thing about it, there ain't no brand marks on the bales either. Nobody can say it ain't yours once you get in the clear with it. Yeah, I guess you got a point. Think Mullen's liable to suspicion you when he finds his field stripped tomorrow? Oh, not a chance. I'm an old war buddy. And he saw me taking a sleeping pill before we turned in tonight. <laughs> At least he thinks he saw me, maybe. <laughs> Good thing he ain't seen you take this alfalfa or you'd lose your job for sure. And after tomorrow, I can afford to lose it. Farm worth in for minutes for horses. Hey, come on, we rested long enough. I want to get you away from here. Okay. Hey, give me that pitchfork. I'll push those last two bales back and make more room on the table. Yeah, here it is. I got a real surprise tomorrow. When... Come on, Slim. Shh. There's something moving. I don't hear nothing. There it is, Kent. Maybe it's a moment. Maybe he woke up. Keep quiet. Who's on this field? It is him. You better answer me. I can see the outline of your truck. Slim, I gotta start up and get out of here. No! Going to my field in the middle of the night with a truck full of my alfalfa. Uh, oh, well. Save it, Trent. Where's Slim? Where to run to? I didn't run any place. You know. Don't move. move. There's a pitchfork you're feeling against your ribs. Just march back to the house. What are you going to do to him, Slim? I'm going to lend him my bottle of sleeping pills to see to it that he takes an overdose of them. It's nice, clean, and quiet. That'd be great, Slim, if I'd hold still for it. But I ain't about to hold still. Look out, Slim. Punch him, Trent. Let go of that fork, Mullen. <laughs> Now, Mullen, here's something you don't have to hold still for. But you'll hold still this time. Who killed him? Who killed him? Who shot him? Stop that and shut up. Oh, we can run, Slim. We can do nothing. Get that load out of here and sell it like we planned. Then keep your mouth shut. If you don't, I'll shut it for you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Just before dawn of the next morning, a hound from a neighboring farm came across the body of Robert Mullen. Its baying attracted its master, who called the sheriff. The sheriff requested aid from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. There's the body, Ranger. Black hound dog over there came across it this morning, set up a holler. Owner heard her, thought she'd find something and come around. Let's see. Which one owns the dog? Fellow in the Mackinac, Sam Richardson. His farmer joins this one along the east fence. Who are the other two men? Harry Trent. Farm on the north is his. And Slim Fireman. Slim worked this place with Mullen. They were buddies in the war or something. You want to talk to him? Yeah, in a minute. Anybody touch that pitchfork? Nope. Not even me yet. I figured it must be the murder weapon, blood all over the prongs. Hard to read prints off that handle, though. The marks on the body show Mullen was jabbed twice. Once would have been plenty. I, uh, sent for the J.P., but I don't think we need an inquest to tag this as murder. No. We'll have to order a medical examination to establish the time of death. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, it felt kind of funny. The left leg bent in under him. Well, there's a reason for that. Pull up the pants leg and you'll see. Yeah. It explains it all right. Artificial leg. He in some kind of an accident? If you can call Okinawa an accident, you get the beach there with the first Marine. Lost a leg and an eye. Left eye's glass. Could have picked an easier life from a farm. Do you have any family? Sister Ellie lives over at Holtzworth. Guess I'll have to bring her the news. Call the local minister at Holtzville. He can tell her better than you can. We can drive over and see her later and find out if she knows anything. It's a good idea. I'll talk to these other fellows now. Okay. They uh, don't seem to know much, though. They may know when Mullen was last seen alive. It's not when a man gets pitchforked to death out in his own fields. Yeah. Well, Fellas, this is Ranger Jace Pearson. Major, this is Sam Richardson. Howdy. Harry Trent. Hello. Slim Firm. I know you. Richardson, the sheriff tells me your dog found the body. That's right. Oh, it must have been about uh, 4 a.m. I was just getting out of bed when I heard her, so I come running. You always run out and investigate when you hear one of your hounds baying? Nope. That black hound of mine's a good one. And I ain't never heard a dog's hound off like she did. I see. When did you see Mullen last alive? Yesterday morning. Passed each other along the fence and said howdy. How about you, Mr. Trent? Uh, I hadn't seen him for a couple of days. Reckon Slim here saw him last then. How about it? Well, sure, I reckon I did. Last night we ate and then I turned in early. Mm. Then this happened during the night. It must have, as far as I know. Why would Mullen come out to this field at night? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't even know he'd left the house until Richardson here come pound on the door and woke me up this morning after he found the body. You live right on the place, Slim? Mm-hmm. How come you didn't hear Richardson's dog? Uh, sleeping kind of heavy. I took a sleeping pill last night. Must have knocked me out good. Had a rough day yesterday. What do you mean, rough? Well, all the extra chores. Holding the alfalfa from this field onto the truck. I was wondering how come there were so few bales from such a big cut. Well, Mullen had a buyer for most of it, I reckon. Anyhow, he parted it off. Yeah, I see the tire tracks. Any idea who he sold it to? He didn't say. Think somebody paid him for the stuff, then came back to rob him of the money, Jace? Couldn't be, Sheriff. Except that Mullen made the robbing mighty convenient by coming out into this field at night. When we learn why he came out here, we'll be learning a lot. <laughs> Justice of the peace showed up and took charge of the body. The sheriff made his call to the minister at so he could break the news to Mullen's sister. He gave her a couple of hours to get a grip and then drove over to see her. He was, he was only here last Sunday, spending the day with him, playing with a baby, arguing with Dan. Who's Dan? I have to... What were they arguing about? I, I didn't mean a real argument. Politics. Hospital living, you know how men get talking. <laughs> and now he says. Take it easy, Ellie. That's your brother's picture with a fireplace, isn't it? Yes. In his uniform. Just before he went overseas in the war. Before he was hurt. Anybody you know of who might gain anything by having your brother out of the way? No. He never made any enemies. 
Guess it was robbery like we figured before, Jase. No money on him and none in the house that we could find. Might have had time to bank the crop on you yesterday. We can check that with the bank. Might as well go, then. Ellie, you shouldn't be here alone at a time like this. The minister's coming back later. Why don't you call Dan have him come home from work? He's away for a few days on a business trip. Away on a business trip, huh? Who's he working for? He's buying, selling, perhaps in feeding grain company. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. So if there's anything I can do, just holler. Bye, Ellie. Goodbye, man. Bye. You've you got to find out who killed my brother. You can't let him get away with it. We'll try not to, man. I never thought how her husband's job might fit into this. Buying and selling feed and grain, huh? Mullins sold that alfalfa most likely man he'd sell it to would be his own brother-in-law. It's something we're going to check on. Hop in. We'll put out a radio pickup for him? No, we'll drive over to the Hatton Feed and Grain. They'll know where he is and we'll pick him up ourselves. Hatton Speed and Grain Company told us the area that Mullen's brother-in-law Dan was working. Caught up to him next morning making a selling stop at a dairy farm. That must be Dan's car there by the barn. Hatton Company emblem on it. Yeah, let's find it. There he is. Other end of the barn, leaning on the stall. Must be the owner he's talking to. Call him down here. We don't have to. He sees us coming this way now. Watch out for any sudden moves, just in case. Uh, Howdy, Sheriff. Looking for me? Ranger and I'd like a word with you. Uh, reckon it's about Ellie's brother. You heard about him, huh? Yeah, my car radio this morning. I called Ellie a little while ago. She told me you'd been to see her. A couple stops I just got to make around here, and then I'm heading for home. When did you see Mullen last? Two days ago when I started out on this trip. You stopped by his place? That's right. Social call or business? Business. Made a bid on his alfalfa. He just about finished sweating and ready to be hauled for storage. How'd you pay him for it? By cash or company check? I didn't pay him for it, Ranger. He said it wasn't for sale. You better be sure of that, Dan. What do you mean? It means that that alfalfa was sold and moved just before Mullen was killed, the same day you stopped there. Whoever told you that's a lie? It's no lie, Dan. We saw it with our own eyes. Everything was hauled from there except maybe a dozen bales. I don't care what you saw. I know that alfalfa wasn't for sale, for me or anybody else. What makes you so sure of that? I'll tell you what makes me so sure. You can check it with the bank. Bob told me he'd made arrangements for a bank loan to buy 20 head of dairy cattle. That's why I'm sure. He was getting them in next month, and he needed that alfalfa for winter forage. He couldn't have sold it, not to anybody. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Blood Harvest, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> the loan for buying the dairy herd. Unless he changed his mind suddenly, Mullen wouldn't have sold the feed he'd been needing for his own stock. The sheriff and I headed back for Mullen's farm. Don't see Slim around any place. Maybe in the funeral home. Let's take a look at the barn. We've looked at the barn before, Jase. No way we could miss a couple hundred bales of alfalfa. No, but we might have missed something we weren't looking for the last time. Just look up. You see, the loft is almost empty. He didn't need much forage with just one horse to feed. Mm, I'm looking for forage. Here's what I'm interested in. Just a bunch of scrap lumber. And a keg of nails. Just about what he'd need to build stalls for that dairy herd. Now, Mullen was too far ahead with his plans to change his mind, if you ask me. Sure looks that way. Why'd Mullen keep his hay truck? Vehicle shed out back? Yeah. Come on. What do you want to see, Jace? truck that Slim said he and Mullen loaded that alfalfa on. Looks like the shed is locked. Uh, no, it isn't. It's the wooden peg stuck through the lock ratchet. We can pull it. Now I'll help you roll it back. There's a the truck. Is this the only truck he's got? Yep. This truck was used to haul alfalfa bales. Must have been tighter than any bales I've ever seen. Look at that truck. Clean as a whistle. Not a straw on the floor. Hmm? 
This is the truck that was loaded out in that field. You can't be sure of that just because the bed is clean. No, but I can be sure by the tires. Look at them. Tread's worn down almost smooth. The tire marks we saw out in the field were well marked. Plenty of tread. Hey, that's right. They were. Come on. Take Mullen's horse from the barn, throw a saddle on it. I'll get Charcoal out of my trailer, and we'll take a little ride. Where to? Out to the fields first, where I can make a plastic cast of that tire tread. The truck was loaded heavy. The compression was deep enough to hold. Why can't we drive out? I'm going to cut across the neighboring farms, too, and see if we can find any matching treads in other fields. We can see the ground better as we move on horseback. It's as easy to drive around the farms and check the tires on the trucks like we did here. Yeah, but I don't want to be seen doing that. If we scare the man we're after, he might run before we get to him. Okay, I'll have this nag ready in a minute. If you're right, Jace, Slim Fireman has been lying about moving the alfalfa. Easy, boy. We'll find out. If he was lying, we'll explain why Mullen was out to that field at night. Because it'll mean that the prop was being stolen at night. And he was killed when he saw who was stealing it. <laughs> Does it take that cast to dry, Jace? I'll be ready in a minute. I would be a lot of truck tires with that same tread. Sure. This piece I'm making a cast of has a cut mark across part of the tread. Oh, I see. Find that same mark again someplace else. We can make another cast and use for evidence. Here, this is dry now. How's that, Sheriff? Good, clear impression, Jace. Come on. Let's ride. We checked the neighboring farms. Sam Richardson's place was clear, and so were the two others. And we cut through the north fence to Mullins' farm and into the acreage owned by Harry Trent. Looks like Trent moved his alfalfa crop too, Jace. Fields are clear. Yeah. Where's the farmhouse? Other side of that patch of trees. Good. We'll keep us covered. Keep your eyes on the ground. Right. Hey, hold it. Ooh. Hold it. What is it? Nothing. Factor marks there. Not what we're looking for. Well, let's keep going. Hey, Roger. Right. There's quite a bit of straw on the ground over to the right, Sheriff. Let's move that way. Hey, right. Yeah. Yeah. Probably Fred had his mail stacked there. He sure did. That's what we're looking for. Ooh. Ooh, Chuck. Ooh, easy. Kind of dim, Jason. Same tread, all right. Looks like the same cut mark in the tread. I'm going to make another cast. And after dark, we can slip in and take a look at Trent's barn and his truck. We slipped back that night. Trent's truck tires were the ones we were looking for. Heavy duty. We went from the vehicle shed to the barn. Pretty dark night, Jesus. Hardly see it here either. Yeah, see enough to find what I want. Down to the left. Here it is. All right, I'm going to climb up. Give me your flashlight. Yeah. Hey, Anything up there? Just a few bales. We can Trent sold most of his alfalfa crop too. Even if he had Mullins' crop here, no way we can prove it. That's where you're wrong, Sheriff. If Trent had it, we're gonna. Be so careful out at Trent's place, Jace. There he is going toward his car. Must have come in to pay his respect. Well, he just came out of the door of that cafe. Oh, look who's in there at the counter. Slim Fireman. Yeah, we could use some coffee. Come on. Sit with you, Slim. Help yourself. Yeah, uh, got a line on who killed Mullen yet? No. Too bad Mullen never mentioned the name of the man he was selling that alfalfa to. No, too bad. You think he might have mentioned it to one of the neighbors, Sam Richardson, maybe, or Harry Trent? No, no, I, I, don't, I don't think so. This is likely. A man who doesn't tell his plans to an old buddy right in the same house with him, I guess he wouldn't tell anybody. Yeah. Here's your jabba, Sheriff. 
Sheriff. Thanks. Ranger. You and Mullen go all through the war together? No, just part of it. Mm -hmm. Where'd you meet? South Pacific? Uh, no, here in the States. I, uh, I was a ward man at the General Hospital. Oh, then you weren't in action together. No. I see. Uh, I thought you were a real close friend. We were. Who says we weren't? We took it easy. Nobody said so. I just meant you... You weren't as close as buddies are when they're under fire together. We were plenty close. Don't let nobody tell you different. Mullen was the best friend I ever had, see? Sure. When you get the guy who killed him, I... I'd like to be there to watch when they strap the rat in the electric chair. I know just how you feel. I'll do my best to arrange that for you. Uh, here's your money, May. Thanks, I'm going back to the farm and get some sleep if I can. Hardly had any since this happened. It's too bad. Maybe you ought to take one of your sleeping pills. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe I will. Good night. Good night, Sheriff. Good night, Slim. You sure rattled his teeth, Jase. He was pretty frank about his service record, though. Yeah, only because he knew I could check it if he lied. Let's skip this coffee. I want to see Ellie and her husband, Dan. Ellie and Dan were keeping a lonesome night vigil beside the body of Robert Mullen. To beckon Dan outside. What is it? I won't leave Ellie alone too long. I'm afraid you'll have to leave her alone for a while if you want to help us string the trap on the man who killed your brother-in-law. You know who did it? I think so. I need your help to prove it. You gotta help. What do you want? How much acreage did Mullen have in alfalfa? Looked like seven or eight acres. Eight, right. You know how much it yield? About two tons to an acre, 16 ton all told. That's a good yield for this year. He took good care of his land. Why? I'll tell you in a minute. Sheriff, we saw Trent's alfalfa acreage. I'd say he'd got about six acres. But, Dan, uh, you don't have to say about. Six acres is right. How do you know? I bought Trent's alfalfa crop for my company. Good. How much? Almost 12 tons. Same acre yield as Bob Mullen. 12 tons. Are you sure that's all? Of course I'm sure. The feed and grain companies keep a record of everybody they purchase from? Sure. A lot to be identified. I mean, are they tagged or stored in such a way you could tell who they were brought from? Yeah, they are. What are you aiming at, Jason? Final proof to break Trent down. Dan, I want you to come with me. Get one of the bales Trent sold to your company, and we're going to wake up every other feed and grain buyer in the county to see if he sold any more than 12 tons. <laughs> sheriff's office. Hey, put it down here, Dan. Yeah. So Trent did sell more of it, huh? Fifteen tons more. We'll see how you can tell this bale from the other one. You can when you weigh them. Trent's bales averaged 110 pounds to the bale on his own stuff. The bales in this second batch are tighter packed, about 140 pounds to the bale. Hey, wait a minute, Ranger. There's something else different, too. I just noticed. Look at the wire on the bales. Mm -hmm. Looks the same to me. Maybe, but you're not as used to seeing baling wire as I am. Wire on the bales Trent sold me is 16 gauge. Wire on this other bale is 14 gauge. Bob Mullen always used 14 gauge. Come on, Sheriff. Let's get Trent and make him talk. Once he opens up, we'll see where Slim Fairman fits. Yes, I see the picture's clear as you do now, but how are we going to prove that this second batch of alfalfa was stolen from Mullen's place? We don't have to prove it. Trent's the one who has to do the proving. We do things big in Texas, but he's the first man who ever sold 27 tons of alfalfa from six acres. Let's go. It was still dark when we turned in the road to Trent's farmhouse, and the light went on inside as we came to a stop. Trent came to the door. Oh, oh, two cars. I heard car. Huh? You thought it was somebody else? No, 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 I didn't know who it was. Oh, I thought you might be expecting Slim Fairman. Uh, no, no, why would Slim come here? Take a few lessons in farming, maybe, so you could show him how to raise 27 tons of alfalfa on six acres. Honey, you must have raised that much, Trent, because you sold that much. The 15 tons of it belonged to Mullen. He bailed heavier and used 14 gauge wire while you used 16 gauge. Uh, I bought Mullen's problem. Why would he sell it to you instead of his brother in law, Dan? I mean, I, I, I hold it for him. He thought the price would be better someplace else. 
Not enough to haul it 50 miles. And besides, you made that sale yesterday, after Mullen was killed. Now, I had to do it. I was in a trap. If I told you about it, Slim would have killed me. Did he kill Mullen? Were you an eyewitness? Yeah, 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 yeah I saw him do it. I never touched Mullen. Where's Slim now? I, I thought you were him when you drove up. He's coming here this morning. I got to check for Mullen's alfalfa, and Slim was going to pick it up and take it someplace for cash. And... There's a car coming now, Jason. Handcuff French to the door now, but that closet. Quick, right. I didn't kill him. Right Come on, Sheriff. Slim won't stop. You'll see my car as he makes the turn for the house. He saw it. He's turning around. Get his tire. That stopped him. He's running for it, Chase. Move off to that side. The car shield me. Right. Stop running, Slim. You can't beat a bullet. He backed into the bullet, Chase. Circle in from the side and keep the door covered. I'm going in after him. <laughs> of dawn was washing across the sky with the barn in deep shadow. I slipped along the side wall and moved slowly toward the stalls. I didn't see what came at me. I just sensed it. Hurled through the air and I threw myself to the side, hit the ground and fired. You all right? Yeah. He threw that sickle at me from the stall. I didn't see him. I don't even know how I hit him. I felt it coming and fired. Mighty good aim. He's dead. So is Bob Mullen. Let's get the For his complicity in the robbery and murder of Robert Mullen, Harry Trent was sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for 50 years. star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. The equipment of a Texas Ranger includes a pair of six guns, a rifle, a shotgun, and other weapons. Not to mention his horse, horse trailer, automobile, and scientific crime detection apparatus. However, there's been a fictional addition to the equipment as the result of motion pictures. An addition that has the Rangers scratching their heads brutally. It came to the attention of one Ranger recently as he passed two small boys on the street. The small fry turned to stare at him. The ranger got quite a shock when he heard one of them say, Shucks, he ain't a real Texas ranger. He ain't got a guitar. Well, such is the influence of modern fiction. But fortunately, the criminals know the truth. When they see a real Texas ranger, they don't look for a guitar. They look for the quickest means of transportation. They want distance, not music. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lou Krugman, Herb Feigren, Tom Tully, Wilms Herbert, Betty Moran, and Gigi Pearson. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Al Gibney speaking. Times mean good times on NBC. Here's news of two outstanding musical events. This Saturday, January 27th, Arturo Toscanini begins the first of a new series with the NBC Symphony. And starting Monday, January 29th, the Boston Pops Orchestra will be heard in a new Monday evening concert series. They call infantile paralysis the visible crippler. It strikes without mercy any place, anywhere. You can fight him with your dimes and dollars, though. Send them today to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Join the 1951 March of Dimes. Remember, Arturo Toscanini once again conducts the symphony next Saturday on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales 
of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Chase Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Logger's Larceny. It is mid-afternoon, September 7th, 1938. Two loggers employed by the Gulf Lumber Company are marking timber near a lonely stretch of company logging road in the Piney Woods region of East Texas. Yeah, yeah. Cutting crew ought to be able to see that, Mark. Yeah. Well, looks like that's the last decent stick left in this stand of timber. Uh, plenty more trees in the woods. Come on, we'll cross the creek and start working that stand up on the other side of the road. Uh, We're already marked an awful lot of trees today. I think my axe is heavy. You know, <laughs> I could do with a breather. Yeah, catch it on the round there. Come on. You'll get used to that axe. I told you I'd make a logger out of you. This stick with me, kid. I'll put muscles like this on your arms. Hair on your chest, iron in your fist. Yeah, if I live through it. <laughs> Bull, I'm about done in. Oh, man, that creek sure looks good. Yeah, don't let it fool you. Ain't fit to drink down here. Sawdust pile at the mill poisoned it. Well, what do we do, Wade? Sure, ain't deep enough to swim, is it? But he want to ride across Piggy Bath. Hey, Bull, look. Huh? Over there on the other side. Up there against that old cutover stump. That's the car. Yeah, upside down, all smashed up. Well, come on. Somebody might be hurt. Hey, Bullet, that's one of the company cars on the mill. Yeah, I see. Sure is wrecked, ain't it? Yeah. They smell like gasoline. Tank's busted wide open. Sure good thing there wasn't a spark. Uh huh. But then some fire if that gas had caught. Hey, look at here, kid. In the front seat. Who, who is it, Bullet? It's old man Hutton. What's left of him? It's a paymaster. Come on, we'd better get him out of there. No, we can't do nothing for him. Get a load of this bank bag. Gee, that's full of money. Uh-huh. Payroll for the mill. Oh, what are you doing? What are you stuffing that money in your shirt for? Look, kid, we ain't been around here, understand? Oh, you've got no right to that money. Well, he's got a better one. Who's even gonna know it's missing? Unless you shoot off your mouth. You twist my arm. I'll twist your neck right off your shoulders if you let out one word. Oh. For the law, Jack. Forget the law. Just remember, you'll get the worst beating he ever had. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand. Yeah, that's being smart. Here, throw this sack back in the car while I got my shirt buttoned. But there's still some money left in it. Sure. All the coins and a few bills. No use being a hog, is it? Besides, this is going to look right. Throw it back in the car, I said. Sure, boy. Sure. Now, uh, you got a match? Crazy bull, a match with all that gasoline spilled around here? Wait and see how crazy. Give me a match. Here. There's only one left in the box. That's all you got? Yeah. Well, we'll make this one count in. Now, get back out of the way. <laughs> Frantic mill superintendent waited until evening to report the missing paymaster and money. Sheriff Stanton immediately contacted the Texas Rangers. An all-points bulletin for the apprehension of the man was sent out, and Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. He arrived at the mill with the sheriff early the next morning. Here's the mill office, Jace. Might as well start there. The quicker we can get a line on up the better. Yeah. If he's making a run for it, he's already got a big lead on us. Meet Ranger Pearson, Mr. Browning. Mr. Browning's the mill superintendent. Howdy, Mr. Browning. Yeah, please meet Ranger. Anything new here? No. I, uh, I'm kind of inexperienced with this sort of thing. I uh, sure have been weak with you. The delay is my fault. It was nearly sunup when I met the sheriff. It took time enough for breakfast and to drag the bank teller out of bed. He says your man Hutton left the bank about a half hour after closing time yesterday. Yeah, they waited until the street doors were closed before they started making up Hutton's orders for mixed currency. Yeah, they usually work it that way at the bank on paydays. 
$18,000 is a lot of money to count out, Slim. Well, we not only know how much money we're looking for, but how much of each denomination. I've got Hutton's list. The bank teller gave me a copy of it. You sure must have slipped out quiet. Not a soul in town saw him after he left the bank. No telling which direction he headed. Uh, would you have a picture of him by any chance, Mr. Browning, to sort of amplify the description we've already sent out? Well, there may be one among his belongings in his shack. You know, Sheriff, I, I still can't believe Bob absconded with that money. $18,000 is a lot of temptation, Mr. Browning. I know it, but Bob Hutton's been with us for years. I'd have trusted him with every asset the company owns. I, I just don't know what to think now. We won't rule out any possibility. Before we go through Hutton's things, I'd like to talk to any of your crew who might have been working near the road yesterday afternoon. Well, Foreman Bull Evans and his helper were marking a stand of timber over by Pine Creek. They're down the drying yard this morning. The rest of the crew's out in the woods. How do they feel about Hutton not showing up? Mm -hmm. Quite a few of them wanted to dig up a rope and go hunting for him. But Bull Evans talked them out of that. Let's go find this foreman of yours. Sounds like some talker. Maybe he can tell us something. <laughs> Put your shoulder to the dolly, kid. Here. Yeah, that's good. I will stack this load of sheathen beside that last bunch of two bys. Stand them on in and slide them in against the ridge pole. There. Okay. That, that's green stuff. It's heavy as lead. Stack it up there straight. Want the whole blame rack to come down on top of you? What's the matter with you? You're nervous? No. No, I. I ain't nervous. Give me a hand, won't you, Paul? <laughs> sure. There. There. Like I told you, keep your mouth shut and nothing will happen to you. Okay. Get that next stick. Yeah. Like that? Maybe we'll make a logger out of you yet. Paul. Oh, look, here comes the boss and the ranger. Yeah. And the sheriff. So what? Grab that next stick and remember what I told you about talking. Find old man Hutton on the payroll yet? Well, Ranger Pearson. Oh, howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Ranger and the sheriff want to ask you and the boy some questions. Well, sure, sure. Glad to help. Hey, kid, hold it a minute there, will you? Yeah, sure. I understand you were working somewhere near the road from town yesterday afternoon. No, we were working a stand over on Pine Creek. Sometimes it was near the road, sometimes it wasn't. Did you see anything of Hutton or the company car he was driving? We didn't see any car, did we, kid? No. Did you hear a car going either way on the road? Yeah, we didn't hear nothing. We didn't see nothing. I'm afraid you're barking up a wrong tree, Ranger. How's that, Bull? Old man Hutton wasn't crazy. He'd seen a chance at a lot of money, and he took it. He never headed back this way from town. You'll pick him up someplace long gone from here. All right, Bull. That's all. Ed, come on, kid. Let's get back to work. Now, wait a minute. I haven't talked to your helper yet. Well, Bull told you we didn't see nothing. I don't know nothing about that money. You're looking for a man right now, son. Not the money he was carrying. Are you as convinced as Bull here that he ran off with the company payroll? Well, I... Well, are you or aren't you? I don't know nothing about it, I tell you. What are you so nervous about it? Nothing. I, I just don't know nothing about it. Look, son, maybe you don't know it, but there's a severe penalty for withholding information from the law in this state. If you do know anything about this case, anything at all, it's your duty to tell the ranger and me now. Well, I... Yeah? Well, there's a pretty bad turn over there on Pine Creek. Mr. Hutton might have had an accident and nobody was around. Say, that is a possibility, Ranger. That's the worst stretch along the road. And one of those turns is a bad one. Ah, uh, old Bob Hutton could drive that road backwards and blindfolded. He's been doing it for years. Besides me and the kid come in by the road last night, there wasn't no wreck along it then. Did you see anything, son? No. No, there, there wasn't nothing along the road when we went by. We came out that way this morning, Jace. Wasn't anything inside then, either. Yeah, the area along the creek is uh, an old cutoff. The brush has come back thick and sponge. The car down in there could be completely hidden from the road. Yeah, we're going to have to search every inch of the way out in town to eliminate accident as a possibility in this case anyway, Jace. This bad turn out of the creek sounds like as good a place as any to begin with. Yeah, let's get out there and take a look. Uh, you mind showing us that cut over, Mr. Browning? No, not at all, Ranger. I'll get my car and you can follow me. Uh, Bull... If anything comes up here while I'm going, you take care of it. Will you? Oh, sure, Bill. Sure, I'll take care of everything. Hey, don't, don't you want me to go with you? No, thanks, son. You better stay here. Yeah, kid, you stay here. 
There's going to be plenty to keep you busy. Roadside tracks and broken brush near the bad turn on Pine Creek were so faint we nearly missed them. The car itself was completely screened from the road by brush. It was badly burned and lay upside down on an open patch of grass. The body of its driver slumped near the wheel. It's an accident, all right, Jason. Seems like good heavens. What a way to die. Marks indicate Hutton lost control when he left the road. Judging from the damage to the car, I think there's no question but what he was dead when the wreck caught fire. I hope so. I told you I couldn't believe Bob Hutton would steal that money. Looks like you were right, Mr. Browning. Here, look in this window. Yes. Yeah. What a mess. Here's your money. What's left of it? There beside the springs of that burned seat cushion. Oh, yeah. I see some corn rolls that the wrappers burned over. And that fluff of ash on top of them is what's left of the paper money. It's hard to believe it could burn that much. It was a mighty hot fire while it lasted. But even the body metals warped all out of shape. Well, Jace, looks like it's back to town for us. I gotta get an undertaker's wagon out here and pick up his body. Mm, I'll have to kill that all points wanted bullet and on Hutton, too. I guess that'll about wind this up, huh? I'm uh, not so sure, Sheriff. What do you mean? Uh, this... This just doesn't feel quite right. What does? Finding this car like this. We might have looked for a day before we found it down here in this brush. Don't you have more to go on than that, Ranger? No, nothing more. Just a hunch. Seems like working on hunches would be kind of dangerous in your business. It usually is. For somebody. Come on, I, I want to get back to the mill. Well, what do you want to go back there for? You don't need a phone. You can use your car radio. Yeah, I know. But there's something funny about this. I want to get it cleared up. Hey, Sheriff, look out. Hmm? Watch where you're stepping. What is it? That matchbox. Oh. Hey, wait a minute. What's so important about a matchbox? It should be plenty important. Look where it's lying. I don't get you, Jason. All right, look up there, Sheriff. That's where Hutton's car turned over. It slid down from there on its roof. The matchbox is right in the track, and it hasn't been crushed. Mm -hmm. We've dropped half the One? That's right, Sheriff. Let's see. It's empty. The last match was used and the box thrown away. Well, used for what, Ranger? What's a matchbox got to do with Bob Hutton's day? Maybe nothing. But even when a car is as badly damaged as this one was, even when it's drenched with gasoline, it doesn't always catch fire. Let's go back a minute. Do you know what you're saying? I think so. You mean somebody could have deliberately set this car on fire after the accident? If this was an accident. Oh, but look, Jace, the only possible reason for arson in a case like this would be to cover taking the money Hutton had with him. And it's still there. What's left of it, anyway? I know, Sheriff. There we are. Give me a hand, will you, Sheriff? Sure, Jace. What do you want to do? See if we can't get what's left of that money out without disturbing the ash around it. I want to send it into the lab. What'll that get you? If any of it's missing, they may be able to tell us. We removed the remains of the charred money bag and its contents as carefully as possible and packed them for transfer to the laboratory. When we drove back to the mill yard, Bull Evans was just coming out of the office. Dead, Bull. Dead? He had an accident in the Pine Creek. Just about where that kid suggested we look, too. Boy, oh, can you beat that? Where is the kid? I think we'd better talk to him again. Well, you ain't gonna get much out of him, Ranger. Why? No, these young punks never look where they're going or what they're doing. He got himself really bunged up. Where is he? In the first aid room back in the office. I wanted to send for a doctor, but he wouldn't let me. I got him on a cot back there. He don't feel so good. Let's take a look. Come on. You too, Bull. Yeah, sure. Right through there, Ranger. Okay. <laughs> Easy, kid. Let's have a look at it. No! Why, his face is weak to a pulp. Bruises on his ribs and belly, too. What happened to you, son? No. Go away. You better answer the Ranger, boy. What happened to you? Go on, kid. Tell him what happened. Look. Drying rack. It fell on me. You are 
are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Logger's Larceny, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The kid was in no condition for further questioning. When we were unable to persuade him to submit the medical treatment, the sheriff and I returned to town and had a talk with the Justice of the Peace. The next morning, the sheriff attended Hutton's inquest while I waited in his office for a call from our lab at Austin. It had just come through when the sheriff returned. Sorry to be so long, Jase. Oh, I was comfortable, Sheriff. You got a nice office. <laughs> Thanks. Inquest over? Yeah. Death by natural causes, I suppose. Yeah, failure of the heart. Doc says Hutton was dead when his car left the road. An out-and-out -out accident. Oh, look, Jase, it's like the J.P. told you last night. That matchbox don't mean anything. It could have blown in on those tracks. I guess this isn't my week for hunches, Sheriff. Well, the lab report came in, too. How did that up? Coins in the bank sack tallied exactly with the withdrawal slip the teller gave us. Oh, how about the bills, the paper money? Mm, there were traces of them in the ash. The quantity was small and might indicate some paper money was missing, but it burned so completely the lab couldn't be sure. Yeah, looks like that's that. Yeah. Well, Sheriff, I guess I better get started. So long, Jace. Thanks. See you again on another case. Yeah. Call us anytime you need us. You know, Sheriff, it still doesn't feel right. You know, Jace, it doesn't to me either. There's that matchbox. Sure, it could have blown in there, but that kid at the mill. Yeah. What about the kid? If he had a hunch Hutton's car was wrecked and where it might be, why didn't he tell his boss that as soon as he and Bull came in from the timber? Yeah, that's right. As was, he didn't tell us till we dragged it out of it. That turn out there didn't have anything to do with Hutton's death. His heart could. He could have gone over the edge anywhere along the road. Yeah, but, Jace, he did go over at that turn. Sure he did. And that's why the kid couldn't have known the car was there unless he'd seen it. Then Bull Evans and the kid were lying. But why? That's what we're going to find out. That and why the drying rack fell on the kid. Kind of funny two accidents should happen so close together. Come on, Sheriff. Let's get out to that mill. There, Sheriff. I didn't look for you and Ranger Pierce, Bank. Got a newcomer? Not exactly, Mr. Brown. Just a few loose ends. I want to talk to that kid who was hurt yesterday. How is he? Ooh, apparently a lot better than he looks. How's that? He was up for breakfast this morning. He says that he was in shape to work. In shape to work? Mm, that's what he claimed. That kid was in shape for a hospital. Ooh, Bull banked him up. He'd been taking care of him. I guess he ought to know. They around the yard here? Well, Bull didn't figure the kid was quite up to yard work. They went out with the felon crew together. Sure. Uh, Bull said he'd watch after the kid. Oh, he did, huh? Where are they? Uh, up in the northeast quarter of Section 3 someplace, about four miles out. Come on, Sheriff. We'd better get out there. That kid was in no condition to work. Well, you, you can't make it in the car. We haven't got our access road to that section finished yet. You got any horses here? Yeah. The one I use for making my rounds of the crews is saddled up out back. Bring it around for the Sheriff. I'll get my horse unloaded from the trailer. Right away, Ranger. Come on, Sheriff. Get me the other side of that end gate, will you? Sure. You think that kid's in any danger, Jake? What do you think? I'm beginning to think so. So am I. Oh, back up, Jackie. Steady, boy. Easy, easy, boy. Uh, here you are, Sheriff. Sheriff, so to be about right. Well, thanks, Mr. Browning. Now, you take that work road at the corner of the yard. You begin to hit some of the crew out at the end of it. They can tell you just where Bull and his help is. Thanks. Let's go, Sheriff. Come, John. Come on, pick him up, boy. Ah! Following Mr. Browning's directions, we found some of his Sawyers and Axemen at work in deep pools. They sent us on to others, knowing only that Bull Evans and the kid were working somewhere up ahead. Hold it, Sheriff. Oh, 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 oh. Listen. Somebody working over there. Yeah, come on. Let's go, Chuck. Come on. Is it Bull and the kid? No. Oh, 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 oh. Hey there. Howdy, Sheriff. Ranger. What you 
doing out here? Looking for Bull Evans and his partner. Boys down the line said they were up this way. Yeah, they were. A little while ago. Where'd they go? Blame the plan, though. They're too crazy. Crazy? What do you mean? That uh, bull was working over there. You can see the cut he was making. Uh-huh. The kid wasn't worth much, bunged up the way he was, so he was just fooling around, kind of grubbing out a little brush. That uh, bull come over to bum a smoke off of me, and when he turned around, the kid was gone. Gone? Yeah. Hey. Slipped off in the brush. Bull hollered for him. When he didn't get no answer, Bull took right off after him, swearing fit to make old Paul Bunyan turn over in his grave. How long ago? Ooh, 10, maybe 15 minutes ago. Come on, Sheriff. Hey, look, what is all this? Tell me later, son. Go. Let's go. Here's the tracks again on this soft ground. Yeah. Oh, oh, charcoal. <laughs> Wait a minute, Sheriff. Steady, boy. What do you make of it, Jace? I don't like it. Where do you suppose that kid's heading? Yeah, beats me. Wherever it is, he's sure heading there in a straight line and hard as he can go. Yeah, with Bull apparently right behind him. It makes about as little sense to that drying rack falling on him yesterday or Bull talking him into reporting for work this morning. What's between the two of them? That's what we got to find out. Tracking us too slow. We're losing too much time. That pretty thick timber ahead. Get out of slow up some. Won't be much to follow when we get in there in those pine needles either. Jace, maybe we better split, sort of spread out. That way we'll be in. Yeah, hear that? Somebody in there's got a gun. Come on. Get up, Charlie. Come on, You know, I'm getting it full. Sounds like the shot's in the middle of that timber stand. It's a bad place to work blind, Jace. Yeah. You might miss him complete in there. Possible. Look, Sheriff. You cut around the timber the other edge in case somebody breaks out in the clear in that direction. I'll head straight for the sound of those shots. Try to box them in, huh? It's worth a try. Come on, Charlie. Come on, timber horse. Let's go. Deep into the timber, I stop near a blowdown. A huge living pine tree blown over onto the ground. I wanted to listen for me. But I knew an armed man was somewhere ahead of me, and charcoal seemed to sense my tension. Whoa, Charco. Steady, boy. Steady. Take it easy, Charky. Huh? Found it. What are you shying away from? Whoa, whoa, boy. All right. Crawl out from under that blowdown. No. No. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Nobody's going to shoot, kid. Crawl out of there. No, get away, will you? Leave me be. You'll you kill me if you find me. Get hold of yourself, kid. Who'll kill you? What for? Bull. He almost caught me. You're all right now, son. Come on out. He shot him. I crawled in there and he lost me. He ran on past. I heard him. But he'll be back. Better tell me why he's after you. Come on, spill it quick. Oh. I saw him take the money. From Hutton's wreck, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we came down to the creek and there it was. He took the money and threw a match into the gas line. He burned the car and Mr. Hutton's still in it. Settle down. Take it easy. Hutton was dead when his car left the road. Why didn't you tell us about this yesterday when we asked you? Well, I, I tried to tell you, but Bull was standing there watching, listening. And look what happened in the afternoon. That accident at the drying rack? The accident. He pushed the rack over to make it look that way. Afterward, he beat me and almost killed me. Came close enough. Why didn't you sneak out to Mr. Browning with your story last night? Well, I never got a chance. Bull got a gun out of his possible bag and kept it under his blanket all night, pointed at me. He never slept a week. I had to get up this morning and make it look like I, I wanted to come out here to work with you. Why'd you head in this direction when you made your break this morning? Well, I figured if I could get to the money and get it back to Mr. Browning, this would all be over. Now. Well, then I'd be safe. You know where the money is? Yeah, yeah, it's an old stump and a drop between here and the road. Come on. Charcoal will carry double. We got some riding to do. understand the kid's terror. A professional criminal knows the odds against him and seldom goes beyond a certain limit. An amateur is like a man in quicksand, more desperate with every step and more dangerous. There. there that's the stump right over there. Oh, Charlie. There's a hollow on the other side of it. Now hurry up, will you? Uh-huh. Take it easy, kid. Charcoal made a lot better time than Bull could have made on foot. Besides, he's still probably looking for you. Well, maybe he's been here already. We'll soon see. Yeah, it's here, all right. Can't you hurry? Hey, this is a pile of money. Yeah, I know. Come on. All set, kid. Just 
just as soon as I stash these bills away in my saddlebags. This is what you call valuable evidence. And this is what's called a gun, Ranger. Bull! Right, over here. You're making a mistake, Bull. You've made yours. Drop him saddlebags. You ain't getting that money. It's mine. Now drop him. All right, get off that horse, kid. Get off, I said. Oh. All right. I'll start backing away from my money. Both of you. I told you I'd kill you if you opened your mouth, kid. Now it's gonna be both of you. You, you hurt, kid? No. No, are you okay? Yeah. Bull's gun just didn't shoot very straight. Oh, you sure did, and then fast. That's what a spring clip holster's for, son. Gage! Gage! Everything all right? Yeah, for everybody but Bull. He's, he's dead? Kind of. What was the deal, Chase? Did he have some of the money from the wreck? Show him what's in the saddlebags, kid. All right. Here, Sheriff, take a look. Hmm. Looks like he had it all. How deep was the kid here in with him? I reckon that's something the court will have to judge on the evidence. Here, give me a hand, Sheriff. And hang Bull across your saddle. We've got one last ride coming. On November 12th, 1938, the kid was arraigned before the county court and found innocent of willful complicity in the theft from the paymaster's wrecked car. He was returned to society with a deeper appreciation and understanding of the duties of a citizen in the face of crime. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. You know, we're awfully grateful to you people for the nice letters you've sent in. It makes you feel good to know that there are some folks who just want to let you know that they're all for you and that they like your show. I know it's kind of an effort to sit down and write a letter or postcard to a voice hundreds of miles away, and that's why it would be downright ungrateful if we didn't thank you for your trouble. It's really a compliment. There's a little story I ran across about a ranger I thought you'd like to hear before we say goodnight. I thought it was kind of funny. It seems that in the days when the Texas Rangers were charged with the enforcement of the Prohibition laws, their reputation for apprehending offenders caused moonshiners to keep a sharp eye out for these famed officers. One day on a lonely road in East Texas, a moonshiner with a load of bootleg whiskey rounded the turn and came upon a man dressed in khaki clothes, big hat, and boots, signaling him to stop. Frantically, he grabbed a wrench and broke all ten of the one-gallon bottles of whiskey. Turning to the man in the road, he called... You can't arrest me, Ranger. You ain't got no evidence. What do you mean, fellow? Replied the Texas Ranger. I have a flat tire. Can you loan me your jack? Good night, folks. See you again next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Conrad, Stacey Harris, Parley Bear, and Bill Johnstone. This story was transcribed and adapted by Tom W. Blackburn, and the program was produced and directed by Stacey Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Monday is for music, the best in music on NBC. Tomorrow evening, the telephone hour brings you contralto Marion Anderson as guest soloist. And for a melodic blend of light classical and classical music, you're invited to the second concert in a new Monday evening series by the Boston Pops under the baton of Arthur Friedman. Now Jack Parr with the $64 question for more good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers.
Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, The Hatchet. It is 8.30 a.m. Sunday, May 16th, 1941. The Halleck family of Rock Point, Texas, is preparing to leave for church. You want any more toast, Jim? Nope. All I want is another cup of coffee. I'll get it myself. Why don't you sit down and eat? Well, I would if I could get that boy to the table. Robert? Robert! I'm coming, Ma. You've been saying that for half an hour. Your eggs are getting colder. We'll be late for church. All right, all right. And never mind that all right business. When your mother called you, you just come a-running. Stay away, Pa. I got a word for face, don't I? I'll be right there. You'll see the jar. You'll go without your breakfast. Now, you come sit down, Patty. No need of your stuff to be an empty. This coffee will do for me. Seems like the older a boy gets, the harder it is to get him out of bed in the morning. What time did he get in last night? After 11. Him and Sadie Lewis went to the picture show. I told him I wanted him home at 10 o'clock nights. Jim, it was Saturday night. He goes to school all week. Well, school will soon be over. He'll be working with me in the store all summer. Maybe he won't feel much like staying out half the night when he's been on his feet all day. Look at that time. Robert! Here, Pa. Here. Well, it's about time. I'll get your breakfast, but the eggs will be like rubber. I don't want anything to eat. I'm not hungry. Well, why didn't you say so before your ma wasted her time and the food? You've got to eat something. I'll have breakfast when we get back from church. Sure, that'll be fine. You can make more work for your ma that way. Gee, Pa, I just don't feel hungry now. Oh, leave him alone, Jim. I'll get him something later. I just put the dishes in to soak. You two want to get out of my way. Why don't you go next door and tell Mr. Driscoll we're about ready to leave. Uh, is he riding with us again? Yes, he's riding with us again, so stop sulking about it. Come on. You ought to be glad to have your teacher for a neighbor. You wouldn't be at the head of your graduating class if it weren't for his helping you. And I see enough of them in school without seeing them Sunday, too. Yeah, but when you get away to college in the fall, you might be wishing you had somebody like him close by to give you a hand. Ring the bell. He don't answer. Maybe he went on. He'd have told us, and I didn't hear his car. Come on, maybe he's out the back. Mr. Driscoll! <laughs> That's funny. Run up the back steps and take a look in the kitchen window. Oh, why don't we just go without him? Will you do like I tell you? Okay. See anything? No, he and... Pa! Pa! What is it, Brian? What's the matter? Look at him. He's lying there on the floor. Oh. Pa, what is it? What happened to him? Come away, son. Don't look anymore. Come away. I gotta call the sheriff. It... It looks like he's been murdered. <laughs> Sheriff Alvin Jeffers took one look at the scene of the crime and put in a call for the assistance of the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Yeah, mighty bloody job, Jace. No weapon in sight. No. Judging by the marks, though, it was something with two edges. One, one sharp. Probably a hatchet, Sheriff. Either that or two weapons. That's possible, but not likely. You say the J.P.'s been here? Mm -hmm. As soon as we're finished, the body will be moved into the funeral home for autopsy. Established time of death. It'll help. Where'd your call come from? Neighbors next door, the Halleck's. Man, wife, and son. Man and boy spotted Driscoll through the window when they come to get him for a lift to church. I'd like to talk to him. Sure, I told him to stick to home. Well, we can go out back and hop the fence. Avoid that crowd out front. Good. 
Yeah, the front room looked like Driscoll went in big for books. Yeah, he was an English teacher at the high school. Alex's boy, Robert, was in one of his classes, I think. Driscoll live alone? Mm-hmm. A widower. Here, step on this box and hop the fence. Yeah, you go ahead. I can get over without it. Okay. <laughs> Well, Alex saw us coming. There he is at the back door. Howdy, sir. Ranger. Come on in. Thanks. Ranger Pearson, Jim Halleck. Howdy, howdy. Oh, uh, my wife, Hattie, and my boy, Robert. Howdy. Howdy, Ranger. Uh, you found Driscoll's body this morning? Me and Robert. Saw it through the window. What time? Oh, about quarter to nine. That's when we always leave for services. Oh, Jace, I ought to call my office. Have the funeral home come for the body now. All right, go ahead. Mind if I use your phone, Halleck? Help so. I'll show you where it is, Sheriff. Oh, you better stay, Robert. Okay. You and your dad found the body. Would you mind, Mrs. Halleck? Not at all. In here, Sheriff. Thank you. Either of you see Driscoll yesterday or last night? We both saw him outside last night, a little after six. I was coming home from the store. I sell groceries. Robert was outside waiting for me so he could take the car. Big date, huh? <laughs> yeah. What was Driscoll doing? Digging a flower border on his lawn. You talked to him? Just called to him after Robert took the car and drove off. Asked if he planned on riding to church with us. No sense taking two cars when neighbors are going to the same place. I see. Is that all? So, you didn't hear anything during the evening or the night? Nope. Me and Hattie turned in a little after nine. How about you, Robert? What time did you get home? Um, what time did you get home? You can tell him I know you was late. Your mother heard you come in. A little after 11. Where were you? To a picture show with Sadie Lewis. What did you see? I don't remember the name of it. Bing Crosby's in it. Case, you going to be much longer? Oh, no, Sheriff. Why? I spoke to my office. One of my deputies got a report. Rancher named Finney chased somebody off his place with a shotgun last night. Doorbell, Hattie. I'm going. Uh, did the deputy think the report might have anything to do with the Driscoll's murder? Who knows? The fellow Finney saw was doing something around a cattle tank, though. Yeah, good place to get rid of a weapon. Cattle tanks have been used before. Well, maybe we ought to go out and take a look. Yeah. Robert? It's Gene to see you. Hi, Bob. Hi. Hi, Mr. Halleck, Sheriff. Hello, Gene. Gee, I just drove in to see if Bob wanted to go out to the shack and camp, and I saw that crowd in front of next door. Somebody killed old man Driscoll, huh? Yeah, I can't go with you today. Well, yeah, I guess not. Are you helping the sheriff, Ranger? We're helping each other. Well, boy, I sure hope you catch that guy. Mr. Driscoll was the best teacher we ever had. Now, we'll try to square things for him, Gene. Coming, Jason? Yeah. Thanks for your help. We may want to talk to you again later. No, you're sure welcome, Ranger. Bye. Bye, man. So long, folks. Bye. Bye. So long, Ranger. Who was that kid, the one who just came in? You mean Gene? No, her name's Gene McCready. Hello, Roberts. They go to school together. Why? Just wondering. Robert Halleck ever give any of you any trouble around here? Yeah, we'll take my car. No, he's a good kid. Why? I well, just got a feeling he was covering up for something, that's all. Mm, like what? Well, if I knew that, I wouldn't be wondering about it. How far to Finney's place? Turn off to the right about six miles out, just this side of the Lewis place. The Lewis place? Well, Robert Halleck says that he was out at a movie last night with a girl named Sadie Lewis. Yeah, she lives out there. Mike Lewis' daughter. Only 15, but a big girl for her age. <laughs> Lewis watches her like a hawk. I'd like to stop by the Lewis place and talk to that girl. Okay, we can go out there after we check at Finney's. Well, right here's Park where he was when I spotted him. I called, but he started to run out through a load of buckshot after him. You didn't see who it was? No, I didn't. Too far off, about 300 feet back to all the house. What time was that, Finney? Oh, just before 11 o'clock last night. Wasn't that kind of late for you to be out here? Well, I've been visiting. I was cutting across the ranch walking home. From where? Mike Lewis's place. We get together Saturday nights and play cards. Oh, no, no, not for money. Just passing time. You always carry a shotgun when you're passing time? Well, as a matter of fact, I do. Bag a jackrabbit once in a while, going, coming, between here and Mike's place. So I always throw the gun just in case. I see. <laughs> I see better than you do, Jace. I've eaten out here. 
Mrs. Finney can do more things with a jackrabbit in a pot than most women can do with a chicken. <laughs> okay, I was just checking. Now, about the fellow you saw. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, like I said, when he didn't answer my call, I bluffed him with a shot. Don't think I hit him, though. No. Looked too far. I barely saw him as it was. Well, which way did he take off? Well, oh, that way. Highway's about a mile across country there. You chase him? Yep, sure did. But I reckon he was a lot younger than me. Well, what makes you say that? Well, after two minutes of running, I was a puffing like an engine to tunnel. He was pulling away with every jump. Is there anything around here he might have been trying to steal? No, not a thing. Unless he was trying to make off with a cow, and there'd be nothing to try on foot. Well, Sheriff, guess we better chuck our boots and hop in there. Uh, ain't in my cattle tank. That's right, Penny. But what for? If we're lucky... A weapon that was used in the killing of the high school teacher, Driscoll. The cattle tank was big. The bottom was covered deep with a couple of inches of oozing mud and slime. We slithered around in it for almost half an hour. Pretty thick along the bottom, Chase. Yeah, it sure is. I was going to have it cleaned out next month. Looks like we're going to have to save you the trouble and the expense. We we'll have to call a pumping crew, Sheriff. Yeah, it looks that way. Hey, give me a hand up, Penny. All right, now, here's it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Wait over here, Jason. We'll boost you out. Okay, Sheriff. Now, we're sure gonna feel silly if we have this pumped out and there's nothing here. We'll feel sillier if we don't have it done and there is something here that turns up later. I think we ought to... Hey, what's the matter, Jace? Feel something. Here, under my foot. Yeah, I felt it coming over this way, too. Some stones in the mud. No, this is metal. Wait, I'll get it. Ooh. What is it, Jace? Look for yourself, Sheriff. Just about what we're looking for. A hatchet. Listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, The Hatchet, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. It was a murder weapon, all right. The blood had been washed away from most of it, but there was skin tissue and hair that had stuck to the blood end. And well, I reckon that's it, all right, Jace. But uh, who threw it away on my place, and why? The killer wanted to get rid of it in a place he thought nobody would be liable to find it. Must have thought of this spot last night. That means he knew the place. He wouldn't cross the range on foot unless he did. You say he ran off that way? That's right. Like Sheriff said, the highway's about a mile. He could have left the car there he was getting back to, or he might have cut off in another direction when you lost him. You have horses here, don't you, Finney? Why, sure, sure, but... Nothing like the one you're towing in that trailer behind your car. <laughs> it's really a horse, Ranger. I think so, too. What I want is a mount for the sheriff here. Where do you figure on riding, Jace? Out on the range, see if we can pick up a trail. I'll unload charcoal and start ahead. You walk back to the ranch house and get one of Finney's horses and catch up to me. <laughs> all right. Not too heavy on this ground, though. They're easy to lose. Yeah, but this is a straight shot from the ridge. Looks like he was sure going for the road, all right. No doubt about it. If he left a car there, we might be able to find some tire marks where he parked. Afraid you're going to be stymied there, Jace. Why? County just worked the roads over. Shoulders are all fresh gravel. Oh? What's the shortest way to the Lewis Ranch? Go back for the car or keep riding? Yeah, we'd save a little time going back for the car. Not much. Well, charcoal's full of run. Let's give him a chance for a workout. Come on. Get up, get up. The Lewis Ranch was big and well kept. There was something dismal and brooding about it. When we got inside, I knew what it was. It was as though the place were reflecting the personality of the heavy browed man who owned it. So you want to see my daughter, huh? That's right. What about? Just want to ask her where she was last night? She was into the movie house with Robert Halleck. Yeah, we'd like a little more information than that, Mike. The ranger... I know everything my daughter does. I can tell you anything you want to know. That may be so, Mr. Lewis, but we still want to see her. 
That's an official request. I'll call it. Sadie, come into the house. Into the parlor. Sheriff and the ranger want to talk to you. They don't think you and Robert was at the show last night. Nobody said that. You don't have to say it. Look, if you can't keep out of this, you can take your mind-reading act into another room until we're finished. It'd be better if you didn't interfere, Mike. Go ahead, ask. Maybe I'll be interested in the answers, too. Sadie, don't be nervous. Just tell the truth. Were you with Robert Halleck last night? Yes. Where'd you go? We went... Where did you go? To the movie. Remember the name of the picture? The new one with, with Bing Crosby. You saw that with me a month ago when I took you to Sweetwater. I saw it again. There's no other show to see in town. Is there... Robert brought you the ticket stuff, didn't he, Pa? Brought you the ticket stuffs? That's right, Ranger. Brought me the stuffs. My daughter's supposed to be someplace. I want to make sure she's there. Not gambling on being fed any lies. No, I can see that. You're not gambling that your girl might tell you the truth, either. Give her the chance. Reckon the law's got nothing to say about that. I reckon not. Let me have that package, Sheriff. Here. What's in it? Just something I want you to look at. Catch it. Yeah. You ever see this before? No. How about you, Sadie? You ever see this before? No, sir, I never. Why are you asking us about it? Just routine. This is the weapon used to kill Driscoll, the high school teacher. Oh. All right, Sheriff. Wrap it up again. Let's go. Sorry to have bothered you, Mr. Lewis. Yeah. You ready, Sheriff? Yeah. Goodbye, Mike. Sadie. Bye. Sadie, you've been lying to me. Answer me! <laughs> Looks like Sadie's in for a rough time, Jace. She wasn't telling the truth. He knows it. Her story ties in with Robert Halleck's case. I know. Oh, oh. Pretty dark by the time we get back to Penny's place. Movie house open tonight? Sure, why? I want to talk to the manager. The theater was a small town show place. The manager couldn't remember seeing Robert Halleck and Sadie Lewis. He referred us to the ticket taker. The ticket taker turned out to be Robert Halleck's pal, Gene McCready. Come on, Gene, talk up. Was Robert here for the show last night or wasn't he? Uh, I don't know. He's your best friend, and you were on the door last night. If he came in, you saw him. Yeah, he was here. Did he stay for the whole show? No. No, he didn't stay for any of it. How do you know? Did you see him leave before it was over? Uh, he, uh, he didn't even go in. He just stopped by to get a couple of ticket stubs from me. So that's it. Why didn't you tell us that right off? Because I, I promised Bob that if anybody asked, I'd say him and Sadie was here. Well, why would anybody ask? Bob thought Sadie's father might. He's asked me before when they were supposed to be here. Well, I guess that's what we wanted, Jason. Yeah, it's part of it, not all of it. Gene, I want you to forget that I asked you anything. Understand? Yes, sir. Let's go, Sheriff. I guess we'd better pick up Robert Halleck and the Lewis girl, Jace. Not yet. All we know is they didn't see the show. That isn't enough. Don't see why not. This wasn't just a prank, you think. Driscoll didn't have no enemies, unless it was one of his pupils hated him. We can narrow it down to one student, though. Not until we've checked on all of them. I'm going to sleep on this tonight. When school opens tomorrow, I'm going out there. <laughs> Driscoll had been a popular teacher at Rock Point High, but he had an iron-bound code of ethics where honesty was concerned, and that was the key I needed. I found the answer in a batch of test papers he'd been grading. I took the papers back to the sheriff's office. Morning, Chase. Morning. Find anything out the school? Plenty. Look at these. Mm, what are they? English class test papers of Robert Halleck and Gene McCready. Mm, let's see. Alex marks pretty high, 94. Yeah. Hey, only half the answers on McCready's paper have been checked. His isn't graded. Compare them and you'll see why. His answer to every single question is exactly the same as Halleck's, all the way down the line. Driscoll must have noticed it while he was marking. Hmm. You think McCready was cribbing his answers from Bob Halleck's paper? Halleck was at the head of the class. McCready was just barely hanging on. 
Those papers were clipped together in the drawer of Driscoll's desk with this slip of paper. A few notes scribbled on it in Driscoll's handwriting. Yeah, read what it says. Mm. An obvious case of cheating. Flunk McCready. If Halleck knew of this, advised principal neither should be permitted to graduate. Well. The test was on Friday. Driscoll must have been grading those papers after school let out. Halleck came home, but Gene McCready was sitting out of punishment in another class for being late. That means Driscoll might have run into Gene Friday afternoon and asked him about it. That's what I figured. Of course, Gene could have told Bob later. Yeah, he could have. Yeah, Robert Halleck's the boy, all right, Jace. He lied about where he was Saturday night, and Gene was working at the theater. Maybe yes, maybe no. You get the autopsy report yet? Oh, yeah, yeah. Came in this morning. What time did Driscoll die? Uh, between uh, 9.30 and 10.30 Saturday night. Then we can't eliminate Gene McCready. Why not? He starts taking theater tickets at 6.30, but the box office closes at 9 when the main feature goes on again. He's got nothing to do after that. His work's finished. Well, I didn't think of that. You better give me the hatchet, Sheriff. I'll need it. Sure. You got it locked in the drawer here. What's your plan? You go out to the school, get Bob Halleck, and bring him to his father's store. I'll meet you there. Would you want Gene McCready, too? He's not in school. He's supposed to be home sick. We can pick him up later. I don't want him and Robert together. Ranger, you're crazy. Crazy, I tell you. Now, calm down, Mr. Halleck. You admit the hatchet comes from your place. No. A minute ago, you said it did. Well, it disappeared months ago. It was lost. It got lost again in a cattle pen. Where's your car? Out back. Through that door. All right, let's look it over. Your son was using this car Saturday night. Yes. Why? What are you looking for? Hatchet had to be carted away from Driscoll's, and there was blood on it. I'm looking for a stain. Well, you don't see any, do you? No. I see a spot on the front seat that's cleaner than the rest. Can you smell that? It's been rubbed with gasoline. Ranger, you're wrong. You've got to be wrong. My kid wouldn't do a thing like that. Either. Out here, Robert. Here we are, Chase. Oh, what's the matter? Why'd they take me out of school? Son. Son, whatever you've done, me and your mom stand by it. Now, tell them the truth. You were at this show Saturday. Tell them you were. How about it, Robert? Gene said you just dropped by to pick up ticket stubs. I, I wasn't at the show. Why didn't you tell me? Why? I couldn't. Because of Sadie's father. He'd kill her. You better tell us what happened, boy. Why? I picked up Sadie in the car at 6.30. We went into the movie house to leave the car with Gene and get the stubs. You left the car with Gene? Yes. So it'd be around the theater in case Sadie's pa came by. Well, then what happened? Then we arranged for Gene to meet us out at the crossroads between Lewis Place and Finney's at 11 o'clock. So I had the car to take Sadie home. See? See, Ranger? He didn't have the car all the time. Go ahead, Robert. Where did you and Sadie go? We went for a ride with somebody who picked us up behind the theater. What do you mean by somebody? Who? Sadie's mother. What? Why, Sadie Lewis's mother is dead. No, she isn't. That's what Mr. Lewis tells everybody. They were divorced before he moved here with Sadie. Could that be true, Sheriff? Well, Chase, I don't know. Mike Lewis always said his wife died. She didn't. He just hated her, that's all. And, well, if he finds out Sadie's been seeing her, he'll beat her up. All right, Robert. I think you're telling the truth. There's something I want you to identify. This. Why, that's our old kindling hatchet. Where'd you see it last? Well, the shack. Me and Gene built the shack up in the woods last fall. We go camping up there. I built most of it because Gene, he was working part-time after school at Penny's Ranch. That's right, Jace. Gene did work for Penny for a while. Come on, Sheriff. we better go pick him up. Gene McCready wasn't at his home, and he wasn't safe. He got the location of the shack he built with Robert Halleck, got horses, and rode into the woods to look for him. 
There's the shack, Jace. Just through that clump of trees. Yeah. Come on, sir. Hey, the door's open and it's Gene. Howdy, Gene. What are you doing up here? Let's come up to take you into town, Gene. A few things we want to ask you about. Like what? Like how you spent Saturday evening between the time you stopped taking tickets and the time you met Robert at the crossroad between the Lewis place and Finney's. Come on, Gene. I'll boost you up behind me. Well, can I... Can I get my jacket? It's inside. Go ahead. Hey, you don't look guilty, Jace. Not a bit rattled. I know. Well, we could be wrong, but you better give me your holster, Sheriff, if he's gonna ride behind you. Yeah, I guess you're... Look out, Jace! Oh! You hit, Sheriff? No, but I hit him. He had a rifle in there. Kept out shooting just as you leaned over. Oh, you hit me. Yeah. Let's see. There's a flesh wound through the side. I didn't want to hurt him. But Mr. Driscoll wasn't going to let me graduate, you old fool. All right, shut up. Hold still till I fix this wound. Will he be all right, Jace? Yeah. Sorry I had to do that, shooting a kid. Yeah, but... His being a kid doesn't make you bulletproof. And it didn't stop him from killing Driscoll. There. All right, Sheriff. Let's rig a litter and carry him in. Gene McCready was just old enough to stand formal trial for the murder of his high school instructor. On September 20th, 1941, he was taken to the state penitentiary at Huntsville to serve out a sentence of 25 years. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McCrae. There's a poem that was sent to me by Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, who's commander of Company B of the Texas Rangers. It's not only amusing, but seems to reflect the thoughts of many a police officer. I hope you'll enjoy hearing it. It's called Not Guilty. I guess I've seen a thousand men go in this jail and out, from tramps with month-old whiskers to rich men with a gout. Not one of them was guilty of the crimes the law accused. Seems they were all just victims of some officer's abuse. From the time the keys are rattled till they're locked up in the cell, their voices, though they differ from a whisper to a yell, the song is always just the same that everyone will sing. I don't see why they put me here. I haven't done a thing. It makes no difference what they've done or how mean the crime has been. When they're locked behind those prison bars, they're always free from sin. Though the evidence be solid and their voice with guilt may ring, they'll stand right up and tell you, I haven't done a thing. Good night, folks. See you again next week. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Parley Bear, Mike Barrett, Sam Edwards, Joe Duval, Tom Cook, and Gerald Moore. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music, fun, and prizes Monday through Friday on NBC to help your busy morning along. Tommy Bartlett brings you Welcome Travelers. Walter O'Keefe MCs Double or Nothing. Clever Quizmaster Bud Collier asks the questions on Break the Bank. Jack Burke presents Songs and Stories. And Dave Garraway with Melody and Humor. That's Monday through Friday on NBC. Now, here are the $64 question. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jake Pearson. Texas 
more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men will make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Yes, sir. 
break. I'll take care of you from now on. The next morning, Tom Billings, a ranch hand, rode out to the isolated shack on the Wilkins Ranch. He discovered the dead body of Blake Wilkins lying in front of the open doorway. Sheriff Hedges was immediately notified and requested help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Chase Pearson was assigned to the case. Morning, Chase. Howdy, Sheriff. Oh, oh, charcoal. Hey, any trouble getting out here? No. Pretty heavy going, though. Must have been some rain last night. Yes. Good thing you didn't try to come out in your car. You'd have been hub deep in mud halfway. Yeah, that's what I figured. I've already talked to the half-brother Chad back at the ranch house. He's pretty broken up. But I figured he'd want to look at the scene of the shooting before he had any questions. Yeah. Did you find anything, Sheriff? Yeah, a couple of things. They left the body right where it was, though. American Sandler's on his way out. Whose horse is that in the crowd? I figure it's the one Blake Wilkins rode out here last night. Followed the tracks out here. Just one set of them. Any footprints around? No, well, couldn't see any. A lot of gravel locks around. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at the body. Hmm. Lying in front of the open door. Bullet well, ended over the right eye. The rain must have washed some of the blood away. Mm. Bullet came out the back of the head, higher up. That means it was traveling in an upward angle. Yeah, that's right, Chase. Went clear through him and then carried through the shack. Come on inside, I'll show you. You got the bullet here in my pocket. We well, found it out back. Yeah. Here it is. What's the left of it? Mm. Smashed up. Afraid it won't help us any. You take a look at the roof, Chase. Back wall over there, shelf of divisions. Yeah. Look at the bullet hole, all right. Let's go back outside. I'd say Blake was just about your height, Sheriff. Looks like. I want you to stand here beside the body and hold your hand out of the level of your forehead. To my forehead? Yeah. That will represent the approximate height of the bullet when it hits Blake. Yeah, that's it. What are you backing up for, Chase? Side along your hand on the bullet hole in the roof. I get it. You're trying to figure out where that shot was fired from. Yeah. And it's leading me straight to this old watering trough. Okay, Sheriff. You can take your hand down. Do you think the killer was hiding behind the watering trough when he shot Blake? Behind it or in it. The bottom of the trough split. It doesn't hold any water. Don't see any footprints around. Whoever it was could have walked on this gravel and rocks over to that gully there. And there's water in the bottom of the gully. Well... However, he did it, he sure covered his tracks. Guess Blake must have heard a noise outside the shack, come outside and got shot. Yeah. But I'm wondering what Blake was doing out here at this shack in the first place. Search me. Didn't even know Blake had come home and got the report of the shooting this morning. About two years ago, he and Callie Briggs, when the next ranch over, ran off to get married. According to Judd, Blake returned home just last night. And made a beeline out to this shack in the rain? Uh, it does seem a little peculiar. Come on, let's ride back to the ranch house and see if Blake's half-brother can throw any light on the matter. No doubt about it, Chase. That horse at the shack is the one Blake rode out there last night. We backtracked the hoof marks all the way here to the ranch house. Yeah, just one set of prints, all right. Well, we thought it was heavy going for our horses this morning. Must have been a lot worse last night than we know Blocks of Blake sank down in the mud. Yeah, I noticed that. Is that the half brother on the back porch? Yeah, that's Jed Wilkins. Hey, hey, oh, boy. Oh, Judd. Yeah, this is Ranger Pearson, Judd. He's in charge of the investigation of your brother's murder. Huh? Well, got any line on the killer so far, Ranger? Not much yet. As I understand it, Judd, your brother's been away from home about two years. That's right. When do you get back? Walked in last night at supper time, about 6.30, I guess. Now, the Briggs can verify the time for you. He's having supper with him. Any reason the time of Blake's return home should need verifying, Judd? Hmm? No. no I, just, I just figured you went all the facts straight, Ring. Yeah. What happened when Blake walked in? Well, right after Blake walked in, Apple walked out. Oh? No. Why? When Blake told us he and Kelly had split up, it seemed Jalvin didn't know anything about it. Neither did I, as a matter of fact. But Calvin yeah, being Callie's paw took it pretty hard. He came over against Blake. Because he thought it was all Blake's fault. As a matter of fact, I had to pull him away from Blake's throat. Oh, see, of course, the way Blake explained it to me later, it wasn't his fault at all. But Calvin didn't wait for any explanation. How'd you feel about Blake coming home, Judd? 
After a brief talk with Ranger Wade out in the hall, I came back into the room. I'd like to know the meaning of this, Ranger. We'd like to know why you suddenly decided to take a trip, Mr. Briggs. I reckon that's my business. You're wrong about that. It's our business, too. The way it looks right now, you get mad at Blake Wilkins, he turns up dead, and you leave town. But I didn't even know about Blake being killed and that other ranger picked me up getting off the bus in Denver. I still want to know why you took off from your ranch this morning. All right. Last night, Blake told me he and my daughter Callie and split up in Dallas. Comes a bad shot. So this morning, I decided to head to Dallas to see where I could locate Callie and find out what happened. Get her to come back home with me, she would. I see. You left the Wilkins Ranch about 6.30 last night. Oh, that's right. Where'd you go? Home. You stay home the rest of the night? Yeah. Any way of proving that, Albert? Mm, guess not. I live alone. Ranger, I didn't kill Blake Wilkins. I'm sure I felt like it for a second or two when he told me about him and Kelly, but thinking about it later, I got over it. I guess when a couple splits up, but we never completely one person more. I didn't kill him. If you didn't, you want to cooperate then. Cooperate? I'm asking you to postpone your trip to Dallas. I want you to keep yourself real handy until this investigation is wound up. All right, Ranger. You'll find me at the ring. He was looking at Mata last night, Chase. No, he hasn't. There are a couple of things that make me doubt that he killed Blake. But what are they? If he did kill Blake, why'd he wait till this morning to take off from his ranch? Well, another thing. Alva walked out of the Wilkins Ranch house right after Blake arrived. How did he know Blake was going to be out at the shack? Well, Blake told Jeb he was going to ride over and talk to Alva. Maybe that's how Alva found him. We know Blake never got as far as Alva's place. Those horse tracks led right to the shack and stopped there. See, that's right. You think Jeb was lying to us, trying to make it look bad for Alva? I don't know. Then there's the matter of motive. You find out, like Alva did, that your daughter split up with a guy and you think it's his fault? You might knock a few teeth loose over it, but as for killing him on account of it, I don't know. Well, speaking of motive, how about Judd? That's just what I'm going to follow up next, Sheriff. See if I can find a motive for Judd Wilkins to kill his half-brother. <laughs> checked into the background of the Wilkins family and found out about several instances of friction between the brothers. But Judd had always been envious of Blake. That started me thinking about the father's death and his will. The executor of the estate was a lawyer named Sam Farris. Sheriff and I dropped in to see him in his office. Yes, Ranger, the will's in probate, but I'm very familiar with the terms and provisions of it. What are they? It was sort of a peculiar will. I told old man Wilkins at the time he made it that it might not stand up in court. Had him change it a little, but I'm still not sure it's valid. Of course, it doesn't matter much now, Blake being dead. Uh, incidentally, I suppose you questioned Judd about cheating? Yeah, I have, Mr. Ferris. Why do you ask? Because of the way the will read. Oh? Just how does it read? Have Blake returned home of his own accord any time during the probate period, the land, the buildings, and the stock were his. Chase, that's very interesting, Mr. Ferris. What provision was made for Judd? Now, he was to get 25% of the profits from the ranch, and if Blake didn't show up before the probate period was up, Judd would get the whole thing. I tried to talk old man Wilkins into set it up as a trust fund. Boiling it down then, Mr. Ferris, if Blake came back of his own accord, the place was his, and Judd, in effect, would be working for him. Well, that's about the size of it. Well, Chase, that should do it, all right. We know Judd was always envious of Blake, so now up pops Blake to take the ranch away from him. Yeah, that's our motive, all right. Mr. Ferris, uh, you got a copy of that will? Yes, but I'm afraid I couldn't turn over my copy to you, Ranger. Okay, you look over the original at the courthouse, Sheriff. I want to study that will. <laughs> Sheriff's office, the autopsy report was lying on his desk. What's it say, Jason? We're all set to arrest Judd Wilkins, weren't we? Still are all set, far as I'm concerned. Why? It's like there's not going to be an arrest. What are you talking about? We just found out Judd Wilkins had plenty of motive for killing Blake. Sheriff, all the motive in the world doesn't do us any good when the facts are against us. You still can't be in two places at once. I don't follow you, Jason. Look. Tom Billings told us he was with Judd at the ranch house the night of the shooting, from about 9 until quarter of 11. That's right. Wait a minute. You mean that autopsy report? Blake Wilkins was killed at a shack six miles from the ranch house. 
And according to this report, the time of death was somewhere between 9 and 9.30. Well, Jase, there goes our case against Judd, then. Well, <laughs> Jase, hang if I see what good this is doing us. We've gone over this shack just like we did before. You have me hold my hand up again, you sighted along it with a bullet hole in the wall, and we're still a little bit along than we were. I know it, Sheriff. Sure. The only thing I can figure is that we don't have all the facts in the cage here. Maybe somebody else we don't know about shot Blake. I think we've already got all the important facts, Sheriff. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. What is it? Take a look at this sugar bowl, Sheriff. It was right under the bullet hole. I don't see anything the matter with it. Look at the sugar inside it. Nothing the matter with that either. Yeah. Well, that's the point, Sheriff. Huh? You ever see sugar that's had a little water dropped on it? Why, sure. It gets sort of crusted. And stays that way. Yeah, but I... Remember what Tom Billings told us? That the rain stopped about quarter to 11? Blake was shot between 9 and 9.30. That's right. Over an hour before it stopped, but... Jace. Yeah. A bullet hole over the sugar bowl would have let a few drops of rain on the sugar. But the sugar's dry. And there aren't any water stains on the shelf, either. That means that bullet hole in the roof wasn't made until after it stopped raining. We headed for the ranch house. Judd was nowhere in sight, which suited me fine at the moment. We eased inside the house. I didn't find what I was looking for in the front room, so we went up into the bedroom. What do you figure on finding up here, Chase? I think I've already found it, Sheriff. Calendar on the wall. Looks like it's hanging mighty high. Yeah. Let's take a look behind it. A bullet hole in the wall? Yeah. I got my knife here. I'll, I'll dig around with it. Yeah, it's in here, all right. Yeah. Here you are, Sheriff. Slug. You see? That's where Judd got the idea. He was probably standing on the stairs and shot and killed Blake right here in this room. Then he noticed the bullet went clear through into this wall. That's why he fired a bullet through the rear of the shack to make it look like Blake had been killed out there. You mean all the time Tom Billings was downstairs with Judd that night, Blake's body was lying right up here in the bedroom? That's just what I mean. Judd must have shot Blake around 9 o'clock, then called Billings over to the house right afterward as a cover. Then after Billings left at a quarter to 11... Judd cleaned up the room and took the body out to the shack on horseback. I heard the door close. Nobody down there in the living room. Come on, Sheriff. Reckon Judd could have come in without us hearing him? Maybe. Take a look in the kitchen. The kitchen's empty, too. Let's look out the back door. There he is, Chase. Running for the car shed. Come on. Judd! Oh, it's not where they are. Hey, he ducks around the corner of the car shed. back there. He might be flying for a horse. We'll see as soon as we get around this corner. Hey, oh, Take cover, Sheriff. The shot came from the bunkhouse. Probably ducked in there to get a gun. Judd, this won't do you any good. Come on out of there. Yeah. He's gone plumb crazy trying to shoot it out with both of us. Judd, I'll give you just one minute to come out of that bunkhouse with your hands in the air. Watch me to come here and get there, Ranger. I don't have to, Judd. I'm gonna send for you. I circled around the ranch house in my car in front, got something out of it, and crawled back to the sheriff. A tear gas bomb. Yeah. This is your last chance, Judd. Here's my answer, Ranger. Okay. Here's mine. Come on, Sheriff. Let these up closer. You'll be coming out of that door any minute now. I'll take this side of the door, Sheriff. You take the other. I can't see. I can't see. I'll take that gun. Got you. Nice. Yeah, they're clear up. You're under arrest, Judd. You have a pretty neat scheme figured out, Judd. You got tripped up by a little bowl of sugar. Sugar? Yeah. I'll bet you'll hate that word sugar for the rest of your life. You know, Sheriff, I got a strong hunch that isn't going to be very long.
Judd Wilkins was tried and convicted of the murder of his brother, Blake. On the morning of June 16, 1945, in the state penitentiary at Huntsville, he was executed in the electric chair. By six, we're right on schedule. You want me to take the wheel? No. Oh, where do we gas up at Frito Junction? It's only another 50 miles. Okay. Yeah, I sure would be glad to get home and see my wife. <laughs> you called a long distance when we stopped for supper. Yeah, but I'm not an old timer like you. This is our first baby we're expecting. You already got four. Ah, don't let me kid you. Sir. You feel the same way about all of them, no matter how many you have. What are you hoping for? Oh, just a healthy kid, I guess. That's all. Although, I, I'd kind of like a little girl. You get one, you have a real picnic. Girls are born smarter than we are. My youngest one, she can work me over for anything she wants faster than a quarter horse to get food. <laughs> you don't look like you're feeling any pain from it, though. <laughs> I, I, it's a big kick to get the things they want. Yeah, but don't get me wrong, I'm just as fond of the three boys, too. Yeah. But, well, a girl does get under your skin a little more there. Ah, they're more affectionate, like. Boy grows up, you want to kiss him. <laughs> he kicks up his heels. They get to be eight, nine years old, the closest you get to him is shaking hands, you know what I mean? Sure, sure, do. <laughs> I guess we were the same with our folks. I wouldn't trade them for anything, though, boys or girls. And in your own blood, you... Well, you find out, since You got a lot of fun and living ahead of you. They'll worry you when they get sick, and they'll break your heart when they get kid troubles that you can't help them with, but nothing you'll ever have will mean as much to you as your young'uns. <laughs> I've been worrying about mine already, and she... He? <laughs> well, whatever it is, it ain't even here yet. I keep wondering if I'll be able to make it. You know, bring them up, educate them, help them to be somebody. Yeah, that's something else you'll worry about with each new one. Man, I'm so scared now, I think I'll just settle for one kid and leave it at that. <laughs> that's what I said 12 years ago with our prison. You'll change your mind. Yeah, I guess so. Mary said that she yeah, wanted... Hey, hey. Huh? What's that ahead? Where? Oh, somebody waving a red lantern. They must be coming to that narrow bridge over Lannan's Creek. I suppose it's been washed out again by a flash flood? Yeah, that could be, although it don't look like there's been any rain here since we started the haul east four days ago. Just the same. They got it blocked. Yeah. Look, Grover, they put up a detour sign. No, it probably wants us to go to the left end of the old road. No, sign points to the right. The fellow with the lantern is waving us that way. Well, 
Oh, I guess he knows what he's doing. Don't look like much of a road this way, does it? Oh, it's going to be mighty rough going. I hope this don't last too long. Hey, this ain't even a road. Oh, it's just a little dead-end turnoff. That guy must have been crazy sending us in here. Back in this rig out is sure going to be a job. Ah, what a dumb trick. I'm going to walk back and ask him what in the name of blazes made him turn us off this way. I'll come with you. You'd think they'd have a highway patrol car station there to take... Wait a minute. What's the matter? By the road. Yeah, well, the lamp is moving that detour sign. Get back in the truck, quick. What is it, Grover? What's wrong? It's like a hijack. Get it rolling back. It's... Don't mind what you hit. Just keep... Grover! Grover! Hey, don't shoot anymore! Don't shoot! He's hurt! You can take it off! Sims were discovered, and the sheriff notified. He called for help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Here are the bodies, Jace. Must have been dragged into the brush when the truck was stolen. Lucky thing Mr. Archer here found them. Mighty lucky. Could have been here for days. How'd you happen to come across them, Mr. Archer? Well, it wasn't me. One of my kids found them. We uh, pulled off the highway, fixing to make camp for the night. Boy, I was gathering wood for the fire. They're out of help because I'm legging out of here like a scared jack rabbit. You make a habit of camping out at night with your family? Mm -hmm. Ain't nothing much a man can do about it when he ain't working. Them motels and places cost money. Where do you come from? The park in the way we head for California. Migratory workers, huh? Mm -hmm. You can talk to his family later if you want, Jace. I let Archer pull his car into a turn up the highway about 200 yards the other side of the bridge. I didn't want to keep the kids around here. He sure ain't got nothing else to ask me. I'd like to get back to my wife. I'm shaky. All right, go ahead. But when you get to the car, stay put. I ain't got no place special to go. Thank you. You got a flashlight, Jace? Mine's about to peter out. Yeah. There, give your batteries a rest. You say they were due in El Paso at 6 this morning, huh? Eh? Yep, was on schedule, too, until they got here, I reckon. Made their supper stop on time last night. The company checked back. When did you get the request to look for the truck? Got the description and license number early this afternoon when they was overdue and nobody had heard from it. The company figured if they'd had a breakdown, they'd have called in. According to their schedule, they should have reached this spot a little after midnight last night. And whoever took that truck had plenty of time to get a long ways from here with it before sunup. Not much chance of anybody spotting them. That's right. You better take a look around. I've been all over the ground between here and the highway, but I guess it won't hurt to look again. Condition my light was in, I might have missed something. I can show you where they were when they dropped blood stains on the ground. Uh, yeah, I saw them. Right where the truck was. The stains aren't far from the tire marks. There are plenty of tires, Jace. Different pattern right smack down the center of them. Well, no, those inside tracks were made by Archer's car when he drove in. Covered part of the truck marks. The way this place is rutted, he'd fall right into the same track. <laughs> I didn't think of that. Uh, here's something. What is it? Cartridge shell. Look at it. 45 caliber army automatic. Oh, and here's another one. Well, we won't have to wait for an autopsy to tell us what the murder weapon was. Hey, I just thought of something. What? That 45 army automatic. There's an army camp about 40 miles further on. J just 10 miles this side of Frito Junction. I'm afraid that won't help us, Sheriff number marking on these shells is a 17. That's the old 1917 ammunition series, World War I. No camp would be using ammo that old. Mm, too bad. I thought for a minute we might have a fast lead. You arranged to have the bodies moved? Yep, sent the deputy to town for an undertaker. Good. Let's walk out to Archer's car, talk to his wife and kids. There's one thing I don't understand, please. Why did they pull their truck off the road? A trucker riding alone might do it to grab some sleep, but not a scheduled rig with two drivers. I can't figure that either. Park your cars up this way, the other side of the bridge. Might as well leave your car right where it is. Not much to walk. Sure. Hold it, Sheriff. What is it? This mark just off the road shoulder here. Hmm. Sort of a circle in the dirt. Yeah. Whatever made the circle was wet and kind of oily. What do you suppose made it? 
What would make an oily round impression that size? Oh, I don't know. Unless maybe it was a lantern. That's what it was, all right. And here's something else. Four small rectangular marks in the earth. Base of each mark about two by four. Well, I can't figure that. Unless somebody had a table out here. I don't think it was a table. Another thing that would make four marks face like that's a wooden sawhorse. Did this bridge ever wash out? Sometimes, when there's a flash flood. Hey, I see what you're aiming at. When there is a flood, highway patrol sets up a detour sign. Sends traffic through that road over across the highway. When that happened last? Oh, not in a couple of months. Now, these marks aren't that old. Somebody detoured that truck into the dead-end road on this side. Lantern and sawhorse were set in here until they were moved onto the road to set up a block. They must have had that particular truck pegged then. Came through at a time when there isn't much traffic between the last town to the east and Pico Junction. Come on, let's talk to Archer. You got a list of the cargo the truck was carrying? Told my deputy to wire a request for it after we found the truck had been stolen. It'll come through to my office. Good. Because we'll have to track this down through cargo. I got a hunch that the truck has been emptied and ditched by now. Archer didn't know any more than he'd already told us, and his wife and three pale, undernourished kids couldn't add anything. We waited until the bodies were picked up and then headed back for town. The next morning, there was a wire from the trucking company waiting at the sheriff's office, a list of the missing truck's cargo. Here's a report on the cargo, Jace, valued at $39,000. You see, a shipment of automobile radios, huh? Well, that's a break. Why? Because they all have serial numbers. It'd be a lot of work if they try and change the numbers, and if they don't, one of the sets will turn up sooner or later. Yeah, but they didn't send the numbers through to us, Jace. Just a set make and model. I'm radioing my headquarters to get them. Come on. Austin can contact the manufacturer and have him send a complete list of the serials through. Then they can distribute the list to all law enforcement agencies on a statewide bulletin. We don't stand much chance of cracking this if we have to wait for a hot car radio to turn up. Don't worry. We're not going to wait. We've got plenty of other things to do. How many deputies you got handy? Three. How about send them back along the highway? We know where Grover and Sims made their supper stop. I'd like to find out if they made any stops after that, before they were killed. Good idea. As a matter of fact, whoever stole the truck may have turned it around and headed back that way. Killers may have been spotted. It's a chance. On the other hand, maybe I ought to send one man toward Pito Junction in El Paso, just in case the truck kept heading west. Never mind. I'll handle that part of it myself. I'm heading for Pito Junction as soon as I can make that radio call. <laughs> put through a request for the serial numbers, then headed for Frito Junction. On the way, I got a radio call from KTXA. The missing truck had always made a regular stop at the mobile gas station in Frito Junction. When I got to the station, I sent for the man who'd been on duty the night the truck was hijacked. Yep, I was on duty night before last, Ranger, but Grover and Sims didn't stop here. I know they didn't. They never got this far. What I want to know is, did you see their truck? The station's right at the crossroads. If the truck came through with somebody else driving it, there's a chance you might have seen it. Ranger, I'd like to help you, but, well, there ain't much business during the night, even though the boss does keep the place open as an accommodation of truckers. I usually stretch out on a cot in the office. If a truck stops, I get up. If it don't, I just hear it go past. Any other stations around here open at night? Nope. The truck Grover and Sims were driving always stopped here, didn't it? Yep. The company they drove for has a credit account here. They haul between El Paso and Houston. Well, the tanks are always just about dry when they hit here on the return haul from Houston. I see. You mean the truck would be too low on gas to go much further than this without filling up, providing it came this way. That's right. Thanks. It's a big help. You're welcome, Ranger. Wish I could help more. Grover and Sims were pretty nice guys. That's the trouble with a killing. The wrong people usually get killed. And it sounds like you've got an impatient customer out there. Yep, one of the soldiers from Camp Boulder. Boys are busy on the pumps. I might as well help him. Hey, he's got the drive blocked. I'll ask him to back up so you can get your car and trailer out. It's all right. He doesn't seem to want gas. May want directions or someplace. Hey, you got a shop here? Yeah, but you have to pull around the back. You're blocking the ranger's car. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Just want to make sure you can help me. Doesn't seem to be much wrong with that motor. There isn't anything wrong with it. Top shape. Then what do you want to put it in the shop for? Got a new radio. Thought you might be able to install it for me. You are.
are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, The Trap, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. A soldier with a new car radio. It didn't have to mean anything, but it might. The make and model of the set he had matched what I was looking for. I got the serial number from the cart that came in and phoned it through to the sheriff for a fast check against the manufacturer's list. Then I went into the shop to ask a few questions. You'll have to drill holes for the antenna, I guess. Unless you want to wear it in your hat, I will. <laughs> it's like a good set. Yeah. Pretty expensive. Well, it told me it sells for about 85 bucks. What'd you pay for it? Well, I, uh, I didn't buy it. I made a deal for it, sir. What kind of a deal? What do you ask me that for, Ranger? Something wrong? I didn't say that. I was just wondering what kind of a deal a fella could get on a car radio. The man you got this from have any others he wanted to get rid of? Well, I, I, I don't think so. He just gave me this one for trade. On what? Something I had that he needed. Uh, look, my pass is only good for a couple hours. I didn't think it would be this long. Maybe I better let it go, and I'll, I'll come back in next time on the town. Okay. I think you better stay around. But my pass. Maybe I... I can get you a little extension of time. What's the camp number? I'll call your commanding officer. Well, what do you want to do that for? Yeah, what's the matter, Ranger? What is it? It's that radio. Grover and Sims were hauling a truckload of auto radios when they were hijacked and killed. What? You telling me that radio is stolen? No, I'm not. Not yet. But I'm waiting for a check on the serial number, and you're not leaving here until I get it. Oh, look, you got to believe me. That guy gave me that set. Yeah. You've been pretty evasive about telling me why he gave it to I you. I told you it was a trade. Or what? Come on, talk up. Well, I... I can't tell you that. Get me in trouble. If this is one of the sets taken from two murdered truck drivers, you'll be in plenty of trouble unless I know where and how you got it. Sounds like you better tell him, soldier. I got the set in exchange for some gasoline. Gasoline, huh? Go ahead. Well, it was night before last. Just after 2 o'clock, I, I just started guard duty at camp. My post was along the fence by the motor pool from 2 to 4. Hey, Ranger, that's not long after the time you said Grover was... Never mind, Milligan. Go ahead. Well, I, I heard this car stop near the fence. You sure it wasn't a truck? No, no, it was a car. So I, I walked over to the fence where it was parked. I, I sort of gave the challenge, you know, asked who it was. And a uh, man walked up. He said he needed some gas. And you gave it to him, just like that. No, no, no. He, he said he'd pay me for it. I told him it was against regulations. And then he, he said it wasn't for him. He said a couple of women were standing down the highway in their car. And then he, he said he'd give me a car radio. Oh, well, it seemed like a good deal, so I opened a pump and filled some cheap cans for him. How many gallons? And you didn't think there was anything wrong with a trade like that? An $85 radio for 25 gallons of gas. Well, the guy was stuck in that. How could he be stuck? It was only 10 miles from the station, and it's open all night. Well, maybe he didn't know that. He knew it all right. He didn't want to bring a stolen truck into this station, and he didn't want to get that much gas in cans from a place that might be checked. Look, Ranger, please, uh, I'm up for discharge in a couple of months. Our camp is being jacked of it. I don't want to get any bad. You should have thought of that before you started to ladle out government gasoline. What kind of sidearms do you carry at the camp when you do a guard trick? Uh, regulation, I'm 45. Any 1917 series ammo? None that I ever saw. Are you going to give me a break? I'm not a judge. I can't give breaks. You're the only key I've got for two dead men. I'll call your post and have the MPs pick you up. The gasoline's the Army's business, but this radio is mine if it's stolen property. How could I know it was stolen? Can you describe the man you got it from? No, it was too dark. Besides... Besides, there were two men. One of them stayed in the car. It would help your case a lot if you could tell us what they looked like, even what kind of a car they were driving. Well, it was dark, I tell you. They talked to each other? Call each other by name? Well, yeah, yeah. The, the fellow I gave the gas to, he called the other one in the car, and he said, drive up closer, will you, Sonny Boy? Sonny Boy? Well, that's not a name. Probably just a wisecracker nickname. I'm just telling you what I heard. I'm trying to do everything I can to help you. Yeah. Rangers to you. Sheriff. Thanks. Hello, Sheriff. Howdy, Jase. That soldier's radio is on the stolen list, all right. But I got something when my deputies dug up. Grover and Sims did make another stop after they had their supper. At 11.30 the night they were killed. Where? Roadside diner. Just stopped for coffee. At least Sims had coffee there. He told the proprietor that Grover was asleep in the cab of the truck. You talked to the proprietor? 
side of yourself. Sure did. Drove off seam as soon as the deputy gave me the report. It's Watson's diner. A lot of truckers eat there or stop to coffee up when they're riding late. Watson know if they had a hitchhiker with them? Any rider they might have picked up? He says no, but he didn't go out to the truck, of course. From what he says, Sims was the only one in the place except for some traveling salesman who was playing the pinball machine. Fellow named Sonny Boy Jensen. Sonny Boy? That's right, Jace. What you getting excited about? Talk to Watson again. Find out what he knows about Sonny Boy Jensen, who he is and where he comes from. Then meet me back at your office. I'll get there as fast as I can roll. <laughs> The army camp was on my way, so I took the soldier with me and turned him over to the camp authorities to be held. I kept a lead foot on the gas pedal as I drove past the bridge in the side road where the truckers had been hijacked and slain. It took me almost two hours to reach the county seat. The sheriff was standing in front of his office as I drove up. Inform KTX, have any chance of location? We'll keep in touch. Howdy, Jase. Howdy. What'd you get? Something that might fit. That Jensen's been traveling up and down this highway for years, selling electrical appliances to farmers and ranchers, mostly. A man like that would have good market for car radios once that shipment cooled off. He could be our boy, all right. You get any line on where he comes from? Works out of El Paso, mostly. But his home's a small ranch about 150 miles southwest of Preto. Sonny Boy Jensen can't be his real name. No, it's Bertram Jensen. They just call him Sonny Boy. Watson said he left the diner about five minutes after Sims and Grover pulled out. Probably passed him on the highway. Had him all staked out and set up that roadblock. You better climb in. Going to El Paso? No. Turn south out of Frito and head for Jensen's Ranch. I don't think he'd take that hot merchandise into El Paso. Even if he got there before daylight, he'd run into some traffic, and that's the trucking company's home base. He'd be taking a chance on loading any place in the city. Mm, I see what you mean. You better check on him while we're rolling. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA. Go ahead, Unit 10. This unit en route to Jensen Ranch near County Line, 150 miles southwest of Frito Junction. 10 4. Request check on subject Bertram Jensen, alias Sonny Boy Jensen, El Paso appliance dealer and owner of ranch this unit is headed toward. 10 4. Unit 10, clear. I've been thinking, Jace. This couldn't have been a one man job. Jensen couldn't drive the truck and his car after the hijack. It wasn't a one man job. The soldier who gave him the gas they needed for the truck said there were two men in the car. Two men with a bad murder rap hanging over them are liable to fight, Jake. They sure are, Sheriff. Better take the safety off your gun right now. There might be time later. KDXA to Unit 10. Unit 10, go ahead, KDXA. Unit 10, clear. KDXA, Austin. That may answer a couple of our questions, Sheriff. Yep. Where Jensen got that Army 45 and the 1917 ammo series, and who his partner was. If you think he might have kept in touch with Dolph Moody for almost 20 years. There's an old saying, Sheriff, about birds of a feather. <laughs> after dark when we reached the Jensen Ranch. When the door opened, I knew it was Jensen. There were little wrinkles under his eyes, and his temples were gray, and his face held a youthful softness as some faces do with a 16 or 60. It wasn't hard to understand why they called him Sonny Boy. Well, it's been a long time since I've seen a ranger around here. You, uh, looking for somebody? The sheriff and I heard you might be able to get us a bargain on a few things. Why, uh, sure. What are you interested in? Automobile radios. Uh, I got a few in my warehouse, and how fast, though? Thought you might have something around here. No, I'm, I'm afraid not. And maybe you know somebody who has. Yeah. No, I, I I don't know many people. I live alone here. Don't see much of anybody. Had any company this evening? 
No. Two ashtrays in this room don't agree with you. There's smoldering butts in both of them. So unless you smoke two cigarettes at a time and walk back and forth across the room to put them out, you haven't been alone. Oh, all right. A neighbor's business with you. Is that a crime? No. Where is he? In the kitchen. Call him. Don't go for him. Just call him from here. Uh, Doc? Hey, Doc! What's this Doc doing, Oh, I didn't hear anybody come in. Jensen tells us you've been visiting him. Where are you from? From Borderville. Well, that's about 50 miles from here. Yeah, Jensen said you were a neighbor. Well, that's right, ain't it? Distance don't mean much in Texas. <laughs> I, I just dropped in on Jensen unexpected. Matter of fact, I, I was just walking up fixing the start for home. Yeah, he he's just leaving. Oh, well, go right ahead. Uh, I'll get your coat as soon as possible. Oh, uh, before you open that, I'd like to ask your friend a couple of questions. Fifty miles is kind of a long walk, isn't it? Only way to leave this ranch would be in a car. If you've got one parked outside, we didn't notice it. Uh, I was going to lend him mine. Oh, I see. He said you dropped in unexpectedly. How'd you get here without a car? Why, uh, it's to ride. Somebody dropped me off the gate. Uh-huh. Yeah, if you got nothing else to ask me, I, I'd like to be going. Yeah, imagine you would, but I'm not quite finished. Maybe you know where I could get a bargain in an automobile radio. Why, well, I don't know nothing about the radio. It's too bad. I thought you might. All right, Jensen. Give him his coat. By the way, either you heard from Dolph Muni lately? Or... Get out of here. You got no right asking questions. You got no warrant. You let us in, Jensen. My story is you broke in, and you ain't going to be able to deny it. Get him on that closet shelf, Gates. Uh, don't try that, Jensen. Oh. Quick, Sheriff. Take that gun out of his reach. Got it, Jake. Oh, Go through the window. Stay with Jensen. I'll get him. Come on, Jensen. Get him. I can see you, Muni. You better stop running before I fire. No sense trying to get in that car. It's locked. That was in the air, Muni. The next won't be. How about it? All right. All right. Don't shoot. Just walk this way with your hands high. Uh, I had to steal a radio, but I didn't do the killing. I didn't. I was on the highway with the detour sign when Jensen shot him. Don't tell me, Muni. We'll save that for the court. Where are the radios? In the barn. Hidden Bale's party. Get the truck in Amber Lake. All right, Muni. Let's go in and get Sonny Boy to make your statement at the sheriff's office. Bertram, Sonny Boy Jensen, and Dolph Muni were found guilty of the hijacked murder of truck drivers Warren Grover and Luther Sims. Both were sentenced to death in the electric chair at Huntsville Penitentiary. Each of the convicted men made an appeal for clemency. And in January of 1949, the sentence of Dolph Muni was commuted to life imprisonment. But the petition of Sonny Boy Jensen was denied. And on the morning of February 19, 1949, he was executed. <laughs> Here again is the star of our show, Joe McRae. Folks, we want to thank you for the wonderful letters you've been sending to us and the warm and friendly interest you've always shown toward our show. A lot of you have asked the question, what's the title of the theme music heard on Tales of the Texas Rangers? The music you hear at the opening and closing of our show is the Texas Ranger song, written by Sam Coslow and Harry Bain and is arranged by Robert Armbruster, the conductor of the NBC Orchestra. We're glad to know that so many of you like it. We do, too. So, Mr. Armbruster, the Texas Ranger song, if you please. is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. 
Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Whitfield Connor, Herb Ellis, Harley Bear, Wilms Herbert, Paul Dalboff, and Bill Conrad. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcutt, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Hal Gibney speaking. Times mean good times on NBC. Next Sunday, one week from today, Tales of the Texas Rangers will relinquish its broadcast time to enable you to hear one of the season's most dramatic events. The Theater Guild on the Air, full hour and a half production of Hamlet. And make a note to be back with us for another exciting Tales of the Texas Rangers two weeks from tonight. Next week, it's Hamlet. In two weeks, another Tales of the Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae. Be sure to listen. Now the $64 question. Tomorrow here, the Boston Pops on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. a.m. March 6, 1940. Pete Salverson, owner of a roadside cafe in West Texas, is opening for business. As he sweeps up in the kitchen, he hears a sound outside the back door. Somebody out back there! Is you, Charlie? Uh, 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 well, uh, what's the uh, matter, uh, boy? Where'd you come from? Come on, feller. Come on. I ain't gonna hurt you. Had <laughs> a boy. Looks like you got here too early to root for anything out of that garbage can, though. That morality of yours looks like you could use some grub fast. Hey, 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 now, 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 none of that face licking. You just come on inside and I'll fix you up. Come on. Come on. Let's see. How about this? That is bone and a couple of hunks of stew meat, huh? All right, fella. There you are. Dig into that. <laughs> Boy, you sure are beat up and hungry. What's this contraption you got strapped on you? Uh, Pete, you open yet? Oh, oh, howdy, Sheriff. How's the coffee situation? Well, ain't brewed yet, but I can fix some up in a minute. Had an early customer here. <laughs> yeah, but he hasn't got any money. I'm a cash customer. <laughs> well, where'd you get him? Oh, he's rooting in the garbage cans out back. What you doing up around so early? I uh, just came back from Huntsville. Delivered a prisoner up there yesterday. Yeah? This would be a pretty good-looking dog if he was taken care of. Who owns him? I don't know. Never seen him before. Never did see a leash like the one he's wearing, either. Kind of funny contraption. Look at it. Hey, let's see that. What's the matter, Sheriff? Well, this ain't a leash. It's a harness. Huh? You see, your dog's a C&I dog. One of them dogs is trained to leave blind people? It sure is. He must have run off from his master, then. Well, these dogs don't run off deep. I had a missing person's bulletin on a blind man three days ago. This might be his dog. Well, the guy that's missing must be around here then, huh? If he is, something must have happened to him. This dog never would have left him. Hey, you got change for a dollar in the register? Oh, sure. I'm going to hit that phone get a ranger down here to help. Wherever that dog's master is, i got a hunch we'd better find him quick. <laughs> Less than one hour after the sheriff's appeal for help, Texas Ranger Jace Pearson joined him at Pete Salveson's roadside cafe. Uh, 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 there 
it is, Ranger. No mistake in that harness if you ever seen one before. You just see an eye dog, all right. You say you found him outside this morning, Salverson? Yeah, half starved, like you can see. It's been a good three or four days since he's eaten from the looks of him. Easy, boy. Come here. Nobody's going to hurt you. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, fella. It's really sore, isn't it? He's had a bad time, Sheriff. Got a pretty hard clip on the head. Must have been knocked out. Since then, he's traveled through some rough country. Lady Chiquilla's got him all sliced up. The footpaths are sore from walking. Yeah, but ever since Pete fed him, he's been yelling to get out of here. Reckon he'd be able to lead us back to the last year? He's right if he can make it. He'll have a better chance if a veterinarian works him over first. Where's the nearest one? Uh, the foreman at the Wolf Green Ranch is there. Want to come out there? Yeah. Meanwhile, you better get yourself a horse. I'll leave my horse trailer here until I get back. You can load your mount in with my horse charcoal. It's a double trailer. What makes you think we'll need horses? country this dog came through isn't the kind we'll be able to get through in a car. He came too far for us to follow on foot. Lost dogs sometimes hit for home, Jase. This person's bulletin came from Arizona in Crockett County. This dog may be headed for there. The way we'll find out's to follow him. If he heads any other way, it'll be back toward the man he's been trained to take care of. I'm figuring that'll be in a southerly direction from here. Well, how do you know that? All barren country that way, full of leche guia. If he came such a long way from any other direction, he'd have run into a town or a ranch and been found before this. I reckon I'll buy that. That makes sense. Get your horse. I'll meet you back here, and we'll drive as far south as we can cross country and then turn this dog loose and follow him. I got the dog patched up at the Wolverine Ranch, picked up the sheriff and his horse, and headed south into the Badlands. We switched from car to our horses and turned the dog loose. He circled around for a moment, got his bearings, and then, despite the soreness of his body, he started into a limping run. He's heading south, all right, Jace. Must be going to his master. Beats me why he went all the way to Peach Place, though. Had to go someplace for help. Not the only thought he gave to himself was just stopping long enough to be fed before he headed back here. How far do you reckon we'll have to go? Well, we came 14 miles by car before the dirt road petered out. He came a lot farther than that. Might have taken him a couple of days. Well, we'll have to stop him at night. See if he keeps going that long. And we'll tie him off. We better make sure we can catch him before dark so he don't get away from us altogether. Uh, chances are he'll wait for us. After all, we're the help he came after. If he doesn't, we'll be able to follow him anyhow. In the dark? Yeah. I treated his collar with some phosphorus paint. Hey, what did you make you think of that? Uh, trick my father taught me a long time ago. He had an old hound dog, great hunter. Got a throat injury and couldn't sound off. Blowing collar made up for it. Well, like they say, we live and learn. Hey, look. Look where the dog's cutting, up in the foothills. Yeah. That's Ambush Canyon that way, isn't it? Sure is. See, no wonder that dog's beat up. I wouldn't tackle this country in an army tank where I didn't have to. I wonder if that blind fellow will be alive when we find him. I don't think so, Sheriff. If he was alive... I don't think the dog would ever have left them. Come on, sir. What kept that dog going, I'll never know. We hit stretches where we had to lead the horses on foot. It was towards sundown of the second day when the dog caved in. He made a feeble attempt to inch along on his stomach, and then just rolled over on his side, panting. He's done for days. Can't even take water. I better... No, Sheriff. Put your gun away. But, Jace, he couldn't move another inch if he wanted to. I'll carry him with me on charge. Man would be mighty lucky if he could find a human being that would go this far for him. He'd never have led us this far back if you hadn't had the vet work on him. Now what do we do now? Keep on going, I guess. If his master is in here, he must have left some trail. He'll keep cutting through till we find Mars. Jason, how would a blind man get into this country, and why? I don't know. But if he wasn't here, the dog wouldn't have been here either. We'd better move on till we find a good spot to make camp. These horses need some attention on the night of rest, too. In the meantime, maybe I can do a little doctrine on the dog. Don't do any good, Jace. All you need is a pack shed. Just stop breathing. He's dead. <laughs> Next morning, we started trail cut, working steadily to the south toward the international border of the Rio Grande. Yeah, the country's getting a mite better now, Chase, but we're only about a half a mile from the river. If anybody else had been in here recently, we'd have seen some sign of a trail. 
Nobody could come through here without leaving some kind of tracks. That dog didn't head this way for nothing, Sheriff. He must have... Hey, hold it a second. Huh? What is it? Look at this. Dog hair caught in this thorn brush. Must have been a few days ago when the dog hit it out. Look at the color. German Shepherd, all right. We're still in the right trail then. But why no human tracks? And the dog came out of here on foot. But this may not be the way he and his master got in here originally. What other way is there? On the river, in a raft, or a flat bottom boat? Well, how could a blind man navigate the river? He didn't have to be alone, Sheriff. That dog was beaten on the head, remember? It isn't likely his master did that, is it? Oh, I see what you mean, but how now, Wait a minute. Look up ahead there, along the side of the ridge, about a quarter of a mile. Yeah, looks like part of the rock near the bit scooped out. Must have been a little landslide. Not on a rock facing as solid as that looks. What do you suppose it is, then? Let's find out. It took us more than an hour to reach the base of the ridge and find the answer. It wasn't a landslide. There were a couple of dynamite gaps on the ground. The fresh earth had been blown out. Uh, two men, all right, Jase. Signs that tracks held tight in this place here. Dog tracks go right along with the one set. That was the blind man. Yeah, not a mark running in with those tracks, though. A little round hole in the ground every few steps. The blind man must have had a cane, too. Move around the wide circle and cut back to this spot. Oh, wait, Jase. What's that thing over there by the brush? Long white piece of something. White cane. Come on. Ahead of its stain, Jase. Looks like blood. It is. Dog must have been clubbed with that. The blood stains didn't come from the dog, Sheriff. The lump he had on his head didn't bleed. Let's beat through this brush. Blood trail on the ground through here, Jason. Yeah. That path just ahead seems to be pressed down in one spot. Let's make for it. The man's body, all right. Face down. Better roll him over and see if it's a blind man. It's him, all right. Held by his right hand. Callous ridge there from holding on to that dog harness. I took the white cane and the dynamite caps and rode along the shore of the river to the nearest town. Called Austin to fly a lab man down and arranged for a boat to pick up the sheriff and the body. I was in the local constable's office 24 hours later when the body was brought into town. Well, the body's over the undertaker's case. Good. The constable told me you were in here looking over reports from your lab man. Yeah. No lead on the dynamite caps, but we learned plenty from the cane. The two sets of prints, one unidentified. It must have been a blind one. What about the other set? And left the other set had a criminal record. His name was James Waterman. Got out of Huntsville six years ago. Waterman? Yeah, I remember that name. You ought to remember it. Pulled ten years for armed robbery. $40,000 payroll stick-up back in 24. Money never was recovered. I wonder why he killed that blind man. Why was he blasting in the face of that rock ridge? Something we'll ask him when we get him. Oh, was the lab man at the funeral home when you brought the body in? Yeah, he's going over it now. Want to get some grub while you're waiting for him to finish? Yeah. We take prints off the body to compare the ones he lifted from the cane. We'll have identification established by the time we get through. Good. Let's go. I'll be glad to eat something I haven't had to cook myself. You know, funny thing. We started off so fast after that dog turned up the other day, I never did check that missing person's bulletin for the blind man's name. The name was Joseph Wilson. He lived in a rooming house in Ozona, operated a newsstand. The landlady reported him missing when she didn't see him or the dog for two days. Now, there's a cafe across the street. Uh... <laughs> took our time. A statewide pickup was out for James Waterman, and it seemed just a matter of pinning him down. When we got finished and walked over to the funeral home, the case wasn't so simple. Our lab man, Marty Ferris, was just finishing a phone conversation. Well, I said there's no doubt about it. Yeah, check on it. Pearson just walked in. I'll tell him. Goodbye. Yeah. Howdy, Jay. Howdy, Marty. Marty Ferris, Sheriff Fisher. Well, we met uh, when the sheriff came in with the body. In case we got trouble, this thing is blown wide open. Why? What's the matter? That's the print. We'll take a look at it. Now here's a copy of the unidentified set I sent on to Austin. The man who made them has no record. Well, why should he have a record? Aren't they the blind man's prints? No, they aren't, Chase. The prints on the body match the known prints pulled from the cane. The dead man is James Waterman. What? That's it, Sheriff. Here, look at the prints. See for yourself. Marty, could you have made a mistake? No, Chase. I just checked with Austin on the phone by classification number. Waterman must have been blinded sometime after he left Huntsville. He took the name of Wilson and nailed it. Now all we've got 
got a set of unidentified prints that might match anybody in the state. Sheriff, our killer isn't going to be easy to find. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jade Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Blind Justice, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Whoever the blind man's companion had been, there had to be a starting point for their journey along the river, a place where they picked up a boat or a raft. The sheriff and I worked our way along the river above the town, questioning the occasional Mexicans who managed somehow to make a living where no living was to be made. And in one spot, less than a mile from the road, we found something. You can see it clearly now, Jase. Yeah. Impression of a flat-bottom boat on that mud flat. Had to be dragged quite a ways to the water. Not many days ago, either. Oh, oh, boy. Mud around where the boat was is caked dry. Spot where the boat was setting still looks damp. Uh-huh. boat must have been there without being used for quite some time. The river's been way down for more than a year. A little smoke coming up from behind those trees. Must be a Mexican hut. Whoever's there might own the boat. Let's ask him. Get up, Charlie. Oh, Come boy. Mmm, tacos cooked. Smell them? Yeah. Smell something else, too. Chicken frying. There's a place. I can see it now. Pretty high class for river hut. Looking back, chicken coop. Kind of new, too. Coop wire, I mean. Hasn't been up very long. Yeah, a woman out in front of the place. She sees it. Buenos dias, senor. Oh, buenos dias, senor. Oh, oh, Charlie. Oh, boy. If you can help us out, senora, we'd like some information about a boat that was out on that mud flat until a few days ago. I never see a boat there, senor. You never saw one there? What made that impression on the mud then? I, I call my husband to speak better English. Sanchez? Yes. I know something about that boat, all right, Jay. Yeah. My husband. Hey, do you want something, senor? Yeah, one, senor. The mark left by a boat down in that mud flat. When was the boat there last? And what happened to it? Hey, it was maybe a week ago the boat disappeared in the night. One morning she's gone, that's all I know. Who took it? I don't know. Just like that, huh? Hey, hey. Good. The boat? No. Try to feed us a story like that, you. Uh, just a second, Sheriff. Sure. Where do you work, Danielle? What do you do for a living? Well, I do anything for whoever give me the work. But for a long time, nobody give me any. You must have saved a lot of money to eat fried chicken and tacos. Where'd you get those chickens? I uh, raised them for you. Mm, without hens and a rooster? There isn't anything in that coop old enough to sit a nest. That coop wire is new. Well, what I mean to say, I, I was just starting to raise them. Where'd you get the money to buy that coop wire and the chicks? better talk up. This is part of a murder investigation. Sure. Blind man was murdered downriver. He got there by boat. Oh, you're like, I, I got nothing to do with murder. I just sell the boat. Why didn't you say so before? Well, please, because the boat was not mine. You sold it just the same. Say, say, look, I, I tell you the truth. The boat is there for two years. Ever since we come, I, I never know who owns it. And then one day, the the men go. Two men? Yes, si, yes. Si. One of them blind? Yes, si, yes. Si. He got a dog and a white stick. The, the other man with him, he said to me, I give you $50 for the boat. But well, uh, I don't say that the boat is mine. I, I just let him give me $50. What the man look like? The one who could see? Oh, he's big, just like you, with the light hair. He's very wavy. Eyes uh, blue. He said that when they come back, I can have the boat back for nada, eh, nothing. And he gave me more money if I don't tell nobody. I say, yeah, you give me more now, but he said he don't have no more until he come back. That's the whole truth, senor, just like Daniel tell you. All right. If it isn't the truth, we'll find out. Come on, Sheriff, let's go. All right. Uh, you two stay right around here in case we want to see you again. Oh, oh, we'll we, we be here. We don't have oh, oh, boy. Hey. Uh, heading back to the town? Yeah. Marty may have some more information. And I think we just got a lead from Danielle on why Waterman and the other man went downriver. Well, if you did, you got something I missed. I promised Danielle more money when they came back. 
The money Waterman got in that stick-up 16 years ago never was recovered, remember? Oh, oh, I get it. That's why they dynamited into that rock ridge. Waterman must have hidden that money until it cooled off. That's right. But before he ever got back to it, he was caught and sent to Huntsville for 10 years. Why didn't he go for it as soon as he got out six years ago? That's one of the things we still don't know. Maybe Marty will have the answers when we get back to town. Marty had the answers, all right. Reports from Austin that had come in while we were on the river. I made notes on everything, Chase, if you can read my writing. Thanks. A check back shows that Waterman lost his sight three days after he left Huntsville six years ago. It's hard to run down because he didn't have to report to anybody. He served his full term, no parole. I see. Happened in a highway accident. Yeah, it caught a lift on a gasoline truck. Went over an embankment and caught fire. The driver was killed. Waterman blinded. Yes, Sonora. Waterman was headed this way from the camp. He was going straight for that money, Sheriff. Losing his sight stopped him. But why did it take him six years to move for it again? He had to find somebody to help him. A man with a load of stolen money hidden away doesn't trust many people. He finally trusted somebody got killed for it. I'm going to take a ride to Ozona. It's out of your county, Sheriff, but it's your case. You want to come along? You bet I want to come along. Let's go. In Ozona, we went to the rooming house where Waterman had lived under the name of Joseph Wilson. The landlady showed us to his room. It hadn't been rented to anybody else, and his things were still there. He left it, just like it was when the police come after I called them. I haven't touched a thing. No money, nothing valuable was left here. Only what you see. It's all right, ma'am. Don't be upset. Nobody accused you of taking anything. Well, I just wanted you to know there wasn't nothing to take. You never had nothing. Always a couple of weeks behind in his rent. Not that I minded. I had nothing but sympathy for the poor man. Even fed his dog for him. It never would have been fed. Look, something you just said is important to me. Now, if he owes you money, there's nobody to pay it, so you're you're just going to lose it. The truth can't hurt you one way or the other. Did he really owe you rent money? Well, yes. Why else would I say it? Every once in a while, he'd catch up. He'd have some kind of benefit check from someplace once in a while. What's your angle there, Jay? I'm just figuring, Sheriff. Daniel got $50 for that boat he sold. There must have been more expenses getting from here down there. Somebody had to finance it. Traveling company, whoever it was. Yeah. It's a cinch it was somebody Waterman met and got to know right here in Ozona. Ma'am, did Mr. Waterman, uh, Mr. Wilson, have any visitors here? Any friends? I saw so, so. Some fellow called him a few times, though, so, and he was home sick and couldn't work the newsstand. You know who it was? No, he never gave me his name. Mr. Wilson just said it was somebody he knew from the stand. The same fellow each time? Mm-hmm. Right, I can tell from the voice. I see. Thanks. Come on, Sheriff. Is that all you want here? Yeah, thanks. We located the place where Waterman had had his newsstand, a main intersection near a bank, a restaurant, an office building, and a medical and professional building. Somebody else was running the stand now, staked out in my car across the street. Looking for somebody to the description Danielle gave us? That's right. The man who called whenever Waterman was sick might have been a regular customer. It could be quite a few customers with that description. Gave. Mm-hmm. We'll tag the ones who come close. See if the newsie or anybody around has any information on them. Somebody might have noticed the man we're looking for hanging around the stand from time to time. If he knew Waterman well enough to call his room and house, he knew him well enough to stop for a talk. Mm-hmm. Right, of course. But he just kind of waiting away from the house. It's the dullest part of the job, Sheriff. But sometimes it's the part that pays off. For two days we watched the corner. Occasionally we followed a man and fitted the description supplied by Danielle. But each time we checked, the subject turned out to be somebody who hadn't been out of town. Then, just before the end of our second day of watching, I nudged the sheriff. What is it, Jim? Over there. No, past the newsstand. Just going into the medical and professional building. Oh, yeah. He looks like he might be the boy, all right. His hair is really light and curly, which most of the others haven't been. Let's see where he went. Oh, oh, wait a minute. He's still in the lobby. There by the elevator. Let's wait until he's picked up. There's the elevator now. There it 
goes, he's the only passenger. Come on. Watch the floor marker. See where the elevator stops. Third floor, Jace. Take a look at the building directory on the wall. Third floor, two doctors, a dentist, an attorney, and a corroborist. Go up to that floor. Try them all. You want me to grab him? No. If you spot him in a waiting room, just sit down like you're waiting to. After he leaves, find out anything you can about him. I'll wait back in the car and tag him after he comes out. How do we get together again? After I find out where he lives, I'll come back and pick you up on the corner. I waited for the man with the light curly hair. He came out of the building in 20 minutes. I started my car away from the curb slowly, came him in sight. He turned the corner and got into a car of his own, drove from an apartment building. I noted the address and then went back and met the sheriff. I hope you didn't lose him, Chase. I think he's the one we want. Why? What'd you get? He was in to see a doctor. Had a dressing on his arm, Jim. Doc said he's a regular patient who's been away on vacation. Oh, been out of town, huh? Yeah, but that isn't all. It's what he's being treated for that ought to make you sit up. Dog bite. Dog bite. I thought that Shepard might have gotten to the killer just once before he was knocked out. Let's go visit him. I know the apartment building he lives in. You get his name from the doc? J.B. Rowland works on the local newspaper. Reporter? No, has charge of distribution and circulation. Also takes care of the morgue. Back issue file. Well, that'd put him in touch with Waterman on the circulation end. And taking care of the back issues might fit, too. I might have told him who Waterman really was. Hey, that's right. Fishing through some old back issues, he might have read about the robbery and Waterman's conviction. Maybe seen the picture of Waterman and recognized it. That'd make him get friendly. No, the money was never recovered, and if Waterman didn't have it on hand, or he wouldn't be running a newsstand and living like he did. Do you think he told Waterman what he knew and finally talked him into a deal? Or do you think maybe fortune? When we see him, we'll ask him. There's the door, Jay's apartment 2B. Do I knock? Yeah. Well, who is it? Special delivery. You've got a sign for it. Oh. Okay. Hope you got a pencil. All right, Roland. Open it all the way. I'll open it. I'll open it. Stay away from that pencil. You're not pencil. Give me that gun. <laughs> money. Yeah, where's the money? What'd you do with it? What did I do with it? I worked on him for months to be trusted. Then we went out of the river, but we couldn't find the place. Couldn't remember all the landmarks. Couldn't see him after 16 years. He couldn't remember. He couldn't remember. I went crazy. I planned on it so much, I went crazy. That's so all. If I had the money, I, I could have gotten away. Without the money, I had to come back here so they wouldn't be looking for me. All right, well, <laughs> go get some clothes. Huh? <laughs> Looks like that 40000 is really gone for keeps, Jay. Yeah. Buried in a rock ridge somewhere near the Rio Grande. That's money that never bought anybody in. I feel sorry for that dog, Jay. breaking his heart and dying like he did. Funny thing about a dog, a dog never passes judgment. It just sticks right to the finish, whether you're good or bad, worth it or not. I'll help her and get a jacket on, and we can take it in. For the murder of James Waterman, alias Joseph Wilson, J.B. Rowland was convicted and sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for a period of 99 years. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. 
Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Peggy Weber, Herb Tigran, Ed Bigley, Earl Keane, Tom Holland, and Tom McKee. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow night, NBC will present Parallel 38, the dramatization of the work of the Red Cross during the current crisis, with Raymond Massey in the starring role. Brigadier General David Sarnoff will explain the needs of the Red Cross during the 1951 fund campaign. So listen tomorrow to Parallel 38, and let your heart guide your hand when you give to the Red Cross. The Telephone Hour welcomes Juicy Beerling tomorrow on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, death by adoption. It is 9.45 p.m. on a Saturday night, September 1937. The business district of Central City, Texas is dark except for the office of Harry Cashman's used car lot. Cashman is pacing the small office in agitation. A man in a leather windbreaker crosses the lot, slipping between the cars for sale and knocks at the door. Well, how do you, Mr. Cashman? Glad to see you waiting for me. All right, spit it out. What do you want this time? I'm kind of short on folding money. Thought you might be a pal and get me out again. You know what this is, don't you, Stryker? The Lord called it a shakedown. I gave you $100 two weeks ago and another 100 the month before. So I need more. Well, you're not getting more, not for me. Why, it's too bad. I'm sorry you feel that way, Mr. Cashman. I kind of thought you were a nice guy. The kind of guy I'd like to see raise my baby. As long as I can't raise myself. Oh, you leave the baby out. Now, you can't expect me to forget about her, Mr. Cashman. After all, she's my own flesh and blood. She belongs to me and my wife, legally, by adoption. Yeah, but you keep forgetting one important thing. I never signed no papers letting you adopt. Your wife said you were dead. She thought I was dead. But my being here proves I ain't. And if we ever have to take this into court, Mr. Cashman, I'm baby Ann's natural father. I got my rights in it. All right, how much? Breaking a hundred will see me through again. I'll give you five hundred. Well, that's better. Now, just a minute. I'll give you five hundred if you sign a paper waving all rights to baby Ann. I ain't signing nothing. I like our arrangement just the way it is. It's working out fine. If you think... Well, go ahead, Mr. Cashman. Answer. It may be business, and I'd like to see you do a good business. For the baby's sake, you understand? Hello. Harry, why aren't you home? It's almost 10 o'clock. Oh, I'll be home in a little while, Hazel. Uh, something came up. You sound worried. Is anything wrong? No, 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 no. Of course not. The baby wanted to wait up for you. I let her stay up till 8.30, but by then she just kept rubbing her eyes and her nose and saying, where's my daddy? Till she couldn't hold her little head up. Oh, I'm sorry, Hazel. I'd give her a kiss for me. I I'll be home in a little while. Harry, are you sure there's nothing? Sounds like you're upset about something. Oh, it's it. I'm just tired. I'll see you in half an hour. Well, all right, dear. Goodbye. Goodbye. That 
met your wife? Yeah. Never did meet her. Maybe we ought to all get together, have a little talk. Striker, if you try that, it's the last talk you ever had. What are you trying to do? Your baby's got a home, a good home, and we love her. We've been married 15 years, never had a child of our own. And now we've got her, and she's ours. Now, if we ever lost her, we'd have nothing to live for. Haven't you got a heart? Uh, I can see I made a big mistake, Mr. Cashman. I should have started seeing you a lot sooner and a lot often. Oh, what do you mean by that? That from now on, I'll be around every Saturday night to pick up my hundred dollars. And I'll take tonight's payment right now. Boy, don't be a fool, Mr. Cashman. I'm younger and a lot stronger than you. Now, don't get yourself hurt. Now, how about my money? All right, sir. There's your hundred. That's the last go get now get out of my sight and don't ever come back, because if you do, I'll go to the police. I'll spend every dollar I've got fighting you. I'll prove what you are. I'll prove you're not fit to have custody of that. Mr. Cashman, I do believe you mean that. I swear before heaven I mean it. So this is your pardon gift to me, huh? Not much considering the size of the role you peeled it off, huh? All right. All right, I'll leave you alone. I'll take my payment in full right now. Dig that roll out again. Toss it on the desk. I see. Now it's a gun, huh? You see it, and I know how to use it. How could Ann have a father like you? She couldn't have, not you. You've never proved you are her father. Yeah. You're getting real bright tonight, Mr. Cashman. I get the money up on the desk. I'm not going to give you another dime, Stryker. All I'm going to give you is what you deserve. Get away from that phone. I'm going to call the police. You ain't calling any rocks. Maybe I'm stronger than you think. Uh, but you ain't for sure good. Oh. Yeah. Give me that money. Maybe you should have been fighting your wife. You see, you're still only one who knows about me, and you ain't never going to tell anyone else. Thanks for the final payment. At 11 o'clock, after three more calls to her husband's used car lot, Hazel Cashman was disturbed by the busy signal and her husband's failure to come home. Phone company check showed the line was not in use. Hazel Cashman called the police. They found Harry Cashman's body and requested aid from the Texas Ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. He arrived at the lot shortly after 2 a.m. Pearson. That's right. You in charge here? Yeah. yeah. Dan Simmons, chief of police. Uh, fellas, I'll talk to you later. I see so you've already lifted some fingerprints. Huh? How'd you know? Oh, dust and powder on the glass top here. And, yeah, two just left. Uh, things aren't going to be much good, though, I'm afraid. Too many people coming in and out of a place like this, signing papers on their desk. What's that over there, Chief? Oh, that yellow spot on the top of the Yeah. I noticed that before. This be a piece of chalk he stepped on. Two little pieces not quite ground in. I don't see a blackboard or anything around here. Any of the for sale signs on the cars marked with chalk? No, no, they're all marked with cardboard cutouts. The floor is pretty clean otherwise. Waste paper baskets empty. This place was swept out after the day's business. That chalk got ground into the rug last night after the place was clean. Yeah, I can see that now. The phone hanging off the hook like that when you got here? Mm-hmm. Cashman struggled with whoever killed him. Must have been trying to make a call. Oh, I don't know, Jace. The body's just where we found it. A good eight feet from the phone. He might have staggered over there and fell, but the fight started right here by the desk and the phone. Uh, got some reason for being secure then? The desk was moved a little in the fight, Chief. Look at the carpet. It's worn spot where the desk usually rested. Carpet's bunched up around the base, showing the desk was pushed, not lifted, and moved for any reason. Mm, you're right. I can't see that it helps us any, though. Give us this little picture of the action, that's all. I'm going to get some of this yellow chalk in an envelope. Uh, are you going to send that to your lab at Austin? That's right. They can analyze it. Maybe come up with something. It's worth a shot. Doesn't seem to be much of anything else to help us, though. Robbery motive for murder is usually the toughest one to crack. You can't really make a habit of carrying a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. Just for People selling cars in a hurry need a fast dollar. We usually had a couple of thousand on them. All we found in his pocket was 86 cents of change. Yeah? I'd like to...
like you to put a man to work on that filing cabinet. He's got a record of all sales. We've already checked that. Every car Cashman has accounted for. Nothing's been stolen from the lot. No, I wasn't thinking of a stolen car. I just want a list of recent customers. Oh. Somebody might have bought an automobile he wasn't happy with and come back to get even. Yeah, could be, but I'm afraid that's a blind alley too, Ranger. Cashman gave a mighty good guarantee on everything he sold and he stood behind it. A hundred percent. Just the same, let's check it. I want to examine every reason he might have been killed. A hundred percent. I sent the ground yellow chalk through to Austin. There was nothing that could be done that night, but the next morning, Chief Simmons and I went to see Hazel Cashman, the dead man's wife. <laughs> we don't like to ask a question at a time like this, Mrs. Cashman. But... I, I understand, and I want to help you if I can. Probably isn't much you can tell us, but any little thing. Does your husband ever have trouble with anybody? No. Aside from the money he carried, do you know of any reason why anybody might have been out to get him? No, there was never anybody who didn't get him. What am I going to tell him the basis? How am I ever going to make her understand that daddy will ever come home again? <laughs> Would you answer that for me, please? I don't want to talk to anybody more. Why, sure, ma'am. Maybe for us, anyhow. I had to leave this number at headquarters. Hello? Yeah, I see Go ahead, I'll write it down. Wait. We were going on a picnic today. Last night, I made the sandwiches and everything. We were going to leave right after church. I knew something was wrong when he didn't come home. I knew it. Take it easy, man. All week long, Harry was teaching Anne how to say picnic. No. You've got to get a grip, man. Hey, your baby's sick. Yeah. Yeah, All right. Better get back to headquarters, Jace. Uh, unless you have something else to have, Mr. Cashman. No. You shouldn't be alone, though, man. Especially when your baby wakes up. I told the neighbor just before the kid. She'll be here with That's good. Goodbye, ma'am, and thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Cashman. Goodbye. Find out who killed my husband. He never hurt anybody. Never. We'll do our best. It's the rush back to headquarters, Simmons. One of my boys pulled in a suspect, Jason. Oh? Fellow who worked for Cashman. A clean man named Moe Smith. What do they got on him? Well, he cleaned the office last night at about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. Cashman usually closed before then on Saturday nights, but Smith admits Cashman was still there when we cleaned up. Well, he's not trying to hide anything there. No, no, but there's something else. Moe Smith was on the town last night. Threw a big party and threw a lot of money around. Still had a few hundred on him when he was picked up. And uh, my man checked on that, Jace. Smith is usually dirt poor. I see. He's going to be worth talking to. You can say that again. I'd have told you inside the house, but I didn't want to say anything in front of Mr. Cashman. That was best. How old is her, baby? Mm, just two years old, Jace. Why? You look kind of funny. How old are the Cashmans? Well, I'd say Harry was about 55. Yes, Mrs. Cashman must be in her 40s. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, the baby's an adopted child. I thought they were a little bit old to have a child of that age. Yeah, they never had any of their own. A couple years ago, they took in a poor girl who'd lost her husband. Anne was her child. Cashman took the kid right off. Then the mother got sick, and when she knew she was dying, she agreed to let the Cashmans adopt the baby. No kid ever got a better break, believe me. I gathered they were pretty crazy about it. Plenty crazy. Why, if that kid even sneezed, Harry Cashman would be ready to charter a plane and fly at a Mayo Clinic. They wrapped their lives around her, just like she was her own. When you feel that way about a kid, it is your own. Loving them is what makes them belong to you. You need to say that again. Hey, any messages from my headquarters in that phone call you took? Oh, Jace, I forgot. I was too hot about my man picking up Moe Smith. Your lab phoned in a report on that chalk. Can you leave? Well, I don't know under the circumstances, but it wasn't an ordinary piece of chalk. Analysis showed that it's a special type of surveyors used for marking. Surveyors? Huh? Yeah. Isn't likely that a janitor would be carrying the kind of chalk used by surveyors. Oh, it might have come from any place, Jace. The customer might have dropped it. It was dropped and stepped on after the office had been cleaned. Maybe our case against Moe Smith isn't going to be as strong as it looks. Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jake Pearson. 
We continue now with tonight's case, Death by Adoption, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. At the city jail, Moe Smith was being held in an ante room. The day was cool, the beads of sweat stood out on his forehead. If he was innocent, he didn't look at him. He began to forget about the surveyor's chart. Come on, Moe. Where were you last night? I was at a party, Mr. Simmons, at my own house. And where were you before the party? I was working for Mr. Harry Cashman at the used car lot. Everybody knows I work there. What time did the party start, Moe? After 10 o'clock, sir. And later we left my house and went a few other places. Were you paying all the bills? Well, well is that right or isn't it? That's right, sir. I don't remember much about it. Next thing I knew, it was this morning, and the policeman woke me up and brought me down here. What time was it when you left the car lot last night? Oh, I worked almost 9 o'clock, sir. Cleaning up like I always do. Was Mr. Cashman all right when you left the lot? Oh, sir, he wasn't. Mr. Harry was always mighty nice to me. Somebody called him on the telephone. He didn't say much to whoever it was. Then he slammed the phone down real mad, and he hollered for me to hurry up and finish. He'd never done that before, sir. Then when I got done and was ready to leave, he told me sorry he yelled at me like that. What'd you do then? I, I, I did some shopping for the party. Got some food. A couple of goods and sweet things. Where'd you get the money? Still it, Mose. Cashman was robbed and you had almost $300 on you this morning when you were picked up. It was my own money, sir, honest. You never got that kind of money working on a used car lot. Three days ago, you were broke. You borrowed $2 from your landlady. You better count for that money, Mose. Where'd you get it? Mm, well, from the numbers. Numbers? You mean you've been gambling on the numbers racket? Yes, sir. And yesterday my number hit. 424. I got my $500. That, that's how come I got money. You expect us to swallow that? Who paid you off, Mose? I don't know, sir. I don't know who you were. Are you trying to tell us you gambled on numbers without knowing who you gave your bets to? <laughs> if I tell you who it is, Mr. Simmons is going to wrestle me. And everybody will know I told. And if I don't find out, you're going to stand trial for murder. Everybody will know that, too. Oh, no, sir. Please. I never heard Mr. Harris. Oh, I got some money from Jonas. One of the pen boys was told to Alan. Jonas been putting numbers on the side? No, sir. He just worked for somebody. Well, the check. All right, Mose. We'll check on your story. And it better be true. I've told the truth everywhere. Mm, he's found it on the level, Jace. And if he is, I'll be able to smash a hole in the numbers racket. Yeah, you can do that, all right. But we'll still be shy of murderer. Simmons staked out the bowling alley where Jonas worked as a pin setter. Moe Smith had told the truth, all right. The pin boy confirmed it when he was arrested for possession of slips made out by betters playing the numbers. We were back to a single clue again, the yellow chalk. We've checked the only surveying crew in the city, Jace. Every man working on it had an alibi. All surveyors aren't in the city. The killer could have come from any place in the county. No road building projects underway, and only other survey and crew we've been able to trace is the mapping crew down in the Big Bend. Not going to be easy to get to. I'll get to them. Wherever this car won't take me, the horse and the trailer I'm towing will. Well, huh? you leave them right away. As soon as I can drop you at your headquarters. <laughs> the mapping crew. I unloaded charcoal from the trailer. The crew was deep in wild country. Almost a full day's ride before I reached them. All right, Charlie. Easy, boy. Easy. Anybody here? No. Over this way. Come on, Charlie. Well, howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Saw marks of a camp here, but it looked deserted. It is. We moved in another couple miles. I just come back with the birds to haul the last of my stuff on the new camp. I'll just kind of pack on this last one. Are you the crew foreman? Yeah. I'll ride on away with you. Keep you from getting lonesome. Glad to have you. I got company, though. One of my men just went on ahead a few minutes ago. We'll catch up to him on the way. Hey, you want me to take one of those lead ropes? No, they're good birds. They won't give me no trouble. All right, let's go. Up, Chuck. Oh, boy. Come on, you long-eared scavengers. You've had enough grazing. You must be covering a lot of ground in here. Ah, oh, plenty. In a sprawling country like this, ranchers lose sight of their boundaries when the land ain't fenced off. Hey, you, uh, after somebody? 
anybody in here, Ranger? Maybe. How long you fellas been working through here? Oh, been almost two months now. You never pull out to go into town? Well, we got horses, of course, but it's a long ride to a road and transportation in the place and the size. <laughs> I just decided to grow me some whiskers and stay here till the job's done. Any of your men ride out? Oh, yeah. You of them go out weekends to Central City or someplace like that for Saturday night. Then they gotta turn around and spend all day Sunday coming back. Family men usually stay and just keep on working, pile up over. <laughs> How many men you got working? Oh, I got 11. Any of them away last weekend? Yeah, uh, four of them. You know where they went? No. Hey, I reckon Bill Stryker can tell you, though. Who's he? The fellow with the other bird. Ah, oh, there he is, just topping that rise about a quarter of a mile ahead. He one of the ones who left camp? Yeah, they all went off together. Let's catch up to him. Okay, come on, boy. Get up, bud. Yeah, sorry. We rode after the man named Bill Stryker. On the way, I saw the surveyor's marks I'd been following for miles. Bog markers nailed to trees. Yellow chalk marks on rocks. Within a few minutes, we caught up to him. Well, yeah, all right. You I was away for the weekend, like Tracy told you. Me and three other fellows. Where'd you go? Central City. Only place worth going we could get to in town. What'd you do up there? Uh, just fool around. All of us together. You were only there for Saturday night. You must have done something special, something you remember. I thought one of the boys mentioned the dance, Strocker. Well, well, yeah. Yeah, that's right. The uh, square dance. Alamo Ball. You spend the whole evening there? Yeah. Like I said, we were all together. All evening. Four stags of the dance drift around. Hard to keep an eye on each other all evening. E yeah. I reckon we could lose sight of each other for a minute or two. You fellas take time out to do any shopping? Well, what could we buy that we could bring back here? I thought maybe one of you might be saving some money, maybe enough to make a deal on a used car. Uh, we, we rode the bus both ways. Half our horses got us from the Atlantic Junction. It's too bad. If you've been shopping around a used car lot, you might have been able to help me. You might have gotten a look at a man who killed a dealer named Cashman in Central City on Saturday night. Killed? Hey, Ranger. You got a reason for being here. Hey, you think one of my crew killed that man? I'll know better when we see the other three who went to town with Stryker here. Let's get on to the camp. It didn't help. They all told the same story. There were gaps times during the evening when they drifted away from each other, but they couldn't pin it down at a specific time on the clock. I didn't have anything to take them in on singly or together. They knew it, and I knew it camped with them overnight and headed back to Central City Police Headquarters. Oh, Casey, let's make out. No good, Chief. Well, we haven't turned up anything new either. Just a chance armed robbery, Chase. That's what it must have been. I'm feeling still bucket that, Simmons. Moe's told us that Cashman was upset about a phone call. Stayed at the lot long after he should have gone home. Must have been a reason. Like what? Like somebody who wanted to see him, telling him to wait there. Yeah. Moe said the call made Cashman mad. Why'd they wait for somebody he was mad at? Maybe because they had some kind of a club they could use to make him wait, whether he liked it or not. They're still digging for something deeper than an armed robbery motive then. That's right. Mm -hmm. Nobody's given us anything to back up any other motive. I know, but a man doesn't make a telephone appointment to be robbed and murdered. He makes it for something else. I'm going out to see Mrs. Cashman again. <laughs> called your husband last Saturday night. It was almost 10, you said. What makes you think he was upset? When you married the man for 15 years, you just know him, that's all. But he said there was nothing wrong. Anything like that ever happened before? He's not coming home, I mean, acting upset? Yes, it did. Twice before. Once was almost two months ago, then a couple of weeks ago. Those other times. Do you remember what day they happened on? I mean, can you remember if it was always on a Saturday? Yes. Always, all three times. But I don't know why. I don't know what was bothering me. Oh, how do you react? He was nervous, irritable. Surprised me the first time. Harry had never been that way with anybody. He snapped at me, the hard girl. Apologized later, but the only one he didn't snap at was the baby. He just seemed to want to hold her in his lap. Just sit there and rock back and forth, hold him. And then during the night, he kept getting up going to the crib to look at I see. Ma'am, did your husband ever say he was worried about somebody trying to take little Anne away from you? Well, no. 
Who could take her from us? Both her parents were dead. Her mother agreed with the adoption before she passed on. Do you ever know the baby's father? Ever see him? No, he died before Annie was born. Killed in an accident. You sure of that? Well, that's what Annie's mother told her. She couldn't have lied. You got a copy of the baby's birth certificate? Yes, it's right in this drawer. With a copy of the adoption papers we got from the court. Here's the court order. And the paper signed by Annie's mother, Dorothy Stryker. Stryker? Was the father's name Bill or William Stryker? Why, no. Here it is on the birth certificate. His name was Arthur Stryker. Came from Fort Worth. Ranger, what is it? I think I know who killed your husband now. And I'm beginning to figure why. You'll hear from me, ma'am. <laughs> I headed for the Big Bend, making a radio check with KTXA, asking the station to contact the Fort Worth police on possible relationship between Arthur and William Stryker. The answer fit. They'd been brothers. But William Stryker had a criminal record. It was late afternoon when I mounted charcoal for the ride into the surveying camp. I reached it about 3 a.m., dismounted, and slipped into the office tent. Central City. Where's Stryker sleeping? Oh, Stryker, huh? That's right. Hop back. Near where the horses are hobbling. Well, you better be careful, Ranger. He's got a gun. Good. Tess can give me the final proof I need if it's the same gun that killed Cashman. Huh? I'll come with you. If he wakes up before I get to him, you hit the ground and stay there, no matter what happens. Don't worry. I'm a surveyor, not a hero. There, under that tree. Ranger's in the room. Got it all in shadow, though. He's not here. Somebody's trying to get away with one of the horses. Come on. Oh, he must have seen you out in the moonlight crossing to the tent. Get away from that horse, Striker. You're in the light now. I can see you, too. It's something you won't say. Oh, Ranger, oh. you're hit. Drop. Got him. Be careful. Might be a trick. Are you other men? Stay down. Don't move. Uh, oh, it's no trick, Ranger. Oh, he's hit more than once and bad. I don't want to die. Don't let me die. Better get one of the first aid stuff you have it. Try and patch him up. You're gonna need some work. Ooh, I'll be all right. You men can get up now. Need a couple of you to make a letter. You need it to take him in. I... Easy, Ranger. Oh, I got you. Oh, man, I'll have to make two letters. You one yourself. Stryker lived long enough to confess his masquerade as the father of his dead brother's child and the murder of Harry Cashman. He was pronounced dead shortly after arrival at the nearest emergency hospital. Jace Pearson had three bullets removed from his body. They matched the bullet taken from the body of Harry Cashman. Six weeks later, Jace Pearson reported back to his company, ready again for duty with the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Here again is the star of our show, Joe McRae. There's a story about one of the first Texas Ranger captains whose outward appearances seemed to be little more than a boy. One of the Rangers in his command, a big, raw-boned, muscular fellow noted for his complete lack of fear, was asked by a townsman, how come a big fellow like you takes orders from him? Why, he ain't even got enough of beard to need shaving. The Ranger looked at the townsman. Maybe he hasn't got much of a beard, the Ranger admitted. But when we go out after a gang of bandits with him outnumbering us three or four to one, I never yet heard the captain say, go get him, boys. He always says, come on, man, follow me. Good night, folks. See you again next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Joe Kearns, Tom McKee, Roy Glenn, and Barbara Luddy. 
This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Hal Gibney speaking. mean good times on NBC. Coming up next on NBC, it's genial accordion playing master of ceremonies, Phil Baker, back at his old Sunday night stand asking America's favorite question. What's that? Why, the $64 question, of course. The chimes are your invitation every Sunday to all the fun and prizes and excitement of everybody's favorite quiz game, the $64 question. Tomorrow, hear the railroad hour. Right now, it's the $64 question on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, breakdown. It is shortly after midnight, the beginning of Good Friday in the year 1937. Jim Wiley, constable of Romer, Texas, is driving to the lonely outskirts of his territory. When his headlights pick out a car parked on the road shoulder, he breaks to a stop. Having some trouble? This heat conked out on me. I'm trying to get it started for half hour. Well, maybe I can get it going for you. I know a little something about cars. Okay about trying? You bet. Go ahead. Says you're half full. Gage must be busted then. Choking like I did and should have plugged the carburetor. Gas was feeding through. We'd get the smell of it. Yeah, better check the tank. Get a stick or something to shove in here for measuring, will you? You bet. This branch ought to do. Yeah, it's good enough. Give it here. Mr. Champ? The grind is a WCTU meet. Leave me kind of stuck. Well, I got a siphon hose from the trunk. You can drain enough out of my tank to get you back to Roma. Is that an all night station there? Huh? No, I'm afraid not. No hotel either. But I can put you up for the night. You don't mind bunking in jail. What do you mean, jail? I'm a constable. Oh, I see. <laughs> don't worry, the jail's clean. Come on, let's go get that hose. Well, it's in here someplace, but I can find it. You got a match? Hi, ah, you bet. I'm going to be in here someplace. I guess I'll let a lot of junk pile up. I can't hold this match much longer. I'll light another one. Ah, that's the last one to burn. Oh. Well, you got that hose of hand? No point getting snappy about it. How come you didn't know the gas gauge in your car was busted? I had... Must have just happened, I guess. It used to me as a car just like yours on my stolen car list. I hope you got proof of ownership on you. I got it all right. In my pocket, point of right square to cut. Huh? Use your head, young fella. Stolen cars, bad charge. It ain't nearly as bad as using a gun on a peace officer. Now you better hand that gun over and come with me. <laughs> hmm? Why, you heck, you small town roof cop. <laughs> you stinking roof cop. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Reach for it. Reach for it. Reach for it. I can kick a face. Go ahead. <laughs> Don't be a loco. You can't get away with this. 
Come to that wall from other dumb cops. You never should have told me you're cops, you know. You never should. There's something coming on your face. Come on, on your face. Get out of that brush. Now you look at this cop, you're going to get a rat to the face. Hey, you off with of this. Hey, help. <laughs> go on, cut the bus. Go on, Pop. Yell. Yell all you want. Try not to yell that more. Go ahead. <laughs> That's too bad, Pop. <laughs> now, you and me gonna make a trade. Bullet from this gun exchange for your car. What's the matter, Pop? Don't you like it? You get caught. We'll get you. Uh, the cop ain't born can take me. I'm off, Pop. I'm gonna die. Why don't you crawl a little? Why don't you beg a little? Maybe I'll change my mind. I said, Bird! You could, you could kill me, but you, you ain't scared me. I'll make it easy for you, Bob. But you gotta beg me. You don't, I'll give it to you through the kidney. And that ain't nice, Bob. It takes a couple of hours to die that way. And it hurts, Bob. I know I watched a cop die that way once before. Good. That's it, Pop. Pray louder. Let me hear you. You're the one I'm praying for. You must be great. <laughs> praying for me. <laughs> you God. Let's see who you pray for in the next couple of hours. <laughs> it hurts, don't it, Pop? And it's gonna get worse. You won't pass out till right near the end. <laughs> Enjoy yourself, Papa. Have a good time. <laughs> Constable Wiley's body was discovered shortly after sunrise when highway patrolmen spotted the stolen vehicle abandoned by the killer. The sheriff was summoned and he called for the help of the Texas Rangers. By noon of Good Friday, Ranger Captain Stinson was at the scene, accompanied by Ranger Jace Pearson. Wiley didn't die either, Jace. Look at that. Yeah. Tried to crawl off to the road. Blood trail. Must have been in agony every inch of the way. Do you have any family? An invalid wife, two daughters, and three grandchildren. A man who did this might just as well have shot them, too. They'll feel the same pain Wiley did, only longer. With an alert out for Wiley's car, we might get a break. The killer may have been spotted in it somewhere along the line. I doubt it. He probably got where he wanted to go and ditched it before sunup. Medical examiner figured Wiley's been dead since about 3 a.m. Must have been shot a couple of hours before that. Give the killer a good start, all right, then. Yeah. Let's get back to the rule. We've got one thing going for us, though. The man we're after may have left some prints on the car he abandoned when he took Wiley's. Lab men flew in before we got here. They ought to be coming through with a report soon. Well, Steve Clark is in town waiting for it. He'll bring it out. I want you and Steve to stay on this case until it's cracked. It's one I'd enjoy cracking. Only lead we've got is that the abandoned car was headed west. Well, that's something, at least. You and Steve can start off in that direction. Hey, here's Steve now. Oh. Howdy, Steve. Howdy, Jay. Yeah. You get the lab report? Yeah, yeah. It'll rattle your teeth. Here. Killer's been identified by fingerprints left from the car he did. While he was killed for Rex Lang. Rex Lang? Rex Lang? Yeah, no doubt about it. The prints were as clear as a bell. There's a copy of Lang's record attached to the report. I don't have to see that. I know it by heart. I wonder how long he's been in Texas. Well, he might have been here for a year or more. Last report on him was when he killed a policeman in Great Falls, Montana. Before that, he pulled jobs in Nebraska, Wyoming, and Iowa. And he's blazed quite a trail. Yes, and I want that trail to end in Texas. It's the first time he's paid us a visit. I want it to be the last. It's not easy to catch. According to that report, he's been jailed only once, Idaho State Reformatory, when he was 16. That's about eight years ago. Yeah, and in that eight years, he's killed six people, four of them peace officers. The first one was the guard at the reformatory. Lang butchered him when he escaped. Look at this record. Look at it. He's sent to the reformatory for beating his young brother half to death with a stool poker. That Lang's picture clipped on the report. Yeah, a mug shot taken at the reformatory. Well, that'll help us. I don't know, Steve. A big-boned 16-year-old kid. And we're looking for a 24-year-old man. Could have filled out plenty by now. It'd be hard to recognize. Well, there, there ought to be some description since then. Ought to be, but there aren't. All the witnesses he's left are dead ones. Is this the complete report? Yeah, that's it, Captain. 
Oh, except this. It probably doesn't mean anything. The sheriff picked up this empty matchbook that was just lying in back of where Wiley's car was parked here on the shoulder. Lab checked it for prints, but they couldn't pull anything off of it. Yeah, it might have been thrown from any passing car. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Let me see it. Advertising on the cover. Grand Bowling Alley in Pintado. Pintado's about 70 miles west, Jace. And that's the way the car was headed. He couldn't pick up matches before he got there. Not unless he'd been in Pintado before and was headed back there again when he tripped over Wiley. Well, that's possible. Our trail leads west anyhow. Don't do any harm to check around Pintado when we get there. You're towing a double horse trailer, Jace, so you and Steve might as well ride together. So it's me. I'll load my horse and put him in with charcoal. There's something about Rex Lang it might pay to remember. He was a ladies' man back where he came from, Pocatello, Idaho. All right, boy. Back up. Even when he was 14? Yeah, even then. It was a high school girl who smuggled in the knife he used to kill the reformatory guard. And there have been indications that he had a woman lookout with him on burglaries where his prints had been found. I'll get my trailer open for you, Steve. Thanks, Jase. Uh, company for you, Charky. No. Oh, you stay in, boy. Ah, uh, you climb in, boy. Come on, get him. Okay, Jase. I guess we're ready to roll. You'll hear from us, Captain. Uh, Jase, Steve. What's the matter, Captain? You both know Lang's record. A killer with a crazy hate for all peace officers. So understand that what I'm going to say now is not in order. If you corner him, you'll have a mad dog on your hands. But I'd like to have him taken alive. That may not be easy, yet. I know, but Rex Lang has become an idol to young punks and reform school toughs all over the country. Now, if we can put him on trial, convict him in a court of law, and have him executed by the state, It'll show those kids that society is strong enough to stand him out like a flea. There's nothing glamorous about dying in an electric chair. But if you have to finish him in a fight, he'll still be an idol. He'll say Rex Lang was so tough we couldn't take him, we had to kill him. I understand, Captain. So do I. Now remember, it's not in order. I want both of you back alive, too. That's all. Come on, Steve. Let's go. We headed west, looking for a dangerous kid thrown into a dangerous man, with a face we might recognize too late. By midnight, we'd check the highway as far as Pintado. In the morning, we'd start to comb the town, still drawing a blank. That guy at the bowling alley wasn't much help, Chase. Didn't seem to recognize that old picture, Rex Lang. Yeah, Lang may have changed a lot in eight years, but if he made the alleys a hangout, the owner should have... Uh, well, you know, Jay thought the face was a little familiar. Maybe yes, maybe no. Lang was blonde and smooth-skinned as a kid. Hair might have darkened plenty since then, face and frame filled out. And he shaves now if his line changes a face. Yeah, yeah, he might have just passed through here and picked up those matches, so maybe they were just thrown out of a passing car. I know. Well, we can't waste too much time on the lead to may be blind. Yeah, how about some breakfast? There's a Mexican place across the street, Lobo. That's for me. I'm so hungry, I'll even eat enchiladas for breakfast. <laughs> Come on, let's cross. Easter Sunday tomorrow, this. Wish I could be home with the wife and kids. I even forgot to order flowers. Why are the captain? He would have some sense of the house for you. Yeah, didn't even think of that. Buenos dias. Howdy. Let's take the food, Jace. I'm tired eating all the time. Why can I get I have everything. Uh, fruit juice, a couple of scrambled eggs, easy with bacon, coffee, and toast. Yes, senor. Yes, senor. Buenos dias, senorita. I will be with you in a moment. Too bad. Here I am starving. I don't even know what I want. Say, why don't you wait on the lady while I'm thinking it over? Of course, senor. Take your time. I thought you were hungry enough to eat enchiladas for breakfast. <laughs> Man, double mustard. He gave me a choice. I guess I'll just double your order, Chase. Ah, what's the move when we leave here? I haven't figured it yet. You bet. How much? Ten? You know, Chase, maybe we should go back. Wait a minute. Yeah. Good night, Steve. Oh, ma'am. Just a minute. Speaking to me, Ranger? Yes, ma'am. I happened to look out of the booth and saw you. Don't I know you from someplace? I don't think so. You sure look familiar. You live here in Pintado? You bet. I must have met you the last time I was through here, about two years ago. I am a sake range. I've only been here six weeks. Oh. 
Well, where'd you come from before that? Fort Worth. That's your hometown? You bet. You sure did look familiar. Excuse me, please. You bet. You had the wrong senorita, no? Maybe. Grab your hat, Steve. Why? What was that all about? Well, something hit me when she was talking. Notice how she kept saying, you bet? Yeah, what about it? That reformatory report about Lang. The part about his habits. You bet was his favorite expression. Oh, no, wait a minute, Jace. Lang may have changed, but I doubt if he turned into a girl. <laughs> no. But she picked up that expression someplace, Steve, from somebody who uses it regularly. And it could be Lang. Well, it's as good a lead as that matchbook, Jace. Worth following. I think so, too. Come on. Let's see where she's taking that coffee. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Breakdown, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We followed the girl, hoping she was taking the coffee to Rex Lang, and hoping to go to less than two blocks from Lobos Cafe when she turned into the doorway of a jewelry store, not far from where my car was parked. Doesn't look like the sort of place we'd find Lang in, Jace. And she went into the back of the store. Look through that corner of the window. Yeah. Now well, there's the container of coffee on that bench right beside the watch repairman. Mm -hmm. yeah, she must have brought it in for him. Guess he's the boss. Looks that way. And he can't be Lang. He must be 60 or more. Jace, get back a little. What is it? She came out of the back. He's behind the counter now. And she's working there then. Not take any chances on being spotted. Drift back this way a little. Yeah, this is good enough. She'd have to come out to see us now. We'll have to keep a tank on her. If she's Lang's girl, she'll lead us to it. But even if she is his girl, no telling how often he sees her. If he's hot, must be hiding out someplace. We could burn up a week or two and then find out we're sending out dogs at the wrong tree. We won't waste any time. Not if we can get some information about her. I'm going to get to a phone. You stay right here on this block, though. Walk the corner with me. Yeah. Jace, if she was Lang's girl, why should she be working? If she was working in the laundry, that's a question I couldn't answer. But I can think of a good reason why she might be working in a jewelry store. Case it for Lang to knock it over? It's been done before. I'm going to have headquarters check back on some jobs Lang's pulled before. See what you can find out along the street here. She's a mighty pretty girl, so it's a safe bet she's been noticed by other storekeepers along here. Maybe one of them knows her name and where she lives. Say, so we don't want to tip our hand by asking too many questions. Don't make them sound like official questions. Make them sound like you're just another man who's seen a pretty girl. Okay, okay. But you ever mention this to my wife and you and me are going to tang her? <laughs> Get going. I'll make my call and meet you at the car later. <laughs> called my headquarters and gave Captain Stinson a description of the girl we were tagging and a list of information I wanted. It was less than two hours later when he called me back. It looks like you may have hit something with that girl, Ace. I made a few phone calls and got answers that fit. What are they? Fingerprint records from out of state show that Lang's burglaries in the past included a jewelry store, a check cashing agency, and a private home where the owner was in the habit of keeping plenty of cash in the safe. Girl fit into those cases? Operandi I've been looking for. And if it was the same girl in each case, she always changed her name. Well, that's as easy as dyeing her hair. It all fits. If you're right, Chase, you're getting mighty close to Lang. That's where we want to be. Thanks, Captain. You'll hear from me. Chase, maybe I'd better send you a couple of more men. That'd only give Lang a couple of more targets. Bye, Captain. <laughs> girl was shaping up like the extra joker in a poker game. By the time I got back to Steve Clark, he had a rundown on her. The name she was using in Pintado was Jojo Deering. That night, the stores were open late for the last-minute Easter shoppers, but finally the lights went out, followed the girl to her home, and staked out to wait. Five minutes later, she came out again. Hey, Jace, look. Just changed your clothes. Yeah. Wearing jeans and a jacket now. Yeah, but why? I don't know. She's moving for her car. I'll let her stay about a block ahead. Don't want to tag her too close with this horse trailer behind us. Right. Yeah, she's pulling out now. It's 
so are we. Steve, I got a feeling we're moving in for the finish. Why? The way she's dressed. Not the way she dressed for a date in town. But it is the way she dressed to go to Lang if he was holed up in some off-trail spot. Works during the week, goes off to meet him on Saturday nights. That chase it adds. We'll know soon enough. She's turning for the highway out of town. Looks like a long trip, Chase. Hey, hey where is she? Took a turn off up ahead. You reach in the back and get a Tommy gun. Well, the captain said he wanted Lang alive, remember? I know. We have to stop that car later. She picks Lang up. I want to make sure we can put it out of commission. Okay. I'm sorry, Steve. Sharp turn off there. Grab a look at the map. Where does this road lead? I don't need the map. This is State 61. Nothing down here for more than 100 miles except for a few run-down Mexican settlements. I'm going to cut off my headlights. The road gets kind of rough, Chase. Can't help it. I can follow her taillight without her knowing we're behind her. Yeah, you're right. Odd anything comes through here, she'd scare in a minute. But she'll roll a lot easier if we weren't dragging that horse trailer. I got a feeling we may need it. No need for her changing her clothes like she did if she's gonna stay in the car. Any place in here where she could pick up a horse? Yeah, about ten more miles. Ranch owned by an old Mexican woman. All she's got is a couple of horses. Can you think of any place near there where Lang might be hiding out? Yeah, yeah, about three or four miles back in the hills. Used to be a mine there. A couple of them, in fact. Uh, they're abandoned, Jace. Isn't there a road to the mines? No, nothing but a rough burrow trail. It's a tough country to get into. If Lang's there, it's going to be tough country for him to get out of. Just before we reached the old Mexican ranch, we let the girl's car pull out of sight. We parked for ten minutes, then drove to the ranch. Her car was there, all right, almost hidden in a clump of brush behind the barn. And there was a fresh horse trail leading into the hills. We unloaded our horses and we followed it. Only about another half a mile to the mines, Jase. She's heading right for them, all right. Something about this that bothers me, Steve. What's that? She stuck to the burrow trail all the way. That's just what I don't like. The only approach in Lang wouldn't be at the end of a clear trail unless he had some way of guarding it. You mean he might have an ambush taken out along here? A man who hasn't been caught or even described in eight years doesn't leave his guard down. I don't know. He can't stay awake 24 hours a day. I reckon not. Hey, wait a minute. Hold up. Whoa, whoa, Charky. Whoa, boy, whoa. See something, Chase? Yeah. This brush at the side of the path has been trampled not long ago either. Just dropping back into its natural position. The horse was waiting in there, and now we got two sets of tracks on the path. That means he expected the girl. Waited here to meet her. Looks that way. Better get down and lead your horse. Right. Come on, boy. Come on, Chuck. Why did he come down to meet her? He didn't have to show her the way. They're still sticking to the path. I don't know. In one way, I wish the moon was a little fuller. And in another way, I'm glad it isn't. Oh. Huh? Well. Yeah, they left the trail here. Brush the stirred again, the tracks turn in there. Come on. This is funny, Jase. We're following their movement through the brush, and we're just making a little half circle right back to the burrow trail. Now look here. We're right back on the path. You suppose he made that little half circle just to leave a blank spot in the tracks? Blank spot of less than 20 yards? Isn't likely. Must have had some reason. See the horses for a second. Go back along the path and find out why he cut away from it. Right. Move slow and keep your eyes peeled. Nothing that seems out of line. Stop. Look at this branch overhanging the path. Just a branch. All right. Hey, Jace can barely see it. A piece of string running from the end of the branch to that tree on the opposite side of the path. Don't touch it. Let's see where it leads. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. Sawed off shotgun strapped to the tree. That string is tied around the trigger. Gun probably has enough scatter shot and slugs in it to kill an elephant. No wonder he better to steer around this. Chase, look at the way that gun is sighted. Anybody on a horse who moved that branch get a charge right through the middle. Anybody on foot who moved it probably get it right through the head. You were right, Chase. He wasn't planning on taking any chances. A rat. Anybody could be killed by this thing. A rancher, some kid riding through. You don't think that'll make any difference to Lang, do you? What a death trap. A 
death trap that's going to backfire on him. This is the thing we used to take him, Steve. When this goes off, you come running to see what he's got. You have another gun, he'll still fight. You won't get a chance if we work it right. I'm going to pull the trigger on this thing and then let out a scream. Plant myself out there on the burrow path. You stay here in the brush. Then what? Just be patient. Don't move, no matter how long it takes for him to get here. He'll come plenty slow trying to make sure that whatever he hits alone. And when he finds me lying out there, fire your gun and start him. But keep your fire high. Jason might pump a slug into you while you're flat on your back. Not if we time it right. But don't fire until he's close enough for me to jump him. You better get the horses and time off down the trail a ways. You'll have time. Say, Jason, how about a toss to see who stakes out on the path? Why should you take the chance? Why not me? Because you forgot to wire the captain about that Easter plan for your wife and kids. Get going after the horses, and then get back to it. Good luck, Jason. Good luck to both of us, Steve. <laughs> I planted myself in the path and waited. I was breaking into a sweat as cold as the ground. Even if he thought I was dead and crazy, he couldn't kill her like Lang might waste one more bullet. A half hour passed. An hour. And then we heard him coming. Slowly, like a cat. Get up, try again, Rex. Or is that enough? No, no. I come. I come with you. Tell that couple together, Jason. Yeah. We'd be ashamed to split such a lovely couple. I guess this isn't the kind of brace that you were after, Jojo, but it'll have to do. All right, Rex, hold out your wrist. Yeah, that does it, Jason. Yeah. Now well, let's get started. It's just midnight. Once we get him in and fast drive, I'll get you home by morning a chance to pick up that Easter plant. Not only that, I'll be on time to go to church with the kids. You going? I'll borrow a couple of words from Rex. You do that. As an accessory in the many crimes committed by Rex Lang, Jojo Deering was convicted and sentenced to a 50-year term in a women's prison at Gorey. Lang tried for the murder of Constable Wiley, slobbered and pleaded for mercy, but the jury gave no heed to his pleas as the prosecution brought his vicious record to light. Found guilty of murder in the first degree, Lang was sent to Huntsville Penitentiary, where on the morning of November 4th, 1938, he died in the electric chair. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers.
Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Byron Kane, Herb Ellis, and Betty Lou Gerson. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun, excitement, and prizes next on NBC as accordion-playing MC Phil Baker gathers contestants around the microphone to see if they know the answer to America's favorite question. What question is that? Why, the $64 question, of course. You're invited every Sunday for Laughs with Phil Baker and the $64 question. Tomorrow, enjoy the telephone hour. Now it's the $64 question on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. It is 11 p.m. a Saturday night in January 1933. Sheriff Russ Morton drives his car to the end of the well-lighted main street of Lingwood, Texas, and turns onto a narrow wooden bridge that crosses the railroad yards and leads to the Negro quarter of town, on the far side of the tracks. In the car with the sheriff is his deputy, Sam Billings. Both men are uneasy. Doesn't look like there's much doing across the tracks, Sam. I don't get it, Sheriff. I was over here less than an hour ago, and the cafes were packed so thick you couldn't stir them with a stick. No. Who sent out to call for us? Pedro at the Cantina Cafe. I didn't get half of what he said. He sounded scared to death. Just kept yelling to come get old Lucifer out of this place. <laughs> old Lucifer? I can imagine him stirring up no trouble. Oh, neither can I. But, Sam, I, I don't like the look of this. Mm, there isn't a light show in the whole fort. Not even in shack or shack. I've been a knife in, Sheriff. Oh, knife. I might, might make one place for Doc. Not all of them. Cantina's off left, off the next street. Nobody on the streets. Even a dog in the prowl. If old Lucifer is behind this, he sure sent everybody around for cover. Now, how can an old man like... Sheriff, look. Huh? Cantina ain't open either. This Pedro got old Lucifer to leave without waiting for our help. Yeah. Closed up tight in the ground. Why? I can't figure it. What are we going to do now? We're going to find out what's wrong over here. Keep your eyes peeled. I'm going to comb these streets until we find a light. Somebody's stirring. Let me show them back and get that shotgun. Right. Never saw nothing like this before, Sheriff. Neither have I. There's... Throw the spotlight on, Sheriff. That doorway over there. That's old Lucifer. Yeah. Stand right where you are, Lucifer. Don't move. Look! Look at him, Sheriff. Something all over his shirt, his pants, and his hands. Yeah, no need to look at him twice. Blood. What happened to you, Lucifer? What's the matter over here? Not doing, Mr. Sheriff. All my doing. Ain't nobody to blame but me. You got blood all over you. And it doesn't look like it's your own. Who are you fighting with? Somebody in Pedro's place try to jump you? No, sir. I ain't had no trouble with nobody here. Had my trouble out to the farm where I work. Out of the farm? Yes, sir. I just walked into town a little while ago, trying to get up my nerve to turn myself in. Sir, I I killed Mr. Redford. I shot him dead. What? You killed your boss? Mike Redford? Yes. I done it just me. 
We got to argue and I shot him dead. I wonder there ain't a light on over here. You can tell us the rest of it in the jail, Louis Burton. Right now, you better get in my car fast before this news crosses the tracks. Yes, sir. And we're in for trouble, Sheriff. Frank Redford's been mighty popular around here. Yeah. Get in back, Louis Burton. Get down on the floor and stay there. Yes, sir. I'm going to drop you off on Main Street, Sam. Round up the constable and a couple of other deputies. Get them to jail as fast as you can. We may be able to keep this quiet until tomorrow. If we can, it'll give me a chance to get a few Texas Rangers in to give us a hand. The news of Mike Redford's murder struck the town on the afternoon of the following day. But by that time, Sheriff Morton had help. He was joined at the Lingua Jail by Texas Ranger Jace Pearson. Uh, here's Lucifer's confession if you want to see it, Jace. He made a full statement when we brought him in last night. A pretty short statement. Yeah, short and to the point. Says he had it in for Redford for a long time. Made up his mind to settle it last night. Went up the house, started the fight, and shot him. He's, uh, had a clothes Lucifer was wearing. Blood all over him. Have the blood analyzed? Yeah. Medical examiner did it when the J.P. ordered an autopsy. It matches Redford's blood type, all right. You ought to have a full autopsy report in an hour. Captain Stinson ought to be here by then. Good. I got my deputies posted around, but uh, extra hands will be a help in case of trouble. Town looks peaceful enough. Mm, the news hasn't been out long. We couldn't keep it quiet after the medical examiner had the body brought in the funeral home, though. Where are you keeping Lucifer? Oh, that's him in the bunk in the cell, back at the end of the block there. No other prisoners? I had them all moved up into the tank upstairs. Good idea. A statement says Lucifer worked on the Redford farm all his life. Yeah. Yeah, started there when Mike's grandfather owned the place and just stayed on. Old Lucifer must have gone crazy or something, Jace. He's had a good home up there. And he turns and bites the hand that beats. That's happened before. I know, but... Uh, uh, Lucifer never gave you any trouble before this, you said. No, no, nothing. Uh, unless you want to count a little row he got in the last summer. Didn't amount to much. Or was it? Oh, Lucifer hit somebody with a shovel. Some wandering farmhand that worked out at Redford for a few days. Him and Lucifer were cleaning out a pig pen, it seems, and this migratory started cussing Mike Redford. Lucifer told him to shut up, the guy wouldn't, so Lucifer clipped him with a shovel. That's the way the story came out when they brought Lucifer up before the judge. The judge fined him $25, and Redford paid the fine for him and took the old man home. Sounds like Redford and Lucifer were pretty close. Oh, Redford Hall was pretty square. What you just told me doesn't fit in with a statement you got from Lucifer last night. What do you mean? Last summer, he hit a migratory for cussing Redford. Look here. On page two of this statement, Lucifer says, I had a grudge in for Mr. Redford ever since his pappy died, and he come to be my boss eight years ago. I didn't like him, and I made up my mind I'd kill him. It doesn't fit, does it? If this statement were true, Lucifer wouldn't have been up before a judge for defending Redford last summer. Howdy, James your horse out of the trailer and watered him. Thanks, Sam. Sheriff Lucifer's grandson, Chad's out in the hall. I want to know if he can see the old man. Just for a minute, please, Mr. Sheriff. Well, I guess it won't hurt none. Come on. Got a visitor for you, Lucifer. Grandson, Chad. No. Please, don't let him in. I don't want to see him. Don't want to see nobody. Grandpa, we've got to get you a lawyer or something. I don't want nothing. You go home. Don't talk to me. You just have home and stay there. Make him go, Sheriff. Go. You know you ought to go. That old man may be right. I don't want to see you know how. Don't ever come here again. But, but Grandpa, you got to... Never mind, Chad, never mind. You get out like you said and go home. Come on. Sam, you better drive him out of town. Let him cut across the field and through the hills to his place, but see that he stays off the highway when you leave him. Okay, Sheriff. Go ahead, Chad. <laughs> Where does he live? Chad. Up in the hills, about four miles behind Redford. I'd like to take a ride out to Redford's place. If there is going to be any trouble here. It won't come before dark. Besides, I'd like to talk to Chad. I'm going to catch Sam and ride with him. Uh, uh, see if I can stop. Sam? Yes, Sheriff? Wait a minute. Ranger's going to ride out with you. Okay. He's waiting, Jase. There's a deputy guard in the place out there, making sure nothing's touched until we get photographed. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Mr. Ranger, what are you going out there for? I told the sheriff everything, sir. No need for you to be going out there. Maybe there's no need for you being behind those bars either, Lucifer. I'd like to make sure. I've noticed a few.
few peculiar marks on Chad's face in the sheriff's office. And in the car, I got a chance to see him close up. They looked like scratch marks, and the edge of a dirty bandage showed beneath the frayed cuff of his shirt. You took a full chance walking into town, Chad. People are mighty hot about Redford getting killed. My grandpa wouldn't never kill him. One who'd know that best is your grandpa. He says he did kill him. Came in with Redford's blood over him. Yeah, an awful lot of Redford's blood, judging by the clothes the sheriff is holding. Where were you last night, Chad? I was home, back in the hills. Anybody with you who can verify that? I said, was anybody with you? Uh, no, I was alone. What do you mean, alone? Ain't your wife there? Wasn't she with you? Well, I wasn't at the shack. I was just around it. Doing what? Just walking around, that's all. Is that how your face got scratched up, walking around in the dark? One of your eyes looks kind of puffy, too, like you got hit. Uh, I got that chopping wood. A piece of kindling flew up and hit me. A piece of kindling hit you on the wrist, too? Pull that sleeve of your shirt up. I gotta cut that, that's all, just a cut. How'd you get it? Come on, Chad, your place is only a mile up behind Redford's. Were you on the Redford place at all yesterday? Sure, but not last night, only in the afternoon. What were you doing there? I just went by to see my grandpa, that's all. About what? To get the lender some money. He give it to you? No. Why not, Chad? You've been mooching on the old man for years. He never turned you down for anything. Why didn't he give you the money? Because Mr. Redford, he saw us talking and he come out the house. I told Grandpa not to give me a He said, I was no counter. I'd be earning my own and not buying from my old man. Mr. Redford, he ain't never liked me. He told me to get off the place. I didn't want no trouble, so I got it. And you just walked around in the hills near your house without going inside where your wife could see you, huh? I don't like the smell of that story, Chad. Maybe you never left Redford's place. I did, I tell you. Honest, Mr. Sam, Mr. Ranger, my wife can tell you that. I did go home last night for a minute. I left the house because me and my wife had a fight. Hmm. Nothing new about that. She got mad when I didn't bring no money back. We went round and round. She throwed something at me and I hit her. She scratched me up and cut my arm with a bread knife. That's when I run out. You didn't go back to Redford's after that? No, sir. I swear. I never did go back. Uh, here's the best place for you to get out, Chad. Got anything else you want to ask me, Jace? No. All right, Chad. You can go. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just wondering if the old man couldn't be covering up for him. You think he was lying about that fight with his wife? Could be. Oh, his women does have a temper. They had it out hot and heavy before. How does he make a living back in the hill? Well, they don't. They live in an abandoned shack up there. He couldn't pay rent no place. He ain't worth his salt. When he first got married, he tried to move his woman and himself into Lucifer's place, but Redford wouldn't have it no how. If anybody was toting a grudge against Redford, I'd bet on Chad, not old Lucifer. Because since somebody was toting one, a Redford wouldn't be dead. Old Lucifer's actions hadn't fit into the usual crime pattern. And when we got to the Redford house, the pattern became even more jumbled. Except for the body having been moved, everything was left as the sheriff had found it. The body was laying right here, Jace. You can see the stain on the rug. Yeah. Furniture knocked around. Must have been quite a fight. A broken bottle over here. Yeah, the sheriff figured that's what finally knocked Redford out. Then he got shot while he was out cold. Made the sheriff so sure of that. Well, the body. Bullet fired right into the head from close up. Burns on the face. And no blood around except that, that one spot on the floor. And those handprints Lucifer left on the furniture and the wallpaper. Handprints are what bother me most. Why? If Lucifer shot Redford, why didn't he just back off and get out of here? Not to get blood all over him. And why'd he smear it all over everything like a kid with a ten-cent tube of red paint? Yeah, I see what you mean. It does seem like it was kind of deliberate. You think an old man like Lucifer could have wrecked half this room fighting a younger man like Redford? Ranger, I guess the sheriff and me didn't think of a lot of things, not huh, to point them out. That's your fault. You thought you had a clear case in the confession. It makes it easy to overlook things. A young fellow like Chad might have put up quite a fight with Redford. What about the gun Redford was killed with? Well, we haven't got it. Luther said he threw it in some bushes on the way into town. Couldn't tell us where. Weapon might have been a 32 or 38. Autopsy will tell us when we get the slug. All right, let's get back to town. If the old man is covering up for his grandson, how are we going to break him down if he keeps on... Wait a minute, Sam. Hmm? Look at this. On the cupboard. What? Two whiskeys.
key glass. Yeah, both of them full. Ring on the wood here shows where the bottle was standing. Looks like Redford poured two drinks, one for himself and one for somebody else. They didn't get to drink them. Fight probably started before they got a chance to bend elbows. We know the bottle is used to knock Redford out. Hey, that kicks a hole in what we've been thinking. A big hole. Who was Redford drinking with? It's a cinch it wasn't Chad. Redford ordered him off the place. An old man's confession must be on the level. No, it isn't, Sam, because it's not likely Redford would have been having a loose friend for a drink either. There was somebody else here. Somebody who either killed Redford or saw who did. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Pressure. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Sam and I headed back for town. The streets were crowded but quiet the way they should be on a Sunday afternoon. But there was a tension we could feel. We made one stop at the funeral parlor for a look at Redford's body. The medical examiner was just finishing. Now you can see, like I said, the bullet was fired from close up. Yeah. What'd you find, Doc? Well, he struck on the head with a blunt object and shot through the brain at close range. I have the bullet here. Do you want that across, please? Yeah. Thanks. 3220 caliber. I'd give a lot to get my hands on the gun this came out of. Lucifer said he ditched the gun. Yeah, Lucifer said a lot of things. And slugs flattened out plenty. Usually so. I notice, eh? There's something else to notice, too, on the body, the burned area around the wound. Well, what, what about it? Ought to be some powder grains buried in the flesh, but there aren't. None that I can see. None that I can see either. How about that, Doc? No, no, it is an unusual wound. When Lucifer told you he threw the gun away, did he mention what kind of a gun, Sam? Mm. No, why? Because this may give us a chance to trip him up. This bullet didn't come from a small weapon. It came from a 32 20 caliber rifle. How can you tell that without a ballistic check? Well, for one thing, the way the slugs flattened out. Rifle has a couple of hundred pounds greater impact than a sidearm. And plowing through a skull, it flattened it plenty. Yeah, but there's another thing about a close-range rifle shot. It leaves a burn, but no powder grains in the skin. A revolver will leave powder grains every time. That makes sense, Doc? Yes, it does. With a revolver, the explosion of the powder on the shell is only a couple inches away from a point blank target. But with a rifle, well, there's the length of the barrel, you know. Yeah. This is my report if you're headed for the sheriff's office. We drop it off for you. So long. So long, Doc. Goodbye. I'm learning a lot as we go along here, Jane. There's still something we both gotta learn. Who killed Mike Redford? <laughs> There were a couple of ranger cars outside the jail when we got there. Men from my company were standing casually at points along the street. They weren't as casual as they looked. The jail was carefully circled and they commanded all approaches. Captain Stinson was inside with the sheriff. Grace, the sheriff tells me you are not satisfied with Lucifer's confession. That's right, Captain. How about bringing Lucifer out here for a minute, Sheriff? Sure thing. Things are going to start blowing around here after sundown, Jason. I know. I felt it all the way through town. All it needs is some hothead to start it off. Well, if it starts, we'll stop it. Well, maybe there won't be no trouble. Mm, the town's pretty crowded, Sam. A lot of cars coming in. Well, the town's always crowded on Sunday. They're not ganging up anyplace. Well, that can come later. There's one sign of trouble you can't ignore. Take a look out that window. There's not a woman in sight all the way down Main Street. The men are coming in alone. There he is, Jase. Thanks, Sheriff. Lucifer? You said you killed Redford and then threw the gun away. That's the honest truth, Mr. Ranger. Where'd you throw it? I don't remember, sir. Was it a gun like this one in my holster? Well, was it? Maybe. Guns look all the same to me. Oh, was it about the size of this one? All guns are about that size, sir. Not all guns, Lucifer. You're not telling me the truth. Because Redford wasn't killed with this kind of a gun. He was killed with a rifle. You're covering up for Chad. No, sir, no, sir. Chad had nothing to do with it. It was me, just me. Listen to me, Lucifer. You think Chad killed Redford, but I don't. 
If you want to help him, open up and tell the truth. Well, Chad couldn't have done it. He left the place with Mr. Rabbit run him off. Honest. I see him leave. Then what happened? I went to my house, and after it got dark, there was a shot, a gunshot. It came from Mr. Redford's house. I left my place, run over to see if anything was wrong, and... and... <laughs> Redford was dead when you found him. Then how did he get blood all over him, Jase? You tell you, sir. Go on. I lived in a little pool of head in my lap. I begged him to talk to him to say something to old Lucifer. I've known him since he was a little boy. Watched him grow. <laughs> but when you found him there, you thought Chad had sneaked back to kill him. I didn't know what to do. Why should you come up on no good like Chad? He is my own flesh, Chad. Blood is thicker than water. How do you know Chad isn't the killer, Chase? Two full whiskey glasses indicated that Redford was drinking with the man who killed him. And he wouldn't be drinking with Chad, Sheriff. It ain't this. Come in. Howdy, Sheriff. Uh, Hello, Rangers. Hello, What's on your mind, Plam? Well, some of the men have been talking around town, Sheriff. They sort of appointed me to come up and see you. Well, he just been to the funeral home to see Mike Redford. What's left of him? Mike was my neighbor. Pretty good friend, too. Glad that you come to tell me, Plam? No, not exactly. Looks like you're expecting some trouble. Some of us thought we'd like to volunteer to help you. We could take over the guard trick on jail for tonight so you and the rangers can get some rest. You can go back and tell the boys we're not tired, Plan. While you're at it, tell them Lucifer didn't kill him. Words around that Lucifer confessed, Ranger. It was a mistake, Mr. Flam. What I said wasn't true. Well, fine. Now you don't have to stay here, Lucifer. Why don't you go home, back to Redford's farm? He's staying here. Why, if you got nothing to hold him on? Protective custody. And that means just what it says, Plan. He'll be protected. You can go now. All right, Sheriff. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Flam. Yeah, Captain? If you should see any men around who look like they're fixing to start some trouble, do us a favor. And do them a favor, too. Tell them to go home. Sure, Captain. I'll tell them. Sam, lock Lucifer up again, will you? Sure. Come on, Lucifer. Yes, sir. Flam looks like he may be the man who sparked that crowd. Yeah. Flam and Redford were mighty close. Sure is. We've got to move Lucifer out of the county for safekeeping. If Flam gets a mob stirred up at night, anything can happen, and a few people are liable to get killed. He's safer in here than he'd be if we took him outside. Not if they fire this building. We'll move him right after sundown. How? Oh. Where? Seems to me the best place would be some small town lockup across the county line where nobody'd know him and nobody'd think of looking for him. That's what I had in mind. Sam? Yes, yeah, Captain? Get Jesus' horse, charcoal, out of his trailer. Pick up two more horses and take them all to the field south of town. Hobble them and stash the saddles away under cover so you know where they are later. Okay. After you leave them, on the way back, you can drop the word that we're moving this far out of here tonight. You mean you want the whole town to know it? They won't know as much as they'll think they know, Sheriff. After dark, you and I can make a run in my car. They'll figure we're moving, Lucifer, and they'll all make a run to block us. Meanwhile, Jace and Sam can slip him out the back and make for the horses in the field. After that, Jace, it's up to you. It's 11 miles cross country to Hills Crossing. There's a lock up there. See that nobody stops you from getting him to it. <laughs> until dark without turning on a light in the building when Captain Stinson, the sheriff, took one of the deputies covered with a blanket and made a run for the captain's car. Now, Sam and I took Lucifer out the back. We ran across the field where the horses had been left and began to saddle them. Listen. Sounds like the sheriff and your captain have hit trouble, Jase. Probably somebody tried to block the road and Cap's scaring them off. Hurry with that last. Yeah, ready to go, Jase. After it takes this one hobble off. Good. Come on, Lucifer. I'll give you a boost. Yes, sir. Charcoal, Jace. Ready to run. Thanks. Steady, boy. You set, Sam? As soon as it gets mounted. No more shooting? No. Captain discourages them quick. Yeah, but by now that crowd may know they ain't got Lucifer in the car. Too late to do them any good. This is going to be a rough ride for you, Lucifer. Let us know if you want to slow up or stop. Mm, I'll be all right, sir. Good. Let's ride. Up, Charcoal. Get up, boy. Come on. Just hang on the horn, Lucifer. Yes, yeah, sir. Come on, boy. Up. When we 
got to Hill's Crossing, the town was dark and sleeping, except for a couple of rangers who'd been sent down to take over guarding Lucifer. Once he was safe under lock and key, Sam and I started the ride back to Lingua. Hey, you're cutting the wrong way, James. We should turn down that valley to Lingua. I know it. We're not heading back for town yet. I want to make one more stop. Where? Back to Redford Farm again? That's not much out of the way. Getting Lucifer safe was only part of the job. We still got to find out who killed Redford. That means we've got to find out who was drinking with him. If there was anybody, Lucifer said Redford didn't have any visitors yesterday. He said he didn't see any visitors. That doesn't prove anything. He'd have been sure to see a car if one had driven in. His shack's near the farm road. He, even if he'd been inside, he'd have heard it. Maybe the visitor didn't use the road. Might have come in on foot or mounted from another side of the farmhouse. Yeah, I guess it could be all right. Probably put his horse in the barn or the back corral. That'd keep Lucifer from knowing anybody was in the house. There's the old wagon road the other side of that grove of trees we're coming to. We'll have easier riding once we get over the... Hold it, Sam. Huh? Oh, whoa, oh, Charlie. Oh, boy. Hey, what's the... Let's... Hound. And they're on trail. Look, over there in the hill. Hey, something's on fire. Jace, that's right up behind Redford's place. Isn't that where Lucifer's grandson Chad lives? Yeah. What do you suppose going on up there? Somebody wants blood. They didn't get it from Lucifer, so they're running down his family. Come on. Up, Chuck. Up, yeah. boy. That shack is really flaming, Jace. They trapped him in there. He's had it. They haven't got him yet. The dogs are still after something. Keep going. <laughs> We raked our horses all the way. We'd been about a mile off when the blaze started. When we reached the shack, it was a flaming heap on the ground. We saw a woman staring at it in a daze. She must have been Chad's wife. She wasn't harmed, so we took off after the sound of the dogs. Listen to that, Jase. They got Chad treated. They wouldn't sound off like that. Yeah, they just threw this thicket. Chad, you men grab your hounds and shut them up. You're all under arrest, and that includes you, Flam. What for? We were just doing a little night hunting. The dogs treat Chad here by mistake. The dogs didn't set fire to his shack, and arson's a crime. Look, Ranger, he killed my neighbor. Why just switch to him? Because you couldn't get your hands on old Lucifer? They were in it together. Redford ordered Chad off a place yesterday. Did you tell him that, Chad? No, sir. I didn't tell nobody to shoot. And you didn't get it from Lucifer, Flam, because you never got near him. So how do you know? Who told you Redford chewed him out? Nobody had to tell me. I was visiting Radford at the house. He saw Chad on a place and went out and ordered him off. But after I left, him or the old man sneaked in and killed Mike. Throw that rifle over here, Flam. Why? Never mind why. Just throw it over. And be careful how you throw it. We're willing to leave here, peaceful. Just a hunting weapon. A 3220 hunting weapon just like the one that killed Mike Redford. For the last time, Flam, throw it over. Come and get it! Oh. Hands off those guns, the rest of you! Oh. That's better. Now gather in and pick up your pal, Flam. Follow them out here, you can tow them back. You hit me! I'm hurt bad! There you just winged. The better breaking you gave Redford when you killed him. It was self-defense! I killed him in self-defense! Sure. Well, he was knocked out after you hit him with that whiskey bottle. Should have finished your drink, plan. You'll never see another glass of whiskey as expensive as that one. Jack Flam confessed to the murder of Mike Radford. His statement disclosed that the killing had been the result of an argument over ownership of a strip of land between his farm and Radford. Flam was sentenced to life imprisonment. Four other men convicted of armed participation in the attempted lynching of old Lucifer and his grandson Chad were given prescribed terms in the county jail. <laughs> Again, it's the star of our show, Joel McRae. There are thousands of people living today who have survived only because of the Red Cross. These people will never have to be reminded of its great service to humanity. But this year, the Red Cross drive has fallen short of its needed goal. So give to the Red Cross, won't you? And invest in humanity. Good night, folks. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of... 
the Texas Rangers. International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Will Wright, Herb Feigren, Ernie Whitman, Roy Glenn, Bill Conrad, and Byron Kane. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Times mean good times on NBC. Coming up next on NBC, it's the $64 question. Accordion playing quiz master Phil Baker gathers another group of contestants around the microphone to play your favorite quiz game. And there are prizes for the lucky participants and excitement and laughs for you at home. Join Phil Baker now as he asks America's favorite question, the $64 question on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on facts. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, bad blood. It is 7 p.m. September 14, 1950. In an isolated house trailer in the fields on the outskirts of Cheney, Texas, Joel Prager, an aircraft worker, is packing a suitcase. There is a knock on the trailer door. Just a second. Howdy, Joe. Oh, howdy, Russ. Ain't you going to ask me in? Yeah, sure. Come on in. See you packing already. That's right. What's on your mind, Russ? Well, Joe, I figured two weeks is long enough for old friends to be mad at each other. I come to ask you to shake hands. <laughs> you know, now that you're here, I can't figure just what we've been mad about. Ain't anybody I'd rather shake hands with than you, Russ. You're my boy. But we ain't never going to talk politics again. Oh, that's a deal. <laughs> I didn't want you to leave feeling sore at me. Well, why are you going, anyhow? Why are you pulling out your job, Solid? You're needed here. Well, I didn't want anybody to know about it yet, but looks like I'm needed someplace else, too. Huh? Here, read this. Well, going back in the Army, huh? I didn't know you stayed on the reserve list. I'm on it, all right. You talk to him about this out at the plant. After all, you're married now. You got a kid. You're in essential work. Maybe you could get out of it. I thought about it, Russ, but well, I don't want to get out of it. I got kind of a funny feeling about it, a feeling I've had ever since the kid was born. Like, well, maybe if I go again now, maybe I can help so he'll never have to go when he grows up. Yeah, I can't argue against that. Not with two boys of my own, one of them pushing 17. They and me are plenty worried about him with this Corey, you think? Oh, don't let it get you down, Russ. Boy, I'll be all right. <laughs> Say, uh, I was just about to fix me some grub. How about joining me? Oh, thanks, but Ella's expecting me home. Uh, say, where's Marge and the baby, anyhow? Oh, she drove the kid up to her mother's today. I got a week more before I report. Oh, uh, we sort of figured we'd go away someplace together, just the two of us, you know, till I have to leave. Yeah, well, when you're pulling out of here? 
tomorrow when Marge comes back? Ella would like to see you and Marge before you go. She's been beefing at me ever since you and me fell out. Yeah, Marge's been bulldogging me about it, well, too. Well, can't you come and have supper with us tomorrow before you go? How about that? Well, that's the deal. Swell. Ella would be tickled. Well, guess I better be getting home the old pay envelope. Do you need any help with anything? I mean, we got a few dollars for No, no, thanks, Russ. We'll get by. Well, good luck to you, fella. We'll see you tomorrow. Hmm? Sure thing, Russ. Say, if they had a draft somebody, why couldn't they take that brother-in-law of yours? <laughs> All of them? That'd be giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> I know Orville ain't giving any aid and comfort to his department out the plant. If he wasn't short-handed, he wouldn't last ten minutes. Well, good night, Jim. Good night, Russ. Second. You forget something? Oh, it's you, Oliver. Yeah, it's me. Russ was just here. I thought it was him coming back. I know he was here. Been waiting out back long enough, waiting for him to leave. You could have come in. Russ don't bite. He doesn't like me. I reckon that's your fault, Oliver. Oh, sure. Everything's my fault. How come you sticking up for him? I thought you and him wasn't talking. We are now, and I don't think it's any of your business. What do you want, Oliver? Joe, I'm need some help. I got my check cashed, and I guess I didn't notice it till I was almost home. I got a hole in my pocket. I lost my pay. Do I look like a half-wit to you? Well, I only want... The last time you came to me with that story, you said your pocket was picked. And the time before that, you said you got stuck with a loan you signed for somebody. That's right, Joe. Honest. Stop using the word honest, Orville. Doesn't sound right coming from you. If your money's gone, you lost it in the pay night crap game in Holland. I haven't been near Holland's in weeks. Oh, Joe, you gotta help me. My wife will buck like a maverick under a branding iron if I don't bring some money home. You and sis got some side money. I know you have. I ain't denying that, but this is one time you ain't dipping your hand into it. Yeah, take a look at this paper. Go ahead, read it. Draft, huh? You want to play soldier again and leave my sister with a kid to take care of. She and the kid will be taken care of, Orly. I'll see to that. You never had to give us anything, and you never will. Joe, I need money. here for you, Alden. Better try someplace else. I said I wasn't leaving without that money. Well, I reckon you'll be here a long time then, Alden. You have to excuse me. I'm going to fix my stuff. I ain't going to ask you again, Joe. Glad to hear. Just going to keep ignoring me, huh? Like I wasn't even here. That's right. Maybe I can make you pay a little attention with this. Alden, put that down. No. I'm going to help you dish out your supper like this. I told you, I told you. I told you. The body of Joe Frago was discovered when his wife returned to their trailer home early the following day. Sheriff Vern Lamont immediately called for the help of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pierce was assigned joined the sheriff at the scene of the crime shortly after noon. I've kept the whole field blocked off, Jace. Nobody's been near the place except Prager's wife and me and the deputy. Good. Where's the wife? Sitting over there in a the car. Tried to get her to go into town to the hotel, but she won't. She's even in kind of a daze. Shock. That's natural. You want to talk to her? Yeah, it wouldn't help when she's like that. Maybe by the time we've had a look around, she'll break down and cry it out, and then we may be able to get something. Let's have a look inside the trailer. Right. There's a the body. And there's a the murder weapon. Wrought iron frying pan. You won't be able to pull any prints off that. Metal's too coarse. That's why I just let it lay there. Medical examiner estimate the time of death. He figured it was between 6 and 8 o'clock last night. Hmm. Suitcase on the bed, half packed. Prager trying to run away from something? No, I don't think so. Letter on the table here explains it. It's in the army reserve. Call back to duty. Let's see. Where was he working here? Out of the aircraft plant, other side of town. Spot welded. How come his wife didn't report this until this morning? Well, she was away for the night. They got a baby? Baby oil and nipple jar on the dresser there. Yeah, that's why the wife was away. She took the kid to her mother's up in Abilene. Come back this morning. You check on that? First thing. Got a list of eating places she stopped at both ways, and she gassed up at a mobile station in Abilene last night after she got there. Mm, spots her away from here, all right. 
Let's check around outside. Right. Will it be okay for the medical examiner to move the body now? Yeah, I think so. How come they parked their trailer out here instead of using one of the parks near town? Save money, I guess. Rents are high with the plant working full blast. Gasoline lamp is better for light than what they do for water. Well, there's a well out back. Used to be a house here some time ago, but it was moved. They had everything they needed to get by. I see. Want to walk out to the road where our cars are? I can send one of the boys into the funeral home to arrange the pickup. All right. Wait a minute, Sheriff. Hmm? Watch your feet. What's the man? This car tracks up the road to the trailer. Gregor's own car, I reckon. Seen tracks all over the road and coming and going. A different tire pattern and a couple of the soft spots, though. Look here. Yeah. Overlaps most of the older tracks, but Prager's car tracks go over the strange tread once. Right here. Yeah, I see what you mean. Another car must have driven in here after Miss Prager left yesterday. And that spot is where she drove over the tracks when she came back this morning. That's the way I measure it. We can pull a cast off that tread and may help us run down the car. Okay. One of your deputies coming up the road now. That isn't one of my boys. Why'd they let him in? I don't know. Hey, you! Yeah? How'd you get in here? I come to help my sister. Who is your sister? Marge. Frager's wife. He was my brother-in-law. That's why the deputies let me through. All right. Your sister is sitting in the car back there. Reckon she does need somebody with her at that. Thanks. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, Ranger? Walk along the edge of the road. Stay out of the tire tracks. Why? Because we're asking you to. Isn't that good enough? Well, I only asked you for a reason, that's all. What's your name? Oh, James. You work with your brother-in-law? Well, yeah, sure. Out at the plant. Not in the same department. So. How'd you know your brother-in-law had been killed? I didn't know. Until I saw your deputies down by the road, and they told me. Isn't the aircraft plant working today? Yeah, sure it is. It's on the other side of town. I brought you out here now. I got a lift out during lunch to see my sister. That'd just about take your whole lunch hour. And more if you didn't catch a ride back right away. Do you make a habit of hitchhiking out here on your lunch hour? No, of course I don't. Then why'd you do it today? What are you asking me all this for? You trying to pin something on me? I reckon that's going to depend on how you answer. Come on, talk up. Well, I, I, I just... Well, I wanted to ask her about my mother. I, I knew that she'd been up home, see, and I, I wanted to find out how my mother was. I see. Your mother been sick? Well, yeah. No, no, she, she's been all right, I reckon. And why the rush to get out here this afternoon? Why not tonight, after work? Because I wanted to come, that's all. Anything else you want to know? Yes, when did you see your brother-in-law last? I don't know, three, maybe four days ago. Not yesterday? No. Not even at work? It's a big plant, Ranger. You only need to even work in the same building. What time did you quit yesterday? Five o'clock. Then you weren't working between, say, six and eight o'clock last night? No. Then where were you at that time? And who was with you? Well, I... I cashed my check at Holland's, and, and then... And then what? Did you come out here? Yeah. What? I said yes, yes, I come out here. I'd have told you before if you hadn't started to question me so funny. Why'd you say you hadn't seen Prager in three or four days if you saw him last night? I didn't see him last night. Listen, you just told us I you came out I told you I'd come out here, but I didn't see Joe. I changed my mind about going in because there was a car parked here. Joe had come. That fits in, Jace. Those car tracks. Yeah, but it still doesn't tell us why Orville didn't go in. I'll tell you why if you let me. I recognize the car. It belongs to Russ Luke. And I didn't want to go in while he was there because I didn't want to get mixed up in any argument. Who's Russ Newcomb? Why should there be an argument? Russ works out at the plant, too. Him and Joe have been friends, but they fell out a couple of weeks ago, hadn't been talking. Then why would Newcomb be visiting here? Why don't you ask Newcomb that? It took a long time for you to suggest that, Orville, considering that Prager's dead and you knew that there'd been bad blood between him and the man you say was here last night. I don't like to throw suspicion on a man for murder, Ranger. You might have quit suspecting me. A man ain't likely to kill his brother-in-law. Newcomb had the reason, not me. Now, you're going to let me go to my sister, ain't you? Yes. All right, Orville. Go ahead. Yeah. Looks like this thing is cracking easy, Jake. It sure does. You better get out to the aircraft plant. Yeah. We've got enough to pick up Newcomb, all right? We got more than that. 
That tire track on the road matches Newcomb's car. We got enough on Newcomb to send him to Huntsville. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Bad Blood, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We drove out to the aircraft plant. News of Prager's death hadn't reached the place yet. We were directed to Russ Newcomb's section leader, and he pointed Newcomb out to us. He was on a welding job. Hey! Hey, you up there! Newcomb! Yeah, knock off a minute. Come down from that wing, will ya? Be right there! What can I do for you? Go into the office where we can talk. Sure, I'll be glad of it. Yeah, Sheriff, what's up? Find a woman who owned that purse? Purse? What purse? What are you talking about? Purse I turned into your office about two months ago. Money in it, don't you remember? Oh, that was on a Sunday. Guess I look different at work out there. Oh, oh, yeah. What's this about, Sheriff? I thought he looked familiar. Turned in a woman's purse he found in the streets a couple months back. There's no identification in it, and the owners never claimed it. Oh? The way you're talking, Sheriff, I reckon it isn't a purse you want to see me about. No, it isn't. You know Joe Prager? No, boy. Joe's one of my best friends. When did you see him last? Only last night out to his place. Why, what's the matter? Joe in some kind of trouble? You say he was a good friend. Other people say you weren't on speaking terms for the last couple of weeks. We weren't until last night. We, well, we got in a dumb political argument one day during lunch here. Both got hotter than we should have. But you patched it up last night. Yeah, when word got around that Joe was quitting, going away, well, I went out and... Buried the hatchet. You sure you mean a hatchet, not a frying pan? Look, you fellas asking me something, but you ain't telling me nothing. You talked politics again with Prager last night? No, no, we just shook hands, and I asked him to bring his wife over for supper tonight, and then I left, that's all. Prager still alive when you left? Well, what do you mean he was still alive? You telling me Joe Prager's dead? He was beaten to death last night. With an iron frying pan. Please do that. Joe? You see anybody else at the trailer? No, no. We were alone. Just the two of us. Newcomb, the law requires me to warn you that anything you say from here on can be used against you. Used against me for what? You're talking like I'm under arrest. You are under arrest for the murder of Joe Trager. <laughs> We took Newcomb back to Cheney and locked him up. Meanwhile, Prager's body had been brought in for funeral home. I went over to see Mrs. Prager to see if she could give further verification of a quarrel between her husband and the man under arrest. Yeah. Joe told me they had some kind of an argument, but I didn't think it would ever be as bad as this. I didn't think Russ would kill him. Why don't you leave her alone, Ranger? I'd already told you there was bad blood. Now maybe you believe me. Other witnesses aren't going to hurt anything, are they? I'm all right, Albert. He's got to find out everything he wants to know. What else do they need to know? If you ask me, they got enough of a case right now. If we ask you, but so far nobody has. And until somebody does, how about keeping quiet? All right. You're the law. Go ahead and make them miserable. I'm going over to Holland, sis. I'll be there if I want to. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep after you like this, Mrs. Prager. Did your husband ever have any trouble with anybody besides Newcomb? No. Was he in fear of anybody, worried about anything? No. Well, he was worried at first when the army letter came. But when we decided it was right for him to go, he didn't worry anymore. Just figured out things so me and the baby could get along. We, we even had a little money saved. We were going away together for a week. Just Joe and me. To the place we went on our honeymoon. We were going to have so much fun. Now I'll have to use that money to bury him. I'm sorry, ma'am. Why did Russ do a thing like this to Joe? Why? Why? I don't know, ma'am. 
I've never been able to figure out why men do a lot of things they do to each other. I went back to the sheriff's office. It looked like the case against Newcomb was just about closed, but it opened again. Opened wide when the sheriff showed me the personal effects that had been removed from Prager's body. Look at this, Jase. Bank book, isn't it? Yep. Prager. It was in his shirt pocket. Take a look at that last line. Drew out every dime he had yesterday afternoon. Mrs. Prager told me they had some savings. They were going to use it to go away. And that's why he drew it out. Yesterday was payday at the plant, too, Jase. So Prager should have had this amount he withdrew. $312 plus his pay. Wasn't there any money on him? Less than a dollar in change. I had my deputies go out and comb that trailer. Cupboards, dishes. They didn't find a dime. You can turn any money over to the jailer when you booked him? About five dollars, that's all. But he had time to hide that money. All we gotta do is find out where he hid it. If he did hide it. What do you mean? That purse Newcomb found a couple of months ago, the one he turned into you. He mentioned that there was some money in it. That's right. A little over a hundred dollars. What are you thinking? I'm thinking about motives. You can figure Newcomb killed Prager because he was nursing a grudge. Robbery angle changes that picture. Yeah. Yeah, it sure does. A fellow who finds money and turns it in when he could keep it isn't likely to kill somebody and steal from it. Unless, of course, he was trying to cover up. He said he'd invited the Pragers to supper tonight, and they were going to come. That's right. Did he check on Orville's movements last night, see if he was telling the truth? Had my deputy do it. Only place to check was Holland's, and he was there all right after work. Cashed his check there, like he said, then got in a the crap game with some of the boys in the washroom. He couldn't have played very long. We wouldn't have gotten to Prager's by 7 o'clock when Newcomb was there. I don't get what you're driving at. Orville must have lost in that crap game. A game like that between fellows who work together, the winners usually stick to the end. Yeah, they get sore at a winner who quit until they've had a chance to get even. The deputies find any sign of bloody clothing when they check Newcomb's place? Nope, but they're checking the cleaning shops now. You know where Newcomb lives? Sure. You want to go over there? Just into the neighborhood. I want to talk to Newcomb's butcher. Come on. Newcomb's butcher? What can he tell you? What Mrs. Newcomb ordered for tonight's dinner? I saw the butcher, and his answer to my question pulled Newcomb back a step away from the electric chair. I got in my car and started to drive toward the field in Prager's trailer. You look like you learned something, Jace. I did. Mrs. Newcomb ordered stew meat yesterday for tonight's supper. She called up this morning and changed the order to lamb chops. Twelve lamb chops. That mean anything to you? And changing from stew meat to lamb chops sounds like she was expecting company. When she orders lamb chops for her own family, she usually gets eight. I see. The other four chops could have been for Prager and his wife then. I think so. Prager was dead when she ordered them. Well, Newcomb could have told her to order them for a cover-up. Could have. It's a little too smart. He didn't strike me as being that clever. Yeah, I'm going to go along with that. I think you're right. Well, what do you expect to find at the trailer? I don't know. I want to look around a lot more than we did before. I shouldn't have waited this long. Didn't seem to be any reason for it with the case we had against Newcomb. Well, there's a reason now. We need a new case, and I got a hunch which way it's going to point. <laughs> We fine combed that trailer, and there's nothing we didn't see before. And the only strange car track you found on the road was Newcomb. Wait a minute, Sheriff. Somebody was sitting down here by the well. He leaned back against it and had his feet stretched out. You can see where the edges of his heels were resting on the ground. Yeah. Circle out around the back here. Let's do a little trail cutting. You figured the killer took off away from the road? If he was on foot, it'd be his best bet. If he went to the highway and walked, somebody might have seen him. He had blood on his clothes. He'd steer clear of town until it was late and everybody was sleeping. No, all right, Jace. Which way do you want me to go? Circle out that way. I'll work on this side. Okay. Hey, Jace. Yeah, Sheriff. Orville was on foot. I know he was. That's why we're looking. <laughs> We found the trail just as it was getting dark. It led me into open country. I got my horse charcoal from the trailer behind my car while the sheriff went to a nearby farm to borrow a mount. It was dark when he caught up to me. You still on the trail or are you cutting to pick it up? I lost it a couple of times further back, but I'm on it now. 
You know this country back here? Oh, I've ridden it before. You'll be coming to the Horner River soon, about a half mile farther. The river angles toward town, doesn't it? Sure does. Cuts under that bridge just outside Chain. That may be the way the killer followed to get back to town. Let's ride for the river bank and see if we can pick up tracks there. May save us time. Good idea. Big boy. Ah, come on, Sharky. We found tracks on the bank, all right. Just a few to left the edge of the water, and that was all. We cut back and forth on both banks for hours before we picked up a sign. We'd come out of the river on rock, and we barely spotted the place where he'd marked the ground again. That did all right, Geese. Same heel impression. He had us fooled for a while, all right. Now let's go. Come on, Sharky. Yeah, come on, boy. What's that up there ahead? Looks like a shack of some kind. I don't know, Geese. Quite a few shacks in here along the river. A lot of deer around. Some folks keep places for fishing and hunting. Well, his tracks lead right to it. Yeah. Get on, boy. Come on, Sharky. Yeah, he stopped here, all right. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Flash your light on that door. Yeah. yeah. Clock's been run. It's open. He was here, all right. Left his marks in the dust on the floor. I guess nobody's been using the place for quite a spell. Yeah. There's something else, too. Put locker here. Lock on it, busted, too. Hmm. Shirt some jeans in there. I'd like to bet there's one set missing. Orville or whoever it was stopped here to change clothes. He must have known the setup. There's a funny smell in here, Sheriff, like the place been smoked up not long ago. Something burning. Hot-bellied stove there. Yeah. Anything in it? Plenty. Clothes that didn't quite burn. Smells from kerosene he poured on him. But he came through the river so his pants were wet. Fire must have smoldered out after he left. Better pull those things out and see if we can save enough of them for identification. It's enough, all right. Look at this. Blood stain didn't even wash off when he came through the water. We prove who owns these things, and we've got our man. He the blood. The shirt was bundled up with a wet pants, just enough to save most of the collar and this. Laundry one. Let's get back to town. It was daybreak when we got back to change. We got what we were after on our third laundry stop. A half-burned shirt belonged to Orville James. We went to his home. His wife was at the funeral parlor with Mrs. Prager, so he was there alone. What you want from him now? Sheriff's got a few things rolled up in that poncho. I thought maybe you might be able to identify him. Who? Who they belong to? Joe and Luke. We want you to tell us. All right, Sheriff, unroll them. Recognize you? What's the matter, Orville? You look kind of sick. I'm just upset about Joe, that's all. I was at the funeral home and sat all night. Well, have you ever seen these things before? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen them. Whose are they? I could be wrong, I guess, but they look awful new. That's funny. Well, what's funny about it? Looks like they would burn quite a bit. Yeah, but they were too wet to burn all the way. Yes, that gives you a really tight case against the new now, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? A perfect case, except for the laundry mark on the shirt. Laundry mark? That's right, Orville. You're a laundry mark. It can't be a laundry mark. It can't be a laundry mark. Keep your hands off those things. You heard him, Orville. Let me go. Let me go. I... Oh, my arm. <laughs> Better hold still. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> my wife. My wife always hounding me for money. Always screaming about how hard she worked. Always yelling about it. How she was running her hands, shoving breezy work too. But she wasn't. She was sending them out. Laundry boxes. The lazy pig. I'll kill her. I'll kill her. You're not going to kill anybody, Orville. Your killing days are over. Open the door, will you, Sheriff? Sure. All right, Orville. In the car. Let's go. Orville James broke down at his trial and confessed the robbery slaying of his brother-in-law. 
He was found guilty in less than 20 minutes and sentenced to Huntsville for the rest of his natural life. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Paul Freese, Whitfield Connors, Sam Edwards, Farley Fair, and Barbara Luddy. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Times mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, the voice of Firestone presents Metropolitan Opera Basso Cesare Sieppi in a melodic variety of operatic selections. Your Monday evening of music also includes the telephone hour, and tomorrow's guest artist is the renowned coloratura soprano Lily Paul. Among this Paul's selections tomorrow is the beautiful aria from Rigoletto, Carlo Nome. Bill Baker asks the $64 question next on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson more than 260,000 square miles and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. afternoon of October 17th, 1926. Captain Clint Stinson of Texas Ranger Company B is seated in his office. Across the desk from him sits a woman sobbing bitterly. <laughs> they killed him, I tell you. They shot him down in cold blood the way they shoot a dog. Now, <laughs> oh, get a grip on yourself, Mrs. Wendell. Oh, help me. Please help me. Ed was a good man. Our baby's only seven months old. Now Ed is dead, and the man who killed him is walking the streets of Crescenta as though nothing happened. Crescenta? Yes, the name's County. That's where I came from. I see. <laughs> Some pretty funny things have been happening in Ames County. <laughs> who was the man who killed your husband? A man named Ray Paul. It happened four days ago. But he wasn't even arrested. The grand jury said that according to the evidence, he killed Ed in self-defense. Any witnesses testified to that? Yes, three of them. But they were lying. They were lying. My Ed never carried a gun in his life. Are you sure of that? A wife doesn't always know. I knew. Why can't you help me? What kind of a world am I living in? What kind of a world am I bringing my baby up in when his father could be killed without anybody even lifting a hand? <laughs> now, now, just take it easy. Mr. <laughs> Get me a sheriff fork at Crescenta in Eames County. Yes. What are you calling him for? I want to help you, Mrs. Wendell, if there's anything that calls for help. You won't get the truth from Sheriff Fort. You said yourself that funny things are happening in Eames County. Funny things are liable to happen in any county where there's a big oil strike. Drifters and floaters crowd in. You can't always condemn a sheriff for what happens. <laughs> you mean it's just too bad if a man gets murdered? I didn't say that, man. Yes. 
Hello. Hello, Captain Stinson. How are you? Fine, Sheriff. I'd like a little information. Sure thing. What about? A man named Ed Wendell, shot and killed in Presenta by a man called Ray Thorpe. Well, ain't much I can tell you, Captain. Thorpe killed Wendell in self-defense. Wendell's always been, well, sort of a hothead troublemaker. Started a fight with Thorpe and pulled a gun on him. Thorpe had to kill him to save his own eyes. I understand there were witnesses. There sure were three of them. Thanks, Sheriff. Just checking. Uh, what brought the case to your mind? Uh, do you have uh, some sort of a complaint? Wendell's wife thinks he was murdered in cold blood. Well, Cap, you know women. Can't believe anything wrong about the men, folks. That happens. Thanks, Sheriff. Anytime. Goodbye. Goodbye. You don't have to say anything. I know what he told you. Mrs. Wendell, I'm <laughs> sorry, but there's nothing much I can do. He left the house smiling, waving to the baby. And then he never came back. And he never wouldn't even let me see him again after he was killed. What's that? <laughs> Mrs. Wendell, are you telling me that you never saw your husband's body after he was dead? No, they wouldn't let me. They said it was a law because of the way he got killed. There's no law like that. Are you sure you're telling me the truth? Why would I lie to you? You never saw the body. No, I tell you, they buried him in the county cemetery. Do you know if an autopsy was performed? I don't know. I see. Mrs. Wendell, if I can get an order to have your husband's body exhumed, will you give your permission? Yes. Oh, they won't let you do it. They're not going to know it's being done. Yes, Captain. Put out a call for Jace Pearson. Tell him to report to me immediately. And bring Steve Clark in, too. Then get me headquarters at Austin. By late afternoon, Captain Stinson had a magistrate's authorization to exhume the body of Ed Wendell. Later the same night, Texas Rangers Jace Pearson and Steve Clark, accompanied by a medical examiner and Mrs. Wendell, were at the Ames County Cemetery, three miles from the county seat at Crescenta. It is almost clear, Jason. All right, Steve, hold it. Let's see if we can get the top off now. Want to flash that light down here, Doc? Oh, yeah, sure. Mrs. Mrs. Wendell. Mm-hmm. Maybe you better go wait in the car, ma'am. No, I'm all right. She'll have to identify the body anyhow, Jason. I guess you're right. All right, Steve, let's get the cover off. Right. Yeah, that's got it. Just lift it up over the edge of the hole. Yeah. Uh, but it's perfectly covered with a sheet. Yeah. We'll lift it out to you. I got this in. All right, lift. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I can get a hold now. Yeah, I'll help you. Uh, all right. That does it. Boost me, Jason. I'll pull you up. Right. Uh-huh. All right. Now grab my wrist. Got it. Hey, we'll have to replace the cover and shovel the grave in again. We can do that as soon as Mrs. Wendell identifies the body. I uh, hate to ask you like this, ma'am. It's all right. I know he's dead. Well, what's going to matter? Uh, Jace, you got a pocket knife. I have to slip your sheet. Yeah, here, Doc. Yeah. Ooh, well, Mrs. Wendell. what we're looking for. Yeah. This man was shot, all right. Shot in the back. The medical examiner took the body into the funeral parlor and Steve Clark took Mrs. Wendell home. It was after 2 a.m. What I had to do couldn't wait. I located the home of the county attorney, Lou Morrison, a ranch about 10 miles out of Crescenta. I got him out of bed. Oh, what's on your mind this time, Night Ranger? Official business. 
Yeah, seems to me you could have waited and come to the courthouse in town in the morning. A few men I'm after might be disappearing from town by morning. I had to wake you up. I need some warrants. Warrants? Somebody in Presenta? Yeah. The first one for a man named Ray Thorpe. On what charge? The murder of Ed Wendell. Thorpe killed Wendell in self-defense. He's already been exonerated by the grand jury. Look, Mr. Morrison, I've just come from the cemetery. We exhumed Wendell's body. That body can't be exhumed without an order? We had an order from a magistrate at the other end of the county. Wendell's body proves Thorpe couldn't have killed him in self-defense because Wendell was shot in the back. That's impossible. Did you see the body before he was buried? No. No, I didn't. But but there were witnesses. The witnesses lied. Mr. Morrison, I want a murder warrant for Ray Thorpe. All right, Ranger. You seem to have some evidence. I'll go into my office and write him up. Get Judge Padgy to sign it. Thanks. I don't have to dress. You, uh, said that you... You wanted several warrants. That's right. Three more beside Thorpe's. For who? For the witnesses who claimed that Thorpe shot in self-defense. On what charge? Well, that's a funny question from a county attorney. A charge of perjury before the grand jury. I got the warrants, but Morrison's attitude told me they weren't going to be easy to serve. I'd arranged to meet Steve Clark at an all-night cafe in Crescenta. He was waiting there. Get the warrants? Yeah. Hey, there's something funny about this town. It smells to high heaven. You say that again. There's more to this than just a murder. The county attorney didn't want to cooperate. And one of Thorpe's witnesses is a deputy sheriff. Yeah, it looks like the law is trying to cover Wendell's death. And I think I found out why. Yeah. Mrs. Wendell spilled it when I was taking her home. Said that her husband was planning on having some kind of a meeting at his house on the night of the day that he was killed. She say, what kind of a meeting? Yeah, it's about the county elections coming up next month. What about him? Uh, Sheriff Forge and County Attorney Morrison are both running for re-election, but nobody's running against him. Both unopposed candidates? Yeah, that's why Wendell called a meeting. He didn't like it. He was fixing to stir the town up for a writing vote. How come Mrs. Wendell didn't mention that before? I guess it didn't seem to have any connection with her husband getting killed before. You finished with your coffee? Yeah. Let's get those warrants served. This town's going to get awful hot. Thorpe works on a ranch out beyond the oil fields. I'll go out there and pick him up while you... Hit the ground, Steve. Where'd it come from? About a flash from the corner across the street. There's something moving in the shadows there. Eh? Let him have it. He's, he's mounted, Jake. He cut through the alley. The field's behind town. Can't get a shot at him now. Come on, let's get our horses out of the trailer. Right. Keep back, everybody. Keep, Keep back. back. Come on. Come on, Charky. Come on. Come on, Lord. So I just fired a little above and to the right of the flash. Wonder who he is. Find that out later. Better get his horse and we'll have to lead him back. Yeah. Easy, boy. Easy now. Come on, we'll fix where it is. Turn him a little, Steve. Let the moon hit this side of his saddle. Yeah. Around, boy. What do you see? A couple of letters burned into the leather. 
Yeah, it looked like initials. Hey, R.T. Yeah, R.T. I guess we can tear up that warrant for Ray Thorpe. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Conspiracy, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. It was sunup when we got back to the main street of Crescenta. The town was waking up for the day, and shopkeepers and morning crews headed for work in the oil fields followed us to the funeral home. I was unstrapping Thorpe's body from my saddle when Sheriff Porch came through the crowd. Let me through here. Let me through. Well, howdy, Rangers. Howdy. Hello, oh, Sheriff. I uh, see you got Thorpe, all right. About time somebody got him. Yeah, I know. County attorney told me what you found out. Could have knocked me over with a feather. Oh, bad. All right, Steve. Grab his feet. Let's carry him in. Right. Uh, I'll get the door for you. Put him down there. All right. Sure is heavy. Tried to fight it out, eh? Tried to ambush us, you mean. And somebody better explain how he knew we were after him. Reckon you can blame me for that, Ranger. What do you mean by that? County attorney called me right after Judge Padgett signed your warrants for you. I knew where Thorpe was hanging out when the hot spots outside the town. Thought I'd go out and pick him up for you. When I told him you was after me, he sort of caught me off the balance and bolted. Kind of convenient, Sheriff. Especially since you let him out once before. After he'd shot a man in the back. I didn't know that. I never looked at Wendell's body. I, well, I was home sick. My deputy handled the case. Same deputy that said Thorpe shot in self-defense? Yeah, same one, Joe Slade. I got a warrant for him, too. I know. That's why I got him locked up in the jail right now. Get mighty cooperative, sir. Well, Slade was right with me when I heard you wanted him. I know my job. I'm trying to help you. How about the other two witnesses Thorpe had? Rollo Kane and Arthur Sampson. I still got warrants for them. You'll find them out in the oil field, I reckon. They got two operating wells, and they're drilling a third. Just past the old stockade, north of town. You'll need horses. The road's too muddy for a car. I'll ride out with you. Thanks, but we can handle it. You need a rest. You've been working too hard. They're not drilling, Jace. They're just pulling the drill stem out of the hole. Yeah, probably jumped the pin on the bit. Funny thing, Kane and Samson being mixed up in this Wendell killing. You think a couple of oil men with producing wells would be on the side of the law? Come behind us. We haven't hit yet, Steve. Man with the tool sheds watching us. Oh, yeah. Doesn't seem to be doing much work. Maybe he's one of our boys. Won't take long to find out. People to ask him in a second. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh, boy. Howdy, Rangers. Howdy. Hello. I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Mind telling your crew to knock off? No, thanks. Hold it, boys. Cut fire. Now, what's on your mind? What's your name? Kane. Rollo Kane. Arthur Sampson around? That's him. Up on top of there, greasing the crown shield. What's the matter down there, Rollo? Tell him to come on down. All uh-huh. right. Rangers want you to come down. Uh, send a hook up for me. Uh, just a second. Look, what's this all about? I got warrants for you and your partner. Oh? What for? Perjury before the county grand jury. <laughs> <laughs> you must have the wrong names, Range. I, I never testified for a grand jury. Who are you trying to kid, mister? Records will show whether you did or not, so if you didn't, you've got nothing to worry about. Now get your partner down here. All right. All right, boys, send a hook up. Look, you uh, mind if I get my coat? It's right there in the two shape. Go ahead. I can watch you. All right, thanks. Get out, Jay! Oh. Cut that power! Hey, drive clamps go off the top of the derrick. Yeah, right where we were standing. Thanks for the push. Yeah. Hey, you you heard, Rangers? That come close to being a nasty accident. It came close to being nasty, but I don't think it was close to being an accident. What do you mean? You know what I mean, Kane. Pretty convenient time for you to step into that tool shed. Well, I'm just lucky, Rangers. Starting right now, your luck's running out. All right, Samson. You can climb down. Sorry that happened, Ranger. I just knocked it off, reaching for that hook. If anything else falls from that, Derek, you're going to come with it. Oh, come on now, climb down. All right, come down. 
No. Man can't be too careful if he wants to live, right? These oil fields can be dangerous. There's something else can be dangerous, too, Kane. Something you're going to find out about. Yeah? What's that? Breaking the law in the state of Texas. We herded Kane and Samson back to Presenta and marched them into the jail. All right, boys, step in. Go ahead now. I'll see you right to the cell. Uh, you know the law, Ranger. You've got to check your guns here in the office if you come inside the cell block here. Unbuckle them and hang them in the cab. All right. I want to talk to your deputy, Joe Slade, anyhow. Steve, you better take care of the horses. Right, well, I'll meet you. Well, we can eat at the cafe in about an hour. Okay, Chase, I'll see you later. Sheriff. Go on, Kane. Move. You too, Samson. All right. You know you're not going to keep us here long, Lance. We'll see. Your charge won't stand up. Into the tank with Slade. I was wondering when I was going to get company, Sheriff. I knew you wouldn't let your star deputy die alone. Shut up, Chief. Get out of the gateway and let these men in, Slade. Sure, Ranger. Sure. Come in, son. I want to talk to you, Slade. Why, sure. You're Jay Spearson, ain't you? You got a reputation for being pretty good at the gun. I'm still alive. Why did you lie to the grand jury? Me? You got the wrong boy, Ranger. Oh, it's my office phone. Are you going to give me the same story I got from your two pals? That's right, Ranger. Same stuff. Sure. Slade never appeared before the grand jury either. It's all your imagination, Ranger. If the three of you have one brain to go around, you'll tell the truth. You're not in here without evidence. The grand jury records are being subpoenaed. Listen to the man, fellas. He knows all about the law. You're in for a few surprises, Ranger. You big surprise. Seeing the three of you sent to Huntsville isn't going to be a surprise to me. Uh, Ranger. Yes, Sheriff. What? Got a gun, Sheriff. You're not supposed to bring a gun past the cell block gate either. It won't do no harm. You don't make me use it. You see, Ranger? Surprises, like I said. Back away from that cell gate, Ranger. All right. Now, you get in there with him. What's the idea? You're under arrest for order of the county attorney. For what? For the murder of Ray Thorpe. The sheriff was showing his colors openly now. He was part and parcel of all that was crooked in Ames County. I was dumped into a cell with three men who would gladly kill me if I gave them a chance. Don't stay off in the corner by yourself, Ranger. That's far enough, Slade. I'll keep in this side of the cell for myself. You don't come past the middle, any of you. Who's going to stop us? The sheriff is gone. Today. Yeah. Since I'm in here, thanks to you, there ain't nobody on you. I didn't come to this town alone, you know. If you're counting on help from that other ranger, don't get too happy about it. Probably somebody breathing down his neck right now, just like we're breathing down yours. Be too bad if you got to brooding about the way you killed Thorpe. Sheriff forgot to take your belt away, you might hang yourself. You got real broken up. Sure. I might even stab myself with this. He's got a knife. About the pocket knife. You think you're going to scare three of us with that? No, not three of you. But I'm figuring it's good enough to scare one of you, the one who comes at me first. You better get together and figure out which one of you it's going to be, because he's the one who's going to get killed before I do. I didn't dare sleep. I had to watch every move they made. There was no sign of Steve Clyde in the morning the sheriff came in. He took Kane, Samson, and Slade out for the arraignment before the judge. When he came back, he didn't bring them back with him. Here's some food for you. Stop playing, Sheriff. You know I'm not going to eat anything you give me. Eat yourself. You may be here a long time. Longer than most of your prisoners stay. What happened to him? If it's any of your business, Judge Padgett released him. No evidence. You call grand jury records no evidence? Seems like the grand jury records have been misplaced. I suppose the county attorney took care of that. This town's going to come down around your ears, Sheriff. You can't... What's that? Maybe what I've been expecting. What happened to Steve Clark? Well, how, how should I know? 
You mean you don't know whether your men got him or not? Well, you couldn't have gotten away. Watch your hurry, Sheriff. All right, now, keep your hands away from that gun cabinet, Garrett. Captain Spencer, Steve? I'm all right, Steve. Have you out in a minute, Chase. Take the keys, Steve. You can't let him out. He's not busy. We've got a rick for him. And to keep the record straight, Sheriff, you'll mind. Howdy, boy. Glad to see you, Steve. I was afraid you caught one in the back. Ah, uh, no, not quite. They tried to take me after I left here, but I got away on Longhorn and outrun them. Had to ride cross country most of the night to get to a phone. Let's go. We got a lot to clean up. Yeah. Captain's got a lot of information on what there is to clean up. Yeah, I sure have. Things that Porch could have told you, Jace. Porch is a rich man. Aren't you, Porch? Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about bank accounts all over the state. Big, fat accounts belonging to you and the county attorney Morrison and Judge Padgett. I've been checking on you for two days. You can't prove nothing wrong about that. Yes, we can, Sheriff. We just come from the courthouse. Your friends didn't have time to burn all the records. You're getting a little pale, Sheriff. You were just business, that's all. Nice business. You and others like you're forming a combine to rob the people of this county. We can convict you on 50 conspiracy counts, along with complicity in Wendell's murder. But killing Wendell wasn't my idea. Morrison ordered it when Wendell started to raise a fuss about the administration. That's all I wanted to hear. Jace, you and Steve go after Morrison. He's not in town. Must be at his ranch. What about the others? Well, we had a shooting match with Samson and Kane as we left the courthouse. They were making a run in the car. Some of our boys took him to the hospital for patching up. How about Joe Slade? No trace of him, but I got a hunch we'll find him with Morrison. Morrison's account shows Slade's on his payroll. Probably burning more papers out at the ranch. Let's go. <laughs> the county attorney Morrison's ranch, Steve Clark gave me the inside on a gigantic racket that had been working in Ames County. Yeah, Jace, Captain dug it all up. When the oil strike came, Morrison's crowd bought up county land at auction, but no auctions were actually held. Of course, Morrison and his pals didn't take the land in their own names. They turned it over to men like Kane and Samson, strong arm boys who would give them a kickback. But there uh, must have been some of the townsmen knowing what was going on. Uh, sure they did, but they were scared stiff. Didn't always take force to do it either. How can you fight a crook when he's in control of the law you have to fight him with? A couple of men who wanted to run for office were beaten out of the idea. That's why Morrison and Porch had no opposition. There's Morrison's ranch up ahead. Yeah, I see it. Hey, Jace, look. There's a car coming down the ranch road. Well, they're raising dust, too. Step on it. Block them off the intersection before they get on this highway. We'll beat them to it, all right. Hey, they spotted us. The car is turning. And we're almost the ranch road. Keep low. You get cut, Jace? No. Get their tires when I turn in after them. Yeah. Good shot. Any turn, turtle. Oh. Out. Look out, Steve. That slave breaking for the trees. I'll get him. You big horse and out of the wreck. Right. You miss, Slade. I won't miss again. You're gonna have to step out and take better aim than that. I got more, Steve. You're up, Slade. We'll leave. You better listen to him, Slade. Oh, all right, Ranger. You have to be crazy to shoot it out. I'm coming. I'm dropping my gun. Both hands up. Get that arm from behind your back. Damn. I hurt my arm and my back when the car turned. Watch him, Jake. Oh! Come on, boys. Uh, still had one rattlesnake trick left, didn't he? Yeah. His last one. Send somebody out for his body. All right, Morrison, let's get back to town. My company should have all your friends rounded up by now, including that phony grand jury you stacked. You won't keep us long. I wouldn't bet on that, Morrison. You won't be handling the prosecution this time, and the judge won't be one of your partners. Get moving, mister. You've got a long way to go. The conspiracy was smashed and 12 key men were convicted and sentenced to jail terms ranging from 10 to 50 years. Since then, Ames County has become a model American community. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Texans are mighty proud of their state, and the story that best illustrates that pride has made the rounds for many years. 
was started by an old Texas ranger whose son was going off to war. Parting, the ranger gave him this advice. Son, you're going to be with fellas from all over the world. There's one thing you must never do. Never ask a man where he's from. If he's from Texas, he'll tell you. And if he isn't, don't embarrass him by asking. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lillian Bias, Herb Ellis, Ken Christie, Byron Kane, Tom McKee, Lamont Johnson, and Herb Migrant. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Al Gibney speaks. Good times on NBC. Tomorrow evening, Gordon McRae sings for you as the Railroad Hour presents a melodic adaptation of One Touch of Venus. Gordon's guest for tomorrow's Railroad Hour production is Ginny Sim. The Telephone Hour tomorrow brings you celebrated contralto Marian Anderson as featured artist. Miss Anderson will offer a group of spirituals and operatic selections accompanied by Donald Voorhees and the orchestra. Bill Baker asks the $64 question next on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, 10 death. It is 1.15 a.m., January 26, 1940. Bob Farragut, a rancher, comes awake slowly. As his eyes open, a wave of nausea sweeps over him, and he breaks into a cold sweat. He throws back the covers, staggers to his feet, noticing that his wife has left her place beside him. May? May? Where are you? May? What's the matter? Why are you out of bed? Bob, are you... Yeah, I feel kind of funny myself. I was just putting some water on my face. What's the matter with me? You're as white as a sheet. You better get back and lie down. <laughs> funny, I can hardly stand my feet without holding on to something. You're all perspired. Oh, Bob, what should it be? I don't know. Must be all coming down with the flu or something. Kids acted kind of funny before they went to bed. I was up with them about 11 o'clock. They were concerned about stomach aches. Wait. We better go have a look at them. If they feel like we do, I'm going to call the doc. Are they, they seem to be all right now. Both sleeping. Better close the window. My pee's dead. Janet's got it. Covers kicked off. I'll put a quilt over it. We better get back to bed ourselves. Have Doc out in the morning. Oh, 
Texas Ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Everything in this medicine cabinet seems to be innocent enough, Jace. Your deputy checked the garbage cans and refuse bin. Yeah, no empty bottle of any kind. Just a few cans, vegetable peel, and stuff like that. We need some wrapping to pack these bottles in so they can be flown to the lab for examination. Go to find what you need downstairs. Yes, I've been in office nine years. And this is the dirtiest killing I've ever had. I'm pretty sure this wasn't an accident. Not with kids being affected. Surrogates are mighty careful people. Car pulling up out Yeah, it must be the dog with the autopsy report. Oh, Sid Max. Surrogate's partner in this ring. Who did it, Sheriff? Sid, if I knew that, I wouldn't be standing here. We gotta do something about this. I don't want anybody getting away with it. You can post a $5,000 reward for the killer in my name. Make it ten. Make it anything I've got. Easy, easy, Sid. I don't know how you feel. The hey, sheriff tells me you own half this place. That's right, Ranger. How come you haven't been out here in a couple of days? Well, I don't live on the place. It was just an investment to me. I got a hardware store in town. Live in there. I see. You know anybody who was packing a grudge against the Farragut's? Against Bob and me and those kids? It's like a madman to want to hurt them. Oh, Jace, that's dark start coming out. Yeah. Well, why does everything take so long? Everybody's standing around waiting instead of doing something. There's no point in doing anything until you know what you're doing. Doc tells us what killed the Farragut's, and we'll have something to trace. No, oh, I'm sorry, Ranger. All right, Mr. Mack. Howdy. Howdy, Doc. You know Sid. This is Ranger Pierce. Hello, Sid. Hello. Hey, Ranger. Yeah, the results of the autopsies are kind of surprising, Sheriff. Death in all four cases is accidental. Accidental. No doubt about it. Deaths were caused by botulism. What's that? It's the result of improper home canning. Stomach content showed the Farragut's had made their last meal on green beans, potatoes, and canned sausage. There's nothing in that to kill them. Yes, there is, Mr. Mack. The doc's right. Canning meat at home is tricky business, Sid. Should be done under steam pressure at high temperature. If it isn't, uh, bacteria forms and it's plenty deadly. You sure that's what killed them, Doc? Bacteria was unmistakable, Sheriff. It was the sausage meat. Nothing else. I uh, guess we should be thankful in a way. It's nice to know it wasn't murder. Dead. Just from sitting down to a meal. And they're all dead. Well, yeah, Jace, looks like I brought you down here for nothing. I don't know, Sheriff. Looks like we've got a real job on our hands anyhow. What do you mean, Ranger? The Sheriff and I have fine combed the house. There's nothing in there that's home canned and no equipment for home canning. Yeah, that's right. All we did find was one cannon jar on the kitchen green board. Must have been washed out along with the dishes from the last meal ate. Are you sure of that? Wasn't even a steam boiler big enough for home canning. A woman doesn't just put up one jar. She cans in batches, and the whole batch might be contaminated. Women do pass out samples of their home cannon to neighbors and friends. That jar must have been a gift. Quite a gift. Like a stick of dynamite with a lighted fuse. Somebody around here must have a pantry full of poison, and they don't know it. You mean what happened to the Farragut's could happen to somebody else? It will happen to somebody else if we don't find out where that sausage meat came from and fast. 
Sheriff, you better get all your deputies and a bunch of volunteers out here right away. We need them to make direct contact with anybody in the area who can't be reached by phone. We've got to warn anybody that may have given the Farragut that sausage meat. I'll call them right away. Now, ask the phone company to put on a staff and make calls to every listing. Right, Jim? Is there anything I can do, Ranger? You get your car. You can take an area when the sheriff and I map it out. I can help you there. I'd rather use you in another way if you don't mind, Doc. Drive into town, go to the newspaper and the local radio station, ask them to get out a warning. Right. Do you want me to come back, Ranger? No, you better stand by in town and pray that we don't bring in another case for the hospital or the morgue. <laughs> Five days and nights, we covered the territory, the shacks and farms and ranch houses without phones, and then doubled back on the phone listings that hadn't answered, running down the whereabouts of people away on business trips or vacations if you couldn't locate the source of the contaminated meat. If only somebody would come forward and admit that they can't discover Farragut's aid, we'd know we were safe. Uh, they may be afraid of being held responsible for the death. Uh, it is something to wonder about. Yeah, we almost back to my office. Maybe one of the other men has left a report. What time is it? Almost midnight. Yeah, here we are. Oh, howdy. Oh, howdy. He's got a team. That's right. This is Ranger Pearson. Hello. What can I do for you? My name is Burton. I just came down from Dallas. I'm an investigator for the Midland and Frontier Insurance Company. We understand that you're still investigating the death of the Paris back. Well, we're trying to find the source of the stuff that killed him. Is that what you mean? This isn't a criminal investigation? No. Deaths were accidental. What's your interest, Mr. Burton? Well, Ranger, it is unusual for the entire family to be killed, except for a highway accident or a fire, some natural calamity. And the targets were all heavily insured by my company. I'm just making a routine checkup before we pay the beneficiary's claim was thirty thousand dollars. Thirty thousand dollars? You say your company insured all the parents? That's right. Ten thousand dollars each on Farragut and his wife, five thousand each on the children. All the Farragut's are dead, though. Who is the beneficiary? Mr. Farragut's partner, Sid Mack. Sid Mack? How long ago were those policies written? Uh, a little over a year ago. And the partnership was closed. That's the main reason my company wanted to make certain about your investigation. It's a matter of routine for partners to insure each other, but... But this involved Farragut's whole family. Yes. However, since there's no criminal investigation, you'll have to honor Mr. Mack's claim. But thanks for your time, sir. Uh, just a second, Mr. Burton. Yes? If I were you, I wouldn't recommend payment of that claim just yet. But the sheriff just said that there's no criminal investigation. There wasn't a minute ago, but there is now. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Chase Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Can Death, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Sheriff Kingman got a search warrant for Sid Mack's house. Mack had already left for the hardware store, but we were admitted by his hired girl. She was young and frightened. She watched us in silence as we started our search and then disappeared. Nothing in here, Jase. Mm, nothing in the pantry either. Let's try the attic. Mm. That girl scooted mighty quick, didn't she? She probably told Mack what we're doing by now. She kept her here until we were through. Well, doesn't make any difference. He'd know sooner or later. And if anything's here, he won't be able to stop us from finding it. Next door here. We're not going to find anything, Jase. If there was more of that contaminated food, he'd be stupid to have it around. And if he did kill the Farragut, he's not stupid. Oh, this whole job is too clever. No job is perfect. There's always a slip someplace. Let's move those crates. Okay. Uh, nothing in these things, Jase. Better look in those barrels, too. Yeah. Hey, hold it. Somebody's coming upstairs. Mac, you reckon? You're the ranger up there, Sheriff? That's right, Mac. What's the idea? We're just having a look around, Mac. We've got a search warrant. Maybe you're going to need more than a search warrant. I had a call from an insurance man named Burton this morning. We had a call from him last night. That's why we're here. I've got a legitimate insurance claim, but you've stopped it from being paid. It'll be paid in due time, if it should be paid. 
Is that so, Andrew? Well, let me tell you something. I think the way you stopped that claim constitutes slander. Do you think of any reason why I shouldn't slap a lawsuit on the two of you? No, man. Not any more than I can think of a reason why you insured Farragut's wife and two kids. Then maybe I'll give you the reason, Sheriff. Farragut knew I had them all insured. You can't insure somebody without them knowing it. The company will tell you that. Farragut was my friend. You understand that? My friend. Sure, I insured his wife. If he'd lost her and been left to the two kids, he'd need somebody to take care of him. And that cost money. Farragut could have insured her himself. So I did it for him. I've lost his kids. I don't have any, and they were like my own. The policies I had on them weren't just life insurance policies. They were endowment policies, too, to pay for the education. Now, what's wrong about that, Sheriff? Nothing wrong, man. If what you're saying is true... Ask the insurance man. Ask him. Out of the ranch before we found out what killed the Farragut. And we thought they'd been murdered. I offered to put up everything I have as a reward, didn't I? But didn't I? Yes, ma'am, we did. I'm glad you mentioned that, Mac, because it brought something to my mind. Something that's been trying to register. And you just brought it out. What do you mean? How long have you been in the hardware business? Eleven years. Why? Because when Doc told us the Farragut died from food poisoning, from food that wasn't canned properly, he had to draw you a blueprint. You didn't seem to know anything about it. I don't know anything about it. No? Don't you sell canning equipment at the hardware store? Well, we can go over to the store and have a look, Mac. All right. So I sell canning equipment. Any hardware store does. What does that prove? Companies that make canning equipment usually put out instruction booklets, too, telling how the equipment should be used. And those booklets contain a warning about the possibility of food poisoning. Maybe they do. I never read one of them. Get me, Mac. A man who's been handling a line for 11 years has to know the answers when customers ask about the stuff he's selling. If he doesn't, he doesn't last 11 years in the business. You're covering up, Mac. That doesn't look good. So, it doesn't look good. All right, Sheriff. What are you going to do about it? Arrest me for telling a lie? Don't be smart, Mac. I don't even know why I'm bothering to talk to you. You got your warrant. Go ahead and search. But you're not going to find anything here. No canning equipment and no canned sausage meat. Go ahead. Search your heart out. <laughs> something about those desks, Jase. Radically told us so, right to our face. I know. You can't prove anything. Yeah, he could have brought cannon equipment home from the store. Could have taken it any place. Then ditched it when he was finished. He'd need more than just the equipment, Sheriff. What? Hog meat? Might have bought a hog. I had one butchered at some farm around here. But, which one? We checked every house in the territory once, warning them about the meat. I reckon we'd have to check them again from a different angle. Be a job. Some folks off in the backwoods keep a hog or two. We'll check them all. I'm towing a double horse trailer. We can load your mount in with charcoal in case we need them for the woods or hill country. Matter of fact, places off the beaten trail might be our best bet. I know it's going to be done, Jase, but even if we find a place, can't jail them for buying hog meat. Just the same, it's our next step. And it might be the step that starts Mac on his way to a cell. <laughs> It was work, grim, routine, discouraging work. A game of questions and answers without ever getting the right answer. In three days, we checked all the spots that could be reached by car, and we switched to the horses and rode into the backwoods. These backwoods people are kind of tight mouth, Jay. Yeah, so I've noticed. I guess they figure the world doesn't want to share the trouble, so they hold up back here. You see what I mean, next place we come to, Crazy Annie. Crazy Annie? That's what they call her. She isn't really crazy, just kind of strange. Has a son, feeble-minded. They had him at the state asylum for a while, but he was harmless, so they let him go. The old lady came into the woods with him, and, well, they've been here ever since. They got hogs? Yeah, hogs, a couple of chickens. That's about all they have got. Oh, yeah, they've got one other thing. The meanest dog in the state of Texas. Keep your eye open for him when we ride up. Don't they keep him tied? Yeah, yeah, but he chews loose. Hates everybody but the old lady and her son. Mace is just through this plum tree. Hey, hold it, Sheriff. Ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh, man. Look at that. Found the earth covered with rocks and a cross sticking up at the head. Looks like a 
grave. Uh, reckon Luke did that, old Annie's son. Always burying dead birds and things. Gives them all a first-class funeral. Oh. Get up. Oh, come on, boy. Uh, there's Luke now. Luke! You scared him. He took off of the woods like a jackrabbit. Yeah. You never know how he's going to act. I don't see any dog any place. No. First time I come here that he hasn't tried to sample my pants. Oh, there's the old lady coming out of the shack now. Yeah, I see her. Oh, hold on. Oh, Sarkis. Howdy, Annie. You frightened my Luke. Why do you come to frighten him? We don't mean him any harm, ma'am. We just came to see you. Where's your dog, Annie? I don't want him sneaking up on me. The devil came for him. He's dead. And Luke cries for him. He's afraid in the night without the dog. Maybe you're just as well off, Annie. That hound might have turned on you sometime. How are the hogs coming? See, the sow has a new litter. The sucklings ought to make good candy. Uh, maybe you got some canned meat that I could buy. I ain't got nothing canned. Not until the butcher. That's true, Jace. Ford checked the shells when we were warning everybody. I see. You ever give any canned sausage meat to the farragats? I never give them nothing. Why are people always asking me that? You know the Farragut's are dead, don't you, Annie? Yeah. You never gave anything to the Farragut's. Did you ever give or sell any canned sausage to Sid Mack? Or any hog meat, or even a live hog? Well, did you, Annie? You've got a right to sell what you own. I don't know the man you talk about. Now, don't lie to us, Annie. We're friends. You know that, don't you? I never sold him nothing. I never did. He never come up here. All right, Annie. Want to ride on, Jace? No sense trying to catch Luke when he's scary like he is today. He can't even talk. Yeah, let's go. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye, Ann. Up, Shark. Up, boy. Of course, it's hard to tell with anybody like that, Jace, but she seemed to tighten up when you mentioned Sid Mack. She did. And started to work nerves. And the boy Luke ran when he saw me. Of course, he's done that before. If they can give us any information, it isn't going to be easy to get. I got an idea. Maybe a wrong one, but it's worth a shot. Let's turn back for town. Come on, Charlie. Come on, boy. Come on. You gonna tackle Mac again? No. I want to see the doctor. Well, there's a complete chapter on botulism in this book, Jace. Now, what was it you wanted to know? This food poisoning from improper canning, Doc, does it always happen? I mean, if the batch wasn't cooked the proper length of time, or if it wasn't sealed under the proper steam pressure, would it necessarily be poisoned? No, not necessarily. It could be all right. I just wanted to make sure. Well, what's your point, Jay? If Max put up that contaminated meat, he'd have no way of knowing it was bad without testing it. So since he wouldn't test it on himself, he wouldn't test it on anybody else either. There'd have been another death or somebody sick enough for Doc to know about. Mac wouldn't have gambled on the Farragut's just getting sick. He wouldn't have even gotten the food to him unless he was sure it was deadly. Well, he could have tested it on an animal. Would an animal eat that food, Doc? Well, the meat would seem all right by taste or smell. Yes. Yes, an animal would eat it. That's all I wanted to know, Doc. Sheriff, we're going for another ride in the woods. I think I know what for. Shouldn't take two guesses. We're going to dig up Luke's dog and send it to the lab at Austin. I want to know what that dog died from. <laughs> Deputy Ford with us to stay on guard and keep old Annie and Luke from leaving their shack. He dug up the dog and sent it to Austin. The answer fit. Death by food poisoning. The sheriff and I rode back to the shack in the woods. Old Annie was white and shaking and her son huddled in a corner. His eyes enormous and frightened, his lips numb. Annie, believe me, nobody's gonna hurt you or Luke. But you've got to help her. You had no reason to harm the Farragut's, we know that. But we're after the man who did have a reason. I don't know. I don't know. All you have to do is tell us. Was Mac here? Did you sell him anything? Or can anything under his direction? Oh, I guess it's no use, Jay. Yeah, he's surprised when you get to town. Any you and Luke will have to come with us. We're taking you in. I don't want to come back. Luke. Luke, listen to me. We're only taking you into town. 
I wouldn't have to do that if you or your mother danced in the question. This is a lion's voice. They want to take me back there. Mr. Max says they'll take me back. Max? Wait a minute, Sheriff. Where did Mr. Max say they were going to take you to? You know where the police went and took me before. I won't let him. Yes, I think he means your sound. What he does mean. The key to why he won't talk. Wait, I got a hunch. Luke, Mac isn't a good man. He killed your dog. Well, he did, didn't he? No. Hugo was giving me stuff to feed him. Luke sold us. He tried. You're getting to him, Luke. We don't want to send you away, Luke. Mac lied. He's the one. He wants to send you away. No. He tried to help me. He told me he was trying to help me send back to him. It was Mr. Farrell that asked me. Don't tell him, Luke. Don't say any more. You better let him talk, Annie. Because if Mac didn't kill the Farragut, then Luke did. He didn't. He didn't mean to. He didn't know what he was doing. Mr. Mac said I should be nice to Mr. Farragut and his wife. Then they wouldn't send me away. What do you mean by telling you to be nice? He said I should go and bring him a present. He gave me the present to bring. Something nice for him to eat. Something in a jar? Something canned? Yeah. Same kind of stuff he always kept giving me to feed my dog. And my dog died, and Mr. Farragut and his lady, the little baby, they died too. I know. With Luke's background and with a smart defense attorney in court scaring him and confusing him, Luke's story wouldn't hold up. Mac could get away with it. But what else can we do? We've got to find the rest of that food and food that passed through Mac's hand. He had a batch of it. Kept feeding the dog samples until he found a jar that was deadly. Annie, your boy's in trouble. You know that, don't you? Leave him alone. How much of that stuff did Mac bring up here? A lot. He kept it hid someplace in the woods, except in what he fed the dog. He didn't tell us why. And after the dog died, that's when he got the jar from his hiding place for Luke to take to the Farragut, wasn't it? Luke never knew what killed the dog till after. No. <laughs> Mr. Farragut, you thanked me. He gave me half a dollar. And the lady, she smiled at me. It was pretty. Luke, do you know where Mac hid that food? Did you see him digging any place? Did you follow him? I, I never know where he kept it. He always went over the hill, way over where it's all rocks. That rock formation across the gully, Jase, about a mile from here. Think he left the stuff there? Yeah, it wouldn't be safe for him to cart around. He had to leave it someplace. Come on. We're going to need more men, Sheriff. They have an all-night digging party. Warren! Gotcha. Get water in the hall. Well, how about your Toronto and head for the nearest ranch? Get on the phone and call for deputies. Tell them to bring shovels and keep their mouths shut about where they're going. I want them up here right away. We dug by flashlight and torchlight. Finally, we found it. A burlap sack loaded with jars of sausage meat. And death. We rushed back to town, and just after dawn, a fingerprint crew flew in from Austin. I held my breath. All we needed was a print. One fingerprint belonging to Sid Mac. We got it. More than one. There were sets on every jar. By that time, his store was open and we went for him. Well, Sheriff and the Ranger, what uh, bright ideas have you got this time? You got an idea? We're going to lock you up, Mac. You can drop that smile, Mac. Luke was just as scared of us as he was of you. We know the whole story. Well, guess fellas with your mentality might believe Luke, but a jury won't. You know what the law says about the reasonable doubt? We also found a few buried samples of your cannon, Mac, with your fingerprints all over the jars. Just yours. So? Like you once said, I sell cannon equipment. I handle the stuff I sell. So my prints were on the jars. Smart, isn't it, sir? Regular genius. Thanks. Sorry I can't return the compliment. You're just like all the smart ones, Mac. You just made one mistake. It was a real stupid one. About those prints. You had to put them on the jars after they were filled, when the canning was completed. Any prints that were on before would have been boiled off. Don't go back for him, Mac. Don't make me put a bullet in. But heaven knows, Mac, I'm guilty. Wait a minute, Sheriff. I'm not resisting. I'm not touching anything. 
Alright. Better lock the door, Mac. You won't be coming back. premeditated murder, and on April 19th, 1941, he died in the electric chair. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Paul Freeze, Virginia Gregg, Will Wright, Jen Christie, Joe Forte, Edmund McDonald, and Don Diamond. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcock, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Gordon McRae sings for you tomorrow evening as the Railroad Hour presents a melodic adaptation of the dramatic opera Madame Butterfly. Gordon's guest for this Railroad Hour presentation is lovely soprano Nadine Connor. And your Monday of music tomorrow also includes a concert by the voice of Firestone with guest artist Eugene Conley. Bill Baker asks the $64 question next on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, no living witnesses. It is 11.30 a.m. on Monday morning in November 1939. Sheriff Ross Petsby turns his car into a quiet residential street of Hoppers Landing, Texas. Seated in the car with him is Mrs. Blackbird, a medical assistant. She becomes increasingly nervous as they approach a sign marking the home of Dr. Walter Hamilton. Now, don't go getting up, Miss Blackburn. There could be a hundred reasons for the doctor to be missing. Not Doc Hamilton, you know it. It ain't like him to just disappear. No sign of him since Saturday night. Wasn't at church yesterday, and he ain't at his house this morning. Always oh, there for visiting hours at 9.30. So he's probably out on a house call. Maybe over to the hospital at Rig Hill. If he was, the phone operators know about it. Besides, his car still in the garage. Well, here's the house. Better get out of the car and see who can't read. That's what I've been trying to do all morning. Sure he wasn't at church yesterday? Of course I'm sure. He always gave me a ride home to my place, and I'd always make Sunday breakfast for him before he'd start on his house call. You don't work for a man for ten years without learning his habits, especially a doctor. Well, he's got to be around someplace. Doc! Hello, Doc! Doc! Doc, damn it! You have a key, Miss Blackburn? Never needed one before. Front door of the waiting room's always been open except at night. Of course, he could have driven off with somebody, but... Well, I don't know. 
If he's here, why doesn't he answer? Well, even doctors get sick. And Doc Hammond's no young tree. He might have had a stroke. Oh. What are you going to do, Sheriff? we got to get inside. I got no legal right to bust in without a warrant. But that'll take time, and maybe this can't wait. Why don't you just go in, then? Doc knows you. He'd understand. If he doesn't understand, I reckon you'll just have to sue me for a broken window. I'll knock this one in with my gun, then I'll climb in and let you in through the door. Well, hurry. Better go through the rest of the house. Kitchen's clear. You can see out back through the windows. There's nothing there either. Here, if I'm, I'm frightened. The sliding door to his office was closed when we come into the waiting room. Better have a look at that office. He isn't in here. I don't know. Oh, oh Sheriff! Stay back in the back man. Oh, don't you hear me? Dressed in a robe and pajamas. Must have had a heart attack. Come in here to get something for it and... Wait a minute. What is it? Only his robe. It looks like blood. His blood. From a bullet wound. He's been murdered. <laughs> Betsby made an immediate request for the aid of a Texas Ranger. Ranger Jason Pearson was assigned. He joined the sheriff at the home of Dr. Hemmett shortly after 1 p.m. Jason? Yeah, this is Miss Blackburn. She was Doc's helper. Yeah, this is Ranger Pearson, Miss Blackburn. Howdy. Howdy, ma'am. I asked Miss Blackburn to stay until you got here. I reckon she knows more about Doc than anybody. I gather you didn't live here in the house, ma'am. No. I have my own place. I don't know just what I'd like to ask you yet until I look around. Would you mind waiting a little longer? Stay as long as you need me. Thanks, ma'am. There's the body, Sheriff. In the office. Through that sliding door. I've been keeping it closed off. Nobody's been in here but me and one deputy. He just took a couple of pictures. Good. Medical examiner been here yet? No, but he'll be along soon. He's driving down from Hesterville. Along the sides of Doc's temple here. Booze about two inches long. It's pretty heavy blow. It's like he might have been knocked out with a gun barrel. That's easy. Because he wasn't standing up when he was shot. He was lying here on the floor. Oh, makes you think so. Bullet went right through the chest and buried him in the floor under him. I moved him a little and I dug the slug out. Here. 45. Yeah. There's something funny about this, though. Quite a bit of blood on this examination table, almost six feet away from the body. Yeah, I was wondered about that myself. The instrument tray and surgical dressings pulled up beside the table. There's a couple of hypodermic needles that look like they've been used. Well, Gage, Doc couldn't have been trying to treat his own wound. He, he never moved after we shot or that slug wouldn't have been in the floor right under. Of course, he, he he might have staggered around before he was shot, after he got hit on the head. That still wouldn't account for the blood on this table. There was no bleeding from the mark on his head. That means the blood on the table comes from somebody else. Medical examiner can type it for us later. I want to see Mrs. Blackburn for a minute. We can use some help from you now, Miss Blackburn. I'll tell you anything I can. Mrs. Blackburn, was it part of your job to clean the doctor's office? Yes. Every day after his final visiting hours. According to the sign outside, his evening hours were from 5 to 7 p.m. That's right. You clean the place after 7 p.m. Saturday night? Yes. What time did you leave? Well, yeah. Doctor had a few calls to make at the visiting house. House calls. I waited until he got back and fixed his dinner for him. But he was late when I left. After ten o'clock. Mm-hmm. Look through the door of the examination room for a minute. Mm-hmm. Is that surgical tray usually in that position? I mean, did you leave it like that Saturday night? No. Everything was put away in the cabinet. How about the examination table? Was that off Saturday night? Yes. 
Was the doctor expecting any patients after you left, late? No, no, he said he was going right to bed. He must have gone too, Jay. The bed had been slept in. He can see what he was wearing. <laughs> I think it would be all right for you to go home now, ma'am. If I need any more information, we can reach you there. Uh, tell the deputy outside that I said to drive you home. Right. I just do him walk. Yes, well, thanks for helping, Miss Blackburn. Well, that settles one thing, Jace. Doc had an unexpected patient late Saturday night. Somebody who routed him out of bed and killed him. But why? I got an idea it was to keep the doc from calling you. Keep him from calling me? What do you mean? Whoever came here was hurt, bleeding. So it wasn't a planned person. Not somebody who came here deliberately to kill the doc. Doc was killed to keep him from talking about the visit. Oh, Doc, we should never talk about a patient visit. In one case, where the law would require it, he'd have to report that he treated anybody for a bullet wound. That's right, sir. That could be me. That probe on the entrance tray has blood on it. And that's just what a doc had used to dig out a bullet. I know. Had a few dug out myself. Let's form this examination room again. What are you looking for? If we're right, the slug doc him a dug out of his patient. We found it, wrapped in a piece of blood-stained gauze in one of the trash containers. There was something else in the container, too, part of a faded blue denim shirt that had been used to bind the wound. It must have been a bad wound, Jace. That denim was soaked. Yeah, take a look at this slug. Looks like a slug from a savage 303. The doc was killed by 45. That's natural. The man who came here wounded was shot someplace else by somebody else. Wouldn't be the same gun. But I worry after must have been in a gunfight then. That's the way it shakes up. With all that blood, he couldn't have come far. Couldn't have waited too long to get to a doctor. And the chances are he wasn't alone. Somebody must have been helping him. Oh, they could have just left Doc knocked out, trussed him up and gotten away. Why'd they have to kill him? I can't answer that one. When the medical examiner gives us the wounded man's blood type, I'm going to send him to the slug who's got through the hospital for a ballistic check. Get a rundown on every police report involving gunplay that took place anywhere within 100 miles of here on Saturday night. The medical examiner came and after a quick check gave us the blood type of the man we were after. I arranged for the two slugs we had to be sent through to Austin at the same time phoned for a complete report on all shooting incidents that had occurred on Saturday night. And the sheriff and I started the drive to his office. This looks like a tough one to me, Jace. We got a blood type to check for, but I reckon a million people in Texas have type O blood. Yeah, but not all of them are going to have a recent bullet wound they can't account for. You're right. If you find one who's been wounded. But for all we know, the man Doc Peter might have got himself caught by accident. If he did, he wouldn't have killed the doc to keep him from reporting it. I guess you got me hogtied on that point, Jace. But all the same, I don't know. Hold it a minute, Sheriff. ADXA to Unit 10. For me. Unit 10 to KTSA. Go ahead. Have info you requested on cases involving firearms. None reported in your general vicinity for Saturday night. 10 4. There is possible lead, though, Unit 10. What is it? Body of man killed by gunfire discovered a few hours ago on slope of Thunder Ridge, Roebling County. About 70 miles west of your present location. Time of death not yet determined. Waiting report of medical examiner. 10 4. Another unit assigned to that case? This unit proceeding to join Unit 3 to explore possibility of link between two killings. And four, best approach to scene is west slope of Thunder Ridge. We'll have to leave car, go in mountain. Then four. Unit 3 making contact by field set. We'll notify Unit 3 if you're coming. Then four, Unit 10, clear. ADXA Austin. You think that might hook up with us, Jay? The only thing that's turned up. Now the Ranger unit there, Unit 3, that's Steve Clark. We can work it together. Suppose I leave you on deck here to cover anything that turns up. Please, please, just drop in my office. Even if this fellow you're going to see was killed on Saturday night, Jake, it could still be a coincidence. I know. But it'll stop being a coincidence if he was killed by the same 45 that was used to murder Doc Nimmitt. <laughs> the sheriff off, then headed for Thunder Ridge. I got to the base, I unloaded charcoal from my horse trailer and started to climb. The sun was sinking as I started up the slope and darkness came fast. We spotted torches moving like fireflies. I rode for them. Easy, easy, charcoal. Watch your foot and go. 
Hello there. Hello. That you, Steve? Yeah. Right. Coming up to you. Howdy, Steve. Howdy, Jace. Mm. Got a walkie-talkie message. You were coming. Didn't come down the road to meet you because we wanted to get the body out of here. Medical examiner can't do much till we get it into town. Where is the body? Back down a patch wheel with the sheriff's deputies. I'm leading the way down. Yeah, might as well get moving then. I'll ride with you. Right. All right, we're gonna move again. Follow this gully all the way down and watch your step. Come on. Come on, Sharky. Any line on how long he's been dead? Not for sure. But I think it's gonna fit in with what you're looking for. What I can judge, he was killed Saturday night. Got anything to back that up? Yeah, the man's a cowpoke. Works on that ranch at the base of the ridge. He rode up here Saturday night to see some Mexican gal he's been caught. But he never did get back to the ranch after he left the shack. I wonder why anybody traveled all the way up here to kill him. He was ambushed on the way back to the ranch. It's been just as easy for the killer to wait until he hit the flat down by the ranch. Funny you should say that. Why? Because he was shot down on the flat. How'd his body get up here? And near as I can figure, he started to ride back up to get help. He wasn't killed right off, fell out of the saddle, and died where it fell. Seems to me he'd have ridden on to the ranch for help. And the ranch house is 11 miles off. It's back up this way, it was only one mile. In case I'll be able to show you the whole thing when we get down. I'll follow these tracks both ways. Say, you, you leave your car near mine? Yeah. Well, the shooting took place not far from where we're parked. There was a break in the fence there and the marks of the truck they weren't deep enough to make a cast of them. You mean whoever gunned him had a truck down there? Yeah, that's right, Jay. We say there are cattle tracks all over the place, too. Uh, that might mean he surprised somebody who was trying to run some stock off the place. Yeah, not only trying, but succeeding. A few white faces that were grazing in that section can't be located. Did he fit in with your doctor killing? Depends on whether your cowpoke was killed by a 45 and whether he returned fire and hit one of the men he saw down there. And yeah, he fought with him, all right. He was carrying a saddle rifle. He dropped it when he got hit, I reckon. I found it beside his tracks down below. I already sent it on to Austin. Only one thing you gotta tell me then, and I'll know if the two killings go hand in hand. What kind of a rifle was the cowboy using? What kind are you looking for, Jace? Savage 303. You got a case. That's what it was. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. We're boasting a little because here at NBC, you'll find the roughest, toughest, most romantic crime fighters ever assembled under one network roof. Take Wednesday evening, for example. On Wednesdays, you'll hear action with Mr. District Attorney, The Big Story, and that new daring private eye, Rex Saunders, played by Rex Harrison. So just keep your mystery ear glued to your NBC station every Wednesday. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and tonight's case, No Living Witnesses, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The cowboy and Dr. Hemet have been killed by the same man, all right. Ballistics proved the bullet dug out of the floor from under the doctor was a twin to the 45 taken out of the murdered couple. Steve Clark and I put our horses in the double trailer I was towing and headed for Harper's Landing. The ballistic boys at the lab didn't take long comparing those slugs, did they? They never do. It all fits. They even test fired the cowboy's rifle. It fired the slug Doc Hammett took out of that patient we're looking for. We're not only looking for him, we're going to find him and whoever was with him. He must be more than one man, all right. Once you told me about the blood on that piece of denim shirt, he couldn't have been in any condition to drive by himself, not all the way to Harper's Landing. Yeah, 70 miles. And he must have known he was going to need a doctor. Hey, you look like that gives you an idea. It does. I think it answers a question the sheriff asked me. Why they killed the doc instead of just tying him up. And what's the answer? They killed him because they didn't just happen by his place. They knew Doc Hammett, and he knew them. That's a big conclusion, Jason. It's not hard to reach, either. Look, Steve... Doc Hemet's house in Harper's Landing isn't on the main street through town. It's on a side street, not easy to find in the middle of the night, unless you knew where it was. Not only that, but they had to pass through two bigger towns on the way there, towns with more than one doctor. Steve, if you were shot and wanted to keep it covered, but you had to be treated, what would you do? Well, go to my own family doc, I reckon, and hope that I could talk him into keeping it quiet. You're right, Chase. That means the men we're after must live in or near Harper's Landing. 
Let's say on a ranch somewhere outside the town. Some place they could have taken stolen cattle. You know the brand mark and those stolen white faces. Say we're gonna do some range riding until we find them. Until they show up for sale at some commission house or auction barn. You think the sheriff will be willing to ride with us? Of course he will. Doc Hammond was a friend of his, and the sheriff doesn't take to killers. <laughs> Carson Ranch is about two miles farther on. Might stop there and get some grub if you'd like. I'm all for it, Sheriff. How about it, Chase? Haven't taken much eating time for the past two days. Ah, uh, why don't you just grab a handful of range grass? Loaded with vitamins. <laughs> You'll be loaded with buckshot if you come up with any more ideas like that. Yeah, come on, Chase. Before we get so skinny that a gust of wind will lift us right out of the saddle. Okay, okay. I guess the horses can use the rest. You see that, Sheriff? He don't care about us, just the horses. Yeah, look who's talking. Never saw you sit down to a meal without seeing to it that your horse was fed and watered first. I was only kidding, Jason. Let's get out of that Larson place. All right. Get up, boy. Get, get up. up. I wish we'd find some sign of those white faces. We must have looked over a couple of thousand ahead without finding a single old friend. Yeah, they got to be around, Steve. They haven't been sold through any commission house or barn. All records have been checked back to last Saturday. Well, we better find them soon before too many people know what we're doing. Ranchers who've seen us know we're not riding this range for exercise. Yeah, that the Larson Ranch off there to the right of the Mesa? There? Nope, that place belongs to Yancey Coburn and his son, Jed. Yeah, pull up a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa, whoa. Oh. Yeah, those cattle are acting kind of funny, Jason. Yeah. Disturbed and excited, milling around. Can't see any reason for it. Wide open range. No sign of a coyote or a mountain cat. Must be something they smell. I've seen them act just that way when a beef has been slaughtered on a range. Blood smell stirs them up and they start bunching just like that. No, well, nothing in that herd to interest us, though, Jace. You can see none of them white faces. The yeah, white parts might have been painted over. You know, that kind of camouflage been used before. I yeah, can't tell that we get close up. We're going to have to check them sooner or later. Might as well be now. Well, there goes our lunch, Steve. Yeah, I guess they eat on the Coburn place, too. Yeah, but Yancey and Jed ain't exactly hospitable. Well, come on. Get up, boy. Yeah, they're bunching right along Coburn's fence line. That's good. We won't have to cut the fence. We can just tie the horses off there and climb through. They sure are acting up. All right, hold up. Ooh, oh, oh, Charlie. Oh. Okay, Steve. Come ahead. Okay. Up there, let it go. Yeah. Ain't no strange stock here, Jason. They're all wearing Coburn's brand. Yeah, I can't spot any that have been altered. Besides, there's not a white face in the lot. You see that plane now. But what are they so head up about? It beats me. What are you looking at, Jace? Cracks. The way they've been milling around. Marks form a big circle. The boulder over there seems to be the middle of it. They move up toward it, and they start to mill and pull back. Come on. Wow. Look at the mess of red ants around that boulder. Oh, they're just pouring in and out of that farming hole under it. Hey, look at it. The hole's bigger than it looks. Most of it's been covered by the boulder. Hey, let's see if we can move it out, Steve. Yeah. Huh? Jam too tight, Jay. Yeah. An opening for my arm. I'll stretch flat and stick my hand down there. Go well, walk out, Jeez. We'll get ants all over you. I don't care about the ants so much. I just hope I don't get a mess of gopher teeth in my hand. Feel anything down there? Yeah. Look, quick line. Hey, Jace, you better wash that off right away. I will. You got your wire clippers? Sure. What's the matter? Cut the fence and bring the horses through. We're going to pull this boulder. Why, Jace? What's down there? Felt like a bunch of fresh skinned beef hides. They were hides, all right. Stripped from a half dozen white face. The place where the brand should have been were burned over to obliterate what had been there. Packed the hides on our horses and headed for the Coburn Ranch house. Are you sure wiped out any proof on those hides, Jace? Yeah. If there wasn't something wrong with them, they wouldn't have gone to the trouble of hiding them. Pretty smart butchering the stuff before they sold it. Probably figured every commission house in the state would be watching for brands. They couldn't risk altering them, and they couldn't risk keeping the stock around. You seen the Coburns lately, Sheriff? I haven't seen Jeb for some time, but I saw Yancey only last night at the drugstore in town. Yeah? Buying something? Yeah, he was. A lot of stuff. Bandages, adhesive tape. I saw the drug is wrapped.
Sounds me up. Sounds like the stuff they'd need to change presses on a bad wound, Jase. You were coming to their sheds. The house is just the other side of them. Ride right into the sheds. Leave the horses there. I don't want them to see these hides yet. Okay. Here we are. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Take a look on that floor there, Chase. Over there. Yeah. You know, the spot cleaned up mighty good. But look, look at the beam right over it. Meat hooks. A little blood on them. Yeah, must have done his butchering right here. Made all for sure to get that floor clean. Let's go talk to him. There's Yancey now at the back screen door. Uh, uh, howdy, Yancey. What you fellas want on my place? The Rangers want to have a little talk with you. I ain't got much time for talking. I got work to do. And so have we. Where's your son? I don't know. What do you mean, you don't know? Just like I said, I don't know. Now, anything else I can help you with? Don't get smart, Yancey. You know where Jed is, you better talk up. You took yourself a little trip down to Mexico. Suppose you invite us in and tell us all about it. Reckon I don't have to have you in if I don't want you, Sheriff. Perfectly right, Sheriff. Steve and I'll just wait here while you ride into town and get a warrant. We can invite ourselves in. You want to make us do it the hard way, Yancey? I ain't got nothing to hide. Want to come in? Come in. You keep a gun in the house? A shotgun there in the corner by the stool. How about a 45, Yancey? Never owned one. You haven't slaughtered any beef lately either, have you? Any log in it? Nobody said there was. Stashing the hides away under a boulder is a little bit unusual. You're getting kind of pale, Yancey. There ain't no... What'd you stop for, Yancey? You're about to say there aren't any brand marks left on those hides, weren't you? You put the words in my mouth. Choose your own words, but answer me. Tell the truth. Where's your son, Jed? I told you he's not in Mexico. He's holed up someplace recovering from a wound. The wound Doc Hemet was killed for treatment. I don't know what you're talking about. Get in here, I tell you. Jase, look at that ladder up corner. Just a ladder? I was I was fixing to do some paint. A man who's gonna paint usually buys some paint before he brings a ladder in. What's that up? Looks like a to the attic. Get out of here. 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 Get better. Now hold this for safe and keep it. You might hurt somebody. Keep it covered, Steve. I'm going to use that ladder and see what we got upstairs. I'll help you, Chase. Jed's probably up there, and he ain't time to come quiet if he's cornered. That's right, Sheriff. Get covered, Sheriff. Get him, Sheriff. Get him, Sheriff. Get him, Don't move. He's smart, Jed. You can't get out of that attic. No. But I can blow the head off an animal comes up here to take now. I gotta see you first, remember that. We don't have to come up after you, Jed. We can rake every foot of that ceiling with gunfire. Yeah, that's just a sample. To make it look like a sieve, you look like one with it. Now you better get down here with your father while you still got the chance. Come down, Jed. Come down or they'll kill you. We didn't do nothing. They can't prove nothing. How about it, Jed? All right. But my leg is hurt. You have to bring the ladder on to help it down. Sure, just to make it friendly. Open that trap all the way and drop your gun down here. All right. Yeah, that's better. All right, Sheriff. Set the ladder up again. This is the gun we wanted, Steve. Yeah, 45. All right, Jed. Ease yourself down and I'll help you. All right. My leg hurts. Look, we didn't do nothing. Well, that's all we ever going to see. We didn't do nothing. Yeah. You'll love it up in Huntsville, then. It's full of innocent fellows just like you. you ready, Steve? Yeah. Sheriff? All ten pieces. Good. All right, Yancey. Get. Get. their trial, Yancey and Jed Coburn steadfastly denied any crime. However, Jed's blood type matched the blood found in the office of Dr. Hemet, and ballistic experts definitely identified his 45 caliber gun as the weapon used to murder both Dr. Hemet and the cowboy whose body was found on Thunder Ridge. It took the jury less than two hours to bring in a verdict of guilty. The Cobans were sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for the rest of their natural lives. And now, 
here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. I believe you'll enjoy an amusing story I heard recently. It comes from a young lady who lives in the Lone Star State. It seems that a Sunday school teacher was making quite an impression with the little ones in her class as she told how the pharaohs of early Egypt drove the children of Israel from that land. A little fellow in the front row was biting his nails fiercely as the teacher went on to describe the cruelties inflicted upon the Israelites. How they were beaten and driven forth without food or water. When the story was over, the young fry stared straight ahead. Finally, he snapped. Gee, where's? Where were the Texas Rangers? See you next week, folks. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Virginia Gregg, Herb Ellis, Ed Begley, and Parley Bear. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacey Keith. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Turn back the calendar. Tomorrow evening, the Railroad Hour takes you back to a golden, bygone era with a refreshing presentation of the musical comedy, High Button Shoe. Railroad Hour singing star Gordon McRae is joined by Margaret Whiting for this program. And remember, tomorrow you'll also hear a concert by the Boston Pops Orchestra. Bill Baker invites you to join the $64 question next on NBC. <laughs>
the National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, room 114. It is 4.47 p.m. the afternoon of October 29th, 1927. Liz Ferris, a chambermaid at the Hotel Alamo in the town of Limpia, Texas, approaches Sam Bixby, the desk clerk. Mr. Bixby. Hmm? Oh, Liz, thought you went home. I uh, can't see if I'll ever get home till I get the rooms finished. And I still ain't been in room 114. 114? Mm-hmm. That's Mr. Boland's room. Oh, he went out a couple hours ago. Well, he left one of them do-not-disturb cards on his door just the same. His key ain't in the box there. I looked before while you were sorting out the mail. Well, he probably just forgot to leave his key. You got your pass key, you can get in. Well, how'd you know he didn't come back again without you seeing him? Suppose he's in there taking a bath. <laughs> all right, Liz, all right, come on. I'll come back with you. Give me the keys. Mm-hmm. Some folks don't care at all when I finish work, long as they can sleep the day away. Now, Liz, Mr. Boland's been here for two days, and this is the first time he's given you any trouble. Well, if it ain't him, it's somebody else. There, there's that do not disturb card on the door, like I said. You try knocking? Not on the door, of course I didn't. I got some consideration for other folks, even if they ain't got none for me. Besides, I run the vacuum cleaner in the hall hard enough to wake the dead. Well, he don't answer to knock. Sure, he went out. Well, if you're so sure, why don't you open the door then? You, uh, you in, Mr. Boland? Mr. Boland? He's out, all right. Go ahead, Liz. All right, I'll make the bed first and get the bed. Ah! Oh, what's the matter? Oh, man, it's quick, sticking out from under the bed, and, and there's blood on the rug. Let me out of here. No, 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 be quiet, Liz. Don't let the other guests hear you. I better call the sheriff right away. Sheriff James Kerfus reached the murder scene and immediately sent out a request for assistance from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to investigate. He joined the sheriff in room 114 at the Alamo Hotel. Everything just like the pounded ranger, except when I had the bed moved so that I could get a look at the body. Both slides, too. It's like it was done with a straight-edge razor, Sheriff. Yeah. A uh, weapon ain't around any place, though. That's what made me figure it was murder for sure. Yeah, you could have figured that out even if the razor was around. Hmm? Palms of his hands are cut, too. He tried to grab the razor and get it away from whoever killed him. Oh, I see. We better cover it with a sheet. Austin will have fingerprint man here soon. You know who he is? The name on the register is Henry Bowling. Been here two days. Come up from Lone Star to sell some cattle at the auction barn. All the way up here from Lone Star to auction cattle? It's pretty far. Yeah, now that you mention it, it is. Yeah, plenty far. I discovered the body. The rest of the scene was. You must have passed him out in the hall. I told him to wait right outside. Yeah, I saw him. We better talk to him. Right. Just trying to clean the Fix me. Stop, huh? Yes, Range wants to go. Oh, sure thing. I already told you all I know, Sheriff. Anybody come in to visit in this room today? Well, that's hard to say, Ranger. A lot of cattlemen in town when the auction's running. 
Well, nobody stopped by the desk, but you know how it is. Men know each other, visit around. Sure. Mm, if he'd been out tending his business like a man ought to be, he mightn't be dead. That's what I said. Now, Liz, I told you he was out. I saw him go. When was this? Mm, a little later, maybe. But it didn't see him come in again. Are you sure it was Boland you saw? Might have been somebody dressed like him, wearing his clothes, maybe. Oh, no, I saw him good enough to know for sure. Stopped just a few feet from the desk to wipe his eyeglasses with a handkerchief. Eyeglasses? There's something wrong with that, Gene? I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, he wear glasses all the time? Mm, every time I yeah, see him, sure he did. I see. When you opened this door, most of the body was hidden by the bed, wasn't it? Yeah. That's right. The bed's been moved since then. I think you better come in and identify the body. Oh, do we have to? Yeah, I'm afraid it's necessary. Because the man in here didn't wear glasses. Oh. Come on. Now, look, he, uh, he wouldn't have to be wearing them when he was killed, Jay. He never wore them. The man who wears glasses all the time has little pressure marks alongside the bridge of his nose. It's a thing we always look for. It helps with identification. Now, move the sheet. Mm hmm. What? That ain't Mr. Bowling. No, it ain't. Well, then who is this fellow? Sheriff, I don't know. I, I never saw him before. He, he's a lot different. Mr. Bowling not only wore glasses, he had a mustache. Mm. And this fellow don't. This couldn't be him clean-shaven? No, sir, could not. Looks like Bowling isn't our victim, Sheriff. Looks like he's the killer. <laughs> photos of the dead man, got a quick developing job done, then headed for Lone Star, the town Boland had given us his address. On the way, I called my headquarters and asked to have Ranger Steve Clark meet me there. He was waiting at the county courthouse when I drove up. Howdy, Jason. Howdy, Steve. Been waiting long? No, just got here about half an hour ago. Say, what's up? Headquarters fill you in on the killing of the Alamo Hotel in Olympia? Yeah, they told me about it. Here. How far out's the Boland Ranch? Well, it begins nine miles southwest. What do we do, go out and grab Boland? If he's around, but it isn't likely. After checking out of that hotel and leaving a dead man in his room... Why'd you head this way, then? Well, nobody at Olympia had seen the dead man before. we got to find out who he is. If there was bad blood between him and Boland, somebody around here might know about it. That's a good thought. I'll load my horse in with yours, and we can go out to the ranch and wake him up. <laughs> Plenty big, spreading and sprawling out south of the main highway. The ranch house was deserted except for a Mexican woman. She was frightened and wouldn't unlatch the screen door. We well, just want to talk to you, ma'am. Go that's away, all. go away. You come back again when Mr. Boland is here. We're Texas Rangers. We just want some information from you. I know nothing, please. You go away. If Mr. Boland is in there, we'd like to talk to him. No one is here, senor. No one but me. It won't do you any good to hide him, ma'am. If he's not there, why can't we come in and look around? No. We should have gotten the search warrant, Chase. No, she's just frightened because she's alone. There ought to be somebody else around the ranch of this size. Boland must have hands. Yeah. Uh, where are the men, senora? The vaqueros who work on the ranch. Round up. All out to work. They round up. All right, senor. You can go back to bed. We'll go talk to them. <laughs> Your senora wasn't really too happy to see you, boy. I know. Well, let's get the horses out of the trailer. You really want to look for those cowboys tonight? Yeah, because we got plenty of other things to do in the morning. Come on, Charco. I'm going. Come on. What's on your mind for the morning? Find out where Boland banks. Watch his account so we can trace him if he cashes a check anyplace. Hey, it'll make it tougher for him to hide, all right. That's how I want to make it. Tough. Well, let's ride. Yeah. Get up, Charles. Get up. Get up. Ha, ha. Boland had plenty of stock, all right. He passed cows and calves for the score. But ground marks showed that the main herds, the selling beef, were driving south. The railroad runs to the south, Jase. Guess they're moving them that way for shipping. Figures. That's why we had to ride so far. Yeah, it must make, take them three or four days to cut out the steers and drive them to a main camp. We ought to be spotting some riders soon. Trail marks have been getting fresher. And if we don't, we're going to have to rest these ponies. We've been knocking on them steady now for about yeah, three... It's all right. We're getting yeah. close. They can rest soon. Look. Where? Mace over there in the moonlight. Look down at the base. On the east end. Yeah, campfire. Come on, Charlie. Come on, get out. 
see the stock now, only part of the herd from the looks of it. Probably got a few folks working each section, driving into the railhead from different angles. They can drive them any way they want. All I want is somebody who can identify the photographs of a dead man. Campfire there, all right, Jace. Nobody around it. That's kind of funny, isn't it? Fire must have been made by cow folks. They gotta be around. Horses couldn't move far if they were hobbled, but there ain't any horses in sight either. Nothing but part of the herd. Maybe they moved around the other side of the mesa. <coughs> whoa, whoa, Chuba. Where'd that shot come from, Jace? Up a brush and rock at the edge of the mesa. Whoa, easy, boy. Come you, This trolley's small. Never mind Howdy. the introductions, Color. You always throw lead at anybody riding this range? I fired over your head. Just a warning. A warning for what? It's orders, Rangers. Somebody's been making off with some stock, and Bolin told us to be on the lookout for strange riders. Uh, Bolin? You around? No. When did you see him last? Just before we started out on Roundup. Teller and I ain't seen anybody but each other for almost a week. And you don't have any idea where your boss might be? How would we know? You seem mighty anxious to find him. I am mighty anxious. Well, the boss in uh, some kind of trouble? He's in plenty of trouble. We'll find it out sooner or later. Uh, he's wanted for murdering a man in a hotel in Limpia. So if you know where he is or even where he might be, you better talk up. Well, if we knew, we'd tell you right off, but we don't. You know anybody bowling has been having trouble with? No. Nope. Well, the boss never had trouble with nobody. There's a dead man who'd disagree with that if he could. Get those photos out of your saddlebag, will you, Steve? Right. Maybe you can identify the man Bolin killed. Here you are, Chief. Thanks. Here, Color, yes. you're too small. Huh? Take a look. Why, say, Ranger, Bolin never killed this man. What makes you so sure of that? Because this is the boss. This is a picture of Bolin himself. are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Room 114, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We had our killer cold, knew his name, his address, and he turned out to be the dead man. Case fell apart. It didn't make sense. You're sure this is a photo of Bolin? We ought to know. We've been working for him for a year ever since he come down from Wyoming and bought this spread. The desk clerk at the hotel in Limpia said he'd never seen this man before. I can't have that. Bolin was registered at that hotel for two days. The clerk said he wore eyeglasses and a mustache. Then the man he saw wasn't Henry Bolin. There's something fishy about this whole thing, Jace. I can't figure why anybody... Wait a minute, Steve. Huh? You fellas said Bolin thought somebody was running his stock off? Yes, right. Is his brand registered? Well, sure it is. Box B brand. Thanks. If you want any more information, we'll be out to see you later. Come on, Steve. But Jay's Come on. Get mounted. Get up, son. Get up. Come on. Hope you catch the men you ask for. Hey. What's on your mind, Jace? What'd you ask about the missing cattle and the brand registration? Bolin thought some of his cattle were missing. The registered brand stolen cattle are hard to get rid of. It wouldn't be so hard if the thief took them to an out-of-the-way auction barn like the one in Limpia and then pretended to be Boland when he sold them. Hey, Jace, that makes sense. Sure it does. That's why somebody registered the Alamo under Boland's name. Then Boland must have found out about it, went up to Limpia for his showdown, and got himself killed. That's the picture. I'll buy it, Jace, but who killed it? That's something we're going to have to find out. Whoever it was, it was somebody Boland knew. He wouldn't have been able to follow him to that hotel room. And if the cattle were stolen from here by somebody Bolin knew, Bolin hadn't been here very long. 
The thief might have been one of his own ranch hands. You play it that way, Steve. And stick around here and see if we can find a poke with a mustache and eyeglasses. <laughs> spotted a pair of riders and asked if they knew of a hand with a mustache and glasses. There was such a man on the ranch and they told us what general direction he might be working in. A couple of hours later, we found him alone, pushing some strays out of a blind draw. That's him, Jase. Just saw the sun reflect on his glasses. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. You! There I where you are! Don't move for that rifle holster! for the past four days. Right here on this range, work. Anybody with you? No, just me. How come? The other hands are working in twos and threes. Well, I ain't. I've been working through this Badlands strip. No herding here. Nothing but a few strays that one man can dig out. That's how come. Anybody seen you here in the last couple of days? How could anybody see me? I've been way back in that scrub canyon. Yeah. Nobody saw you there. Nobody'd see you if you weren't there either. What's your name? Dave Boot. Boot, huh? All right, you better come with us. Come with you? For what? I ain't coming any place. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Somebody murdered your boss, Henry Boland, up in Limpia yesterday. Murdered Hank Boland? That's right. The description of the killer fits you. What? Well, you're crazy. I, I've been right here, I tell you. Tell me anything you want. But you're coming to Limpia. I want a couple of people to get a look at you. We got back to the car and drove Dave Booten to the sheriff's office in Limpia to see if he could be identified. Ranger, I'm telling you, I ain't never been near this town. If you haven't been here, you got nothing to worry about. Did you send for the chambermaid and the desk clerk, Sheriff? Yeah, yeah, they be here right off. Thanks. As a matter of fact, you have to come now up the outside steps. You see him through the window? Ranger, I'm telling you... You better not say anything just now, Booten. Come in. Howdy. 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 Reckon you remember that ranger here? Yeah, ain't like we would forget him after seeing him only yesterday. Liz, Mr. Bixby, I want you to meet Mr. Booten. Howdy. 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 Hmm. Doesn't seem like you've ever met Mr. Booten before. I thought maybe you had. No. Nope. Can't say I ever had the pleasure. No, me neither. Although for a minute it did look like... Like who? Now listen, lady, you never... Quiet, oh, Booten. Well, what's everybody getting excited about? I was just going to say, he looks like Sarah Lee and his old beau, the one that run off when everybody expected they was going to get married. <laughs> oh, Reggie is oh, already. Thanks, Liz, Mr. Bixby. He just wanted to be sure that this man wasn't the one who was registered under the name of Henry Bowler. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, no, nothing like him. Except for the eyeglasses and the mustache. Yeah, I guess we might as well let these folks go back to the hotel, Jason. Yeah, it's like you were telling the truth, Wooden. I'm sorry. No harm done, Ranger. No way you could have known. Uh, geez, I've been thinking. You suppose a uh, mustache and eyeglasses might have been a uh, disguise to throw us all? That's a thought, Sheriff. It's been done before. Well, that ain't the way it was this time, Ranger. Why not, Bixby? Well, them glasses may have been fake, but not the mustache. Man, you're after had a real mustache. I know, because cause I seen him in the barber shop, and the barber trimmed it. <laughs> Put Boudin on the bus to Lone Star and sent him back to the Boland Ranch. Clark and I spent the next day questioning everybody in Limpia. The crew at the auction barn, cattlemen, everybody. They couldn't add a thing to what we already knew. When we got back to the sheriff's office, there was more bad news. I had a call from your headquarters at Austin, James. And they checked those prints the lab crew lifted from 114. Whoever left him had no record. Yeah, that does it. I still think it must have been somebody from Boland's ranch. Somebody he knew. That's what we think, and that's the way it looks. Let's face it, Jace. It could have been a stranger stole the cattle. Boland found out about it, went in for a showdown like any hothead, and got himself killed. The killer could have come in from any direction and left in any direction. Yeah, that's right, Jace. No way you're telling him. Come in. How do you, Sheriff? Rangers? Yeah. Something we can do for you? Well, my name is Denny. I drive a line haul for interstate trucking. Route between New Orleans and El Paso. I think I got some information you might want. 
At least was a thought so over at the Alamo Hotel. What kind of information? This. Key to room 114, the Alamo. Where'd you get this? Was it was nightfall last. The night of the day Bolton was killed, Jake. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so my relief man was driving. We made a coffee stop, placed about 40 miles this side of Lone Star. Pulled a truck in the side of the service station there. I was sleeping and didn't want no coffee, so I stayed in the cab and dozed while a relief man went inside. I got it. Go on. Well, cattle truck pulled in for gas. Empty cattle truck, huh? Headed which way? Southwest. Toward Lone Star. Did you notice the license? No, no, but there was a mark on the side box with a B in the middle of it. Bolin's box B brand, Jase. Must have been the truck used to haul the stolen cattle up here. To haul the killer back to the ranch. Uh, what about the key? I was coming to that. Uh, if he fell in the cattle truck, he paid for the gas. I didn't see him too good. And I was just sort of slumped in my cab. You know, half groggy. Not exactly watching him, but seen. I know what you mean. Well, when he fished the money out of his pocket, I saw him kind of look at something. He dug out with it. Then he sort of looked around like he was looking for some place to throw it. Station man left him and went inside the change. Then the fellow walked right past my truck real quick. He didn't see me, of course, because the cab was dark, and I heard him throw something. Made kind of a clink. Then he went back to the cattle rig and drove off. That's what it threw away, this hotel key here? That's it. I found it when my partner came out. We went back to check the top and the tailgate, and I sort of looked around and found the key with my flash. How come you didn't just drop it in the mailbox? Well, we had a lot of stock along the line, loading, unloading. Well, route came right through here. Thought I'd stop it and just drop it off. Information help in? It sure does. Thanks. Headquarters will see to it your boss hears about it, too. Sheriff, better take down his statement. Okay, James. Come on, Steve. Right. See you later. All right, James. Heading back for Lone Star. As the wheels will turn. Pile in. Yeah. How are we going to narrow it down, Chase? Boudin was the only hand with a mustache and the glasses. He's clear. Glasses still could have been phony. Something the killer wore only while he was in Olympia. We know the mustache wasn't a phony. Bowen's hands have been on Roundup for a couple of weeks. A lot of them let their beards grow. Would have been a simple matter to shave the beard and leave a lip cover. Sneak away with a load of cattle and then shave clean before he got back. I uh, know, I know, but Boudin wasn't the only hand working alone. One of the others did it and disappeared for a few days. His sidekick know about it. It doesn't have to be a one-man job, Steve. Sidekick could be in on it, too. Well, that figures. Well, what's up late, Jase? Fingerprint them all and get a check on the prints up at Austin? I think we can wrap it up quicker than that. We know the killer doesn't have a beard now. and uses a straight razor. That was the murder weapon. Yeah. Boudin can tell us which of the men shaved with straight razors. And once we know that, we can settle the rest with a camera I got in the car trunk. How? By asking the straight razor men if they'd like to pose for a couple of identification pictures with eyeglasses and a phony mustache. Tell them we'll have to hold them until the pictures are seen by a couple of witnesses in Lempia. That ought to flush some action from them. Action? I'm betting the man who killed Boland will raise more fuss than the alligator when the lake went dry. <laughs> back to Lone Star just in time. The bank had taken over the management of Bowen's ranch as executors, and the roundup was just about complete. Last the herd was being driven into the stock pens near the railroad siding when we reached the south end of the ranch. There's Bowden, Jason. Take care of the horses over there by the corral. Yeah. Come on. Hey, Bowden. Hey, Bowden. Yeah? I want to talk to you a minute. Oh, oh really? How you making out? Make out fine if you will help. Pretty sure it was somebody on the ranch who killed your boss. Well, how can I help you? Just tell me which of the folks use straight razors for shaving. Hmm. Well, what she is Jones and Tuller and Happy. Tuller, huh? Hey, Jace, isn't he the bright boy that fired on us first time we rode out on the range? He's the one, all right. He was clean shaven, too. Feller with him was named Small. You know where they are, Boudin? Well, it was over there a minute ago, driving the last... Oh, oh, here they come now, Chase, around the end of the corral with the horses. Hey, you better drift away, Boudin. Good thing. Well, howdy, Rangers. Back again? Yeah. I'd like to have another talk with you, Tuller. You too, Small. Sure, ain't you? What's it about? Thank you, wait till you dismount. Right. Yeah. What do you want? Yeah. Find out who killed Boudin? I'm pretty sure it's one of the hands. All you fellas without beards are going in with us. What for? Why? Yeah. 
What would that prove? Prove plenty when we get what we want. Take photos of all of you with prop eyeglasses and mustache on you. A couple of people in Olympia want to see them. Well, if they think they recognize somebody, that ain't legal evidence. We'll have something to help it along. We'll fingerprint the man they think they saw what? because Boland's killer left his prints all over that hotel room. Please, you warned me. Shut up. Huh? I helped steal the cattle, that's all. I didn't go to Olympia. He did. I told you to shut up, you rat. All right, Color. You can both. Shut up, you. Oh, shut horse and go behind the other mounts at the rack. The frightened animal reared over us and knocked Small into me before Clark could grab the bridle. Oh, keep your eye on Small, Steve. I'm going after Tuller. He jumped the fence into the cattle chute, Ranger. Don't let a man watch up in there, Steve. I'll climb up. Get him from above. You better stay flat up there, Ranger. I can see you better than you can see me. You got yourself in a trap, Tuller. Yeah. I have you and wanted to come down after me. I don't have to come down after you. You're a dead pigeon in that cattle chute. Dad, don't you believe him, Ranger? No. That shot you fired's already got the cattle stirred up. Hey, you men down in the pen, don't you believe him? 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 Don't you believe cover you won't like. If they open that gate and I fire into the herd, they'll run you down. You'll get chopped to death. All right, boys, open up the gate. I'm not fooling, Teller. I'll fire into them. No, 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 I come on, I come on. Here's my gun. All right, and climb up on the fence. All right, Rachel. All right, I'm coming. Now, oh. here, give me your arm. I'll pull you out of there. Good, Ranger, okay. Don't, don't let me drop now. I, 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 don't, I don't want to make no trouble, Ranger. I made a mistake, I did it. You made a big mistake, Teller. Too bad you didn't use that razor strictly for shape. Go on. in the crime, Charles Small received a sentence of 25 years. Frank Tuller was tried and convicted for the murder of rancher Henry Bolin. Today, after two decades, he still serves his sentence. Life imprisonment. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Reflecting on the old-time One Riot, One Ranger reputation of the Texas Rangers, a visitor to Texas recently mentioned to a ranger that he'd been noticing a number of current press reports where two rangers had participated in the quelling of a riot or investigation of a crime. After citing this observance to the ranger, the man asked, how come two men are being assigned to some of these cases now? Are the rangers less effective than they used to be? The lanky ranger shook his head. Oh, no, he said. One ranger is still sufficient to handle the situation, all right, but in these days of complex legal technicalities, we've been sending two of them along. One to take care of what trouble there is, and the other one to serve as a sort of a disinterested witness. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Ann Diamond, Herb Bygren, Peggy Weber, Tom McKee, Bill Johnstone, Herb Ellis, and Barney Phillips. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacey Keats. This is Hal Gibney speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Monday chimes mean the best in music on NBC. Tomorrow night, Gordon McRae stars in the Railroad Hour presentation of the operetta The Firefly. The NBC Symphony presents a one-hour concert featuring works by Vivaldi, Wagner, and Stravinsky. Tomorrow's NBC Symphony concert marks the first in the series under the baton of the widely acclaimed young conductor Guido Cantella. Now the $64 question. Three chimes mean good times on NBC.
Before we bring you tonight's Tales of the Texas Rangers, here's a Christmas message all of us associated with this program would like you to hear. Christmas is just two weeks away, and unless everybody helps in his own city or town, there are some less fortunate children who will not receive Christmas gifts. Let's everyone join your local groups and give a thing. A thing for kids for Christmas. In your town, there are one or more agencies collecting toys for less fortunate children. Do your part and contribute the things you can. Thank you. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joe McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joe McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men will make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, the lucky dollar. It is 7.30 of a simmering hot night. August 14, 1945. In a small South Texas town not far from Corpus Christi, Joe Barry is counting up the day's receipts of his modest store. His wife, Clara, is locking up in back. What the? Look what's happened to the lights. I'm not through back here. Well, I didn't turn them off, Mom. One of the fuses must have blown. You think it could be the refrigerator again? No, I just put in a whole new unit, didn't I? Hey, you just stay where you are, Claire. I'll get my flashlight here and see what the trouble is. Don't you, <laughs> and don't worry, honey. I'll be careful. Yeah, let's see what we got here now. Oh, all these fuses look good. Joseph? Now, everything seems all right in here, Ma. Must be in the main switch box. I'll take a look outside. Down. Main switch is closed. Now, who is that? Huh? Keep your back from me and give me a flash. What? Who are you? Never mind. Now, now hold up. up. Nobody's going to hold up to a very I'll call you on cold. On cold. Didn't you find the trouble, Joseph? Joseph? Joseph, what on earth you doing trying to count up here with so little? You mean, Joseph, what are you doing? Keep away from me. Joseph, get away from that chair. Shut up. Oh, crazy little rat. Stop it. Joseph, stop it. Joseph, stop it. When Joseph Barry regained consciousness, he staggered to the phone and called Sheriff Jennings who, in turn, requested help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was at the scene of the crime a short time later. Just like Barry said, Sheriff, if he pulled his master switch outside the store, it'll draw out the storekeeper. And he must have thought Joe was alone in the store. Sure he did. Too bad he wasn't. This is Barry be alive now. Well, let's go inside again, Sheriff. I'd like to ask Barry a few more questions. You know, Jace... This is mighty like another holdup we had in this area just a week ago. Yeah? Look at so. No gunplay, but otherwise just the same. Main switch pulled, only went out to check the fuses. The slug. Nobody saw the thief? Nobody. It's supposed to be the same guy. Good boy. Mr. Barry. Fair stranger. Find anything more? Maybe. I know this is hard on me, but I'd like to ask a few more questions. Mm -hmm. 
Go right ahead, Ranger. Ask all you want. I'll do anything to catch the devil that, that murdered my wife. Oh. You're sure you didn't get a good look at the burglar? Something you could remember as identification? No, sir. He came up on me out of nowhere. No sound, nothing, until he spoke. Then we fought. But that voice... I remember that whispering voice anywhere. He spoke. You didn't mention that before, George. Uh, didn't I? Uh, it's kind of hard to think right now, sir. With poor Clara. What'd the burglar say, Mr. Barry? Uh, not much, Ranger. But I know that voice. I know it all right. Go on. Try to remember. Word for word. Uh, he said, hold everything, Pop. Keep your back to me and hand over your flashlight. And then when I caught him, let go, you old fool. My fault. He lit me next to my knee. I saw Clara. It's all right, Mr. Dunn. I won't ask you to talk much more now, but would you mind coming over to the cash register for a minute? Sure. I couldn't. There was so little in the drill, Ranger. Only $45 it was. $45 for my Clara. Look here, Mr. Barry. Hmm? Can you tell me about this piece of adhesive stuck on the front of the register? Looks like something was pasted to it. It was, Ranger. That murdering skunk even took the first dollar this store ever made. My lucky dollar. Lucky dollar? Yeah. Had it stuck up there on the register with a couple of pieces of adhesive tape. He took it. Not all of it, Mr. Barry. Look here. The corner of the bill is still stuck under this piece of adhesive. Must have torn off when he grabbed it. It's not much to go on, Jase. It's a start, Sheriff. Dollar bill that matches this torn corner and the bullets from Mrs. Barry's body. <coughs> How can we help him, Jase? The best thing for him is some rest, Sheriff. I'll leave it to you. All right. What about you? I'm hoping we can pick up some fingerprints on the register here and from the outside switch box. I'll radio the lab crew to fly down here and we'll see what they can find. Meantime, we'll notify all banks to be on the lookout for a $50 bill with one corner missing. The lab crew came in from Austin and gathered all evidence. By the next day, I had a report from Captain Stinson. On that very robbery and homicide, Jase. Yeah, Captain. Any make on the bullets or prints? Nothing on the bullets. All we know is that they're from a 32. But on the prints, that's another thing. Something What's that? No direct prints, Jase, but the thief wore cotton gloves. There's an imperfection in the weave of the left thumb. Yeah, there's not a lot to go on, Captain. I know it, Jase. You got any more leads? Not exactly, but we don't think it was done by somebody just passing through. No, why not? Because Sheriff Jennings had a similar robbery in this area last week with the same M.O. Pulled the switch and worked in the dark. A lot of people down there with the cotton season in full swing, aren't there? Swarms of them. Uh, it's hard to say. Well, if it is, you've got a big territory to cover, Jase. Well, I got an old dollar bill working for me, too, Captain. Yes. And by the way, Jase, all the banks in your territory will have blow-ups of the torn corner of that bill by morning. Good. I guess all we can do now, Captain, is sweat it out and wait for that dollar bill to pay off. <laughs> Captain Stinson made good his promise. By next morning, every bank in the area had a description of the missing lucky dollar and photos of the torn corner. Two days went by. Then, on the 19th of August, a man walked into State Bank. Yes, what can I do for you? Money. Here is money to pay for the loan on my house. Oh, we have a loan on your house? See. Si. Your name, please? Hey, Ramos. Juan Ramos. Oh, I'll get your records, Mr. Ramos. Uh, uh, what is wrong, senor? This dollar bill gave me a uh, uh, corner's thrown away. Mm. Well, it's good. The dollar is good, no? Oh, sure. Sure, but uh, 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 just a minute, please. Huh? Oh, okay. Hello. Hello, operator. Get me to the sheriff's office. Sheriff's office, Jenny speaking. Hello, Sheriff. This is Jim Loftus over at the bank. Oh, yes, Jim. What can we do for you? Well, I just gave him the bank and he handed me that dollar you're looking for. You did? Let me see. Hold on a minute. What's up, sir? A man by the name of Ramos just passed a dollar at the bank that answers the description of the lucky dollar we've been looking for. He's still there. Down the stall and we'll be right over. Hello, Jim. Yes, sir. We're coming right over and don't let that Ramos get away. Uh -huh.
This is the missing lucky dollar, all right, Sheriff. See how it matches? But I swear to you, Ranger, I do nothing wrong. I come to the bank to make payment for my house. Where'd you get this dollar, Ramos? Well, I earn it, Ranger. King Shabby, where it comes from. One day I work one place, one day another place. Who knows where I get paid the dollar? Where was your last job? Well, I, I worked for five days for Mr. Larson here. You know, it was a trap. Larson, Cody Larson. Runs a sort of swap shop in the Mexican settlement, Jase. It's a dump, but oh, he does a pretty good business. Let's go see Mr. Larson. Then. Maybe you'll be able to tell us something about Ramos and the lucky dollar. <laughs> Tell him, Mr. Larson. Sure, Ramos worked for me, Ranger, but only for a few days. Mr. Larson, look carefully at this dollar. Hmm. What about it? Ever see it before? Hmm, how do I know, Ranger? A dollar's a dollar, ain't it? Not always. Feel this one, for instance. And it's sticky. And the edge is torn. Try to remember, Ronnie. It's very important. To you. To me. An old lady was shot down, killed by someone who stole this particular dollar. An old lady? That dollar from someone? No, 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 no. I didn't do it, Ranger. I earned the dollar here for Mr. Lost. Take it easy. Say, maybe I do remember this dollar, Ranger. You do? And it seems to me a little Mexican girl gave it to me. Sure, I remember because it stuck to the other money she gave me. You know where we can find her? Uh, I uh, think she works at one of the cotton farms near here, sir. I don't know for sure, but if she gave me this dollar and two more to pay down on a red slip dress. Yeah, I told you, she came back to me. Never mind that, Mr. Larson. Just when did she pay you on the dress? Uh, just last evening, Ranger. Yeah, I keep open at night for the workers, the cotton pickers. I paid off Ramos when he closed up. Must have given him that sticky buck along with the rest of his pay. <laughs> I told you, Mr. Larson, give me that dollar. The girl say when she'd be back for a dress. Today. You've never seen the girl before, Mr. Larson? You don't know her name or where she lives? No. Didn't you give her some kind of receipt or a deposit? Oh, sure, but just for the three bucks. When she brings in the receipt and the rest of the money, she gets the dress. You don't need a name and address for that. You're going to think, too. I think we'll wait for the lady, Sheriff. Meantime, promise. If she were in, stick around town. I may want to talk to you again. See you, see you. Thank you, Ranger, just come this way. It ain't much to look at. All this junk fire in the air, but make yourself comfortable as you can. Don't worry about us, Mr. Larson. Just go on about your business as if we weren't here. When the girl comes in, let us know. You can depend on that, Ranger. I will. Yes. You reckon O.J.'s telling us the truth? I don't know, Sheriff. We ought to find out pretty soon. I got a hunch that lucky dollar's gonna hit the jackpot. <laughs> are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, The Lucky Dollar, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. That's Cat Thompson. I know him, Jase. Owns one of the biggest farms in these parts. When does he pay his pickers, sir? Like the rest. Once a week. Saturdays. What's wrong? Have you asked this question? 
Because you paid this dollar down on a dress last night, Chica. It's the dollar we've been looking for. Did you spend it? Yeah, where'd you get it? Someone's pay, I did for working in the street, keeping cotton. If you're a picker, how come you're off work at this time? I want to get my new dress. I ride into town in one of the trucks. You can walk off your job anytime you feel like it, Chica. It's my business. You're wrong there, young lady. Plenty of our business when you pass a stolen dollar. Stolen? Come on. You're going back to the Compton Farm with us. Sheriff Jennings and I drove Cheetah Marsalis back to the Compton Farm. The girl had a new red dress that had been seen in the hackers. We found Prescott Compton at one of the trucks near the main house weighing the cotton as pickers were bringing in. Well, that's Compton right over there. Okay, I'll take that look out. Come on. Miss Thank Compton. You, Mr. Compton. Well, howdy, Sheriff. Mrs. Ranger Pearson. We'd like to talk to you. Good. This girl works for you, Mr. Compton. Cheetah? Oh, sure she does, Ranger. Whole Marsalis family works for me. Fine people. Hey, what are you doing away from the field? You haven't gotten yourself in any trouble, have you? I've done nothing, Mr. Compton. She passed this dollar bill that was stolen in a robbery and killing four days ago, Mr. Compton. Cheetah can't seem to remember where she got it unless it was for me. Not for me, she didn't. That robber was four days ago. I pay off on Saturdays, Ranger. Where a whole family is hired, like the Marsalas, I pay the head of the family. In this case, father. This is a dollar, Ranger. Here you are. No, sir. Didn't get this from me, I swear. I've been paying my pictures off with new bills. New bills. Well, Cheetah? I didn't do anything wrong, Ranger. I don't know where that dollar came from. Well, we'll soon settle this, Ranger. Cheetah's brother's working right close here. Carlos. Carlos. Oh, no. Oh, Carlos. Please. Hey. No. Come over here, man, boy. Yes, I okay. Hey, senor. Uh, what do you want? Cheetah, what are you paying? Papa will get work for you. The uh, Ranger here wants to ask some questions, Carlos, about some money your sister had. It's been a little trouble. Trouble? Trouble with Cheetah? What you done? Did your father give her any spending money, Carlos? Hey, Papa, he was all a little saving, but fifty, maybe seventy-five cents. And he never gave Cheetah as much as eight or nine dollars at a time, eh? Oh, no, senor, never. Cheetah never had that money. Any idea where she might have gotten it? I can guess. From Bandy Bird. Carlos. From who? Bandy Bird. John Oda, Bandy Bird, has worked for me for over a year, Ranger. Trust with it, as far as I know. Except he fancies himself sort of a lady man or not so. Cheetah. Did Donald Burke give you this dollar? No, I tell you, I don't know where I get that dollar. Then you lie, Cheetah. Hey, take it easy, my son. I'll get the money from no other place, and you know. You can get it. Candy. No sister of mine go to take money from a man like that. Where does Bird work, Mr. Thompson? Well, Carlos can take you right to the truck, Ranger. See, you better show you the way, Ranger. And you, little sister, you pick your cotton here close to the house where I can keep an eye on you when we come back with your fine dandy. It's changing everybody. Come on, Sheriff. Carlos, let's get started for Bird's truck. Carlos Marsalis directed us along the road to the cotton field to where Donald Bird had been working. A trailer was there, but the truck was nowhere in sight. Hey, that's strange, Senor. I know he was working here. Hey, Sam! Come over here a minute, huh? Come right over. Have you moved to another part of the field? No, I don't think so, sir. What do you want, Colin? Where's Dandy Bird? This ranger still want him. What, Dandy drove out of the field three, four hours ago, Mr. Ranger. He had to He's in town? He sure is, boss. It's a cotton gin. Did Dandy get himself some kind of trouble? I don't think there's any plenty of trouble. We don't need cheer alone. Sister? Well, she drove into town with Dandy. She did. She lied to us twice, Sheriff. Bird was at the gin when she came to the store for a dress. Sure he was. Thanks for the information, Sam. Oh, glad I can help, Mr. Carlos. Yes, me. Can you give us a good description of Dandy Bird? See, si, see. Si. He's about as tall as the sheriff. What do you think? What do you think? He's thin, blonde, color eyes, and blue. Veil blue. Cold like a snake's eyes. Uh, no scars, no distinguishing marks? No, sir. Uh, only he is always dressed up, even in a truck at work. He dresses fancy. That's what I call him, Dandy. That's a pretty good description, Jay. Couldn't be hard to pick him out in the crowd. Oh, please, Ranger, let me go with you to town. No. You can do more good back at the farm, Carlos. I'll drop you there. You keep an eye on your sister until we contact you again. Eh, bueno, sir. 
We'll head back for town, Sheriff. We'll pick up Dandy at the cotton gin. <laughs> Big lineup of trucks at the cotton gin, but we didn't see any driver that answered Dandy's description. Sheriff Jennings and I went up to the loading platform and headed for the superintendent's office. Here we are, Jay. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? Ranger Pearson would uh, like some information, Mr. Collins. Why, sure. Come on in my office so we can hear ourselves talk. Well, yeah. have a chair, gentlemen. Uh, mm. Now, how can I help you? You know most of the drivers by sight, don't you, Mr. Collins? I'd say so, Ranger. The regulars, anyway. But there's a heavy crop this year. You saw the line of trucks outside. Well, there's lots of new drivers. The man we want is regular, Mr. Collins. Works for press conference. The man's name is Donald, or Dandy Bird. Dandy? Why, sure, I know him. Honey, you should ask for him, too. Somebody else wanted him? Yeah, phone call came in here about a half hour ago. Phone call? Mm-hmm. I went out on the platform and gave a yell. Andy moved up close to the head of the line. He climbed out and came back in the office with me. And you heard the conversation? What there was of it, Ranger. I wasn't paying much attention. It seems to me he did say something about meeting somebody at the same place tonight. Then he hightailed out of here, and I haven't seen him since. Is you any idea where he went? No, and I wish I did. Left the truck standing, blocking the whole line. You're looking for Dandy Bird, Ranger. I'd like to get my hands on him myself. Well, thanks, Mr. Collins. Oh, uh, just one thing more. But do you know who called Bird on the phone? I know. Sounded like some little Mexican gal. I left Sheriff Jennings scouring the town for Bird while I went back to the Thompson farm to have a talk with Cheetah. We didn't have much time. It was getting dark. As I turned off the highway onto the Compton Road, I saw Carlos Marsalis running for me. Ranger! Ranger, please, sir. Yeah, what is it, Carlos? Cheetah, sir. She's gone. What? I thought I told you to keep an eye on her. I did, I did. But she went into a shack and I went. But when she don't come out, I go in. And Cheetah's gone. Her clothes, everything. Then I look out the window. I see her. She's stopping the bus. I, I, I run after her, but it's no use. The bus was gone. A bus. Past me coming down here. Pile in, Carlos. We'll follow her. Carlos Marsalis and I followed that bus for 18 miles. Then we saw Cheetah get off in a town that wasn't known if it was so She went into a dingy beer truck. It was small, but plenty noisy. Parked the car where it wouldn't be noticed and sat there for almost an hour. Why should my sister go into a place like that? I hope it's because of Dandy. I hope he shows up. I'm going to kill him. He got to the state, Carlos. He'll get what's coming to him. See, but just to sit here, Ranger, doing nothing. Wait a minute. Look, going over to the canteen now. Yeah? Is that bird? See, si, see, si, that's him. Let me go, huh? No. You stay here, Carlos. And I mean it. See, si, Ranger, whatever you say. Everybody do to get the rangers after him. These guys are always looking for trouble. Hey, what about them deer? Dandy, you tell me the truth. Hmm? For you, I leave my family, Dandy. I love you. Yeah, yeah, I know, baby. The deer, senor. Ah, just in time. Boy, am I dry. <laughs> like I said, kid, <laughs> Dandy Bird never makes trouble for nobody. I've got plans for you. Dandy, what's wrong? The ranger's coming in the door. Huh? He's heading this way. Oh, we've had gone, Dandy. Come on, Cheetah, get out of here. Get back. There we are, Bird. So you did leave the rangers here. No, Dandy. You stay where you are, Ranger. Don't go for your guns. I've got the girl in front of me. Dandy, let me go. No, no, no. Hey, you'll 
glove with the imperfect weave was found on Donald Byrd at the time of his capture. Confronted with this and the undeniable evidence establishing his gun as the murder weapon, Donald Bandy Byrd made a full confession. Cheetah Marcellus was given a suspended sentence of five years. Byrd was sent to the state penitentiary at Huntsville for the rest of his life. Joel McRae with another interesting anecdote about the Texas Rangers. In the early oil boom days of Texas, the Rangers were faced with a problem of rounding up lawbreakers and holding them in custody until they could get them to the nearest jail, which might be 50 miles away. Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, now commander of Country B, Texas Rangers, used a novel fresh air jail that became known as the Ranger Trotland. It was simply a long chain strung up between two posts with 50 or 60 trace chains attached. When an arrest was made, he padlocked the free end of the trace chain to his prisoner and left him there to face the jives and laughter of local citizens. Though it's no longer used today, the ranger trot line started quite a few would-be bad men in a straight and narrow path. And to this day, there are some characters who still can't stand the sight of a trace chain. Good night, folks. See you same time next week. Good night, Joel. Folks, there have been so many requests for the Texas Ranger prayer read by Joel McRae a few weeks ago that there has been some delay in answering all of the mail. If your copy of the Texas Ranger prayer has not been received as yet, please be patient. You should receive your copy soon. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of... The Texas Rangers. Chimes mean good times on NBC. It's yo ho for the open sea tomorrow as the Railroad Hour presents Gilbert and Sullivan's comic opera, The Pirates of Penzance, starring Gordon McRae, Lucille Norman, and Clark Dennis. Gordon McRae will star in the comedy character role of the Major General. This will be the third of Gilbert and Sullivan's musical whimsies offered on the Railroad Hour. For music in a more serious manner tomorrow, the NBC Symphony brings you another hour-long concert of some of the world's greatest music under the baton of the brilliant young conductor, Guido Cantelli. Now the $64 question. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The 
the National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, the Cactus Pear. my job. I got a job because there was one open. If you left it open, that's your worry, I reckon, not mine. You've been making up to the old man trying to get me fired ever since you came into this country. That ain't so, and you know it. I've been looking for work, yeah. But you didn't get fired on my account. You got sacked because you can't leave a bottle alone. Sounds like you're calling me a liar. I ain't calling you anything. I'm just telling you. And how about clearing off? You telling me to clear off this range? All right, I'll get. But before I do, I'm going to whip your tail, Coots. You better not try it, Breck, because you ain't about to whip my tail. No, wait, I... You ain't. Now, clear off, like I told you. Don't come back. Ain't going to be no need for me to come back. Put that shotgun down. Get away from me. Get away. Here's the other barrel for good measure. All right, boy. Come on, get up. Get up. discovered by the owner of the ranch next day when he rode out to search for the missing rider. He summoned the sheriff, and the sheriff called for the assistance of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. You say you spotted the buzzards this morning, Mr. Galt? Yeah, yeah, and I found Coach. From the look of him, he must have been shot sometime yesterday. Thought I heard a shotgun yesterday afternoon. Should have rode out then. Why didn't you? Uh, Sheriff, you know, we've been having a time with the coyotes and mountain cats lately. I just figured one of my hands must have spotted one and cut loose. Coots was fixing a break in the fence, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Might have known something was wrong when Coots didn't come back to the ranch last night. The uh, spot's just up ahead where my deputy's standing. Yeah, you can see the body now. Anybody been stealing cattle around here lately, Sheriff? Oh, a few head now and then, Chase. Nothing big. Coots might have run into somebody doing it, though. Might have. Well, here we are. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Howdy, oh, Sheriff. Uh, hi there. Yeah. Hi, the horse is off the fence here. I don't want him tramping around near the body. Good no, idea. Right. Uh, Coots with you a long time, Mr. Galt? No, is he? No. Hired him on less than a week ago. He was new around here, Chase. Only been here about a month, all told. Ever say where he came from? Yep. Yep, over around Marfa. Bit with both barrels, Jace. Once through the stomach, once through the head. Yeah. It was on the ground when the second charge hit him, though. Look. Well, the shot clipped the grass. Yeah. Killer's horse stopped here, too. Looks like. Mm. Shoots must have had a fist fight with the man who killed him. How do you figure that, Jace? A little dried blood on the grass here. A scuffle marks and some of the blades pressed down as though somebody'd been lying here. Mm, Coots was shot, though. Might be his blood, wound. No, with his wounds, he was killed instantly. He didn't move 15 feet and then back again after getting blasted like that. Come on. All right. 
Hey, what you looking for? Watch moved off this way. Prince mixed right in with some of your herd. Grazed around here and then took off mighty sudden. See here where they dug in to get started? Yeah, that could mean a cattle thief, all right, chasing the stock, Jace. We'll find out. Let's get back to the horses. Follow this trail. <laughs> so the trail of his horse wouldn't stand out clear. Uh, I don't see how you can tell that. Heard mm, moved up range toward the mesa. Anybody stealing them would have been driving them to the south fence where the state road is. Have to get them to a truck to get them away. Yeah, but what made them run then, Chase? A uh, shotgun must have stampeded them. They'd been driven. Some of them left marks where they cut out to get away from the rider. The rider would have left tracks cutting after them. Uh, I see what you mean. But shouldn't we keep on trailing them, though? Yeah, but not this way. He was headed for rocky ground near the mesa, trying to lose anybody who might follow him. He's smart. I don't get your plan. And he was careful leaving here after he killed a man. He might have been so careful riding in before he killed. We'll backtrack the trail he took getting here. He might tell us where he came from. That makes sense, Juice. Let's go. Up for it. Ranger, can I have the body picked up by the funeral house now? Yeah. Even an autopsy isn't going to tell us much. Oh? I thought you could tell a lot from the shot that killed somebody. That uh, ballistic stuff. Man. Not so much with a shotgun. Barrels are smooth bore. Don't leave rifle marks. But hey, hold it. Hey, hey, hey. Hey. What'd you find, Ranger? These empty 16 gauge shotgun shells. The killer might have ejected them here to reload his shotgun in case he ran into trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell anything at all? We find the gun they came from, we might be able to match the way the hammer hits the shell. Yeah, if we find the shotgun. Every rancher in Calpoke in the county must have one. The sheriff and I backtracked on the approach the killer had used to get to the Triangle Ranch owned by Golf, but we came to a dead end. Well, Chase, guess this is as far as we go. Can't follow him on pavement or the gravel road shoulder. Yeah, road out from town. It's too bad. I was hoping he'd come from a ranch someplace. Would have narrowed us down to one spot. Nothing much we can do now, except we can go around examining shotguns. One other thing first. A couple of deep tracks in that ditch off the road. Must have had rain here recently. Yeah, day before yesterday. That's why he left such a clear print there yesterday, man. I want to get a kit from my radio car and drive back here. What for? Take a couple of photographs of that print. Make a faster impression of it. Help us to identify the horse if we find him. I took the cast and headed for town. To check every horse in the territory would have been impossible, so I had to gamble on a shortcut. Howdy, Ranger. Sheriff. Howdy. Howdy. Hey, uh, mind dropping that hammer a minute and taking a look at this? Sure thing. Hey, what is it? Plaster cast. Shoe print of a left hind hoof. You remember making a shoe like this, Ed? In common plate, sir. It was caulked or something I might remember, but I don't know. I know it's a tough one, but all shoes are a little different. We're in different places. Hoops have to be fitted for slightly different shapes. That's true, all right. If I come across that shoe now, after seeing the cast, I might recognize it. Good. I'm going to leave this cast here. If anybody brings in a horse to be shod, and the left hind hoof looks like the cast, don't touch it until you call us. You're right glad to have it. Keep my eyes open. Any other blacksmiths around here, Sheriff? Oh, not for over 50 miles. Are you going looking for that gun now? You start on it. I'm going to pay another visit to the Triangle Ranch. I want to talk with Mr. Gall again. <laughs> Uh, finish here in a minute, Ranger. Uh, Joe, run on the rest of the irrigation pumps, will you? Okay. That's fine. Good. Uh, what was it you wanted to know? I asked you if Coot seemed nervous, like he'd been running away from something, or somebody he was afraid might catch up with him. Uh, no, I can't say he did. All he was anxious about was finding a job. 
Seemed like good workers, so when I had an opening, I took them on regular. Oh, one of your hands leave? No, no. You see, I, I had to fire a folk named Harvey Breck. Fired him, huh? Why? He was drinking in the bunkhouse and doing his work. Did this Breck no boots? No, I just didn't see him around. How did Breck take it when you told him he was fired? Well, <laughs> he was kind of drunk. Cussed me out a little. Is that all? Yep. I trade him off, give him an extra month like I do with any hand I have to let go. He seemed all right after that. You know where this Breck is living now? I hear he's bunked up in one of them deserted Dobie huts by the old quicksilver mine. The road's washed out, though. All the huts are empty since mine stopped operating. Uh, why? Is it? You want to see him? I sure intend to. <laughs> through town and picked up the sheriff and we rode our horses out to the abandoned mine. I've checked a hundred guns today, Chase. Every tough and near tough I could think of. No good, though, huh? No, no hammer marks like the one we're looking for. You fire the guns to get a test shell for comparison? Sure. But I swear none of them was the gun we want. I kept the most likely ones and labeled them for you, though. Good. You can add one more when we test Breck's gun. I hear the shacks now. Whoa, boy. Oh, oh. Must be that one. Little smoke's coming up the chimney. That's Rick. Red is coming. You fellas looking for... Oh. Howdy, Sheriff. Howdy, Breck. Ranger wants a few words with you. Okay. Mind if we come inside? All right. Rick, and you know that somebody killed the man who took your place over at the Triangle Ranch. Yes, yeah, so I heard. Happened Tuesday afternoon. Where were you? I was right here. Anybody who says I wasn't is a liar. Nobody said anything yet. Where's your shotgun? I don't have a gun. You don't, huh? Well, where's the gun you cleaned not long ago? I didn't click. Don't tell me you didn't. This oily rag in the corner says you did. This rag was used for cleaning a gun and nothing else. Better get the gun, Brick. We want to see it. Under the bunk. Sixteen gauge double barrel. Yeah, loaded too. Hey, let me have it a minute. Let's match these with the shells you've been carrying, hey, Sheriff. Wait a Shut up, you... Rick. Twins, all right, Sheriff. No doubt about these matching. Breck, we found these shells on the Triangle Ranch. Hammer marks match yours. And Coots was killed with a shotgun. Not that gun. Sure, you found shells from it on the Triangle Ranch because I worked on the Triangle Ranch, remember? You get laughed out of court with evidence like that. I fired a hundred shots out there. At coyotes. Your story could hold this. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Because there's one other thing, Breck. We're all going to take a ride into town. After I check the shoes on your horse. Uh, that's real interesting, Ranger. Because if we're riding into town, you'll be packing me behind you. I don't own a horse. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Now we continue with tonight's case, The Cactus Pair, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Breck had a stop and he knew it. The story about the coyotes and the empty shotgun shells covered him and he didn't even have enough to take him in. We left him and headed back for town. If he is the one, Chase, we're going to have a time proving it. The gun would have made a strong case against anybody who hadn't worked on the ranch, but we can alibi that. Yeah. You got something on your mind, Chase. What is it? He swore he hadn't been on the Triangle Ranch in a week since Galt fired him. Yeah. We can't prove otherwise. I don't know. If he did shoot at a coyote, it must have been before Galt fired him. That means those empty shells would have been lying out in the ground when it rained two days ago. 
cardboard portion of the shells don't look like they've been wet. The sun could have dried them out after the rain, Chase. Yeah, there's some metal on the shell, too. I'm going to send those shells through to the lab at Austin. Do you think they'll be able to tell if they've been out in the rain or not? Metal gets wet. There's got to be some oxidation. Lab will know whether there is or not. If there isn't, I mean the shells were fired in the past two days. Yeah, but he'd still stick to his story, Chase. You know how a jury is with scientific evidence. A little leery of it sometimes. I know we'll need more. I wasn't thinking of the shells as jury evidence. I was thinking of them as a time saver for us. Oh. If he's telling the truth, we'll have to start all over. But if he's lying, we'll have to trip him up. I sent the shells through to Austin, and while I waited for a report, I drove to Pete's old home at Martha. He'd been well liked there. No reason for anybody to follow him and kill him. It was a routine check, and on the way back, I got my report from Austin. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead. Have report from Austin Lab on exhibits submitted by Unit 10 for examination. Ready for it. Lab reports slight oxidation probably caused by brief exposure to normal night moisture. No evidence that shells were thoroughly soaked, though. No indication of such exposure in lab report. 10 for Unit 10 clear. PDXA Austin. I drove back south as hard as I could. When I got near the quicksilver mine, I took charcoal out of the trailer and rode onto the shack Breck had been using to make sure he was still around. Oh boy, oh charcoal. Open up. I want to talk to you. All right. What do you want this time? Just want to make sure you're still around, that's all. Well, you see me, don't you? Yeah. I see something else, too. It's like you've been packing a few things in there. That's my business, not yours. I'll make it my business if you try to leave this county. Now, look, Mike, you've got nothing on me. You'd have taken me in before. If I want to move out of here, I reckon I can move. Right. Hit the county jail so fast it won't even give your spurs time to rattle. Yeah, you're talking big, but you ain't got a charge to hold me on. Ain't no law against shooting coyotes. No. There's a law against moving into a shack without the owner's permission. The mining company give you the right to live here? Yeah. Doesn't gonna be hard to check on. All right, then, Ranger, go back to town and check. Because until you do and get a warrant, you got no right in here. Have you? Okay, Brick. I'll be back. And you better be here. I got back to town as fast as I could. I had to have a minor charge to hold him on. As I pulled up to the sheriff's office, I found out I wasn't going to need it. Stay in the car, Chase. Why? What's up? You got here just in time. We're just heading for my car. Let's move. Which way? Straight ahead. Blacksmith shop. He found the horse we've been looking for. Look, just like the cast. Oh, oh boy. See this nick in the left hind shoe? It's nail bent a little. Same as the impression on the cast. Sit, all right. Who owns it? Ranger, you're probably going to eat me out for this, but he's mine. Yours? You mean to say you couldn't recognize a shoe you fitted to one of your own horses? Well, that's a trouble, Ranger. I didn't show him. I only bought them a month ago, and I was just going to put new plates on them for the first time now. That's how come I just spotted the shoe. What were you doing out on the Triangle Ranch when Coots was killed? But, Ranger, I wasn't out there. Your horse was, last Tuesday. But I wasn't riding him. I loaned him out. You better tell us who you loaned him to. Well, I let Harvey Breck use him. What? Breck? Well, when my wife can tell you, I'll call her. You don't have to call her. Come on, Sheriff. Let's go. <laughs> Stopped for the sheriff's horse, loaded him in a double trailer with charcoal, and headed for the mine. He left the car at the washout, unloaded the horses, and drove to the Adobe shack Breck was using. We got enough to take him in now, Chase. He's still here. He was packing to leave. Look, he hasn't left yet. Here's the hut he was using. 
Strike a light under the door. We're on time, then. Not much to spare. It's a cinch he figures to move out tonight. He won't move now. Stop here. Oh, oh, oh. He isn't going to come easy, Sheriff. Watch out for that shotgun. If he wants gunplay, he can have it. We'll know when he answers the door. All right, Brack. Open up. We know you're in there, Brack. Now, come on. He'll be waiting there so he can nail us with that shotgun if we bust in. We can wait out here for you, Brack. That light in there could keep us waiting all night if he's gone. You mean it's a trick to slow us up? We'll find out. Keep that door covered while I kick it in. Right. That was empty. Brett had made his getaway. We went over the ground outside to get his direction. We led toward rugged country and we followed as fast as we could on horseback. Cut him back and forth to pick up his marks. Well, up into these hills, Sheriff. We made some time. It was easy to trail this far, and he's on foot. Yeah, but we're going to be on foot too now. Why? He's headed for the border, Chase. Rio Grande's that way, but no horse can take this country between here and there. Oh, boy. Oh, Charlie. How far is it to the river? Forty miles of country the devil won't have, and we'll have to cover every inch of it up. That's what he's doing. Come on, let's go. We must be close to a fight. Hey, look, Sheriff. That's him. Top of the ridge. Get the cover under that ledge. Huh? so they can move off and graze later. Are we going to get to him? Long way up that bridge, and we'll be moving right into his sights. You go around that way. All right. Crawl and hunt whatever cover you can find. I'll go the other way and see if we can't circle in behind him. We move slowly, inches at a time, up the side of the treacherous slope. It took almost an hour. It was just what Breck wanted. two miles to his one, Jace. Every time we lose the trail, he gains ground. Yeah. Can't be helped. We get to the top of this ridge, and maybe the wrong one again, like the last two we climbed. Well, it's daylight in a couple of hours. We'll be able to spot his tracks. Better then we can move fast. Maybe we better rest until then. We can. Count on him having the rest. It's the only time we can up on it. I can do that, Chase. But there'll be another day and night of this without a wink and no guarantee we'll catch him at that. We may go any direction to make us cross. You want to rest a few hours while I go on ahead? If you're going, I'm going. Good. Come on. If we only knew which... Hold it, Sheriff. Right. Between the rocks. Here, throw your light on it. All right. Look. Barely grown in the earth between the rocks. The roots ripped out a little and exposed. Yeah. Flesh, too. Grab the scrub to pull himself up. Good. He means we aren't trying to listen for nothing this time. No. Better keep on climbing. Yeah. More mountains ahead. Hey, wait. Move 
Anderson? No. No, got over this way. Something on the ground by that the cactus patch. Yeah. Dug for water again and hit it, too. Stay away. Dig a little. Get a drink for myself. Knows the cookie, all right. Never misses. Seems to know just where to dig if there's even a mouthful of water. What's you doing over there? The aid here. Rest of two. Actor's pear's been cut and skinned. The sun hasn't dried the skins out yet. He's only an hour or so ahead now. His tracks show he's slowing down. Still going fast enough to make that river sometime tonight, though. We'll be there, too, then. A little water running up in this hole now, Jace. We better take him half full. You first. Thanks. Then let's move. That's as hard as we could. He was getting closer to the river. We're going towards that Alina Canyon, Jace. It was narrowed. How far? Just a half a mile away. Got to run then, Sheriff. You make it? Try. at the river. He was just waiting in. Stop, Brett! I'll get him. Don't make me put a bullet in you, Brett. Yeah. You, you ain't taking me. Oh, yes, I oh, am. Let go. Let go. I'm over the border. Not while you're still in the river. Let go, I said. I don't... Oh. Get him! Yeah. But you're going to have to help me. Drag him to shore. <laughs> A few more feet. He'd have made it. He needed just a few more seconds. Just about as long as it took to eat a cactus. Harvey Breck was tried and convicted for the murder of Robert Coots. His sentence... 99 years. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. When the Allies invaded Normandy in World War II, they got an idea as to how far the fame of the Texas Rangers had spread. Both surrendering Nazis and liberated free French said they knew the war was as good as over because the Texas Rangers had landed. Of course, it was the heroic American Ranger troops who made the landings, but nothing could convince the Nazi war prisoners that these were not the terrible Texans they'd heard about in many American legends. Good night, folks. See you same time next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. included Tony Barrett, Wilms Herbert, Tom McKee, and Gerald Moore. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Monday means music on NBC. Tomorrow night, the voice of Firestorm presents a selection of melodies in the Christmas spirit with Metropolitan Opera star Jerome Hines of Soloist. The NBC Symphony brings you another one-hour concert 
featuring works by Vivaldi and Beethoven under the baton of the brilliant young conductor Guido Cantelli. Stay tuned for the $64 question with more good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Christmas present. It is 2 p.m. December 21st, four days before Christmas year of 1931. On a city street corner in North Texas, a man dressed as Santa Claus suddenly leaves his post beside a large red pot labeled Help the Poor. Shivering with cold, he enters the newly opened building of the Panhandle Equity Bank and approaches the bank guard. Say, master, you mind if I stay in here a few minutes, warm up a little? I sure don't. I've been watching you through the window. Don't know how you stood it as long as you did. Oh, this Santa Claus outfit's pretty warm at first, but then the cold sort of creeps in on you. How long do you expect you to stand out in that? Oh, eight to two. Six hours, that's all. Well, it's uh, two o'clock right now. You can go home. Yeah, not till my relief man shows up, I can't. Then later he gets here, some money in a pot out there. Oh. Well, why don't you wait right in here till you see? Well, I was hoping you'd say that, because I'm sure. Oh, there he is now. Just drove up in the car. Oh, he can't leave the car parked there in front of the bank. There's a time limit on parking. Well, I think he's just wondering why I'm not there. I better go out and... Oh, he sees me. He's coming in. Howdy. Howdy. I was wondering when you get here. God let me come in and warm up. I hope your Santa Claus suit is warmer than his. We'll be closed up by the time you need warming. Well, I don't think I'll get very cold. I got a cool 45 in my pocket, one right for your belly. Now, don't move forward. Don't move, Santa. Give your hand away, big guy. You, you, you guys are pulling a stick up. Don't you can figure that all out for yourself, stupid. Let's make it a nice, quiet stick up. Just walk to the rear of the bank with us, take us through the door to the money in the vault. Now, go on. You'll never get away with this. You just trying to attract any attention. You'll never live to know whether we're doing that. All right. Open that door. The girl by the desk has to open it. It's button control. Well, I'll tell her you won't in. Uh, Miss Keene. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Lovett. Your Santa Claus friend's coming in with you? Yeah. Oh, we're so busy, I didn't even notice. But something wrong, Mr. Lovett. You look kind of sick. You'd be more than sick if you let out one year. They've got guns in their pockets, Miss Keene. <gasps> Watch your mouth, sister. Nobody else can see us now. Take his gun. I've got it. Now, sister, whether he lives or not is up to you, understand? What do you want me to do? Put the keys to those money trays. Get to it. All right. You've got the sack. Tell her what to put in it. Stuff it into your jacket when you're through. All right. And remember, sister, one you have to miss your kit. All right, all right. Go on. Come on, stuff it in the sack. What are you going to do when you leave? Come on, fast. What do you mean? We'll give you a chance to get away. I mean, we won't yell or anything until you're gone. Honest. Honey, that's real nice of you. Maybe you ought to be wearing the Santa Claus suit instead of me. You think I'm going to fall for a free up, will you? One of the bank executives is heading back here. All right, all right. I'm almost through. As soon as I get it in my face. Hey, what are you doing back here, Lovett? Why aren't you out front? Uh, the, the, the Santa Claus fellas, Mr. Peabody, just wanted to... Oh, what's the other one doing in the vault there? The scheme, what the... Oh. Oh. Answer this question later. When and if he comes to. 
Congratulations on your self-control. You'll have to get medals for saving your own lives. Oh, come on, let's go. I got All it. right. Let's leave these people to quiet. Wait. Oh. Statewide alarm was put out to all law enforcement agencies in a matter of minutes, but the perpetrators of the Santa Claus stick-up had vanished. Texas Ranger Jace Pierce, the closest unit to the scene of the crime, was requested to investigate. The chief of police gave me the general details. I'd like to get your story firsthand. Well, I I saw the guard take them through there, Ranger. I, I went back to see why he was leaving his post on the bank floor, and that's that's when I got hit. You have any idea how big they were? No, I don't. I was too excited. Let's see. What's your name? Leon Peabody. I'm second vice president. How about the girl, Miss Keene, and the guard, Lover? Both of them were knocked out, too. Miss Keene finally came to and we sent her home, but they took Lover to the hospital. He, he wasn't in good shape. Skull fracture? They don't know. Well, how come you stayed around? It's a nasty bump you've got. <laughs> I feel it, too. Plenty. Ooh. But uh, I knew the police would need whatever information there is, so I stayed. Yeah, you better sit down. Oh, thanks. You think you could recognize either of the hold-up men? Yeah. Dressed the way they were? I'm afraid not. It's a cinch they chucked those Santa Claus suits right after they left here. I hope they left a few fingerprints. Mm, both of them were, were wearing gloves. Yeah. You get a tally on how much they made off with? We're, we're running the tape on it. We'll know in a couple of minutes. This job worked pretty smoothly. They seem to know the setup behind the petitions there. Have any of your employees ever been in any trouble? Those men weren't employees of the bank. I uh, know they weren't. But somebody inside could have supplied them with your new layout. Helped them plan the job. Well, sir, all of our employees have been with us for at least a year. And we haven't taken on any new ones since we moved over here two months ago. Mr. Peabody. Uh, oh, yes, Donnelly. Is that the rundown? Yes, sir. 63,800. And we've got serial numbers on some of the larger bills. Good. That'll help if they try to pass any. I'll take a copy of that list. Police can alert the other banks and merchants. We'll get numbers out on the statewide and interstate. We may run down some more serial numbers when we cross-check the pocket. That'll be fine. I think you ought to go home now, Mr. Peabody. We can reach you there if you're needed. Oh, thank you. I guess I shouldn't even think about myself, though. I'm a bachelor, but the guard love it. He's got a wife and three children. Yeah. Pretty rotten Christmas present for them if he, if he doesn't pull through. I paid a call on Miss Keene, the girl who'd been slugged. She was in a state of shock and hysteria. By nightfall, all possible angles had been checked, and we still didn't have a lead. My boss... Ranger Captain Stinson flew in. I met him at the airport and drove him to town. You talked to all the welfare agencies that have Santa Clauses stationed on the streets? Yeah, and every man they have checked out clean. It was a phony setup, Captain. Even though one of the bandits spent the whole day right out the corner outside the bank. Well, that was smart. Got the bank guard used to seeing him. Yeah. City police are checking to see if they can find out where the suits came from and who got them. Good idea. How's the bank guard doing? Love it. I checked the hospital. He's still out. No fracture, but they can't bring him around. He may have... KTXA to Unit 10. That's yours, Jason. Yeah. Unit 10. Go ahead, KTXA. City police report stolen car found in alley off Crockett Street between Maple and Lolly. Maybe car used in Panhandle Equity Bank robbery. Police chief requests your assistance. 10-4. Proceeding there immediately. 10-4. Unit 10, clear. We better get there fast. This may be the break we need. Here it is, Rangers. Abandoned in the alley. Prowl car spot didn't check the license on the stolen car list. When was it reported stolen, Chief? Early this morning. The owner says it might have been missing since yesterday. He's been away. You check on him? Yep, he's clear. That's where he said he was. What makes you fellas think this is the car? Found this on the floor, under the seat. Big red button. Hmm. Off a Santa suit, all right. I'm going to climb in behind the wheel for a second. Ask one of the men in the prowl car to flash his light this way. Good. Let's have a spotlight here, will you, boys? Okay, Chief. That do, Ranger? Yeah, that's fine. 
Have any of your men moved this rear vision mirror, Chief? Nope. How about this front seat? You slide it back to get that button you found? No, oh, just saw it under there and reached in and got it. What are you trying to figure, Jase? The last fellow who drove this car was pretty big. About an inch or an inch and a half taller than I am. What makes you think so? Because the seat's all the way back where it would be for a tall driver. And I have to raise myself a bit to get a clear view through the rear vision mirror. Well, hey, that's good thinking, James. Yeah, but maybe he didn't touch anything. Maybe he left the car just like it was when he stole it. I'll give odds against that. The man who's getting away from a bank stick-up wants to know what's coming behind him. <laughs> since the report of the robbery, so the men we were after figured to be close by. But all we knew was that one of them was about six foot three. In the morning, we made a routine check with police headquarters. Morning, Rangers. Morning, Chief. Morning, Chief. Have your men come across anything? We're just going to check through this report. It tells us the location of just about every Santa Claus suit in town. All of them belong to organizations using them for their Christmas parties. It was once in a while they let some private individual bomb for a kid party or something, as if they put up deposit funds. We've got a list of the places that have loaned suits out. We've got them. That's top paper. And we'll just start to check it. You look if you like. Thanks. Looks like we might be adding a murder charge to the armed robbery, Captain. Well, thank God, David. Not yet, but it looks bad. They're yeah, operating for a blood flow on the brain. Uh, Wait a minute. What is it, Jason? I think we've got a boy to talk to. This list. Two suits borrowed from two different organizations, but both borrowed by the same man, Anthony Ross, 124 Pettigrosa Street. Say, that's worth looking into, Jace. Come on. Let's pick him up. Listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Christmas Present, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The home of Anthony Ross at 124 Pettigrosa Street turned out to be a rundown shack on the outskirts of town. A small boy and girl, not dressed well enough against the cold, stopped playing with a mongrel dog as we drove up. They stared at us while we went up the rickety porch, the dog barking at our heels. It's all right, boy. It's all right. Take it easy. Good boy. There's a good Yeah, what? Oh, Texas Rangers. You Anthony Ross? Yeah. We'd like to come in. Oh, sure. Danny, you and Jim take the dog and the back of the house and stay there. Look at those suit boxes, please. I don't see him. What do you want to see me about? We can start with those boxes on the table. What's in them? I, I, don't, I don't know. Just just a couple of packages. That's all. They, they ain't mine. You better open them up, Jason. Yeah. No, no, no. Wait a minute. I, I, I tell you, they ain't mine. You got no right to... This search look. warrant says we have search for him. Now, look. Now, the, those things ain't stolen. They were rented. Mm -hmm. A couple of Santa suits, all right, Captain. Now, look. A button missing from the jacket of this one. I, I, I don't know what this is all about. Why, why are you coming? Maybe we can refresh your memory. The guard you slugged at the Panhandle Equity Bank isn't expected to live. What? Who was wearing the other suit, Ross? Who was your partner? What are you guys doing to me? I... I, I don't know what you're talking about. We're talking about the $63,000 stick-up you and somebody else pulled yesterday. And since you're about five foot ten, I can tell you that your partner is about 6'3". Rangers, you're making a mistake. I, I, I don't even know anything about a hold-up. But the suit was found in your getaway car, the one your partner drove. It wasn't me. I, I tell you, I, I didn't even know what kind of costumes were in them boxes. They ain't mine. And where'd you get them? Uh, I, I picked them up at, 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 a, at a couple of places yesterday morning. You say you picked them up, and you're trying to tell us you don't know what's in the box. I, I picked them up for somebody else. They were rented out in your name. The woman ordered them in my name. What woman? The one who hired me to pick them up. That's a pretty phony story, Ross. Who was this woman you're talking about? What's her name? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't even know. 
better come with us, Ross. No, 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 no. You, you, you got to listen to me. Please, please listen. You, you got to believe me. I, I, I was in town early yesterday morning. She, she come right up to me on the street. I, I was put, pulling my, my, my kid's old wagon along trying to find some junk I might sell. You sure you don't want to think this story over before you go any further? She, she, she asked me if I wanted to earn a dollar running a couple of errands. I said, sure. I thought you'd give my kids a meal for the change. She asked me my name and address, and I told her, and then, then she told me to wait while, while she went into a booth and made some phone calls. When she come out, she sent me to two different clubs, told me that would be costumes and packages. She had them left in my name to avoid the confusion, she said. You didn't think that was funny? Mister, all I could think about was earning that dollar. She, she'd give me money, deposit money for the costumes, and, and, and told me to come back and, and meet her with the stuff on that same corner. Where were you at 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon? I, I was looking around for a junk again for a couple hours after I delivered the packages. And, and I, I guess at, at 2 o'clock, I, I was walking back home from town. A long walk to here in this weather. Cost of a bus ride will buy a loaf of bread for the kids you saw outside. Is that a crime? What's it to you if I walk my feet off to feed my kids? All right, Ross. That was a nice act. But there's a big hole in it. You say you delivered the Santa Claus suits to a woman you didn't know. But you've still got them. Yeah, I've got them. They're going to mean a good Christmas. Uh, you're not going to believe what I tell you. The woman came here last night, drove up in a car, woke me up. She, she, she said she was leaving town in a hurry. She didn't have time to take the costumes back yourself. And, uh, and if I'd take them back, I, I could keep the deposit. Fifteen dollars each. Yeah, but you're not going to believe that, are you? You better get your... Will you, will you give me a chance to ask one of the neighbors to watch out for my kids? I'm afraid you'll be gone too long for that. I'm sorry, but we'll have to take him into the juvenile home. Oh. I guess, I guess they'll get better care there than I've been able to get. I get my coat. Ross, you been doing any painting around here? Paint? This place looks like it ever saw paint. What made you ask that, I just noticed this inside the leg of this Santa Claus suit. Paint blob. Looks fresh. Well, how come it's inside the leg, not outside? I don't know. Something we'll have to figure. This is the large size suit. Must have been worn by the big boy we're looking for. <laughs> Did a job a little bit, dropping the Ross kids off at the general home. Sometimes it's the only thing to do. You cried for their father. It always makes something inside you cry a little with them. You took Ross to the jail and locked him up. Well, that seems to be it, Rangers. By the time he comes up for trial, he should be ready to name his accomplice. That is, if we don't find him before then. I'd go along with that, Chief, if we'd found any money on him or in the house, even a few dollars. Uh, kids got under your skin, aren't you? Mm, they got under yours, too, Captain. You know it. Yeah, but we got to remember, that bank guard has kids, too. Have you got any late reports on him from the hospital? Man stationed there says the operation is over. Don't know how it's going to come out yet, though. Might as well go over there and check with the doctors, Jace. I got to get back to company headquarters. Do me a favor, then. You're heading toward Austin. Take the Santa outfits with you and have them sent on to the lab. Get an analysis of that paint in the trousers. Maybe some traces in the boots, too. Well, how come the boots? Well, they need to go on over regular shoes. I figured that paint stain on the inside of the pants came from a blob of paint on the shoe of the man who put them on. I see. All right, Jace, you want to know the content of the paint and see if lab can run down the source, is that it? Yeah. You were uh, working up to some kind of a machine? Maybe. A few things I'm trying to fit together. If they do, though, you'll hear from me. I went over to the hospital and checked with the doctors. The outcome was still in doubt. The guard's wife was there, face twisted with worry and fear. There was nothing I could do to help until I got some sleep. Then in the morning, I went back to see the police chief. 
Oh, Ranger, I'm glad you dropped in. I just had a long-distance call from your lab headquarters in Austin. Report on that paint. Here, I wrote it all down. Paint is manufactured right here in town. The brand name is Light Glow. Light Glow? Mm -hmm. Can you get a list of local painting contractors who use it? Well, I reckon just about all of them do. Good paint, this wouldn't hardly be Texas if it didn't deal with a local outfit, would it? No, it wouldn't. Thanks a lot. I'll see you later. Where are you going? Over to the Panhandle Equity Bank. Mr. Peabody, do you know who painted this bank before you opened? Well, the contract for the building included the paint. And I guess that was done on a subcontract. Did you find out from the contractor? Sure. But you mind my asking why? I told you the day of the robbery. Everything was too well planned. Like the men who did it knew the inside of the bank. Yes, I remember you saying that. You think the painters may have? Uh, that's what I think. But uh, why not some of the construction men? I've got a reason for being interested in painters. Check it for me, will you? He checked. The contractor gave the name of the painters. Two men, Eddie West and Martin Hogan. They'd been working the day of the robbery. He said at a house on the north side of town. I went out to the house to see the owner. Why, yes, Ranger. They worked here all day that day. I remember we heard the report of the robbery on the radio. They were both here all day? Yes. Didn't even go out to eat? Had their lunches with them. Hmm, kind of smelly when a house gets painted. Most women usually get out of the way. I wanted to watch them. So I was here every minute. See, they didn't get sloppy. I like things neat. I see. Well, thanks, ma'am. I'm sorry I bothered you. Uh, why are you asking about them, Ranger? Nothing important. Not as long as you say that we're here. Goodbye, ma'am. Merry Christmas to you. Yeah, thank you, Randy. Merry Christmas. She was the alibi for Eddie West and Martin Hogan. She was too nervous about answering a few simple questions. Nervous enough to make me wonder. I went back to the jail, got Anthony Ross out of my custody, and drove him to the north side of town. Get out, Ross. We're going in here for a minute. Why? What are you trying to frame now? I just want you to meet somebody. Well, back again, Ranger. I thought we'd... That's her. Ranger, that's the woman... Who is he? Who is this man? You ought to remember me, lady. My kids are in juvenile home on account of you, and I've been in jail. I never saw you before in my whole life. Tell him the truth. Tell him before I... Hold it, Ross. Take him away from here. Go away, both of you. Ranger, I got those costumes for her. For her. You're a liar, a liar. That word fits somebody, all right. Can I come in and have a look around, ma'am? What for? What do you want? I want to check over the painting job to see if it's just new painting or if there's some new plaster on that side. Well, you can't come in. You have no right. The boys, your alibi on four must have come back here after they cracked the bank. Because you must have picked them up in your car after they ditched the one they're using. I don't know what you're talking about. They carry the money on them. Did they cover it up here, safe under fresh plaster and paint until it cools no. off? No! No! Call for a search warrant and wait till the crew comes and tears this place apart. Go better for you if you don't try to cover it. The money isn't here. Well, come on, come on. Where is it? It's... It's here, all right. In that wall. Behind the picture. Come on, Ross. Which one's your boyfriend? Logan or West? Eddie. West. He said we'd get married. Go to Europe next year. We'll all go someplace next year, but it won't be Europe. West about six foot three? Yes. How did you know? I got an early Christmas present. Somebody sent me a crystal ball. As soon as I call the police and dig out that bank money, you're coming with us. Ranger, uh, I'm clear now, ain't I? Looks that way, Ross, but you'll have to go back to jail for a while and be checked out by the local police. That won't take any longer than it'll take me to pick up Eddie West and Martin Pogden. <laughs> Christmas Eve like a couple of house painters would be doing. I found out where they were working. Logged to the warehouse. Local police covered the building until I went in. Eddie, who's that? 
Who came in? Bob will be the watchman. Watch out for those pink cans. Don't worry. I see them. That ain't the watchman's voice, eh? From all the shadows where we can see you. I'm coming. But seeing me isn't going to make you happy. Eddie, the answer takes us right. 